Maybe Tomorrow by J. Little Chapter 1 Gaylord Leclerc loved the space around him, the furniture, the rug, the etching, all of it. But as he looked around, he longed for something else, longed for some demonstration to equal the bitter violence he felt within himself. He looked again at the etching, and shutting his eyes, wished desperately for something to happen. The time was fast approaching for him to have a girl, and act like a grown man, instead of like a timid, adolescent child. Why, why, he cried within himself, can I be like fellows my age? Why can I feel grown up? He stood still a second longer, a helpless figure in the brightness of the room. Somewhere, somehow, he was certain that in the pattern before him lay the answer to the old conundrum of his life. It was all dim and puzzling, baffling with its secrets, and as he sought to understand, it blurred and spun even more before his closed eyes. For many months, he had felt this uneasiness grow. No one he knew was beset with the melancholia, emotional frigidity, or feminine symbolisms he found in himself. And instead of decreasing, as they should, they grew with each passing day. He wanted to fight them. But how? He could not fight things he didn't understand. Why couldn't he understand them? Why couldn't he be at ease among boys his age instead of drawing meekly away? Oh, if only he could. That would at least be one accomplishment. With a feeling suspended between erotic hunger and intellectual curiosity, he thought of Joe Kinaric. Joe Kinaric, big man, a father and only seventeen, his age. He could see Joe's huge physique turning over and over in the slow spiral, moving away from their schoolroom. From time to time, one hand held a baby while the other held a hand of his pregnant wife. The loose dress was at last all he saw of her, and then Joe's face came back boyish yet manly in its youthfulness. The vision left him with an uneasy feeling of being anchorless, adrift on an unknown substance. He did not sob or weep like ordinary boys. He cried with a despairing stridency, like an animal bound and helpless, which is being flayed alive with stones and cannot bear its agony. He thought of Robert Blake. It came out of itself from deep within him, and as he looked admiringly at Blake's clear image, in the back part of his mind, there was just a ghost of a suspicion. It wasn't quite the proper feeling he should have. I can't help feeling this way about Bob, he thought hotly. There's nothing wrong in liking him, admiring him. I only wish I were like him. The thoughts rocked his bewildered state even more, but with it came a languished longing. He shivered on remembering the deep bronze face, set mouth, grinning. Darn, Bob had the cutest grin. No wonder everyone liked him. He was so good-looking, so friendly, so sweet, so darn good-looking. It was the sort of face that made his fingertips itch to reach up and stroke. That made his voice drop deep in his throat, murmuring ancient, wordless, wonderful things. Dreaming of Blake now, he found himself wishing again for his friendship. It could reconstruct his whole life. He even visualized the difference, but it had blurred. It was only another dream for the barrier between them had never been scaled. He was too shy to be the aggressor, and Blake, after all these years, didn't even know he was alive. But he could not end his thoughts of Blake abruptly. He stood as if drugged, reminiscing of times he had come into a gathering where Blake had been. Afterwards, he found that he could remember precisely what he had worn, whom he had danced with, and every careless word he had said. He remembered every detail in that bronze face. It was a face he could not forget, a face he had seen and marked, one that had troubled him in many a senseless dream. And now he thought of Robert Blake, neither timidly or morosely, but as a child longs for a new toy. Bob, he murmured, and as his voice caressed the word, like a lover breathing the name of his beloved, Oh, Bob, why don't you ask me to go out with you some night? There's no one I'd rather go out with. No one. It would make me so happy. I wish you'd go riding with me. I wish I could ask you. Why can't I ask you? He had no words when Blake did speak to him. Only a warm feeling in his blood and on his skin and in the burgeoning parts of his body, like a burning fever. He was drunk with admiration around this bronze idol. 
He was drunk, too, with the creative fury inside him, which was for him a book of prophecy, revealing himself to himself. Why was he so bashful, so timid and shy he couldn't go after the things he wanted? Others did. Had a support, a prop been lacking in himself? Had he been born without a nerve others possessed? There was bound to be something. Something mysterious. The conflict that had been generated inside him had grown with each passing minute, and now they were magnified beyond all reason. Gaylord sighed deeply. All love he felt for Blake grew within him. Even if it was strange, he couldn't stop this feeling. He had always felt strange around Blake. Yes, always. A feeling of something not understood surrounded Blake. Oh, God, he sighed. Life's sure a mess. He dropped his gaze to his clothes and moved slowly, his thoughts changing with every step over the deep carpet of his upstairs room. He was dressed, ready to leave. Yes, in a little while he would have to yield himself to another ordeal, a self-inflicted ordeal. First, he would drive to the auditorium, alone, where the dance was. Then he would walk down the crack sidewalk, alone, and the riddle would be repeated. You're scared. You're timid. You're a sissy. He could see the cunning glances thrown at him. He could hear their wisecracks, and he would shrink into himself, as he had always done when a crowd was involved. Perhaps Blake would be outside. He doubted it, since it was quite late. Still, it would be nice to walk up with Blake and Joy. Blake was so friendly, kind, not like the others. He could see and hear them in the blur before him, devoid of kindness or understanding. And the auditorium also aspired into a tantalizing web, into which his life was woven with a deadly grip. It held fast, awakening memories of himself that he would never forget. A misunderstood boy named Gaylord, standing always alone. With a degree of confusion, he was a child again, sitting next to his mother, recalling her saying, You know the first thing my nurse told me after you were born, darling? She said you were the most beautiful baby she had ever seen. You were so pink and pretty, not red like most newborn babies. Your Aunt Emma named you that first night. She was going with a boy named Gaylord, and when she suggested it, I liked it immediately. I was afraid your daddy wouldn't like it, not naming you after him, but he wasn't there that night, and afterwards, he liked it too. His mother had told him about that night, about the small hospital room in which these words had been spoken, about the storm that had raged outside. She had made it all so clear, so real, that even as a child he heard the deafening blast of thunder tearing at the shuddering, rattling window panes, had closed his eyes on visualizing the flashes of lightning sweeping through the room. And when he had asked her where his father had been, she had only said, I don't know. A dim smile had curved her full lips, and in her eyes had been a serene look he had not understood. I don't know where he was, she had continued, but he did come shortly afterwards. She had looked at him and opened her right hand. Pale pink color had flashed on the tips of tapering fingers before him, and he had thought the hand excitingly feminine, though perhaps the skin a bit too rough, too coarse for perfect beauty. Mother, why are your hands so red? he had asked. Mother's worked hard, honey. Before I married your daddy, I lived on a farm, and girls who plow don't have pretty hands. I've worked hard with these ugly hands. But they're not ugly, he had answered. They're just red. His mother's stories flashed before him now and worked down deep into his mind. They spread before him like an oil painting of familiar interwoven lines, and across it trailed a dirty road, rough and crooked. It continued by fields of cotton, as white as floating clouds, past hay meadows and black earth, and stopped at a farmhouse. Here, in this almost unpopulated setting, his mother had lived and grown up. He loved to hear her tell about how she had plowed the earth, picked the cotton, tell about the wild tangle of weeds she rode over on horseback to school. Yes, he loved these stories that she told as they sat together, cutting out paper dolls. But the story he loved best of all was the story of how she had met his father, a story of young dreamers, a story that might happen to him. It had happened at a country dance. He had asked her to dance, and she had accepted. 
even though she had not known him, she had danced with him all evening, and several weeks later he had asked her to marry him. She had accepted, and they had moved, right after the wedding, to an oil field where he worked. She had told Gaylord about the small house, about the wedding dress she had ordered from a mail-order catalogue. She had shown it to him, for it had been in a box under the bed all wrapped in tissue paper and scented with sachet. And now Gaylord remembered the first time he had tried it on. It had fitted perfectly. So had the white satin pumps. He and his mother had had fun that day, and he recalled saying, I wish I could wear dresses all the time, mother. And she had answered, I wish you could too, darling. I prayed for a girl before you were born. Are you sorry I'm not a girl, mother? He had asked. No, dear. I wouldn't trade you for the prettiest one in the world. You're just what I wanted. It wasn't too many years back he had tried on the dress again. He had been alone this time. He would have been ashamed for even his mother to know he still liked to wear it. But to wear it again was no more. It was too small, and so were the shoes. He had felt sad that day. Sad with the realization he was growing up. The happy hours of playing Lady were over. His thoughts moved away from his mother's stories, but lingered on the dress. I wish I could wear it tonight, he thought. I wish I was a beautiful girl, and I was all dressed up waiting for Bob to call on me. I wish I wasn't a boy. For a second, he considered the unfairness of it all. He thought of that girl, Joy Clay. She had come between dreams and reality. She would be in Robert Blake's arms tonight. He would hold her close and whisper things to her that Gaylord would never hear. Why should he? After all, boys don't tell other boys about love. In fact, he couldn't even gather up enough courage to ask Blake to go riding with him. I'll ask him, he said suddenly. If I get a chance tonight, I'll ask him to have lunch with me tomorrow, and I'll ask Joey too. It'll be easier. I don't know what I'd talk about with just Bob. He thought this over a moment. It was a simple thing an everyday occurrence. He was certainly capable of speaking to Joy. He reviewed his advantages. First, he had played with Joy as a child. They had been good friends. That was good. Blake had always been nice to him, had always spoken when they chanced to meet. They certainly had no cause to be ashamed of him. After all, he was intelligent, wore good clothes, he wasn't ugly, and didn't have pimples like so many boys his age. He crossed the carpet and went to the bathroom looked at himself in the medicine cabinet mirror. He was hardly conscious of running a moist finger over each eyebrow. So engrossed was he that he had forgotten he had done the same before. He opened his eyes wide and viewed the contour of his face. He closed his eyes and thought of himself as a girl, a beautiful girl. The thought was not a strange one. It was the playing over, over, and over again of events in which he was the star figure. He tried to imagine what it would be like to be a beautiful girl, and his mind conjured up a picture of a large gathering, intimidated and cowering in the presence of this lovely female who insisted on this and that, who chose to be rid of them all except a bronze, handsome god. In these fantasies, he had charm and wit, beauty and importance. He lived them. Without his knowledge, they penetrated his actions sufficiently to increase still further the distance between himself and his classmates. He did not understand them, and they did not understand him. He was conscious of this now, in a way he had never been before. A faucet inside him had suddenly been opened, breaking through his melancholic, dreamlike existence. Rebelliously, he leaned toward the mirror and ran a soft powder puff across his face. What did it matter if Blake was going with joy? He tried to convince himself. After all, he had to take some girl. Joy was very pretty. She was sweet, too. He was glad it was she and not someone he didn't like. Bob Blake will never take you to a dance, a ghost-like voice whispered. Why should he? You're not a girl. Believing you are, why don't you get a date? Can't you? As he listened, these words were engraved pitilessly on his mind, and yet the flow of his thoughts was not halted. We can double date. And I can get a date, he thought. I know girls, too. Wanda would love to go with me. We can double date. Yes, double date. His tense young face lightened. It was one thing to imagine the fact and another to be confronted by it. He was astonished to find his eyes dry. 
but his muddle-headedness was not affected by tears. He would not cry like he had done so many times. He had come home from school, determined to read all evening, had flung himself into a book, but there were too many things interrupting his trend of thoughts. Try as he might, the book was uninteresting, monotonous, and feeling lonely, he had decided to go to the dance. What an idiot he had been not to have asked Wanda to accompany him. He had talked to her after school, and she had hinted she didn't have a thing to do that evening. He was fond of her and liked to take her places. She wasn't too popular at dances, not as popular as some girls. He found himself thinking of Thelma White. Yes, Thelma was popular. But he wouldn't take her if she were the last girl on this earth. He could see her smiling. He was reminded of devouring red lips and coiling snakes. The vision left him with a sick feeling in his stomach. He was reminded of a night long past, but still vivid in his memory. He listened a moment to echoes of her voice that still rang in his mind, then shook his head as he realized he was hearing nothing. Gaylord shuddered and passed his fingers over his eyes to brush away the panorama that had unfolded before him. I'm still going to this damn dance, he said with a determined air. I don't care if Thelma will be there. I'll get to see Bob, and maybe I'll get a chance to ask him about lunch tomorrow. He clenched his fists together and attempted a lighthearted laugh. Gaylord finished his toilet in a daze of whirling thoughts about Joy and Bob Blake. He was not interested in the girl, but he was mightily interested in making a good impression on Blake. He swore to himself that he would yet become the most correct, most admired, most warlike student at the auditorium. He screwed up his courage and walked briskly toward the stairs. He pictured his parents in the living room, chatting with each other over the little events of the day, and between them the lamp, bright and silent. Gaylord thought for a minute. Guess Dad will be glad I'm going out for a change. I've always stayed home too much, he says. From now on, I'm going to go to everything. I'm going to go to every dance or party from now on. I'm not going to say no anymore. If I'm a flop, I might as well find it out now. I might as well. Gaylord considered himself a mistreated hero. He still smarted under the insults of his classmates. But this would change, too. They wouldn't have any reason to call him sissy again. He hurried downstairs, thinking, not seeing the mass of shaded colors in the large oriental rug which almost covered the parquet floor of the living room. The soreness over his classmates' bitter words lessened gradually, and Gaylord began to be eager to be at the dance. The forlorn look was discarded. He was thinking of what he was going to say to Blake when he saw him. The room was vacant, but the lamp he had thought of was burning. He wondered where his parents were as he passed through the lovely rectangular room, filled with costly furniture, draperies, and vases. Gaylord noted with pride several roses in a crystal vase. He leaned forward to smell their fragrance. Well, you look mighty sharp. Where you going, Gay? Gaylord jumped to stiff attention. The words brought him back into the room. He had been so absorbed he had not been aware of his father sitting in a large, carved, upholstered chair. The words startled him, but instead of Blake, who had been so vividly on his mind, there sat his father, Clayton LeClaire, who was the personification of things he had always longed for, assurance and polish. He turned quickly, straightened his shoulders, and forced a smile. Oh, he said, I didn't see you, Dad. Clayton LeClaire held a newspaper in his large brown hand and a cigarette with gray ashes of an unbelievable length was between his healthy lips. The light from the porcelain lamp shone brightly upon him, and glistened on thick, curly hair, intensifying its blackness, and his dark brows gave his face a youthfulness which was most becoming. His linen was immaculate and as faultless as the small and closely clipped mustache. He looked a man of success and unashamed appetites. Got a hot date you didn't want me to know about? he said. There was a twinkle of malice in his dark blue eyes as he went on. What's her name, huh? Gaylord scanned his father's friendly face, awkwardly chuggled the change in his pocket. I don't have a date, I, he said in a slow, strangled tone. I could have gotten one, but, um, I wasn't going until all of a sudden. Going where? They're having a dance in the auditorium, and I thought I'd go for a while. That is, if you and mother don't care. Leclerc screwed up his eyes and peered at Gaylord as though he were in a very poor light. He flicked his ashes into a heavy glass ashtray. Care? 
he questioned in a pleasant tone. Hell no. You go on and have some fun. Gaylord's face brightened, and he regarded Leclerc warily from under his bushy eyebrows. Between you and me, said Leclerc in a fatherly way, I'd rather go to the dance alone too. That way you can play the whole field. You don't have to dance with one gal all evening in case you take a lemon. I guess you're right, Gaylord grinned. He hadn't even told his father he never had a date, but he had guessed it. Sure, I'm right, Leclerc rose. You run along and have a good time. Will you tell mother? Sure, I'll tell her. Gaylord was not surprised. In fact, it seemed the most natural thing in the world when his father put an arm around his shoulder and walked to the door with him. I'll have a good time, Gaylord said. And thanks, Dad. He had an impulse to kiss his father's cheek for the first time in years, but good. Don't stay out too late. Remember, school tomorrow. I won't. Leclerc watched Gaylord jump into the cream convertible he had given his son on his last birthday. As he continued to look at his reflection, he muttered to himself, Walks just like me, looks like me too. He likes that car too. Damn, I'm glad. Don't let them gals kidnap you, Leclerc yelled. I won't. Bye. Bye. Leclerc smiled, but his eyes remained opaque and expressionless. Have fun. Carol Leclerc came to the door in time to see the car disappearing down the street. Where's Gate going? She questioned. Got a hot date. A date? She questioned. With whom? I didn't ask. Leclerc turned and looked at her gratefully. He kissed her and, circling her waist with his arms, said, He's gone to a dance. You know, honey. That boy's okay. You did a good job raising him. I wish I could have spent more time with him, but you did okay. He held her closer to him. You know, Carol, I think I finally bought him something he likes. He's crazy about that car. After a while, they walked arm in arm into the house. Through the vestibule, they strolled to the living room. Leclerc returned to his paper and sank into the large chair in an excess of stupefied pleasure, still thinking with joy of his last glimpse of Gaylord, handsome in his simple sports shirt, dark hair in place, smiling up at him from inside the car. It was a perfectly satisfying picture, and he had no way of knowing that in his car, Gaylord was crouched, shivering, and afraid. Carol Leclerc also sat down, remembering a dance she had gone to some seventeen years ago. I hope he doesn't fall in love the way I did, she found herself thinking. I don't want to share him with anyone just yet. I guess I'm selfish, but I want him for myself a little longer. I love him so much. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 The gloom of the auditorium had been perennially deepened by the shadows cast upon it from the giant cottonwood trees surrounding it, shadows that roamed over its rows of endless worn shingles, on the grounds that bedplated its weather-beaten sides, moved and swayed in the moonlight as if some unseen hand was fanning its decaying bark. In cotton, the auditorium meant a perfect floor to dance on, a good time. But to Gaylord, it was an ugly thing of the past, a leap into the days of his childhood. It had none of the architectural beauty which distinguished so many public buildings in the South. Apparently, it belonged to that period of square-shaped ones which had been built with no thought of beauty, only for quick and easy construction. And if Gaylord could have chosen the building where dances were held, he would never have chosen this one. He clenched his teeth together and looked away from it, looked at the long line of parked cars. Automatically, he pulled into a vacant space, took the key from the ignition, opened the door and got out. As he stood on the gravel, feeling the large rocks pressing into the soles of his shoes, he locked the door and then, with one last look at his car, started toward the old structure that centered the public park. He felt a pang, deep and cutting, seeing couples walking hand in hand towards the auditorium. He would have to walk alone. Why did he always have to be alone? Little biting thoughts of worry began fretting his mind, and he was glad for the darkness. Would they think he couldn't get a date? He fingered his soft shirt and unbuttoned the top button. Everyone left their collars wide open. He would be like the rest. Suddenly, as if to get away from the pressure of his thoughts, he kicked the sidewalk, saying to himself, I wish they'd fix these darn walks. These cracks are dangerous. I'd like to tell the Chamber of Commerce a few things. Other things that should have been attended to were stirring in his brain, 
and he wished he had had the nerve to tell them it was a shame the open porch was so dimly lighted, the entrance so shabby, the black lettering public auditorium so much in need of paint. The two small light bulbs should have been freed from the spider webs and dead insects that draped them too. The thoughts came breaking through. A stout demand breaking before an innate shyness, like dreams, like dreams unresolved. In protest against them, he screwed up his courage and walked briskly toward the crowded porch. He noticed again the scarred lettering and outer walls. To him, the very sight of the building brought back unpleasant memories, and with each step, he was sorry he had come. He was overawed and chilled by the surroundings, the couples on the porch, and the sensation of complete unfamiliarity with any person around him. It was all caught in the dross of the past, the heartache of loneliness and longing, like an echo out of his childhood calling him back. The path lay clear ahead to the porch. He could imagine what was being thought under the examining eyes of his classmates. They smiled on passing, but... He would have turned back if something within him had not urged him on. Hi, Gay. Oh, hi, Connie. He stood undecided. He briefly considered mingling with them, but they were together, and the boy with Connie gave him a queer look. He hurried by them, but the friendly greeting had helped, had given him new courage to walk across the crowded porch under the eyes of all these strangers. Gaylord stood for the most part in silence. Aside from the occasional glances at him, no one seemed to take any special interest in him, and as he moved slowly towards the door, he felt himself becoming absorbed in the gathering. Hi, good looking, a girl's voice rang out. Gaylord spun around in unbelieving happiness at the tones, but the greeting was not for him. He dropped his head quickly. He knew they had seen him. He could feel eyes looking at him, laughing like a hungry man at the sight of a chicken leg, and his face turned a deep crimson. This embarrassed him even more. He had a sudden flooding sense, that is, he tried to imagine that all this was just a dream in looking glass land. But this crowd of nonsense impinged very strongly on the real thing. It meant that now his living body, instead of being safe in his bed, breathing deeply fresh air, would be carted across the porch, bathed in perspiration. This fact disturbed him violently. Gosh, it was hot. He wished Wanda was by his side. He looked around at the coatless boys and was glad he had not worn one either. He hoped urgently that the powder on his face didn't show too much. His forehead was so hot. Was his hair all right? Gaylord put his hands in his pockets, looked at the golden amber peering from the small broken window panes, giving life again to the paint craving window seals. The soft beams fell on the moving figures on the dance floor and now shone on Gaylord's earnest face and handsome physique. He smiled at those he knew, and his movements, without being clumsy, lacked the assurance and grace the others around him possessed. His stomach was still churning inside him, and his head was spinning. He shifted again uneasily, and glanced over the heads and through the low-hanging trees to the line of ugly one-story commercial buildings that faced the park. He felt a quiet sadness reaching into him as he looked at them so common, so ordinary, so bare of any distinction. Irregular lines of dusty paned windows, dingy and deserted in the gray light, topped with tin and wooden awnings moved before him. They had been built years ago and forgotten. There were one or two that could boast new paint, a lighted window, but the others? Nothing more than inevitable corrugated tin, rusted and fallen apart. He was unhappy and ill at ease here after all these years and his thoughts moved idly as he looked at his hometown of Cotton. He, who had dreamed of the Champs-Élysées, was here among walls of careless time and deserted hands. Tomorrow, many tomorrows, he would still be here in the old familiar routine. When school was over, maybe he could get away, away from the town and people he did not belong with. But where? Where and with whom did he belong? Gaylord moved to the rail, his hands resting on it. He gazed into a bed of zinnias. Their blossoms stood straight and proud, their petals coarse and red as flowing blood, their centers deep and mysterious, their leaves long and pointed as knives. He wondered who had planted them and how they had survived in the grass-infested earth. He watched a lightning bug move silently along the rim of darkness, giving a twinkle made possible by some unseen force. And he felt that he was, himself, 
caught by forces greater than he, pushed and pulled by incomprehensible currents. A shrill whistle sounded, and a freight train creaked and shook down the tracks that lay beyond the graveled street he had parked on. The depot, surrounded by trees and in different shrubbery, was plain in his mind. Several lighted street lamps fronted the orange-colored edifice, and as he thought of it, he remembered the first time he had waited there for his favorite aunt to arrive. He remembered saying to her, The railroad tracks cut cotton into two parts, the north and the south. The south side's got the old part of town. Nobody likes it. It's got the auditorium and the post office. But the best side is the north. It has the new buildings and the nicest homes. And his aunt had answered, And honey, I bet your daddy built his house on the north side, didn't he? And he had replied, How did you know? I just know your daddy, she had answered. I don't like it here. I wish we lived in a big city. I hate small towns. You do? Her face had tensed, but she went on, Honey, you won't have to live here all your life. When you get to be a man, you can go any place you want to. And after you've seen large cities, you might not think this little town is so bad after all. Large cities are lonely and very cold to strangers sometimes. That had happened a long time ago, a million years, and he was still here. Nothing had changed. A larger city couldn't have been any colder than this small town, this clannish place with its bullies and farmers, this infested burg he hated because no one thought of him as grown. Everyone still called him a boy. Damn them. All of them. Every damn, damn one of them. At times, there was an ugliness about him that pressed on his heart, suffocating him. It was like that now. There were people around him, but they seemed to be playing by themselves in a gray mountain world. Gaylord caught himself wondering whether the auditorium really existed. The cramped porch, the dirty windows, the dreary lights with their tattered cobwebs, and the circle of rust above their dingy glass bowls. The whole combination. He closed his eyes from the fevered dream except that he knew that the dream lay only in his mind. It was all real as stone, and all he had to do was open his eyes and re-enter the nightmare. He opened his eyes and returned to reality, to the bright young faces running from pale pink to deep tans. The dresses of the girls patterned the scene before him with whites, blues, and yellows. A boy laughed and affectionately placed his arms around his girl, his white teeth showing against large red lips. How young and happy he seemed. Gaylord wished he might do the same thing with such ease. Across from him, a girl was fingering her eye, her lovely face drawn and frowning, while her escort tried to help get something from her eye. Gaylord watched the two, remembering the time something had gotten in his eye. There had been no one to help him remove it. In fact, a chubby youth had laughed at him. That had happened not too many years back, right beside these walls. He turned and looked at them. Walls. Walls that had brought back unpleasant memories. Memories of this building. Inside the wall at which he was staring, he had gone to school. Around its grounds, he had cried many times. Tears of fear had filled his eyes and rolled down his cheeks after his mother had left him there for that first day. Left him alone with strangers. His eyes were resting unseeingly on that wall while he turned over that day in his thoughts. It was chaff blown into his memory never to be forgotten. How cruel they had been at recess, pointing to his white starch suit, teasing and calling him names because he didn't want to play ball with them. For the first time, he had been called a sissy. His curly hair had been laughed at. They had pulled at it hard. He had tried to fight back, but had been pushed into a puddle of muddy water. He remembered getting up from the shimmering foam, crying unintelligibly, only to be pushed back again. He recalled the gush of mud in his hands and the surprised look on the two boys' faces as he let them have it, full force. He grinned to himself on recalling this, but this satisfied feeling was brief. He remembered the tears of that night and how he had wished to be back in the oil field, living in the three-bedroom house instead of in the new home his father had built in this wicked, cruel town. How often he had thought of those lost classmates who had always been so understanding, so loving. How could he bear these grinning faces after knowing those friendly ones? Something had happened to him that morning long ago. Something had twisted his feelings, and his mind had become confused and different from the past calendar of days. A wall began to grow between himself and other boys, mounting higher each day. Each year it stood stronger between his and their hostile world. 
He turned to girls, played dolls with them, built imaginary houses from the huge pile of firewood stacked at the rear of the school. After that first day of school, he had steered clear of boys. He was not built differently than they, but he was, in some mysterious way, different. Gaylord stared into space and searched his mind for an answer. He wondered now about the impulse that had brought him here. Robert Blake was the unpalatable reason for it. The fact that, underneath all his bashful ways, he still had a powerful desire for Blake's friendship, or just to see him. Where was Blake? A girl pushed against him, and he smiled back at her. She wore a white sweater and gray skirt, with a little clasp of imitation pearls around her neck. Her hair fell in soft rolls about her face. She was at her very prettiest. Gaylord stood and watched her, and two thoughts followed each other through his mind. I wish I was in her shoes. Why, since I was born a boy, can't I be like the rest? Gaylord was seized with a feeling of vertigo, an actual dizziness, as though he were teetering at the edge of a precipice, looking into a turbulent sea, resisting an impulse to jump into it. From this fog of bewilderment, he tried to free himself. He watched a girl skillfully paint her mouth. He listened to every word spoken around him, listened so intensely that they seemed printed on his mind. Another push lunged him forward almost to the auditorium door. A buzzing sound mingled with shouts of laughter and music greeted him. A boy beside him had said something and giggled happily. Gaylord had not heard the cause of the laughter, but he laughed with them. Gaylord stumbled to the door during the last strains of a song. At the end, there was a storm of hand clapping. The singer hurried back to his seat without bowing. Almost immediately, the seven-piece dance orchestra struck up again, and couples jammed to the floor. The hall was large and hot, smelling of wax and mixed colognes. Gaylord stood stiffly, looking about as if trying to locate someone. He pressed his lips together, looking at the dancers, joggling on the floor. The trumpeter, blowing deafeningly into the microphone, held his glance for a second. Then he spied Robert Blake on the dance floor. He was dancing with Joy Clay, and her hand was resting on his massive shoulders. They reminded him of incidents in novels about love. They did seem like they were in love. It was not pleasant for him, but he couldn't tear his eyes away from the dancing couple. Blake was his one link with what he had wanted. Joy was sweet, but, gosh, he wished he were she. This existence was only a perfumed, glamorous unreality, he realized, like a Hollywood movie about a poor girl who marries a prince. But it was nice to dream about, nice to think about, too precious a dream world to be broken up, and so he persisted in his fervid, pointless imaginings. Hi, Gay. Hello, Vic. Having a good time? Gaylord asked. I'm trying like hell. Victor's face twisted in a wry grin. The drops of perspiration dropped from his broad forehead. Sure hot, isn't it? I'll say. There was no point in this kind of talk, but Gaylord was glad. Vic was a nice boy. He wasn't good looking, and his ears were too big for his head, but he was always nice and friendly. Victor gave him a big smile. I'll see you, Gay. Gaylord watched him race through the dancing couples. He was fascinated by his ease and speed. Already, he had tagged a girl and had her in his arms. He watched them a moment, and then Blake and Joy came into view. He watched Joy look up and laugh into the bronze face so close to her own. What did she say? He wondered. Did she say she loved him? Blake did not, and Gaylord was particularly aware of this. He did not look down, at least not until she had slapped the back of his head. And then it had been brief, very brief. Longingly, he watched Blake. Watched the grace the slim, strong body possessed. He was not envious, and the unhappiness inside him seemed to weaken and dissolve itself. It was an emotion not understood. Listlessly, he moved under pressure and let someone pass, the emotion still within him. It was impossible for anyone to deflate this moment, no matter how hard they pushed. Hello, Bob, he murmured, and then proceeded swiftly through the increasing tide. He walked by the wooden benches that circled the sides of the hall, walked past children holding on to each other. They ran in front of him, behind him, in and out of the swaying bodies. They seemed to be everywhere. No one seeing him would have known of the mixed emotions moving behind his smiling countenance. Only his deep blue eyes seemed a little sad as he made his way past them. He saw a vacant spot at a distant corner and made for it. 
At last, he sighed and sat down on the hard surface. It was hot in the corner, but it was deserted and dark. He was glad for this darkness, because from here he could watch almost unnoticed, or so he hoped. He tried to single out his two friends, but it was useless. They had vanished. They were lost in the throng of swaying figures and faces that laughed and shouted. But it didn't bother him now. He was safe, and they couldn't see him. Such wonderful music, and how he loved it. How dull and uninteresting life would be without the strains of the humming violins, the delightful tinkle of the piano, the roughness of the bass. He looked admiringly at the men in the orchestra, wishing he were one of them, especially the slim vocalist. He looked a little sad, but his eyes were bright and happy. He stared at the singer in admiration and tried to imagine what it would be like to be in his place. He closed his eyes and his mind conjured up a picture of himself, a singer with a big band behind him. Gosh, it would be so wonderful to go from city to city, traveling and singing in worlds unknown to him, a world free of emotional sufferings. Cities, states, towns, and countries poured out of Gaylord altogether, coming from some unseen depths inside him. Why was there no outlet for him? Why did he have to bury his desires so privately within him instead of realizing them? Why did Blake impress him so much? Was it because he felt Blake represented areas of experience and knowledge that he himself did not possess? Was something he wanted? Joy was pretty, real pretty. Why was he thinking of Blake and not Joy? Boys at 17 were all girl crazy. Why wasn't he? He could no more understand this feeling than he could the reason why he acted so oddly superior and aloof. He didn't want to be that way. God knew he didn't. Yet his actions betrayed him. He couldn't make advances to boys. He couldn't give them an affectionate slap on the rump or kid them, and he always seemed to freeze up at any tentative gestures of friendship they made in his direction. With them, he was ill at ease and since they felt the same toward him. Girls weren't so bad. He had dates. In fact, several girls had asked him for rides, or dances, even dates. But Gaylord knew he wasn't considered a good date. Even though he was tall, good-looking, and drove a divine car, their expression, there was something missing. He just wasn't one of them. The financial security that his father had achieved had made it possible for him to have almost anything he wanted. And one day, when he had wished for a Radio Victrola combination, a new expensive model had been delivered the next day. And buy all the damn records you want, his father had said. I'm afraid you wouldn't like the ones I'd select. Charge them to me. Clayton LeClaire had always been like that. From the very first, he had showered gifts on his son. Guns, balls, catcher's mitts. One day, he had even brought home a pony with all the accessories, but it had only left the usual questioning expression on his son's young face. Oh, Clay, Carol LeClaire had said with disarming candor, Gay doesn't care for those things, and anyway, if he did, I'd be afraid for him to ride on that pony. It might hurt him. But he's big enough to have a pony, Carol, LeClaire had answered. It's so gentle a baby could ride him. Gaylord is just a baby, but he's not going to ride it. He's a boy, Carol. Let's raise him as one. But I can see he doesn't care for it. I'll take it back like everything else I buy him. But I'm not going to buy him girls' toys even if he likes them. Damn it, Carol, you're wrong in raising him like a girl. LeClaire didn't approve of the things his wife bought their son. He didn't think Gaylord should play with dolls and sets of dishes, and it made him angry when he came home and found both his wife and son looking through magazines for paper dolls to cut out. One day, Gaylord had come home from school, and after noticing his eyes all red and swollen, his father had questioned him. What's wrong, son? Nothing, nothing at all, Gaylord had replied and ran to his room. He had read the hurt expression in his father's face. He had longed to throw his arms around the broad shoulders and pour his heart out. But how could he? How could he explain a smaller boy had caused him to cry? If the situation had been different, if the boy had been larger than himself, perhaps he could have told the whole story. But this was just another incident he must keep locked within himself. This he could not even tell his mother. Gaylord had cultivated his own group of friends, and most of them enjoyed coming to his house. Dancing and eating the delicious things his mother always served was a real treat. 
They all liked his parents. His mother, a favorite with the boys, was so pretty. And his father, after the living room rug had been rolled up, was the most popular male in the room with both sexes. Gaylord wasn't unpopular. He was a good dancer, and many times his passions had been aroused by the softness of the girl snuggled so close. He had no desire for sex with them, but he had kissed them and necked with them. There was that one time, but the girl had been the aggressor, and because he wanted to be like the rest, who he was sure did those things, he had allowed the acts to be fulfilled. Lately, the living room had been dark, and the rug had been rolled out for dancing for some time. After that experience with Thelma White, he didn't care for dancing or girls at all. The auditorium corner was warm, and as the tumult continued, he felt its excitement stir timidly through his body. The lights had been dimmed, and a million stars shot from a circular mirrored ball that revolved, spinning a fairy-like transformation over the crude walls and patched ceiling. He no longer regretted the impulse that had brought him to the dance. The moving stars awoke memories of a thousand nights. He was a girl and dancing with Blake. The darkness felt clean, and in Blake's strong arms, he had a feeling of security. In them, he could forget the crowd and still be a part of it. From the frightening terror that had descended upon him that first day of school, from the cruel remarks about his person, from the blows he had received, he had always crawled away within himself. But now, as he imagined himself in Blake's bronze arms, a feeling of being wanted had entered. The shyness had left. Ahead lay a bright future, a transcendental answer to all his suffering. He sat on the wooden bench, lost in thought, not feeling its hardness, his soul filled with the dream that had come so often lately, and the mirrored stars swept silently across his childlike face. He closed his eyes, and in the dream, Blake took his hand and drew him close. He remembered the grin, how cute it was, how genuine. He made a wide circle of all those he knew and decided again that Blake was the only one. The pleasure, the sheer physical delight of their bodies touching, grew within him to such an extent that he wanted to stay in their protection forever. Against this, like a warning knock, came the feeling of danger, a threatening danger lurking in fiendish eyes, eyes that did not understand as if the bronze arms had suddenly been taken away from him and desiring to get them back, he flinched his eyes, a response to the sensation of peril. It was like a struggle against sleep or the beginning of something terrible. Come on, beautiful. What you sitting here all by your lonesome little self for? Let's dance, cutie. The words were coarse and drawn together. They smelt of whiskey and the warm fresh air was suddenly contaminated with filth and germs. It surrounded him closer and closer until it choked him, and his beautiful dream was replaced by a dreadful anticipation. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Gaylord turned to face the man, stared at him with a bewildered look. He had been so completely happy, but here again abruptness and ugliness had ended it. He was like a person who had received a stunning blow without a warning, and who, in the first moment of shock, does not realize what has happened. Gaylord withdrew from the touch of the strange hands, and his lips parted as if to say something, but no words came. How about it, baby? Again, the heavy-coated words. How about let's wiggle the frame? Gaylord did not see the drunk, really. What he saw were black pits where the eyes should have been, crooked fangs in the place of teeth, and poison gas instead of breath. It was not an odor that was familiar to him. It was sickening and repulsive. He wanted to run, slap the clutching hands, but even as he thought this, he knew it was senseless, that what he was thinking was impossible, and yet he could not stop thinking. Again, he tried to speak, to point out the mistake, to say he wasn't a girl, but no words came from his quivering lips. The impulse that had carried him forward had vanished, replaced by something strange and grotesque. How could he cope with this? What should he do? Gaylord shrank against the dark wall, and the hands about to encircle him were magnified and distorted. He was petrified. No longer did he hear the music or the shuffling of the crowd. No longer did the stars twinkle. The ecstasy was gone. The fright which had been with him when he had first come into the auditorium 
was meek in comparison to the way he now felt. If he could only run, run away from everyone. Suddenly, the hands retreated, and from the dark pits, bloodshot eyes beamed at him like monstrous, huge-eyed fish. The man rocked, laughing with surprise. Gaylord stared, attracted and repelled at the same time. Then the man's shoulders were snatched up and replaced by another, and in the soft light, the new shoulders looked broad and strong. Someone was freeing him from this horrible ordeal. Immediately, he thought of Blake. Blake had come to his rescue. God, how wonderful he was. How nice of him. He didn't want to run if Blake had come to help. Come on, Max, you drunken bastard. No, the outline of shoulders wasn't Blake. Blake hadn't come to his rescue after all. The strange voice continued. Can't you see this kid ain't a dame? It laughed. You old son of a bitch. Gaylord heard a loud slap. I didn't know you were so damn drunk you couldn't tell the difference between a skirt and a pair of pants. The hell she ain't, Max coughed, bending down and studying Gaylord's face. He stood swaying like a pendulum from an old grandfather's clock, and his breath came rapidly and sickingly. You're too pretty to be a boy, Sonny. He hiccoughed loudly. Yeah, too damn pretty. You sure fooled me. He reached down and pinched the pale cheek. Ever fooled the boys, Sonny? You sure look like a broad. A damn good looker, too. His face colored and his cheeks burned. I've never fooled... Gaylord sputtered, but was interrupted by Max. I'll tell you what, Sonny. He broke in with a gurgle. Come on out to the car with me and I'll fix you up. You'd like a drink, wouldn't you, Sonny? Damn. You a cute little fag. He grinned, went on. Got some good whiskey. Best money can buy. Let's get out of this damn joint. Come on. Let's go out to my car. I want to show you, uh... He tried for Gaylord's cheek. Again, he lost his balance and, with a loud whoops, fell into the frightened boy's lap, his hand going between Gaylord's legs. Gaylord drew back, holding a scream in his throat. Leave me alone. I don't like whiskey. Please, leave me alone, he cried. His hands were as numb as his paralyzed legs, but he managed to shove away the demanding hands grabbing his legs. God, how awful, thought Gaylord. What can I do? Soon everyone will hear him. Why won't he leave? He couldn't see the man. He only heard people around him talking. God damn, Max. I didn't know you went for boys too, you dirty bastard. There was a certain excitement in this voice. It continued. Leave that quail alone, for someone hears you. Then, with a chuckle and a nudge, the voice continued. I've got a real skirt for you. Says she's ready for anything you've got. Ain't that what you said, babe? That's what I said, Sid. He's just my type, rough and ready, a woman cried out. I'll take that drink, Daddy. She helped Max to his feet. And anything else she got? What else she got, huh? She giggled at Gaylord, and he noticed the outline of her frizzy head, light in color. He's drunk, honey, she said to Gaylord. But he's harmless. You're not scared, are you? Gaylord shook his head. No need to be. He's just drunk. I'll take care of him. She shouldered Max up and ran a hand through his tangled hair. After several unsuccessful attempts, she pressed her lips on his and felt his groin. Nice, honey. She grinned at Max. Really nice. It's all urine, Max yelled with mirth. He kissed her. Let's get out of here. He started to walk, looked back at Gaylord and with a drunken stare, grinned and mumbled. I'll be back for you later. Don't leave, you beautiful doll. The woman tightened her grip. Not when I get through with you, baby, she challenged. When I get through with you, you're going to be pooped. Beautiful doll, huh? The three left, and Gaylord Stare followed them, Max swinging his arms around the woman, gallantly trying to escort her through the crowd. Let a lady pass, damn it. He heard Max shout to a couple whereupon he stuck out his hand and pushed them aside. The woman trotted along beside him in her high heel shoes and cast a spell over him with her loud, fluttering voice. She can sure have him, Gaylord thought. What a mess they are. It's funny. It was funny. It was a comedy, but he had been the heir. They would have laughed at him in the same hidden smiles if they had known. It was as if he was made to be laughed at. It was the thought of a puzzled and tormented boy driven into a kind of fatal acceptance. Gaylord now sat rigidly on the bench, and the constant shaking of his feet on the floor was in unison with beating of his heart. 
He felt naked and wondered how many had noticed. His mind shouted for him to go, to get away before the drunk returned, but he was not sure of his legs. He tested them to be sure the weight from his body would not cause them to fold. When Gaylord rose to go, he passed through the crowd shuddering and with his eyes cast downward. He was still confused, but he knew his way past the swaying mass, past the blur of faces. Someone taunted. Hi, Gay. You're not leaving so soon, are you? I didn't even know you were here. He smiled back at the boy, but never stopped. He didn't care if he was almost running. He was afraid he'd ask him why he was shaking and he wouldn't be able to tell him. He liked him and didn't want to be rude, but he could find no excuse or lies for his nervousness. He arrived at his car like a tornado. In a state of exhaustion, he unlocked the door and leaped inside the car, his heart pounding inside him. Had the ignition switch grown smaller? Why wouldn't the key fit in the slot? He tried again in a perspiration of impatience. He kept looking around, but he was alone. Was he really alone? Had Max followed him? No, because that woman wouldn't have let him go so soon. Still, he had said that he would be back. Tremblingly, Gaylord tried again, and this time the key went into the slot with ease. He immediately turned the key and pushed a button that lowered the door glass. But just as soon as the glass had disappeared, it appeared again. Better keep it up, he said out loud. That fool might come up this very instant. The thought made his stomach turn. He pressed down the door lock and looked into the darkness. Max's vile breath seemed to fill his nostrils again, and another shudder racked his whole body. He knew he was going to cry. He put his teeth over his bottom lip and bit down hard to stop it from trembling, to keep back the tears. Suppose his car wouldn't start. Large drops of perspiration ran down his forehead, and the cords in his neck tightened as he pressed on the starter. Suppose the battery was dead. His mind was as tangled as the curly hair over his forehead. Suppose he had flooded the engine. No, he couldn't have done that. But, but suppose, and supposition possessed him. He pressed harder on the starter. The motor started immediately, and his sigh was lost to the sound of loose gravel spinning under the wheels as his car lunged backwards. At last he was free. The car lights gave life to the rocks on the road, like spotlights on a stage and their colors of rusts and tans were bright. They had been laid down like a mask on something formless, warm, dusty, brought from a lost riverbed where they had been born, to remain here until their spirits were broken and shattered. Like me, thought Gaylord. Like me. They too fought back, hitting under the fenders, fighting hard, but their efforts were lost under huge crushers that bade them lie down and be silent. Like me, Gaylord thought again just like me. It was fight, fight, fight all his life. Other boys felt richer than he. They didn't wear as good as clothes as he did, but they had something he lacked. Self-assurance. He guided his car recklessly, not even stopping for traffic lights to change their blood-like color. To his eyes, it seemed they were not there at all, but the buildings on either side seemed to close about him. He changed his glance to the road, watched it stretch front of him. Danger hung in the sullen air. Danger lay like an oily film across the street. Danger tinted with a brassy hue the arched and silent sky. Somewhere out there was a drunken figure of Max. He pressed on the gas, impatient to be in his room, impatient for security. His home looked as dark and bleak as the rest of the street as he parked his car in the garage. But when he stepped onto the steps of the porch, he saw a low glow through a small opening in the front door. It was somehow a soothing and restful light. Gaylord pulled the front of his shirt together and shrugged. His mother was very likely in there waiting for him. With a deep breath, he turned the doorknob. It was unlocked. He closed and latched it behind him. Inside, the hallway was quiet. No, there was no one waiting for him. Gosh, he was glad. He breathed a sigh of relief as he crossed the living room, turned off the lamp. Gaylord felt suddenly relieved with the familiar odor of the house and the hallway, the smell of flowers, polish, and clean carpet. Thank God I'm home, he said. There was a moment's hesitation. Then, with a deep sigh, he walked upstairs to his room and switched on the light. He stood there, just gazing, wondering why he had ever left it. His Hollywood bed stood modern and elegant on the carpet. It said plainly, and the bleached mahogany cabinets at its side repeated it. I was custom-made. He looked at the tall lamps gracing the cabinets with the same air. 
They depicted nudes of opposite sex, seated on an open rock from which flowed growing ivy and were made of crudely sculpted clay. Their shades were in the modern vein, covered with raw silk. Flanking the lamps were several books, a stud box and a piggy bank, a present from his favorite aunt. Most boys didn't care whether or not there were draperies at their bedroom windows. Gaylord did. First, there was a gossamer-thin Ceylonese that hung like gathered mist next to the Venetian blinds. Over that, hanging in deep folds at each side, hammered satin, woven in gray and chartreuse zigzag lines, touched the carpet, a wide cornice duplicating the material of the draperies and bedspread framed this expensive display of fabric. From this, his gaze fell on an etching of two wrestlers, their naked bodies tied in a sweating knot, masterfully done and framed in an antique mirror. It dominated the wall over his desk and was his pride and joy. Gaylord's solitary thought left the room, gnawed at another bone. Why was I mistaken for a girl? He asked himself. Is my hair too long? Or did I have too much powder on? Just why did he think I was a girl? Questions with no answers dominated him as he unbuttoned his shirt and threw it over a chair. With a sudden flash of intuition, he went into his bathroom, turned on the light, and looked at himself in the medicine cabinet mirror. He hadn't changed. He was handsome, but he certainly didn't look like a girl. He ran a hand over his face and leaned over to peer at it. His eyes narrowed on his cheek. It was faintly bruised, and a red mark discolored the fair skin. His teeth clamped, and he uttered a sigh of disgust. He noticed his hair, curls going in every direction. Taking a comb, he ran it through the shiny blackness, wondering again if perhaps it wasn't a little too long. He noticed his eyelashes. They were longer and heavier than the average male's. Maybe they were the reason. Eyes were very noticeable, and his were sort of girlish looking. And then he wondered what it would be like to be a girl. He thought of the conversations he had heard in the school laboratories, conversations dealing with sex and female bodies. He pictured himself a girl and what he would do in case some strong male seduced him. Men were always seducing females. Even in school it had occurred. He had heard of these things. It had been repeated over and over again. In fact, several boys younger than himself had wished for this, had even had erections right in front of him and several other boys. They didn't seem to mind who saw their sex organs. They weren't embarrassed, but he was. Why was he? They talked and looked as if they knew something more than he had learned. But he had learned lots these past two years, all about doctors girls went to when they were pregnant, about diseases. He got frightened when he realized the awful things that could happen to him. And every time he saw the boy the gang called Gond, he remembered the disease this boy was supposed to have had. He still shrank away every time he saw Gond, and thank God it had not happened to him. He left the bathroom and strolled into the bedroom. This room had been his idea, and now, looking at it, he was aware he had created a room of harmony and comfort. He loved every bit of it, from the tops of the polished tables to the walls of dull satin paint. He had a flair for coloring and good taste in choosing furniture. He often wondered why. Other boys he knew didn't care what kind of room they slept in, but to him, his room was part of his half-dream world. Carefully folding the bedspread, he placed it on a chair. Freshly turned down sheets were tucked all the way around the bed. A fold in one was thrown back to a pair of soft pillows with starched slips, their creases still showing. He kicked off his loafers and flung himself on the bed. The soft light cast shadows of light yellow across him and deepened the colors of the leaves of the hand-printed paper that rose behind his bed not stopping until they had reached the ceiling. He lay there on his back, not seeing the ceiling, listening to the words, You're too pretty to be a boy. Good looker, too. Come on and dance. The finest whiskey. Hearing them repeating, Good looker, too. Come on. Again and again. A little smile crossed his face, and he seemed pleased. Then, with a frown, he was uncertain just how he did feel. He certainly didn't want this to happen again, but even with the pain it had caused, there now was some compulsion that forced himself to admit he was thrilled over the mistake. 
He lay on his bed thinking what he would have done if he had been a girl. No, he wouldn't have danced with that trash Max, that drunkard. He would have told him to go chase himself. Without devious reasoning or complicated emotional processes, Gaylord became a girl. Gaylord, the boy, took a blackout, and Gaylord, the girl, did wonderful things among a crowd of people. I'm sleepy, he finally admitted, yawning. Guess I'd better get undressed and go to bed. But before he went to sleep, he thought of the drunk again, the red spot on his cheek, and of Robert Blake. And then, after he was asleep, he dreamed he was a girl and in Blake's arms. End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4 The next morning, Gaylord awoke with a jump. He had been dreaming, and his mind was still trapped between the dream and the early morning light coming through the blinds. He tried to remember, tried to recall the dream that had left his heart pounding, his body quivering, but he couldn't. It had vanished like the darkness. It took him several seconds to come to himself and to the reality of his surroundings. Had he really been dreaming of Blake? There had been so many dreams in his life lately, and the ones about Robert Blake were so real that even on awakening he could have sworn that they had actually happened. He ran a hand over his jaw, feeling the few bristles that had sprouted in the past few days, rubbed his drowsy eyes with both hands, yawned and stretched for the ceiling. He started to worry folded his hands under his head and stared at the visions playing tricks with him. The violent and disconnected happenings of the past evening lulled within him, and as he came to full wakefulness, he felt a subtle alteration in the atmosphere of the room. Was this really his room, his storehouse of earthly possessions? His eyes gazed about the room as his fingers groped around his groin. Had that really happened, or was it only a lost dream? Surely no other boy had been called a girl before. The dance, the slim vocalist, the music, even Robert Blake became a blur of nothingness. But the drunkard was vivid in his mind. He felt of his cheek. It was true, for the cheek was slightly swollen. Why, puzzled Gaylord, had the drunk chosen him to dance with? Amazing. Shaking himself out of his self-absorption, he glanced at his watch. Darn, it's only ten to seven, he mused. Oh well. He yawned again, and a little smile crept across his face. Delicate laughing lines formed under his eyes. He had been mistaken for a girl. All his life he had viewed the thought with wonderment. A boy who should have been a girl. For a long time that had been the dream, but last night it almost happened. You beautiful doll. The words were clear and real this time. His eyes closed and blinked open again. It was amusing now, and he felt complimented by the mistake. He was different, separated from masculinity more than ever. The words came back, served to remind him of his secret longing, and remained. Gaylord tossed on the bed, wondering if Blake would have liked him if he had been a girl. Recalled always there had been something dreamlike about Robert Blake. But then, so many things seemed like dreams to him. That man at the dance last night? Surely that had been a dream. The way that woman pawed over Max? A dream. Thelma White. That also seemed like a dream now. Like something that had not actually happened. That just couldn't happen to him. It was dream stuff. Or was it all real and true? And was it that he, Gaylord, was the dreamer? Well, he'd find out when he saw her again. If she smiled at him in that ugly way of hers, he'd know if it was really a dream or not. Thelma White. Gaylord wanted to forget that name. He didn't want to ever hear it again. She had tricked him, had even mentioned something about Robert Blake. What had she said about Blake? Robert Blake. Bob. Good-looking, honorable, and strong. He knew his own mind. He'd never go with a girl like Thelma White. She had lied about him. He'd never make fun of anyone or even allow someone to say ugly things about his friends. Not Bob. Not Bob. Yes, Bob was good. He would be so proud to have him for a friend. But he thought of Joy. Joy. Where did he and Joy go last night? They had probably gone for a ride after the dance. A long ride. Looking for some secluded place to park. A place where they could be alone. Fiercely, he wished he was a girl. So that Joy could never have him. In the next breath, he prayed. Oh, God. 
Why wasn't I a girl? I'd never complain again if I was a girl. He kicked off the sheet and sprang from his tumbled bed. He wore pajama pants but no coat, and was apparently warm, for under his nose were drops of perspiration. He ran across the room, stood in front of a mirrored door. I haven't changed, he said, facing it. I still look the same. My face and chest do. His hand moved over his chest, pressed against his warm flesh. He brushed back curls from his forehead, pressed them into place. Lazily, he looked at his reflection, and his movements were slow and easy, as if with the drug of vanity. He noticed the red spot on his cheek. Son of a bitch, he murmured. It is true. It did happen. With a sharp jerk, he untied his pajamas. They fell breaking about his ankles like hungry ocean waves. He stepped out of them and stood naked before the mirror. It's still there, he said. I wish it weren't. He pulled at the coiling growth. What he saw only dissipated the clarity of reality. He tightened the smooth and developed muscles of his buttocks, watched his thighs grow firm and hard, looked at himself for a long time, trying to discover some invisible part upon his flesh. I wish I were built like Bob, he cried. I'm too white. I've got to get a tan, damn. Life's so complicated. How could life ever be happy for him? He went to the bathroom and stepped under the shower. The tingling sensation of the water hitting his body felt good. He turned on more hot water, his skin reddened, and he uttered a cry and bit his lips. This wouldn't give him bronze skin. How silly could you be? He looked down at his body again, rubbed a delicately scented soap over it, looked at the growth-like shadows around his groin. He hadn't changed. In fact, he seemed to have grown. Oh, Bob, Bob, he thought and the blood in his veins hardened and grew warm. He tightened his palm, and out of the pounding motions, came. I shouldn't do this. I'll feel tired afterwards. I'll... He closed his eyes and wished he had never begun this evil vice, but already he had capitulated to his lust, which was a depraved way for sex, he told himself. He wasn't so damn different. He was just like the rest, just as bad as any other fellow. But all boys did this. It came with growing up. Even men, he was told, found in this act the keenest pleasure for pent-up emotions seeking release. It was simple, so easy to do. With a girl, it took time, many dates and time. With a girl, you had to take your time. With some girls, you didn't. He remembered his first terrifying experience, remembered where and just how it had happened. He never wanted to go through that again. Never. Gaylord had often wondered why boys carried pictures of naked men and women with them. He had a couple of them locked in his dresser, but he wouldn't think of carrying them on his person or showing them to anyone. But every once in a while, he would take them out of his dresser drawer and look at them, especially the one of a naked man about to mount a girl reclining on a divan. The man in the picture did have a handsome body, not fat and ugly like most of the pictures he had seen, but he was always afraid his mother or father would find them. He would certainly have been ashamed. Sex had never been mentioned in his family, and he was glad that his father had never told him the facts of life. But he had learned, learned through the boys of school. He walked from the shower and settled his naked body back peacefully on his bed. He felt relaxed, but he was sorry he had been too weak of character to stop before it was too late. That first time he had done this, had been terrifying, painful. But after the pain, it did relax your mind. Still, afterwards, he hated himself for the weakness, making promises it would never happen again. But it had continued. His resistance had been beaten again and again, unable to cope with the burning inside. Still, it was better than with a girl. God, yes. That one and only time with that girl was awful, terrible. I wonder if Bob does, he mumbled. I wonder if he does that more than with girls. But he's had a lot of girls. Anyone he wants. They all like him. I wish he liked me. To his disgust, Gaylord found that the morning school bell had rung. He walked down the hall thinking, I could go back home, but I might just as well go on in and face them. Yes, they'll crack some smart remark about my being late. I wish I didn't feel like a stranger walking into that darn room. I wish I was at my desk. I'll go home. Now, 
I'd better not, he thought suddenly. If I go home, I won't see Bob. I've just got to see him. Wonder if he saw me last night. Wonder what he thinks if he did. He opened the door and walked to his desk. Gaylord, let's try to be on time, the teacher said before he had a chance to sit down. I'm sorry, Miss Gray, he answered. My watch must be slow. As he looked down to his watch, he heard several giggles. Let's leave just a little earlier from now on. Yes, ma'am. He did not look about him. He was much too preoccupied with his books. He wondered if his teacher knew what had happened this morning. Could the others read his mind? Was she at the dance last night? How many in this room were? I hope they didn't see me, he prayed. Oh, God, I hope they didn't. Morning, Gay, whispered a feminine voice from behind him. He turned his head slightly. Morning, Joy, he answered shyly. Wonder if she saw me. He didn't mind so much if she had. She wouldn't tell anyone or even let him know she had. But suppose one of the boys had heard the drunk. Nothing could be worse than that. Bet Bob wouldn't say anything. He didn't go around hurting people's feelings. There sure was something appealing about him. Anything he did was all right with everyone. Well, after all, why not? Wasn't he the star football player? He thought of the time Blake's car battery had been dead and how he had asked for a push. He remembered Blake saying, Gay, could you give me a push? Go easy so your bumper doesn't get scratched. What difference if it did? Blake was worth more than an old bumper to him. He was so glad that Blake had asked him. He didn't care about a few scratches. The sun was up and beautiful over the school, and the small open windows between the wings caught its rays and sent them inside the cool classroom. In a corner, a spider was already busy weaving a larger web. It looked all silvered, with dew hanging there from skyhooks. From the spider, Gaylord's gaze fell on a new face seated across the aisle opposite him. He wondered why he had not noticed him before. Obviously, he had been there all the time. Gaylord's heart jumped. He was a handsome boy sitting there behind the desk. And when he smiled, deep dimples formed in his cheeks. His hair was neatly plastered down, and his clothes were very clean. Gaylord pushed his books, knocking a pencil to the floor. He didn't see it fall and was surprised when the boy handed it to him, saying, You dropped this? Oh, thanks. I didn't know I dropped it. You're welcome. Gaylord wanted to say something else, but when words didn't come, he smiled. He felt the blood creeping into his cheeks and silently cursed himself. There was something warmly companionable about this boy. I need someone, thought Gaylord desperately. I need someone, and I believe he needs someone, too. I'm young, maybe only seventeen, but I'm older than my years in some things. But there is no one to understand. Maybe he would understand. Maybe. The gym director waited for them. He stood there, one foot on a folded chair. Instead of looking at them, he seemed to be watching his feet. He was a short, bushy man with green eyes and deep red hair. For a while, he watched his foot on the cement floor. Then he looked at them and stood on both feet. Everybody here? Get yourselves stripped and dressed in a hurry, men, he yelled. We've got lots to do today. He shifted his stare over at the class. Then, noticing Gaylord, who had just come through the swinging doors, his ugly mouth opened again. Did you hear what I said, LeClaire? Get the load out of your butt, and today I want you back here on time. His screaming crossed the room. Yes, sir, and Gaylord walked to his locker and began undressing. He wondered if it would ever be possible, in this world, that he would one day hold his face up to his gym teacher and they would look directly into each other's eyes. I'd sure like to tell him to go to hell, he thought, and someday I'm going to. He tugged at the buttons on his shirt and slowly uncovered his chest. He strove against his warm flesh nudity as he pulled off his underwear. He felt eyes watching him standing there naked and he was glad he wasn't short and fat like some of the others. He grabbed his blue gym trunks and quickly slid his slender legs through them. He stood there with the others, arms folded, waiting for the instructor to speak. He looked at the tangled hair, the blotted pinkish chest of his teacher, and the dirty red trunks around his flabby waist. You ugly thing, he thought. You filthy person. At least you could have had your trunks washed. He had squirmed, wishing they'd start. 
shifting his weight from one foot to the other. He hated the class, and after the first trying week, was on the verge of quitting, but decided against it. He was determined to have a good physique, and the exercises would do that for him. He had worked hard all year, but it had been worth it. He had developed handsomely. Even his hatred for his teacher had subsided at times. Other times, his hatred had deepened. There was a mad scramble of naked legs and arms when the instructor yelled, That's it for today, fellas. Hit the showers. Gaylord stepped aside and let running boys pass. Another stuck his foot out and tripped a would-be mercury, then laughed. They all laughed at the sprawled-out body on the floor. All except Gaylord. To him, it wasn't funny. Why, the fall could have broken a leg. Yells of delight filled the room and echoed in the huge beams overhead. Gaylord slowly walked to his locker. He was anxious for the others to shower and leave. He wanted to be alone when he took off his trunks. Wanted to be alone when he stood under the long line of showers. He opened his locker and ran his hands through his pants pockets, trying to locate something, anything that would take up time. Then he hung them back, glanced around the almost deserted room. I guess I've taken long enough, he thought. I'm glad some don't take showers. They sure must smell. He took off his trunks and walked rapidly toward the swinging doors. A husky boy wildly pushed it open and came running toward him. His naked body and flying hair dripped with water and his face gleamed with excitement. Right behind were two others running after him. One had a filled sponge which he threw but missed and the other had a dripping towel he kept snapping at the boy's buttocks in front of him. Look out, Gay! screamed the water-soaked individual running past, his arms flying through the air, his face filled with wild excitement and laughter. He quickly turned his head to see how far behind his pursuers were. Gaylord tried a faint smile, watched him. It was not until he turned that he discovered the boy with the towel had stopped beside him. He saw the big feet and hairy legs standing in front of him. He cringed expecting to feel the wet cloth fall across his own bottom. Hey, fellas, the boy bellowed, squinting his devilish eyes. Come back here. I want you to see something. He pushed back the dripping hair from his forehead. Gaylord heard the scruffing of returning footsteps. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he was sure it wasn't going to be anything pleasant. How can I get away? He pondered quickly. I've got to get away. What do you want, Pete? Asked one, looking at the boy with the moving towel. Look, he laughed, pointing at Gaylord. Look at the tool this sissy's got. Gaylord's legs began to tremble. Pete continued. Shit, I thought you had the biggest one in school, stud. But pretty boy here's got you bested by a couple of inches. Gaylord put both hands over his groin. They followed as he walked. Stud went on. What's the matter, pretty boy? Don't you want to show it off? You ought to be proud of that honker. Gaylord tried to grin. It's nothing to show off, ain't it? No. Does it make the gals squeal, pretty boy? Hell, even I get a grunt out of them when I poke this in them, grinned Stud. With a jock like that, you ought to make them yell, Daddy. He held out his own. Let's measure. Let's see how much longer it is than mine. I've got to take a shower, Stud. Hell, you ain't dirty, pretty boy. What's your hurry? You didn't answer my question. Gaylord sputtered. What question? Does it make the gals squeal? Shit, stud, he ain't never had a piece of ass, have you, dearie? I certainly have, Gaylord wanted to shout, but he only walked on. Stud grabbed him by the arm, said, Come on, let's measure. Let's get it hard first, Pete giggled and reached between Gaylord's legs. Don't, Pete, Gaylord pleaded with disgust. Please don't. Please don't, Pete sarcastically mocked him. Mama's baby doesn't want the rough boys playing with his Peter, does he? Gaylord slapped the hand on his flesh and demanded, Leave me alone. He continued walking slowly. They followed too close. One whistled and laughed. Fellas, look at that pretty ass. How'd you like a crack at that, stud? Bet it'd be better than that whore you've been screwing. He slapped the naked cheeks and the sound echoed. He wanted to run, but was afraid they'd trip him. He had to use his head. He wouldn't let them get the best of him. But what could he do? Look how soft and shaky it is, too laughed Pete. He shook the flesh and followed it with a lightning-quick slap. Gaylord's buttocks burned, and so did his mind. I said, I've got to take a shower. Leave me alone, damn it. I mean it. Why, Gaylord, you said a nasty word. Stud put his hand on his naked chest. 
Shame. Shame. Don't you like flattery? All the girls think your face is so pretty. Well, we like your cute butt, he giggled. Don't we, fellas? Sure we like it. In fact, we like it so much, let's all have a crack at it. Huh? Sounds good to me. I ain't ever cornholed anybody before, but I'll try anything once. Gaylord took another step, then tried to run. It was like a horrible dream when he tried to scream, but no sound came. He couldn't escape now. They had circled him, and, quick as a cat, one had thrown one arm around Gaylord's neck and pressed hard. He put his other arm around his waist, and Gaylord felt parts of their bodies touch. Come on, dearie. I'm hotter than a bitch dog. I ain't had a piece in two days. I ain't ever been up the back door, he laughed. Gaylord's waist hurt from the tight gripping. Don't, he cried. He broke away from the boy. Ah, oh, come on. He picked up a piece of soap from the floor and massaged it in his wet hands. It lathered freely, and with these hands he grabbed Gaylord. Come on, I'll fix you up. And you said you ain't been up the back door before, Pete. That's what I said, but I'm a damn liar. That's what I thought, laughed Stud. I'll show you how it's done, grinned Pete. I'll be first. Like hell you will, snapped Stud and grabbed Gaylord. His bareness touched Gaylord's legs. The leg jerked, as though a live flame had been put to it. His legs came out of the paralysis then, and he kicked and struggled. At that, Stud pressed his body closer to his, pinning Gaylord against him. Gaylord was crying inside his head. They can't do this to me. Why should they always pick on me? I've never hurt them. Around his waist, the wet hands tightened, and a swish of wet cloth circled his knees. He turned and stared at the exposed part of Stud's body in paralyzed horror. It was wormy white, contrasted with the ugly sallowness of his face and hands. He felt the same kind of nausea he had once felt when he had gone out with Thelma White, but this was worse. He saw the cruel, tense look in the smoky eyes, and now he felt hard flesh against him. While his head rocked, he tried with his legs to free himself. With his elbows, he tried to jab Stud's side. Let me go! He sobbed, squirming and kicking. He tried again to be free. Let's carry him to the can. Yeah, no one's there now. Grab his legs. Yeah, grab his legs, repeated Pete. The naked body pressed closer against his back, and his skinny, strong arms went around his chest. Two more hands grabbed for his kicking legs, holding one firmly in a vice-like grip. Gaylor twisted, screamed, and kicked backwards with his free leg. He was without fear now. Through a drunken blur that filmed his eyes, he fought back the best he could. The kick brought results. It struck Stud in the groin. God damn you, son of a bitch, Stud yelled in pain. He let go for a second, then tightened his arms around Gaylord again. His stiff, naked body drew closer. I'll give it to you right here if you don't stop that kicking, you damn jackass. And now they were all around him. He couldn't run. He couldn't even kick anymore. Please, God, he prayed. Let someone come along. He was cornered, trapped. Already his feet were off the floor. There was no way to free himself. He was helpless. Please, he prayed again. Don't let them do this to me. Please, don't let them. Robert Blake carelessly walked toward the school gym and stood barefooted on the top level watching two little girls playing jacks. One of the children grinned, showing a large gap. What happened to those two pretty teeth you had the other day, Marion? he asked. They fell out, Bob, but the rabbit gave me two nickels for them. That's so, he grinned and patted her head playfully. Now you'll get two new teeth, won't you? And you'll have two nickels, too. I sure will, she smiled. She liked Robert Blake. He had bought her ice cream several times, but that wasn't the real reason. He was so pretty and always spoke to her. He always took time out to say something to her, had even played jacks with her. She looked up at him and asked, Want to play jacks with us? Not now, honey. I've got to take a shower. Innocently, she looked at his naked chest and legs. Did you lose your shoes? Uh-huh, he teased. Can I wear yours? They wouldn't fit, silly. She looked at his big feet. Don't think so, huh? He chuckled. No, I don't guess they would. What was that? It sounded like a scream from the gym. Blake perked his head and listened. Yes, there it was again. Faint, but real. Someone was in trouble. He'd better hurry. He raced towards the gym door, caught the handle in his large hand. It grated noisily on its hinges and swung open. 
It was warm in the gym, and the smell of sweat caught his nostrils. He saw the group of boys and thought it was a fight. Then he saw Gaylord, his face streaked with fear, being carried helplessly towards the toilets. Blake felt a trembling inside him, seeing Gaylord make a pathetic gesture as though to lift his tormentors. He saw the lips moving, shaping cries, but they were low and tired. Blake rubbed his knuckles together angrily. He was on his heels. Gaylord heard the sound, looked up and saw Blake running towards him. He was running madly and his yells were loud and demanding, filling the deserted gymnasium with a resounding echo. What the hell's going on in here? He demanded. The eyes of the three boys, their hands loosening their death-like grip, watched the tall, glistening figure running towards them, saw the long, masculine legs, shadowed by curly hair sprinkled even and thickly, continuing over the expanding chest. Dark olive skin that started on the broad forehead covered the large biceps of both arms and ran below the knees to the tensely drawn thighs. The hair was short and glistening. Strands fell over the frowning forehead and the white gymnasium trunks made the waist look even smaller. They met his glare with a sheepish grin. Their hearts pounded faster, this time from fright. Stud's lip curled back to show a broken tooth, said, Hi, Bob. Blake's entire body racked with anger. The tears he saw squeezing through Gaylord's eyes were held tightly back, as though he were ashamed of them. But the illness inside his own heart was the worst he had ever experienced. Three of them, he thought angrily. Three of them against one. Chicken shit bastards. Put him down, he demanded. His voice was a loud explosion, and his dark eyes a cold stare. The three boys still held their prize. I said, put him down. And Blake grabbed Stud by the arm fiercely. His big hands were tight and cruel. Stud did as he bid, and the others followed. Gaylord was free. He said nothing only stood there limp. He wanted to cry, but couldn't. The Greek god standing there wouldn't want him to cry, and he wouldn't. He held his teeth together hard. He felt his fear leaving him and recognized in this bronze body everything he himself didn't have. He wasn't jealous, only admiring. Stud twisted his lips after Blake's release. Look what we found, Bob. A Venus, he giggled nervously. Yeah, a Venus with a penis laughed Pete, twisting the towel he still held. A Venus with a penis, he repeated. That's good, ain't it? The three boys tried to laugh. Blake stood there, and his muscles looked and were strong and powerful. Fine thing, he finally said, and his eyes were mean. I'm surprised at you guys. Trying to be tough, huh? Why don't you call some more so you can really get him down? There's only three of you. That's chicken, all right. Damn shame, I call it, when three grown men jump on one. Damn shame. He turned to Gaylord. Are you all right, Kay? He grabbed Gaylord's hand. The hand felt good. I'm all right, Gaylord said. But he could still feel what had touched his body. He felt like the skin would be eaten away there. I'm surprised at you, stud. Picking on someone smaller than you. Blake looked at the big-eared boy. He's bigger than stud in places, Bob. Look. He pointed, and Gaylord grew crimson. Blake did look, and Gaylord had an impulse to run, but the hand on his shoulder was enough to stifle that impulse completely. He could not leave Blake. He looked up at him, and there was no youth in his eyes now. No tenderness, no gaiety. Blake stared at the three boys with burning gravity. His whole expression that of a man mad enough to kill, and powerful enough to do so. Shut up! God damn you! Blake shot at them. The three shrank back. Hell, Bob, one whined. You don't have to get so red-ass. We were just having a little fun. We're going to hurt him. He tried to grin. Can a fellow have a little fun? Not when it means hurting someone else. Not as long as I'm around. No one's going to have fun at someone else's expense. Now get out. Get out. And if I ever catch you doing this again, I'll forget I'm a gentleman. We weren't going to do anything. Hell, I said scram. Get out of here before I kick the shit out of the whole damn bunch of you, Blake yelled between clenched teeth. And each boy thought he would do just that. They sneered but backed away. Come on, Gay, Blake grinned, and put an arm around Gaylord's shoulder. Let's take a shower. Maybe that'll get rid of the stink around here. They walked toward the shower. Blake, with his arms still around Gaylord, one of the boys yelled at them. 
Be careful he don't knock you up, pretty boy. Then all three of them hurriedly ran from the gym. Bastards, Blake muttered without even looking back. Thank you, Bob, said Gaylord gratefully. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't come along. Forget it, Gay. We'll both feel better after a shower. Gaylord thanked him again. They walked through the swinging doors together and crossed the shower tile floor. They stood in front of the showers and Gaylord watched Blake's thick fingers strip off his trunks, pull them down over his hips. Then they fell of their own accord to his feet. A circle of white, whiter than the sudden exposed buttocks. He watched Blake scratch his ribs and was surprised that he wasn't embarrassed. Damn, water's cold. Blake grinned under the heavy spray. Come here, Gay. This will make you feel good. Gaylord caught the extended hand and stumbled after Blake under the cool water. He flung his arms around Blake's waist. He didn't care if his hair got wet. He pressed his face against the bronze hairy chest and cried. He didn't want to, but he could no longer restrain himself. Blake's arms encircled him, held him tenderly, and pulled him closer. Their wet bodies rubbed against each other, and the fragrance, waterborne, scented the air. It felt comforting to be in Blake's embrace. Don't cry, Gay. His fingers moved across the forehead, smoothed the curl hair, must there, brushed them back. They're not worth one single tear. Don't cry. Please don't. Oh, I can't help it. I'm such a baby, Gaylord sobbed. No wonder they pick on me. No wonder they... Why am I so... so... I wish I were like them. Now you know you wouldn't want to be like them. Blake raised the dripping head with both hands. I like you just the way you are. What's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with you, Gay. Oh, yes, there is. Gaylord wanted to shout. I'm a sissy. That's why they make fun of me. I like to wear girls' clothes. Powder, rouge, perfume. I don't want to like it, but I do. I'm a sissy, and I can't change. I want to be a girl. Was taken for a girl last night. I wish I were a girl so I could love you. I'd love you so much. He stood there in Blake's arms, crying softly. His breath caught occasionally in his throat and made him gasp. He looked up into Blake's eyes and hugged him tight, clung there voiceless. You know, Gay? Blake breathed softly. You, you do remind me of a, a Venus. He kissed the upturned lips, and the spraying water formed a glass curtain of protection around them. End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 Subconsciously, he pushed the waves deeper in his hair, remembering Blake's strong arms. He murmured the name, and even though it sounded warm and friendly, there came with it a feeling of extreme helplessness and fear. He gripped the wide wooden desk and pulled himself up. What about those three who had molested him? His emotions were like boiling water, changing every second. He moved slowly. Here, in this crowded school, he felt himself at the mercy of the treacherous limbs of youths whose rugged countenances he faced every day and whose eyes seemed to tower above him. He shivered, knowing the only way to find escape from their insulting words was for him to either die or move away from Cotton. But he knew he would not do either of these. He would remain there, and the slapping and words would continue. It was really true, and the only thing for him to do was to endure it. The morning ordeal had left him exhausted, and now, at the door, he turned and listened to the wind. It was silent sound, and if the shrubbery outside had not stirred, there would have been no evidence of its presence. He shivered again. But it was not the warm air that made him do so. It was the recollection that Blake had kissed him. It had been a dangerous thing to do, and if anyone had seen them, they would certainly ridicule him. He wondered briefly why they seemed to delight in teasing him. He had never done anything to Stud or the rest, yet Stud would be the first to expose him. He pressed his hands around the school's bronze doorknob and looked down. Its color reminded him of Blake. His fingers gathered themselves into small fists, and he pressed his hands against the knob. If only it could be Blake in his grasp. He glanced at the pane in the door as if it might reveal the handsome face, but only his own sad eyes were caught in its blurred coldness. Gaylord's legs ached. He left the door ajar and turned down the long corridor. It was filled with yelling and hurrying students. 
Their arms were burdened with books, but in their faces were no signs of pain. He kept close as possible to the wall, walking around the legs, backs, hips, and arms, avoiding them rushing here and there. His feeling of frustration was intensified by the general atmosphere of the hall. Everything about it was oppressive. Years of walking down them, his whole life had been jailed in one of its blackboarded rooms, sitting for centuries behind uncomfortable marred and varnished desks, naked boys, frowning teachers, and stupid geometry problems, smart aleck boys who laughed and whistled at tight sweaters filled with protruding breasts, cocked gay caps over short, wiry hair. It all rolled through his memory, nailed there. He hated the whole combination and still longed to be part of it, to walk and talk with the same sureness and naturalness they possessed. He was aware of the friendliness around him, and when someone asked, How do you get out so quick, Gay? It made him feel good. Several others spoke, and it helped him so much. Perhaps they did like him. Perhaps it was he, his fault. Suddenly, without any warning, his body was filled with a violent blast of fright, so enormous that every nerve in him became rigid and trembled with it, forcing him down and down, as if his eyes were moving of their own accord, rushing ahead of his body. He could see himself being caught up and hurled to the floor under its pressure. He flinched his eyes, expecting the hand on his shoulder to tighten, to suddenly strike with a heavy slap, but it remained soft and small. Hello, Gaylord. The voice was melodious and feminine. The girl looked and looked at him, into and through him, before she went on. Then she smiled and said, I didn't mean to scare you, Gaylord. The smile grew on her face. Her hand left his shoulder. Something pounded back into Gaylord. He could feel it in his throat. It was difficult for him to speak, but when he did, the words came out in a relieved sigh. Oh, Lois Sue, he said. And then his face reddened. For some reason, he always blushed when he shouldn't, for no reason at all, for some reason. Sure, he knew why. He had looked away from the girl in his confusion, but now looked back squarely into her face, looked at the lips which had uttered the name Adonis. One day, he had overheard her saying, I think Gaylord's an Adonis, to a group of girls he had passed in the hall. It had only been a whisper, but he had heard every word. He had gone directly to a dictionary, could hardly wait until the large book had told him the meaning of the new word. He had never heard it used before. Adonai, Adonic, pertaining to Adonis. There it was at last, Adonis, a youth beloved by Aphrodite or Venus for his beauty. From that day on, her unadorned face had become beautiful to him, not because of the features, but for the beauty of her mind. Did I frighten you? She asked again. Oh, no, just made me jump, he said, looking into the soft gray eyes. I was thinking of something. He noticed the stout leather strap across her small shoulder. She looked at him without saying anything, and the steady, loving eyes embarrassed him. He smiled at her and said, I love that last poem of yours in the bulldog, Lois Sue. The bulldog was their school paper. Did you really, Gaylord? She flushed a faint pink. He sounds as though he means it, she thought. He really liked it. He's beautiful, kind. He's Adonis reincarnated. I certainly did, he went on. He took her hand but did not hold it. Someday you'll be famous, and then I can say, Sure, I know her. I went to school with Lois Sue Reed. It puzzled him how such a sweet and musical sound could come from between two short braids of hair. He looked at their bright ribbons and at the worshipping eyes. They embarrassed him, and yet he did not resent them. Incidentally, I've started another one. She felt the eyes of her god of ancient mythology upon her, and loved the moment. Her thin lips parted, showing tips of pearl white teeth. He watched the excitement in her eyes. Another one? he asked, changing the weight of his body from one foot to the other. Why, I think that's wonderful. Have you written very much? I've only one line. I wasn't going to tell anyone until I was finished, but she hesitated. Would you like to hear it? I'd love to hear it, Lois Sue. That is, if you want me to. He waited patiently. He was so tired and wanted to be away, but he could tell she was pleased, even if she didn't say so. Even if she did tell him not to say anything until it was published, she was pleased. 
From the leather-strapped case, she took out a paper and read, Why are you so silent, sitting there so far away in dreams? And yet, his eyes lingered on her and then moved slightly. Had she written these words for him? Was she asking him this question? He told her he liked it very much. Standing there with her, he remembered the time a baseball had hit him in the mouth. He had been watching the game and, seeing the ball coming toward him, had tried to catch it. Quickly and suddenly, the light had spilled over the rim of the world. The sun drowned in a dense smoke, and the pain he had felt was intensified with tongues of flame. Catch it in your hand, not your mouth, sissy, Joan Sears had yelled at him. Joan Sears, in tight blue jeans, had yelled those words at him. Joan Sears, with short, tangled hair. Joe, they called her now. He had gotten up, his face heavy with pain, and now, with this momentary irritation on his mind, he recalled a scene from his childhood and this girl who used to be called Joan. She was the first girl he had seen naked. He saw again the clump of mesquite trees, bordered by high, sunny weeds and grass they used to play under. The narrow path ending under twisted branches of lace-like trees was all so clear again. He recalled the sentence, Let's play Tarzan. I'll be Tarzan, and you be the girl I fight for, huh, gay? As if carried back to the scene, on the very air of the hall, he recalled her tearing off the percale dress, remembered the blue forget-me-nots dotting the fabric. He had gazed at her nude body in amazement after she had discarded the pink underpants and scampered up the tree's low-hanging branches naked. There was nothing there. Had something happened to her? Girls are different from boys, she had answered his question. Put on my dress, and I'll save you from the monkeys. Innocently, she had rolled her head from side to side, and a monkey chant came from her small, moving lips. I didn't know girls were different from boys, he had answered. He disrobed and put on the dress. I did, she grinned. Look, I bet you can't turn yours this way. See? She had come beside him. My brother put his inside me once, right in here. Gosh, didn't it hurt? Nah. She reached over and pulled up the dress. Gaylord didn't mind. You wanna? She asked. Yours is bigger than Tim's. I don't think so. Let's play. And now she had become Joe and looked unhappy in a dress. She looked so much better in slacks. Why couldn't they have exchanged sex? Why? She stood out among a group of girls as much as he felt he did with a bunch of boys. What a difference between Joe Sears and this gentle girl by his side. His gaze left Lois Sue, swept over the chattering, laughing students passing down the hall. He and Lois Sue moved on, but unlike the others, they did not laugh with a wild abandoned air. Remembering her poem, he told her again the lines were lovely and asked what she was going to call it. I don't know, she answered. I won't know until it's finished. I can't seem to find a title until after my poems are finished. I guess you're right. Guess the title comes afterwards. Well. Sometimes right in the middle of the night, I think of one. I got one from a dream one time. Which one was that? The mount. Oh, I remember that one. I liked it. Here's my room. She put out her free hand and he caught it. It's been nice talking, Gay. And thanks for the words of encouragement. They help me a lot. Bye, Gay. Bye, Lo Sue. I'm in every word. Bye. Bye. The students did not merely move along the school sidewalks. They swarmed. It was a river of bare feet, a rumble of skates, a rustle and swish of girls' skirts, greetings tossed back over a shoulder in passing. The cries of the younger students echoed thinly from the open school door. Gaylord saw her coming toward him, alone, older than the other girls, more sureness in her stride and in the way she carried a large purse. Her hair, blowing just a little, looked pretty and her lips swung in unison with her shapely legs. Faintly embarrassed, he looked at the girl with intense concentration. His gaze rested on a vulgar feature of her dress. It had a low-cut neckline, deliberately pinned back to show the crease between her breasts. Well, hello, good-looking. Long time no see, she said. Where you been keeping yourself? He blushed, said, Hello, Thelma, and gave a quick glance around. Had anyone heard her remark? She was always calling him that in public. He wished she wouldn't be so brazen. He didn't like the sweet perfume she wore. It surrounded him and worked down in his nostrils. Several boys whistled on passing. Gaylord waited, on alert for some smart crack, some ugly gesture. But none came from them. 
Thelma leaned toward him and looked him straight in the eyes. Why haven't you been to see me? I've missed you, good looking. I've been pretty busy studying, Gaylord said and glanced significantly at her. Too busy for love, she said in a very level voice. She laughed and patted his cheek. You shouldn't let yourself get that busy. The coolness of her voice and the self-assurance of her attitude startled Gaylord. With that same look eight months ago, she had said, Hop in, Gay. I'll take you home in my new car. Eight months ago? Or was it nine? Ten? Or had it really happened? Yes, he realized it had really happened. That he and this girl had been inextricably involved. He had been overawed and chilled by her forwardness, had been scared and repulsed when she had placed his hands over the large swells of both her breasts, had shuddered from the forced kisses that might keep his teeth from chattering. He had thought of Blake when her hand massaged the increasing hardness, and she had said something about Blake. He remembered that, even though it had been repulsive. She had said something about Blake, something about the things he liked. Well, if Blake liked and did those things, he could too. He would not be a sissy this time. Again, he could feel her body meeting his, this soft body that had reached up to his. Again, he could feel it under his rigid legs, the warmth of her breath on his neck, and then the frightening climax. Oh, honey, you're what I needed. And he had let her draw his body to hers. That's wonderful, darling. Ah, oh, so wonderful. Kiss me. The act had been consummated. He had experienced the moment he had dreaded. The moment we all look forward to in secret, whatever we may feel about it. Had felt as if his insides were exploding, as if everything within him had suddenly been removed. To him, it was ugly, terrifying, although he had heard differently. There were no words for it, and even if Blake did such things... He swore this would be the first and last time for him. When she had let him out in front of his house, his body had felt dulled and leaden, and his arms and legs thrashed uselessly to keep it up. He kept thinking of diseases, newborn babies, and on his bed he had cried himself to sleep. And here she was again, standing beside him with the same expression. She was asking him to repeat what had happened. She looked at him and he felt naked and ashamed. He wanted to break into the current legs and arms to run as fast as he could away from this person who degraded the act of birth. But he stayed on and listened to her say, You've been getting better looking, honey. Have you been having any fun? She looked between his legs, at his eyes, and down again. Not much, he answered. I'm saving our little hideout. What you doing tonight? I've got a date tonight, Thelma. He felt a wave of disgust spreading through him. Now she was causing him to lie. And what for? Why didn't he just tell her he didn't want to go? But how could he with her looking at him? Her gaze seemed to go deep inside him. It was the look of a conquering female over a beaten male. I thought you didn't have dates anymore. Well, uh, I don't often, but it just happens I have one tonight. Maybe some other night? I'm beginning to believe you don't like me, she pouted. You're always busy when I call, too. I'm going to stop asking you. You don't like me, do you, handsome? I do, too, Thelma. But I'm... Um, now why did he say that? I know, you've got a date. I wish I didn't. Okay, baby. She patted Gaylord's cheek again, the fingers running over his neck. Some other time, and don't forget to call me. I'm not going to call you anymore. I've done my share. So from now on, it's up to you. I won't. By the way, she said, have you seen that little dried up history teacher? I'm supposed to pick him up. No, I haven't. He's probably still inside. He's not as good as you, handsome. The old fart. She winked. I'd rather have you. He wished she'd leave. He had never felt so exposed. He gritted his teeth and wished he had had the nerve to tell her to go to hell. That she didn't even deserve the history teacher. He should be out shortly. I won't wait for him if you want to go for a little ride. My car's here. Gaylord's lips tightened and she went on. I've got all afternoon just for you. All night if you want. Gaylord stood his ground firmly. I'm sorry, Thelma. He got out. I can't this afternoon. Joy Clay moved with the jostling, friendly students, never once returning to her serious self. She was alive, open, and friendly. Without waiting for any word or gesture from anyone, she grinned and waved at those she knew, walked and answered talk without the slightest effort. She felt good, and it showed in her pretty face. Where's Bob, Joy? Someone asked. How should I know? She laughed back. She met a friend, and they continued to walk together. Suddenly, she turned to the girl and asked, 
Isn't that Thelma White over there? They both looked. Sure is, the girl answered. Well, what do you know? She's back in school after all these years. Wonder what she expects to learn. Who's that she's trying to proposition now? I can't see his face. If you turn around, looks like Bob, about his height. No, it isn't Bob. I don't think she's having any luck with him, whoever it is. Joy, isn't that gay? Gay? Gaylord LeClaire? Looks like him. It couldn't be. Like hell it isn't. Gaylord had turned and his face was plain to them now. It sure is. Why is she talking to Gay? He's too sweet a boy to mess around with her type. Joy felt as if she could be embarrassed for him. He is sweet. Too shy for me, though. Still, the last time he took me home in his new car, he was kind of cute. He is good looking. Bet in a couple of years he'll really come out. I think his mother's kind of spoiled him. He sure got a good looking dad. I could go for Clayton LeClaire. He seems much younger than he is. He's not too old, is he? Joy wasn't interested in Clayton LeClaire, but she had suddenly become very interested in Gaylord. I don't know how old Mr. LeClaire is, but I do know I'm not going to let Gaylord go out with that person he's talking to. Maybe he's been out with her before. Do you really think so? Still waters run deep, they say, she grinned. Maybe he isn't as shy as I think he is, huh, Joy? Maybe not. The next time Gay takes me home, I think I'll do a little investigating. Well, I'm not going to wait that long. I'm going to go do a little right now. He's not going to get messed up with her if I can stop it. And I think I can. She winked at her friend. Watch me. Good luck, girl. I'll see you. Bye. Bye. She walked toward Gaylord, thinking, Gaylord LeClaire, don't you dare go out with Thelma. I think too much of you to let you get involved with her type. She was almost to him now. You've grown, she thought, looking at him. I didn't realize you were so darn good looking. And I don't believe you're interested in talking to Thelma. I hope you know what she is. The whole town knows. She was almost at his side now. He had not seen her. The breeze rippled against her skirt, and she cut down her pace, walking slowly with short, mincing little steps. Gaylord saw her. His face flush and his black hair glistened in the sunshine. He noted with acute distaste that she had spied Thelma. He followed Joy's gaze and noted for the first time that there were yellow sweat rings at the armpits of Thelma's dress. She looked, he thought, like what she was, a cheap person. Hello, Gay, Joy said cheerfully, directly. It didn't bother her, that directness. Somehow, she felt he was glad to see her. Hi, Joy, he answered a strange half-smile coming and going on his face. Have you seen Bob? She asked in a glowing soprano. I must have missed him. She looked at Thelma. Hello, she said, her voice sharp and cold. Hello, Thelma returned in the same tone. She sized Joy up from every angle, from her ankles to her small pointed breasts. You've gained a little weight, haven't you? No, I haven't, Joy snapped back. She turned to Gaylord. Have you seen Bob Gay? No, I haven't, Joy. Was he supposed to meet you? Having male trouble? Thelma snickered. No, not especially. Are you? I haven't seen him, Gaylord said quickly. He looked from one to the other, his young face frowning and troubled. They sure hate one another, he thought. I don't blame Joy, though. I hate her, too. I wish she would leave. I never have male trouble. I have trouble keeping them away from me, she turned toward Gaylord. Honey, I've got to run along. Don't forget. Call me. She grinned at Joy. Bye. Be careful of Gay. He's a hot number. She looked back at Gaylord and patted his cheek. Aren't you handsome? Gaylord was speechless, stood there statue-like, watching her swing her purse. Watched her as she almost glided down the sidewalk. She's a character, isn't she? Joy grinned, wrinkling her cute little nose. Her eyes sparkled like the opal ring she wore. She sure is. I hope you don't think... I don't think anything of her or what she says. She sure looks older than 18, doesn't she? Gaylord tried to make conversation. She looks 30. She used to be pretty. She's still pretty, but... Pretty? Well, sort of. I don't think so, she challenged. I think she's awful and cheap looking. She wears too much paint and that gaudy purse looks like it's big enough to carry supplies in it. And she probably does. And that dress pinned down with those cheap imitation diamond pins? I guess you're right. I certainly am. And it came to Gaylord that he was in a bad spot. 
Because of Thelma, he was afraid of what Joy would think of him. He took out his handkerchief and dabbed clumsily at his nose. His fair face was so filled with concern that he looked funny. Joy suddenly found that she had said too much. She was afraid that now she was going to laugh. But then she remembered that she used to play with Gaylord as a child, that she had loved this boy who was now a stranger, that she had liked playing with him very much, and after that, she didn't feel like laughing. Thelma's the type that men like and women hate, she said. I don't like her. She took his arm and they started walking. I'm glad you don't, Gay. She's not for you. The focus of Gaylord's mind widened beyond Thelma White now and took in the campus of the school. It was a place of bare earth, noise, and thug-like strangers. Half a dozen boys were clanking at the rusty flagpole with rocks. Other boys were walking past, mumbling under their perspiring foreheads. One boy in track shorts ran past, another followed. All around were patches of boys and girls, patches of reds and greens, patches of tans and blues, patches of various colors. A tangle of snaky hoses woven in black and green lay across the sidewalk. An enormously fat and husky young man almost tripped over it, and a four-letter word filled the air around them. Look out, Skinny, Joy giggled, and watch your language. He grinned back and ran on. Gaylord sighed like a horse having a saddle taken off. I thought sure he was going to fall, he said to Joy. Joy squeezed his arm and regarded Gaylord with amused eyes. So did I. Maybe it would have knocked some of that fat off if he had. I'm glad I'm not fat. I'd sure hate to be like Skinny. I just can't understand why some people let themselves go. Nobody wants to go out with a fat man or a girl. Gaylord did not know what to answer. It seemed that Joy wanted to say something, but could not find a way to begin. I wouldn't want to date with a fatso. I wouldn't either, said Gaylord. No use to get fat. A picture flashed across Gaylord's mind. The picture of his grandmother, which he had visited so often. His grandmother was fat, wore a shapeless printed dress, and had straight black hair. She was old, shapeless, but so wonderful. He remembered a picture of her as a girl. Yes, age did bring on changes. My grandmother sure was fat, put in Gaylord. So was mine, but that's different. No use to be that way when you're as young as Skinny or Velma. Velma could be very attractive. She's very nice. I like Velma. I feel sorry for her. Nobody ever asked her for a date, she grinned. I should talk, shouldn't I? Bob stood me up too. Guess I'll have to go home alone. Gaylord glanced at his watch. Ten after four. He felt obliged to ask her if he could take her home. I'll take you home, he said. Oh, swell, gay. I'd like that, she giggled happily. I haven't ever ridden in your new car. Do you realize that, Gaylord LeClaire? Gaylord realized that she spoke truly. She had not been a companion for a long time. It had all changed with the years. She had even changed. She was now a grown woman, and he found himself wondering how many times Blake had done the act with her, the sickening act, that had happened between himself and Thelma. Robert Blake came forward with all the assurance of a welcome hero. The freshness of his face and the breeziness of his bearing in no way suggested he had kissed a boy and liked it. Hey, you, he growled, tapping Joy lightly on the neck. Why didn't you wait for me? He grinned quickly at Gaylord. Hi, fellow. How's it going? The three walked together, and out the corner of his eyes, Gaylord watched Blake, saw the nipple chest imprinted on the white sweatshirt, the dark hair, soft lips, looked at the big hand that held Joy's at the other swinging with careless grace in time with the slow steps of the big shoes. He admired the back of Blake's head. Blake was a man's man, all right, and yet he was kind and gentle. Every once in a while, the muscles in his arms tightened and looked powerful under the deep bronze skin. Did those arms really embrace him? Did those lips, those gentle lips, really kiss him? Had all this really happened, or was it only another dream? Whatever it had been, either dream or reality, it was completely desirable. It would probably never happen again, but it had happened once. Happened this morning, or was it years ago? No, he was certain it would never happen again. Joy was lucky to have such a lover, lucky to be able to kiss and be held by those strong arms, and he wished it was possible to exchange his place for hers. Hi, Bob, a group of girls chimed on passing. Hi, grinned Blake. Ladies' man, said Joy, poking him in the ribs. Lucky gal, Blake grinned. Isn't she lucky, Gay? He began. To have a good-looking fellow like me to run around with? 
I don't see what I see in this puss of hers. Kind of cute, though, if she only had a nose. Huh, put in Joy, wrinkling up her small nose. Gay likes my nose, don't you, Gay? Gaylord couldn't muster up any false cheer. The three had never walked together before, and he wasn't at ease. He never was, though. It was nothing new. Don't you agree with her, Gay? grinned Blake. I'd... I think Joy's lucky. Gay, Joy cried. Don't you agree with this conceited beast? I was going to say... Blake interrupted. Now don't flatter her. She's hard enough to get along with as it is. Gaylord's eyes darted from one to the other. The words seemed to rise up at him with the sound of trumpets. You'd like to flatter Bob, wouldn't you, Gaylord? He was relieved when a group of girls called Joy. You two wait here, she said. I won't be long. You can both take me home. She hurried across the brown grass, under a tree about thirty yards away, a group of girls waiting, and when Joy reached them, there developed an exciting chatter. Wonder what they're talking about, grinned Blake. Gals can talk more and say less. Gaylord's gaze turned to the girls, looked out over the brown shell of ground, webbed with strewn paper, filled with the sound of feet shuffling and departing. Faces gushed endlessly before him in tides. They had been waiting for this appointed time. Another day of school was over. They had won and were free to have fun now. They were the most fortunate beings who ever lived. They had come out of the building happy, all smiles. Each one had a name, wore clothing, and each one was born with the same as himself. He looked at Blake, repeating to himself with a curiously deep emotion. But me, I'm minus something. I don't know what it is, but I am. Damn, Blake grinned. I sure need a shave. Gaylord watched Blake run a hand over the short, dark bristles. He grinned, and his entire face wore an indefinite, cunning smile fixed upon it like a mask. At first, Gaylord thought the smile was from the mouth, full-lipped, big, bronze-red. But on looking up directly into the eyes, half-closed under tranquil lids, he saw that they did not smile at all. The smile really came from the eyes. He watched the arm muscles expand and in a voice, low-pitched, said, Not too much. I've got to shave every day. Sure gets tiresome. Sure does. I guess it does. I don't have to shave every day. What do you do to your face, Gay? It's so smooth and clean-looking. I wash the hell out of mine, and I still get blackheads. I don't do anything. Do you eat lots of candy? Sure do. Does that make blackheads? Someone told me it did. I'm not sure. A horn blew, followed by a loud young cry. Carolyn, if you're going to go with me, you better hurry up. I've got to get home. Don't get drunk with power, Junior. Just because Daddy let you drive the car today is no sign you can't wait for me. Remember, I'm driving it tomorrow. You'll get home in time for dinner. That reminds me. I've got to get home, too. I wish Joy would come on, said Gaylord, looking at his watch. I do, too, Blake answered. Sure was hot today, wasn't it? Sure was. I did a little track and got sweaty as devil. I was on my way to take a shower when I... Bob, I sure thank you for doing... Forget it. I ought to have my head examined for even bringing it up. Forget it, Gay. He patted Gaylord's shoulder. Say, he said in a fresh tone, are you doing anything tonight? No, nothing that... Let's go to Egan. Tonight? Yeah, we can go to a show or just take a ride. He poked at his lips in a grinning scowl. It's about time we got to know each other. Don't you think so? I think so. So do I. I'll pick you up at seven, okay? Okay. Maybe a little earlier? I'll be ready, Bob. He tried to copy the grin. I like you, Gay. Sorry it's taken so long for this to happen. Gaylord heard footsteps in Joy's tones, but her steps and voice were far away. Suddenly, he had achieved a world. The long-dreamed victory was his. He had gazed and desired this, but had almost relinquished the thought of it ever coming true. Perhaps now he could recapture something which had been so void from the beginning, which had made him lie awake at nights, wondering if words with music and ecstasy would ever be heard. He visualized only one thing, that Blake, perceiving at once his feelings, would go with him to a place remote from the crowd, where he would repeat what had happened in the shower, where he would gather him in bronze arms and be his impetuous lover. And in the clarity of that moment, he experienced his first real pang of love, as though here on the deserted earth, he was seeing Blake for the first time. End of chapter 5
Chapter 6 Gaylord spent a full hour in his bathroom, patiently performing his toilet. There was within him a kind of warm luxuriance, and it glowed about him. There's no one like Bob, he thought. The sound of his voice, the expression in his eyes, the way he walked, all made him feel that he had had a momentary glimpse into another world. Everyone else seemed intolerably dull, even contemptible. The evening had settled swiftly, and the sun had gone down long ago. A cool little breeze had sprung through the open windows and struck his cheeks. He wondered if Blake was thinking of him now, and he felt sure that he must be. No man could kiss like that and forget. The kiss, if nothing else, he thought, would make him remember, draw him back to his arms in spite of himself. He mumbled to himself as he searched for his favorite cologne, and on finding it, raised it against his cheek. It stung. He powdered his face again to erase the redness. Over each eyebrow, he then ran a moist finger. I don't think I've got too much powder on, he pondered. He did look pale, but it was night and wouldn't show. He was happy and spoke to his reflection. You look okay, Gaylord Leclerc. I'm glad you noticed my complexion, Mr. Robert Blake. I'm glad I don't have any blackheads. You don't either. You've got the most beautiful face I've ever seen. Yes, you have too. He turned out the light and stepped from the bathroom, went to his dresser and stuck a clean handkerchief in his pocket, then surveyed himself in the mirrored door. A soft voice came from downstairs. Gaylord listened without moving, as if rooted to the spot. His mother was saying, Gay, Gaylord, Bob's here. I'll be right down. He ran down the steps and crossed the deserted dining room. He saw Blake and for a second was embarrassed, tongue-tied, and not awkward. Also, a little sorry he had used powder. Blake looked so brown and golden. Hi, Gay, Blake said. Hi, sorry I wasn't down. Forget it. I've been trying to make a date with Mrs. LeClaire, Blake cried enthusiastically. But she doesn't want to come along. I'm sure you two boys would just love for me to tag along with you, wouldn't you? Grinned Carol LeClaire. She turned her face from one to the other. You know, you shouldn't be going out on school nights, don't you? And Gaylord was out last night. Gaylord broke in quickly. Now, Mother, you said I could go with Bob. Why did she say that about last night? I'm not saying you can't go, dear. I just mean that both of you should be studying. Won't be long before both of you will be graduating. You want to graduate, don't you? We'll graduate, Miss LeClaire. I'm sure you will. She walked toward the door with them. Sure you don't want to come along? said Blake. I'm sure, Robert. Thanks. Be careful, boys. Don't drive too fast. And Gaylord, don't stay out too late. I won't, Mother. He's only a child, Robert. So get him home early. Oh, mother, whispered Gaylord. His face was as scarlet as the roses on the coffee table. Don't worry, Miss LeClaire, Blake grinned. I'll drive carefully and we'll be back early. The two got into Blake's car and drove away. When Carol LeClaire returned to the living room, she was recalling yesterday's. I wish he was a baby again, she dreamed. It's been a long time since Gaylord's asked me to read to him. My little boy, she mused. How he used to love those fairy tales. How much fun we used to have cutting out paper dolls. Doesn't seem like he should be grown so soon. Doesn't take long. They're children for such a short time. Such a short time. Sometimes I'm afraid he isn't happy. I've tried so hard to understand him. At times I do. At other times he's beyond my reach. I don't think he's in love. I hope not. Oh, I hope not. I'm glad he's gone with Robert. He's a good boy. Gaylord needs someone like him. Funny, Clay could never be his buddy. They just didn't seem to click with each other. And Clayton tried, too. Tried real hard. Poor Clay. And he loves Gay so much. So much. Daylight was gone, and a breeze was creeping into the warmness of the summer air as Clayton LeClaire left the slow traffic of Cotton, Texas behind him and headed home. It was very seldom, lately, that he had stayed downtown until eight o'clock. His tentative plan for just one game had been abandoned, partly because he was enjoying himself, even though he was losing. The big door swung open at the turn of his key. 
In the papered foyer, a beautiful carved pedestal, surmounted by a mirror, stood to the right of the entrance, and at right angles to this was a large square opening. The polished marble surface of the pedestal was bare except for one beautiful piece of Dresden. Carol heard the familiar sound of her husband's steps. On seeing him, she said, Clayton, where have you been? She looked beautiful, glancing up from her knitting. Her short golden hair that had never known the steaming clamps of a curling iron had been carefully groomed. Her cheeks were slightly rouged, and her lips had been brushed with a soft lipstick. Played a little poker with Sam and Walter, he said, tossing his hat on a chair. I wish you'd tell me when you're not coming home for supper. I didn't know it was so late. He craned his back and kissed her on the forehead. Mad at me. I'm not mad, but I do wish you'd call. I waited and waited, she said, still knitting on a pair of woolen socks. Are you hungry? It's still on the table if you are. You're mad at me, aren't you? Carol's head came up and some of the irritation flashed back into her eyes. Clayton flashed a sudden grin. No, she said. I just wish you'd let me know, dear. I hate to have the table messed up. You look good enough to eat. I like you when you're mad. Not too mad, but just like now. He gazed into her hazel eyes, looking up at him below long sweeping lashes. Give me a little kiss and tell me you'll forgive me this time. Stop, Clayton. You'll miss my lipstick and I don't have time to. Where are you going, honey? Jane's coming by and we're going over to Mrs. Collins for some bridge. She wanted you to come, but I didn't know where you were or when you'd be back. I thought maybe you'd gone to the oil field. Don't you want to come with us? Not tonight. I'm tired of cards and Manita's a lousy player. Always plays the wrong card and never knows how many trumps are out. He walked toward the kitchen and Carol followed. Where's Gay? He asked. He's gone to Egan with Robert. Who? Robert Blake. Oh, I didn't want him to go. He's been running around too much at nights lately. You shouldn't have let him go to that dance last night, especially on school nights. Why did you let him go then? He wanted to go so badly. And Robert's such a nice, clean boy. Carol, he's growing up. I don't think he's running around too much. He poured himself a cup of coffee. You can't keep him tied to your apron strings all his life. It's about time he got out with some boys for a change. This Blake boy seems like a fine boy. I'm glad he's taken up with Gay. Maybe he can interest Gay in some new sports. I don't like to see him sit around here like a lovesick girl. I want him to be happy. I'm afraid he's not now. Gay's such a child, really. Now that's where you're wrong, Carol. He's going to... He was interrupted by door chimes. That must be Jane. Carol left her husband and walked through the quiet living room where several lamps were still burning. She opened the front door. Are you ready, dear? Come in a moment, Jane. I'll get my purse. Go see Clay. He's in the kitchen. Jane Servinka walked toward the kitchen. She was middle-aged, and the white collar on her dress was as neatly arranged as her coarse gray hair. She wore no makeup. Still, her plump cheeks glowed with a pale pink color. Well, how do you do, Mr. Leclerc? she said. Well, how do you do, Miss Savinka? How about some stale coffee? She laughed. No thanks, Mr. Smotty. Aren't you coming along? Not tonight. I just got home from a poker game. I don't think I could stand the sight of a deck of cards. You must have lost, huh? Jane chuckled. How'd you guess it? He whispered like a boy who had swiped a piece of pie. Old maids are sort of clever at that. It's about the only thing they are clever about, though. You better come along. You two beautiful women run along. You'll have to count me out tonight. I'm going to bed. Hell, it's bedtime now. Why does Manita start these so damn late? Jane laughed. You know her and her ideas. Yeah, I guess I do. Guess I'm just getting old. Yeah, you sure look it. I know it. Now don't start feeling sorry for yourself. You know you're still the best looking guy in my life. If it wasn't for that wife of yours, I'd try my luck at nabbing you. If I don't do some quick nabbing pretty soon, I'm going to be too darn old. Carol came and stood by the kitchen door, carrying her purse. Jane grinned at her, then back at LeClaire. Always my luck, she said. Just about the time I get going, the wife always enters. Why didn't you stay out for a few more minutes, Carol? Carol grinned at her best friend. 
Seems like I came in just in the nick of time. I wish you'd stop trying to steal my husband, Jane Savinka, especially right in my own house. He is kind of cute, don't you think so? Now look, he's got enough bad ideas without you giving him any more. If he gets any more like he had tonight, you can have him. Fight over me, gals. Come on, fight. You're too willing, and I wouldn't have a chance with this young female. They all laughed, and then Jane asked, By the way, where's my real honey? He's gone, Carol sighed. I think I'm losing him, too. You try to steal my husband, and Gay's getting so grown up. Where'd he go? He went to Egan. By himself? No, he and Robert Blake. I don't know if they went alone or not. I wanted to ask if they had dates, but didn't. He's that football player, isn't he? You know him, broke in LeClaire. Fred Blake's son. You know Fred? Jane nodded that she did. She had heard he was quite a ladies' man. He's such a nice-looking boy, put in Carol. Not as good-looking as gay. That boy's really handsome. Jane turned to LeClaire. Looks like you, Clay. She noticed Carol's forlorn look. All right, he looks like you, too. You'd better say that, Carol grinned. Then, with serious pride, she added, He is handsome, isn't he, Jane? He's sweet, too. In fact, I'm afraid too much so for his own good. Why? Oh, you know how these young girls are today. I just hope he doesn't get messed up in this love business. He's so serious. He won't. Remember me. I'm his dad, and no girl ever broke my heart. The gray-haired woman laughed out loud. Listen, who's talking? It's not too late, grinned Carol, and she gave the brown cheek a soft but firm pat. After a few more sentences of conversation, the two women left the kitchen. LeClaire followed them to the front door. He said, You gals have fun. Tell Manita I'm sorry I couldn't make it tonight. Bend down, and I'll give you something, Carol said. Right here in public? Right here in front of this old maid? Carol LeClaire, you're a cute but wicked woman. Man, you love it, growled Jane. Lucky dog. And where do you get this old stuff? That old maid stuff? Okay, Flapper, you ask for it. He kissed her forehead. She let out a deep sigh and whispered comically, Thank you, kind sire. Thank you very much. No one could understand Clayton LeClaire's implacable determination to own more oil wells, get control of more land, buy one more lease, when he cared nothing for power and already had more income from producing wells than he could spend or even comfortably manage without continuously driving himself. But if his associates could have seen the bare Louisiana house in which he was born and in which, at an early age, he had seen his mother die because there was no end to her slaving and no money when she needed a doctor, the matter of Clayton LeClaire's desire for security would have been an enigma no longer. The fear and horror of poverty that had tortured him after his mother's death had sunk deep in his conscience and continued to run on and on like a current of exhaustless power. It was this that drove him out, increasing his leases and land holdings, each one paying in a flood of black gold into his already weighted hands. After the two women had departed, he picked up the evening paper and sank into the chair Carol had occupied. On the end table were the unfinished socks. The bright wool held him. The phone rang, and LeClaire's vision was gone. If he had suddenly been hit on the head by a drill bit, the jar would hardly have been greater. Guess that's Manita wanting to know what's keeping them, he thought. He picked up the phone and said, Hello. May I speak to Gay, please? The answer was so immediate, so young and virginal, he swallowed hard. I'm sorry, Gaylord isn't here. Who's calling? Mr. LeClaire? Yes. This is Joy. Joy Clay, remember me? Joy, why, of course. How are you, Joy? Haven't seen you for a long time. Why haven't you been around? I've missed you. I've been awfully busy. The voice was soft and low. Yeah, I guess a pretty girl like you is kept busy. She laughed, then said, Thanks, Mr. LeClaire, and just for that, I'll come by and see you real soon. You do exactly that. How's your mother and that mean old daddy of yours? They're fine, thanks. Give them my regards, and I'll tell Gay you called. Oh, no, 
Her tone changed. Don't tell him I called. No? He was puzzled. It wasn't important. Don't tell him. Please don't. I won't say a word if you don't want me to, honey. Thanks, Mr. LeClaire. Bye. Goodbye, Joy. And don't forget, you promised to come by real soon. I won't forget. Bye again. Bye. He hung up the receiver and lit a cigarette. His feelings of wonderment was gone now. Suddenly, he knew that she was deeply concerned, that she wanted almost desperately their conversation to remain a secret. He could have told her Gaylord was with Robert. Evidently, she had thought he had gone out with another girl. This being the case, he was glad he remained silent. Keep them guessing, he grinned. He can tell her himself if he wants to. Think she kind of likes that boy of mine. He glanced with a humorous expression at the evening paper without opening it and mumbled, she likes that boy of mine. Yeah. That's the way they act when they're in love. She's a sweet girl. I hope Gay does like her. Joy Clay had always been friendly and respectful in her association with Gaylord. Partly because she liked him, partly because she was sorry for him. But her pity was casual, and the other? Now she didn't know. A week ago, it was the same feeling she had for, oh, other boys? No. She had always liked him more than that. Idly, her hand went across the keyboard of a grand piano. She had never been bored, but this evening, she considered herself the most unfortunate girl on earth. There was a loud thump, and the keys screamed discordantly at her. She ran from the room to her bedroom, stopped in front of her vanity. Where is he? Her lips formed the words to her, but there was no sound. Her arched brows drew together, and her face had an expression of almost tragic anxiety. He can't be, she thought. He can't be with Thelma. She had never been jealous before in her life. Why should she be of that hussy, that slut? A column of moonlight came through the thin, slantwise wooden blinds and reflected in the mirror. She went to the window, pulled back the crisscross curtains, and looked at the moon. It looked so round and golden in the clear sky, but Joy could not think nor care nor see its beauty. Once more, the old and loving thoughts, longings for Gaylord, which had ebbed when she had thought herself grown, revived. Now she remembered with aching clarity all the small separate things they used to do, how much fun it had been playing house, sewing doll clothes, how gentle and kind he had always been so thoughtful of her in everything he said and did. From that first day, he had been that way. Her eyes swam, enchanted by the moon now, and the rage within her grew calm. She closed her lids and beheld not the Gaylord she used to know, but as he was today, the wave in his hair, the deep blue of his eyes, the smooth texture of his sunless skin, the shy timbre of his voice, which gave her a real sense of physical pleasure. She remembered the small bump on his ear and wondered if it had always been there. Words came drifting from the vision, alive and sweet, but other voices crowded his away. Gaylord silently sank into the dark background, and she stood before herself, a grown woman. He called to her from beyond, but she was too busy dancing with others, too happy with other arms around her small waist to answer his call. She was too busy dancing dancing with a boy she had just met, a boy named Robert Blake. She turned away from it and brushed her hand across her eyes, smearing the tears that were slowly beginning to drip down her velvet-like cheeks. In the mirror, she noticed their roundness, the slight lift of the cheekbones, the clear complexion. She raised her eyebrows slightly and watched the tiny lines form in her smooth forehead. She wasn't sure she liked her brownish-blonde hair in a page boy. He wasn't sure it was just right for her. Blake had said he liked it. Gaylord had never said a word about it. Still, she hadn't really been around him. But after all, she sat right behind him in their home room. He should have noticed. Everyone else did. Darn him, she thought with dismay. Darn him. He must be blind. Joy mulled wretchedly over her problems, but no solution came to her. She looked at her red fingernails. They're too bright, she thought, and began to peel off the polish. She wished she had never seen Gaylord. If it hadn't been for Thelma White, 
I just wonder, she pondered. Has he been out with her? He said he thought she was pretty. He's never even told me I was. I don't think he's even noticed my figure. Damn it. Well, Bob thinks I'm pretty. She looked in the mirror, noticing her breasts, small and pointed. She raised her skirt above her shapely legs. Not bad, she thought. She turned and thought of the curve in her back. Good. Her hips were about right. She looked at her flat stomach. Her hands went up to each side of her neck. I'm pretty, she said. Lots prettier than Thelma. Damn him. I'm a good-looking woman, and he's still a baby. Let Thelma have him. I don't care. I've got Bob. Turning again to the moon, she could not shake off the feeling of melancholy. She had never been this way, and she found little pleasure in brooding over herself. This was the first time she had ever told herself she was pretty. She had always considered herself just another girl. But now she wanted to be more than just another girl. She wanted to be loved and loved and loved by Gaylord. She stood by the window dreaming. It was moonlight on a lake again, and a soft breeze blew across the waveless surface, caressing her cheeks. She was there in Robert Blake's arms. Robert Blake. How he reminded her of Gaylord now. Even with the added weight and deeper colored skin, he was like him. Alike? Oh, no. Gaylord had never taken her in his arms the way Blake did now. Had never whispered the words into her ear that Blake whispered. She closed her eyes and remembered Blake's kiss. Blake had kissed her passionately that first night on the lake, and after several dates, she had allowed him to kiss her neck, almost down to her breasts. She remembered the emotions, the thrill when he had placed her hand on his lap. Discovering his body, she had wanted to draw away, but her fingers had remained. She remembered the throbbing underneath the sticky wool. It was like a magnet holding her hand. The nipples of her breasts became hard, remembering his hand sliding underneath her dress. It was as if it was there now, all moist and warm on her naked flesh, and again the moon became a blur. She had wanted him as badly as he had wanted her, had wanted to throw her arms around him and draw him close, wanted to feel his kisses, his hands cupping her breasts. I can't, she had thought miserably. What kind of a girl am I? I'm me, Joy Clay. I can't allow myself to do this. I can't. Her head had been enveloped in a fog. She had gotten dizzy, but not too much so. She had known she had to do something right away, or... Don't, Bob, she had said. Let's don't, please. Please, Joy, he had whispered. No, no, Bob. He had caught her face in his hand and forced another kiss. His other hand held something warm against her leg. Joy had wrenched herself away from him. I'll stop, Blake had whispered, helplessly after she had slapped him. I'd like to, Bob, but I can't. I understand. And now she wondered what would have happened if she had allowed Blake to possess her. He was so kind and understanding. She was as bad as he. She had wanted him, too. Now she wished she had. I wish I had let him she cried. Every sense of emotion had heightened to an almost painful intensity. She dropped the curtain savagely, almost tearing its thin fabric. Damn moon, she gritted the words between her teeth and flung herself on the bed. She stared about her and wondered if Gaylord had ever been out with Thelma White. She gave a frightened little sob and bit her lips. Thelma wouldn't fight back. She knew that. Joy lay there thinking, her fine nostrils flaring with her breathing, her face very white, her eyes behind their sooty lashes, enormous in their small face. She was seeing Gaylord over Thelma's naked body. Her small fingers clutched tight, open, and then clutched again. She thought about what Thelma had said, but it wasn't the kind of thing that it did any good to think about. If she kept on brooding over it, she would go mad, start crying again. She didn't want to do that. Gaylord hadn't asked for a date tonight, but she kept on hoping. Maybe he would call. Maybe he would forget Thelma. Maybe. Joy! It was her mother's voice. Her heart leaped with excitement. It was Gaylord. 
He did call, and she had gotten herself upset for nothing. He was coming over. She wanted to break into wild laughter, and for a mad second, wondered what dress he would like best. She'd wear one that he would be sure to notice. Joy, are you asleep? No, mother, she almost shouted. Mary Jane's here. Mary Jane? Suddenly and forcibly, a hard stab shot through her, and she looked deflated, diminished. In the distance, she heard a witch cackle, laughing at her dream and at her. She turned about wearily. I'll be there in a minute, Mary Jane. She almost cried. She felt enclosed in ice, rubbed her eyes. Mary Jane's here, she whispered to herself. Oh, hell. She gave a little laugh and left their room. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 From birth, Robert Blake had been physically a big boy and possessed a terrific strength. Now, at 18, he stood over six feet in his bare feet. His face, beneath short pitch-like hair, looked as though it had been sculptured out of bronze. His mouth was long, with a touch of wry humor about it, and his eyes were as brown as an old penny. His nose, which had been broken in several football games, showed no ill effects. It looked perfectly chiseled above a square and dented chin. His physical bigness was so evenly proportioned that his 200 pounds seemed an unbelievable weight. He had a widely scattered host of acquaintances and friends, for the warmth in his eyes and the way he walked instantly awoke friendly welcome for him in any crowd. People, both young and old, found themselves enjoying his broad grin and the gleeful twinkle always present in his eyes. He stood in mortal fear of nothing. He loved crowds, and a football field was his most natural environment. He employed his talent there, and was considered the best football player in the county. He hated books, and his teachers found it necessary to give a little on many of his examinations. He was as different in temperament from the quiet secret of Gaylord as white is from black. Rarely sitting, his long, lean legs always were moving. He was very passionate, and his first affair with a woman had occurred when he was only thirteen. She had been twenty years his senior, but this had not alarmed him. Since then, there had been many more. In love, he formed no boundaries. He relished every moment of the unexpected excitement, and he had no ability to feel ashamed of the times he had practiced unnatural sex acts. Life held no mysteries. It only produced incidents and people, and he had an insatiable appetite for everything. If asked, he could have explained why he had selected Gaylord LeClaire for a friend, but he wouldn't have. He would have said it was because he liked him, and that would have been enough. He would never admit to anyone Gaylord was a sissy and desirable. He discovered early he had the ability to hold attention and attract girls, and even men merely by his presence. But the sighs and attentions he attracted, he accepted without conceit. In this, he differed from his pleasure-mad father, who was a pushover for an attractive woman. After they had driven away, leaving Carol LeClaire on the front porch, Blake was the first to speak. Dern, that's good smell and shaving lotion you got on. He leaned right, sniffing the air. It's not shaving lotion, Gaylord answered meekly. It's cologne. So. Still smells good. Blake was hearty, expansive. I'm glad you like it. Blake's brown eyes, luminous through the dusk, darted over Gaylord, and under his moving nostrils, the corners of his mouth moved upward. I like cologne. Use it too. I like that new one called Passion Rose. Sure a sexy name, isn't it? Gaylord did not answer immediately. He tried to push away the grin from his face. Passion Rose, he thought. That's what I've got on, and he doesn't even know it. Just like a man. Pretty sexy is right, he grinned. They moved on, and there was music now. They were passing flickering neon, and a revolving jukebox was blaring out music. Thanks for asking me to go with you tonight, Gaylord continued. I'm glad you asked me. I am too, Blake grinned, his big jaws moving. I'm really glad, Gay. He fumbled in a shirt pocket. Want some gum? Thanks. How's that new Buick? Sure is a beauty. Bet it'll go like hell, won't it? Not any faster than your Ford. We should have used it tonight. I never thought... 
We'll use it some other time, Blake grinned. Damn, I wish Dad sold them instead of Ford's. This can will go all right, but it sure does rattle like hell. Sounds like it's fallen to pieces. Gaylord found himself thinking. I wish I would have known you wanted to drive my car. Just to have you touch it would mean a lot. Gosh, Bob, if I could only tell you the many times I wish to be sitting close to you. To be able to talk to you the way we are now. I hope we do it often. It can't be too often. He was not looking at Blake. He was searching that unknown but familiar road in front of the blinding lights coming toward them. He looked at their brightness swimming past, and he thought of water falling from a great height and splashing on rocks below. He was passing down one of the oldest roads of his childhood, the way to the city, and he remembered the many times he had traveled over its pavement, good trips and bad ones, sad ones and happy ones. But tonight, the passing scene of familiar backdrops and landscapes held a different charm. It was all important now. The trees, the houses behind the trimmed hedges, the flat fields and the lighted billboards were all seen through different eyes. Bob, Gaylord whispered. Huh? Thanks for this morning. This morning? Yes, this morning. Stud? He was conscious of Blake gazing at him. Oh, that. His bare brown arm reached down and he patted Gaylord's leg. In the moonlight, Gaylord saw the wink, the grin. Ain't nothing. He went on. Nothing. Forget it, Gay. It was a lot to me. I don't know what I would have done if it hadn't been for you. There. It was said. He tried to smile, a hesitant little boy's smile, but his voice was full and very serious. They wouldn't have done anything, just a bunch of bullies that get a kick out of doing something like that. I'm not so sure. When Stud pushed against me, he had a... Well, anyway, he sure was repulsive. I was scared, Bob. Guess you got his blood pressure up, huh, kid? I don't see how. Not a girl. Gaylord was sorry he had said this. In the dim and shifting light, he knew, and he also knew Blake knew. It's been done before, Blake grinned. It has? Gaylord knew it had, but he didn't know what else to say. Hell, gay. Boys play around with each other. It's only natural. Haven't you ever played around with another fellow? He almost whispered, his countenance assuming in a flash, secret and indecent mask. No, Gaylord answered with vagueness. I haven't, have you? At this, Blake laughed softly. He blinked and tossed his head in a series of chuckles. Gaylord wondered how he had ever had the courage to ask such a question. He grinned back at Blake, thinking, I'll bet you can read my mind. I bet you know what I'm thinking. I'm glad it's dark. Blake said, You're a sweet kid, you know it? He patted Gaylord's thigh again. Thelma thinks you're sweet too. Did you know that? Gaylord saw the broad wink. He almost swallowed his gum. Looking at Blake, he asked aghast, Thelma? Thelma White? Uh-huh. Thelma White. Oh. What's the matter? She didn't say anything wrong. She thinks you're swell. She does? Yeah. Said you really knew how to make love. You know what else she told me? Gaylord sat for a moment, staring and biting his bottom lip. Just what else had Thelma told? Don't you want to hear what else she told me? What else? She told me she had been out with you. Said she thought you didn't like her because, he grinned. She got your cherry? That's what she thinks. I just don't care for her type. That's why I haven't been with her anymore. She's got such an awful rep that... I've been out with girls. Everybody thinks I'm just a kid. Nobody believes I'm grown. I don't know, but I'm... I think you're grown, Gay. Blake added tenderly, his hand resting on Gaylord's arm. You know, I don't think you're a kid. I wouldn't have asked you to come along tonight if I had thought that. You'd better not, Gaylord said, giving Blake's leg a slight kick. Ouch, Blake yelled as if he had been struck by a hammer. Oh, Bob, I'm sorry. Gaylord did not hesitate. He bent down quickly and held the leg. I didn't mean to kick so hard. Does it hurt? Is it bloody? Blake asked seriously. Don't take your hand off. 
Rub it. That's better. You'd make a good nurse. I'd love to nurse you, Gaylord thought. No, I wouldn't either. I don't ever want to see you hurt again. You're too wonderful, too sweet to suffer. Don't ever get hurt. I love that grin of yours, you handsome devil. I know I didn't hurt you, but I'm glad I kicked you. Oh, Bob, I wish you'd kiss me. You look so beautiful. He wanted to say all this, but instead he said, I'd love to nurse you, Bob, but I hope you never need a nurse. You would? I wouldn't be much of a friend if I wouldn't. And we are friends, aren't we, Gay? Yes, we are. I hope we'll always be friends. I think we will. I think we'll be real good friends from now on. They came to a side road that ran off the highway among huge oak trees. Looking down it, Gaylord could see the large round moon trying to find its way between their leafy branches. There were unseen living things along that path too. Cattle, horses, to say nothing of numerous sly things, their fangs ready to kill, who ran wildly at the approach of man. There had never been such a night. The deep blue color above was carelessly splattered with splotches of glistening diamonds, and the air was never so gentle across his cheeks, caressing and passing by softly, without a sound, to be lost in the vastness of space around them. The low, melodious hum of the motor was like the purr of a kitten, contented and glad it was with them. Tonight, when everything was so enchanting, so full of mystery and yet so very simple, the world was wonderful. How marvelous, even with all the far-fetched grotesque things upon it, the world was still wonderful, so complex in its simplicity. And passing through the timeless and impenetrable forest, Gaylord dreamed. Nothing in particular, just dreamed. A great oak hung there, its trunk rough and broad, its limbs hanging with moss, stretching out and over the road, shutting out the moonlight. He looked at it with the bewildering excitement of a poor man unearthing a hidden treasure. God makes beautiful things, young Gaylord thought, awed by their discovery. Beautiful skies and trees. He wished suddenly the top would fly back so he could see the miracles around even more plainly. Maybe that would give him courage to say the things within him, things that were demanding to be said. Automatically, he closed his eyes, wondering what Blake was thinking of. The wind was from the south, fresh and strong in his face and hair. He dreamed of being a girl and, leaning back against the seat, sighed deeply. Maybe his life had changed. Maybe tomorrow and the many tomorrows things would be better. If I was a girl, he thought, I'd be in Bob's arms. He'd be loving me and kissing me. He'd be mine. He'd be, hey, Blake's hand shook Gaylord. Am I such bad company you go to sleep? He left his hand on Gaylord's shoulder. I'm not asleep, and you'd never be bad company. Gosh, the hand felt good on his shoulder. I was just thinking. About me? He knows I was thinking of him, thought Gaylord. He can read my thoughts. No, he sputtered. I wasn't thinking of you, Bob. I'm disappointed, grunted Blake. Here I thought you were thinking of me. Suppose I was. He remembered the kiss and the warmth that had come with it. There was nothing ugly or unpleasant about it, unless it was what people would say. And now he turned his back on the world. Suppose I was thinking of you, Bob. Would that be unusual? I don't see why. We're buddies, aren't we? I hope we are. Well, we are. It was that simple. With three words, their friendship was sealed. At last, Blake wanted him. To be lonely is one thing. To be wanted is another. There is no loneliness so acute as that of a boy upon a trap, facing many eyes. But to be wanted is to be free. Free from eyes and tongues that watch and question and condemn. Feeling himself now thus wanted, Gaylord relaxed, and after a moment he stretched his legs and breathed deeply. An approaching glaring light made him blink and squint, and finally shut his eyes altogether. Yet the very hurt of the glare pleased him, and he embraced it. Leaving a hand on his knee, opening his eyes again, 
drinking the beauty around him. His glance swung to Blake. Something like a laugh leaped into his eyes. Isn't this a beautiful night, Bob? He said. Yeah, Blake grinned. It's beautiful, all right. I think it is. It's been awful dry and hot, but it's cool tonight. The air feels good. It does to me, too. Sure hot in that damn schoolhouse today. Blake spoke in an easy manner, and Gaylord's courage quickened like a young fire when fuel is laid freshly on. After a moment, with a slight gesture, he touched the other's arm. I'm glad you asked me to come with you. I haven't been out with anyone for a long time. I used to go out. But lately, I just stay at home and read. Can't read your life away. I know it. But there's not very many I like to be around. It's not that I think I'm better or anything like that. It's just something I can't explain. I understand. I'm glad, Bob. But you don't think I'm conceited, do you? I know some think I am. Hell no. I'll never forget what you did for me this morning. Forget it. I can't. I keep remembering. Remembering ain't good at times. Take life as it comes. That's the way I've got it figured out. If you want something, try to get it, and if you can't, well, there's no use fretting about it. At least you tried. No use to sit at home and cry over it. Look for something else. I'm going to stop looking. You are? Blake resumed his survey, and a burning desire to bring the other close grew within him. He sat in half-surrender until he heard, at some distance, the wail of a train coming from the west. And it seemed to moan. Don't, Bob. Don't. People love to gossip, and they'll find out. They're always looking for sweet young flesh to crucify. He's been through enough. Don't touch him. Then suddenly, the image was shattered by the apparition of Joy Clay. He saw her pointed breasts beneath a sheer green dress, and his hands felt moist and sticky. He remembered her shapely legs, and wondered why he had never tried again after that night on the lake. Other girls swept his vision, but the naked form under the shower came and stayed in front of him. He remembered the shivering boy he held so tenderly. He hated himself for his thoughts now. The world, if they knew, would always be ready with its glances and its whisperings, wherever and whenever he should face the eyes and tongues of men again. No, Gay, he thought. I can't. Even if I want to, I can't. So he sat where he was until Gaylord faced him and said honestly, Bob, what? What's the best exercise to make arm muscles? To make arm muscles? Hell, that's easy. I'll teach you a couple. I'll make you so damn strong you can whip anybody, even me. I don't want to whip you. You may want to sometimes. I don't think so. Sure. That's one thing I'm real sure of. So Blake submitted, filling his eyes with a different determination. I'll make him strong, he thought. I'll show them he's not a sissy after all. A bridge loomed ahead of them. They passed beneath its strong steel beams, and before them lay the beginning of Egan, Texas. Under a mass of trees and shrubs, bound to a grass-covered earth, stood a large two-story house. Its high windows blazed with light, and the wide veranda and huge four-squared chimney stood white in the moonlight. Old Man Reeves must be having a party, said Blake. Look at all those cars and people. Sure is a big crowd, isn't it? Do you know Marlene? I've seen her at dances. She's very pretty. I've had a couple of dates with her. She's kind of snooty and always powdering her face. Hell, I couldn't even let the windows down because the wind would mess her hair. I asked her one time after we'd been to the show if she'd like a hot dog. You know what she said? No. She said, thanks, Robert. She calls me Robert. But I don't care for them. Must we go to a drive-in? Did she really? She's that away. They drove along, past more houses and filling stations, past rows of one-story buildings, past the sidewalks where a few people lingered. Two Negroes in bright checkered shirts and tight cuffed trousers laughed and snapped their fingers as they walked. Gaylord looked at them with a curious sensation, wishing he could walk down a street with the same careless stride. Gaylord did not protest when Blake suggested, Let's eat. 
and when the red light changed to green, he swung the car onto a vacant lot of shelled earth around a neon-circled building. A blonde, unattractive female waited on them. Well, she asked sharply, what's it going to be? Hello, sweetheart, Blake grinned, noticing the mole on her chin. You want a hamburger or something else, Gay? Before Gaylor could speak, Blake said, with a quick appeasing smile, Now, I think you ought to have a hamburger. And he told the girl, Two of the biggest hamburgers you got, beautiful, and a couple of Cokes, and some potato chips. I'm not that hungry, Bob. Yes, you are. Gaylord shook his head. Well, he grinned, You're the boss. Gaylord looked at the girl. She was studying Blake. He thought she would let Bob have her without any talking. She wouldn't say no. She looked as if she'd enjoy having him in bed with her. Anything else you want? She slyly asked. Want anything else, Gay? No, thanks. Guess that's it. Oh, bring me a package of cigarettes. What kind? What kind you got? You better take eagles. They're mild and won't stunt your growth, she assured him, returning his wink. Blake laughed. Okay, eagles it is. Gaylord blushed, realizing he was looking at Blake's legs, remembering the same look in Thelma White's eyes, wondering if Blake was only kidding or meaning his remarks. He hated the look on the girl's face, and he was near hating her, too. He looked into Blake's lap again and saw the bronze hands groping between the thick thighs. He felt alone and loveless in a bitter, heartless world, hating himself at the same time. I wish I was like Bob, he cried silently between clamped teeth. Why can't I be? Why? Blake broke his thoughts. I wish we'd come in your car, Gay, he grinned. Bet that ugly cunt would have really tried to date us then. I don't think you need a different car. You don't? She'll go with you. Blake laughed, said, Oh, yeah, damn. He doubled his fist over his groin. I've got to take a leak. How about you? I don't have to. Sure? I'm sure. He watched Blake cross the shelled earth and thought, I'd never be able to do anything with you by my side. I've got to go, but I couldn't do anything. Not with you watching. Damn, I wish I could. I wish I was like you, Bob. Wish I could walk just like you. No one can do that. No one but you. It's part of you. Only you. And it wasn't long before he saw the familiar walk coming toward him. Phew, I feel better, Blake grinned. Nothing as refreshing as a good pee, he slumped back into the seat. Maybe I had better go. With a hamburger and coke coming, I may need a little more room. Don't shake it more than twice. Gaylord's face flushed, and he laughed nervously. I won't. He was glad he was alone in the small toilet. He looked around and read the many remarks written on the walls. Men and women in grotesque positions, outlined with names and dates, appeared everywhere. He looked at the large drawings and wondered if people really did such things. A man, about twenty-five, wearing a bright sports shirt, came through the door and walked unsteadily toward Gaylord. He zipped his trousers quickly. His voice was young, and he enunciated so poorly that he seemed to have his mouth full of mush. Damn beer sure goes through a fella, don't it? He continued. I've been drinking the damn stuff all day. I gotta. After a few words, Gaylord stepped back. He didn't wait to hear the rest of the sentence. In a few steps, the young man in the toilet faded into the past. Deep within him, within the secret places of him, he felt a familiar phenomenon take place as he walked back toward the car. He wanted to wash his hands and comb his hair. Darn that fella. Why couldn't he have waited a few minutes? The car hop had just placed the tray on the car when he sat down beside Blake. She glanced at him and remarked, You sure got pretty hair. Wish mine was curly. Thanks, Gaylord said looking at her stringy mop, and he tried to grin like Blake. He's the best-looking fella in cotton, Blake put in, but he's fast as hell. What's wrong with that, she murmured. That's just my type. Gaylord felt the girl's eyes on him. He knew their expression, queerly penetrating and insistent, as cold as ice from an icebox and as cunning as a cat creeping toward a bird. Gaylord remembered that look that night when he found himself against Thelma she had looked at him that way. He didn't like it. She continued, If you want anything else, just blink. 
and with a wink at Blake, she left. She sure was on the make, Blake grinned. He took a bite of food after handing one of the hamburgers to Gaylord. Good, huh, Gay? Sure is. Almost simultaneously, he noticed Blake's hands, or perhaps it was the dark hair on them. For a moment, as Blake lifted his hands, they stood out in front of two dark eyes. The fingers were wide and long. The hands of a fighter or an artist. But on feeling his gaze returned, Gaylord took another bite of his hamburger. I'm glad you insisted on my having one. Didn't know I was hungry. I was starved, Blake returned. His tone was expressive, gay. It made Gaylord happy. For a while, they ate in silence. Then Blake said, How do you like to have that gal under you? Bet she'd give you a race. Ain't pretty, but in a pinch she'd do, wouldn't she? Not for me. Blake's eyes narrowed as he looked up from the hamburger quickly. Huh? He grinned. Not even in a pinch? Not even then. I don't believe. Why lie, he thought. His desire was not for the girl, but for the one at his side. Strangely, this desire was not new or unpleasant. It had some mysterious joy in it, or else why did it repeat itself so often? But now this also seemed hopeless. Blake was for girls to love. He felt Blake liked him, but was afraid that was as far as it went. His thoughts went to the girl and the things she had to offer. He had nothing. After all, boys didn't love each other the way they did girls. And with his thought, he saw the hopelessness of his love. It hung over him, all tangled with something confusing, remorseful, yet lovely. He heard the whistle of truck tires coming along the road from which they had turned off. It was shrill and penetrating, shaking the earth on passing, causing him to jump at its sudden outburst. Without warning, the voice of the car hop whined. Ready? Yeah. Gaylord watched Blake. He watched the girl take the bill from the bronze fingers. Her hair hung in wisps around her broad cheeks, and her eyes, under which were dark circles, tried to smile. Gaylord thought, how can Bob even think about going out with her? She's so hard-looking, so common. It wouldn't be so bad if she was pretty, but gosh, not her. Oh, Bob. Don't go out with her or ask her to meet you later. Please don't. Then, with no haste, the girl picked up the tray and after a few words left. Blake's car backed and turned, throwing its lights on the girl, who was stooping to pick up a beer bottle. Guess you're right, Gay, Blake said. She's no prize beauty. She sure isn't. Blake laughed heartily. Guess she's had a lot of hardware. He paused, glancing at Gaylord. How about a movie? It'll be nice and cozy in one. The words hung between them like bait as the car swung onto the road, its twin blades of light cutting into the slab of cement. Gaylord looked at the boy at the wheel and found a strange, soft gentleness in the handsome face. He looked back to the road. Inside the theater, it was cozy with Blake beside him, sitting so close to him, watching him eat a bar of candy, his torso sunk deep into the chair and his propped legs in front of him. Sure you don't want just a little bite? Blake whispered. No, thanks, Bob. No popcorn? Gaylord laughed a silly little laugh. No, Bob, I'm stuffed. I just couldn't. He glanced at the broad forehead and moving jaws. Then he crouched in the seat like the other. A sort of happy stupor crept through him, and just sitting there made him light a body, so that sometimes he breathed with a sigh. As he put his head against the seat, he felt a warm hand reach out for his. In the soft light, they held hands. Like wax in a flame, it lay there. It was good to know he was not alone. Time stood still. Yet somehow, it was time to go. After the show, Blake suggested a drink, and on entering a drugstore, a group of boys greeted them happily. They were young, healthy, full of life. They were idling boys who exchanged school gossip with each other then would follow with forced explosion of laughter and backslapping. One of them called out boldly to the boy behind the soda fountain. Give me a Coke, Hoss. Quick, I've got a hot date waiting. Who's the unfortunate girl? The boy behind the counter asked and laughed. Listen to him, will you? And he's supposed to be my best friend. He lit a cigarette. She's got a friend, too. Want to come along, Bob? I don't know if I can take care of both of them. Not tonight, Blake said. Got something lined up? Sort of, 
haven't we, Gay? Quickly, Gaylord raised his eyes. He had been watching with absorbed attention the reflection of Blake's face in the mirror behind the cluttered shelf. His companion had asked him a question, but he didn't know what he had asked. He had been too busy imagining Blake pulling his pants over his legs, peeling off his shoes and socks, waiting till the last moment to slip off his shorts, then tossing them carelessly across the foot of the bed which lay a naked girl. He was glad Blake had interrupted his thoughts. What? he asked. I just said we've got something planned. Have fun, you two, said the stranger to Gaylord. Don't get caught. I won't, Gaylord grinned, happily realizing that Blake wasn't naked, wasn't with a girl, and that he was ready to go. I'm ready. Anytime you are, Pop. They passed the drive-in they had eaten at earlier, and the car hop who had waited on them was seated on a bench close to the wall. The lot was practically vacant. Only one car was in the enclosure. Blake sounded his horn and waved. She responded with a broad smile and a flip of the wrist. Want something? Blake asked. No. No, I'm not hungry. Shall we have another Coke and get her a little? Blake grinned. Or do you think we'd better go on? Let's go on if you don't mind, Bob. Okay, sweetheart. Blake was expansive. I feel good. You should. You slept all through the show. Did I snore? Gaylord giggled. No, but I thought you were going to any minute. I'm surprised I didn't. I ate too much. Was the show any good? It wasn't too good. How'd the dame make out? She killed herself after he left her. I felt so sorry for her. Betty Davis is my favorite actress. I wish they'd give her better stories. She just lived the part. She was so miserable when she found out her husband had not come home. I think I know how she felt. Men sure can be mean at times. Yeah, guess we can. Especially when it comes to dames. Bob? Huh? Did you want to, uh, see that girl? What girl? The girl at the drive-in. No, why? I just thought maybe you wanted to see her. Her? Blake questioned. He sat laughing, then placed his hand on the other's leg. Hell no. I don't want to see her. Why should I when we're together? I'd rather be with you any time. Gaylord watched him yawn deliciously, watched his breath suddenly quicken with a sense of imminency, of immediate necessity. He experienced an unexplainable tinge of uneasiness as Blake's arm went around his shoulders. It rested there a moment, then pulled Gay toward him. Come here, Blake grinned. I'm lonesome over here by myself. Gaylord didn't answer, but yielded to the powerful hand, slid over close. You're not by yourself, Bob. This is better, though, isn't it? Yes, Bob. He murmured after a long moment. It seemed longer than it was. I was lonesome, too. The hand rubbing his shoulder felt good. He pressed his cheek trustingly against the other shoulder that rose and fell with breathing. His hands rested on his lap as they might rest on a pillow, and he realized that this was the answer to all his dreams. He closed his eyes from the soft gray light, exchanged it for a rosy hue. He wondered if this were really true, wondered if he were really here. That's better, Blake's low voice said. Much better. When Gaylord opened his eyes, the haze across the sky had thickened, and the moon and stars themselves had vanished. They were alone, between two forests. There were no clearings here, no farms, no filling stations or houses. The civilization from which man came was far away, and those who ventured here were explorers or lovers, with only one thought, to be alone. Watching the changing profile of the trees, Gaylord did not realize they had long since left the highway, that he was on a strange road. He only knew he had at last lost the world he had wished to lose so many times. Bob? he finally asked. Huh? What are you going to do when school's out? Oh, I don't know. Haven't given it much thought. Won't be long. That's right. Sure won't. I should have finished last year, but I wanted to play ball another year. I love to watch you on the field. You seem so sure of yourself. I love football. I know you do. I'd rather play than eat. Scares me sometimes when so many jump on you. Don't hurt. The voice held amusement. Sure looks like it would. You ought to play, Gay. I'll bet you'd be a good runner. If I could play like you, 
I wouldn't mind. You could. Just takes time. You gotta learn, and you can't learn without taking a few knocks. When I first went out, I was lousy. I bet you weren't. Yes, I was too. Couldn't even keep that pigskin in my hand, and God knows it's big enough. Dropped it all the time. I sure was clumsy. While Gaylord listened, he thought, Your hand is big, but it doesn't feel clumsy. It feels soft and wonderful on my shoulder. The car stopped, and Gaylord felt himself drawn even closer. A strong hand came up and imprisoned his face. Where are we? he asked. Lover's Lane. Blake's voice sounded far away, but the hand on the thin shirt over his flesh was very near. Lover's Lane. A more timeless moment had never entered Gaylord's life. He tried to be casual by adding, Your old stomping grounds, huh? Bet you've been here lots of times. A few, Blake murmured drowsily, pressing his hands. I never knew about this one. Not even with Thelma White? Not even with Thelma White. The odor of oiled hair and bronze skin was in his nostrils, and the darkness ebbed and flowed around him in gusts of warm and melodious wind. Gaylord was startled as he recognized the strength of emotion Blake aroused in him. The murmur of crickets was constant, the croaking of frogs deep, but not heard. He smiled uncomfortably and tried to release his shoulder. Instead of letting go, Blake's embrace grew tighter. Gaylord found himself thinking, God, he's strong. Why should I pull away? I've never been so happy. Never so happy. Blake bent down, and his lips were soft and warm. The solid strength of his arms hurt, but suddenly they changed to gentleness. He yielded hastily, and Blake held him tight, drawing him close. Something was being born in him, full-blown and mature and his blood beat upward from the pit of his loins in scalding waves. He looked at Blake as though he could consume and preserve him as he was that very moment. Oh, Bob, he cried silently, I love you so much. Again, Blake's lips brushed his as though they were something infinitely rare and precious, something so fragile a breath would destroy them. Bob, oh, Bob, Gaylord whispered, you're sweet, gay, very sweet. Wordlessly, Gaylord leaned forward again into Blake's embrace. His arms stole up and lay about the thick neck, and his face was pillowed against a heaving chest. You are too, he whispered. You are too, Pop. And once more, he felt the unbelievable strength of the man, and a slow, gentle melancholy was slowly possessing him. A warm, naked hand had now begun the agonizing journey from button to button up the front of his wrinkled shirt and down it went to the zipper in his trousers. Inside his trousers, he felt firm fingers dig into his flesh and round his groin. He gave no thoughts of the past. His many evenings of loneliness were forgotten. He remembered only love, bare arms embracing, the first kiss. He saw Blake in his football suit, looking like a bronze god and running like a wild deer down the entire field. He saw Blake naked and remembered how it had been. He remembered the grin. Even with his eyes closed, he could see the tight muscles of the arms about him, and the hand massaging his bare flesh was very plain. Bob, he breathed, lingering on the name. He felt as if his entire being was boiling, was steaming like a boiler seeking a quick release. His heart pounded, and back of his exploding mind a thousand dreams became alive. With a violent fury, he threw his arms around the other. He was not afraid of what was happening. This, he knew, was what he wanted. This was natural, as if it had happened many times, and he was eager and desirous for the act lurking there in the pools of shadows. What a difference between this and that time with Thelma White. That had been an ordeal, but this... He swayed unsteadily as the silence rose up around him when his clothes left his body. He lay back, feeling Blake's body, hard and rigid as timbers against him, and hot with an animal's vitality. He threw his arms around the naked back above him, felt Blake's firm mouth on his own, felt Blake's tongue forcing itself into him. Ways of kissing that had never occurred to him were sought for and discovered. His hands worked gently up against the oily hair. He caressed it until darkness went out of him, and the slow joy of two. He could feel the pounding of Blake's blood, 
rolling out to meet his, leaving a weakness in him, a tropical languor, a melting, a dying, a flame. It was all accomplished there in the darkness between them. Hands found flesh and lips found lips again and again, and through them tasted deep of the pagan world of beauty and desire, blackening out all doubts of vulgarity and lewdness. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Clayton LeClaire awoke listening to the chimes of the grandfather clock strike ten. Must have gone to sleep, he thought. He yawned and stretched his masculine legs far out in front of him. He settled back in the chair, feeling the stiffness in his limbs. I'm tired, he thought, and his hand came up slowly, fumbling with his cravat. He drew it off and tossed it on the table. Then he unbuttoned his starched collar and slumped back in the chair. His face glowed with a healthy color that only the sun and the wind could give, and his dark black hair glistened with oil. A small curl fell carelessly over the broad forehead. He looked more like a spoiled boy than a father of a seventeen-year-old son, but his tightly drawn, wrinkled trousers plainly showed his manhood. His deep blue eyes, set close together, were shadowed by heavy lashes, full dark eyebrows, and under his Roman nose the thin, pencil-lined mustache moved. I'm tired, he thought again. Too damn tired. Wonder if they're coring. Guess I should be there. Oh, to hell with the damn well. They know what to do. I'd like to sell out and take a long trip. Wonder if Gay would like to see Europe. The rewards of hard work. We all need a trip. I can afford it now. Carol's worked hard, too. She's helped me. Damn, she's helped me so many ways. And Gay? Gay. Even to think the name was like a cry in the brightness of his heart. Gaylord. He was almost grown now. Time flew by so swiftly, too swiftly. He looked at a tinted picture in a silver frame on the carved mahogany break front, remembering the day it was taken. Let's see, he thought. Was Gay only three when that was taken? He recalled his wife had made the white dress. He had fussed when she put lace around the neck and sleeves, and he remembered who the outstretched hand, holding a rubber ball, was pointing to. He had sat there grinning, remembering, there had been a day when Gaylord was small. Five, he was, he thought. That day, they had been lying on the front porch of their oil field shack, and Gaylord had yelled to a neighbor. Miss Marks, Gaylord had cried. Look at all the hair on Daddy's legs. Gay. Clayton LeClaire had laughed, looked at Mrs. Marks and asked, Now what do you think of my son? I think he's going to be a devil, just like his hairy daddy, she chuckled. But I bet he's going to be better looking. Daddy, Gaylord had cried, when I grow up, will I have hair on my legs like you? You probably will. I wish I had some now. That'll come fast enough. Then, when you're all hairy like Daddy, you'll be sorry you ever wished for it. I like to wish. Don't you want something besides being hairy like Daddy? I'd like a new doll. Wouldn't you rather have a football or steam engine? No, I'd like a doll better. How about a train? Oh, I've got one, Daddy. But you've got a doll, too. I know I have, but I'd like lots of dolls. I'll buy you a doll if that's what you want. But I'm going to make a roughneck out of you yet. You're going to grow up into a big man, and Daddy's going to let you take care of all his oil wells. Do you have oil wells? I will, son. They're going to be yours, too, and I'm going to teach you how to take care of them. He had looked out over the derrick tops and then back at his son's small form. When he spoke again, his voice was deep and tender. I'm going to hit one of these days, and when I do, you're going to forget all about dolls and go with Daddy. Daddy will take you with him, and we'll just make lots of money. Then we can buy lots of dolls, huh, Daddy? Yeah, we can buy lots of dolls. Carol's roots, planted deep, would be hard to change, he had thought, but I'll get him interested in oil. I'll get him interested. He's young. He'll change. Change. Why do I want him to change? What's wrong with me? I love him as he is. I don't care if he plays with dolls the rest of his life. But he won't. He's just young. Let him play while he can. Life's not easy after you're grown. When I think about the way I used to hustle, about my childhood, 
In the bloom of his manhood, he had come to Texas, had gone to a country dance and met a girl named Carol Bender. That was over sixteen years ago. He was a stranger in need of a companion. He was away from home and those he knew. But the dance and Carol Bender had suddenly changed all this. A good girl was a novelty in LeClaire's life. He had always gone with those who would give him the things he desired. Carol Bender had been different. He had been surprised to find her a virgin when she had finally given in to his pleading. It had taken several weeks, and he was almost ready to give up trying. Then that one evening, she had been pathetically eager for his affection. Her moods of gaiety and her lovely face got him, and before he knew it, he was deeply in love with this country girl who plowed cotton fields and still retained a freshness, a desirable softness that had been lacking in other girls. The evening she had told him she was pregnant, he was glad. What the hell? He was old enough and he loved her. It would be good to have a home and settle down. He'd never had a real home or love. Not the kind of love he could read in this girl's sparkling eyes. So he had married her and immediately after the ceremony there had been a big reception at her house. Her parents had been very nice to him. So had all her friends. All this was as clear in his thoughts as if it were happening again. Above all, it brought back one long-remembered buggy ride. He was a fresh-married man again, sitting close to his bride, sitting there under the buggy's tasseled top, heading for the oil field in their new home. The day was warm, and her cheek was soft and fragrant against him. I don't care what kind of house it is. I'll love it. I'll fix it up with curtains, and maybe we can paper one or two rooms. He thought mechanically, certain that those had been her exact words. It had been fun fixing the place, hanging paper, putting curtains over the small glass panes, painting the woodwork. They had even hung a new door on the outside privy. He remembered her words. Darling, she had said one afternoon, that sack looks awful. Let's put a door in its place. Then we'll have to open and shut it, he had grinned back. But the new door had been added. He recalled her saying, Darling, don't squeeze me so tight, remember? She stood there in his vision, a travesty of the slim, willowy girl he had possessed, the girl who was soon to become the mother of his son. It would be a boy. It had to be. While she was pregnant, he had been going out quite a bit, playing poker with the boys. In fact, he had been on a spree the night his son had been born. He had rushed to the hospital soon afterwards. She had been kind and sweet. And when she had told him the name she had selected and asked if he liked it, he had answered in the affirmative. Then suddenly he had hit. He had bought an oil lease very cheaply, and it had rewarded him with a big profit. He bought more. Each one turned out just a little better than the past ones. He was on his way. Clayton and Carol LeClaire had arrived in cotton with their son, unknown to many in the sleepy town. But that was before he had drilled a well close by a well that had gushed in the best producer in the country. After that, the Leclairs were well established. From the big chair, Leclerc looked at the ceiling, at the rich draperies, at the room's expensive furniture. Gosh, Mom, I wish you were alive. I wish you were here so I could give you... He thought of a face darkly tranquil in the Louisiana earth. He recalled in a clear vision the living face of his mother. Marguerite Leclerc. And with this vision, there came to him, like a sound of cool stillness, the events of his days in Louisiana. The old days came back, the days of his childhood on the low, swampy lands of his home. Clearly, he saw his mother bending over an ironing board. She smiled at him from a prehistoric past. This lovely, dark complected woman, with the affectionate smile, spoke and uttered his name. With that word, he thought of his father, Clayton LeClaire Sr. He could see him again, walking out of the home place, dressed in beige trousers and puffing on a long, dark cigar. How handsome and vain he had looked. Even now, in his memories, he strutted and held his head high as a peacock. Like floating myths, the figures of his mother and father moved before him, moved on the earth where he was born. He remembered the roughness of his home, the sand road before it, the great cypress and pine forest, the silent bayou running through it, 
the things that crawled under its greenish water, and the mud chimney of his grandfather's home. His grandfather, how good and kind he had been when he had brought his few belongings into the little room that was to be his, after the pine box had been placed in the hole dug deep in the crested earth. The word mother formed on his moving lips now as he sat there, eyes closed. Again, he felt the grief of that day. It was a grief of time past. It was a man's dream of being a child again, but it was impossible to be a child any longer. He heard the hollow, loud knocks the chunks of dirt tossed into the hole had made on the pine box. He saw again the fresh mound between the high weeds and grass, the small group of people surrounding it, the grave of his mother with only a few bouquets of garden flowers around it, one of roses tied with a string, and another some yellow-centered blooms squeezed tightly together and placed in a cracked fruit jar. He saw the freshly turned red soil surrounding the two bouquets, the muddy bayou laying so silently between the old cemetery and the pine woods, and they wove themselves again into his wondering mind. Your mother wanted to come live with me, Clayton, his grandfather had said in French. She's going to sleep now. Don't cry, no. You'll be my boy. You want to? Yes. Bewildered over the strangeness of everything, the absence of his father, the place they had lowered his mother, and afraid of what his father would do to him now that his mother would no longer be home, the seven-year-old boy had clung to his grandfather. I'll go home with you, Grandpa. I don't ever want to be back to our house. If Mama's not there, I don't want to. Clayton LeClaire stiffened suddenly. A light patter of feet on the porch brought him back from the past. There was a the sound of a doorknob turning, and Carol came into the room. She stood there looking at him, her lovely face as soft and kind as a fawn's. You look tired, honey, she said. Why don't you go to bed? I was just sitting here. Feel all right? I'm all right. I was just thinking, LeClaire said heavily. Carol walked to him. That must have been unpleasant thoughts. Is there anything wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. I was just thinking of my mother. She came over and sat on the edge of his chair, stroked his hair, said, I wish I had known her. She must have been a wonderful woman. She was. Not a damn thing out of life. Just work, work. She had you. I was too young to help her. But she had you. I'm sure she got more out of life than you think she did. Maybe so. I'd give anything if she were alive today. I could treat her like a queen now. I wish she were too, Clay. To him, at that moment, Carol LeClaire was the most beautiful thing in the world. You've been good to me, Carol, Clayton said. I want you to know that. Their eyes met in complete accord. For me too, Clay, Carol answered. Then she reached up and kissed him. Clay? Yes. Let's go to bed. I'm tired and so are you. They walked the rest of the way to the bedroom in silence. End of Chapter 8 Chapter 9 Once again, Gaylord strolled into his classroom, this time five minutes early. Last night with Blake, a feeling of guilt, sweet guilt, had come over him. But this morning on entering the long hall, no feeling of fatigue or depression had engulfed him. He had walked with the springy, confident stride of a youth who was sure not only that the universe was his, but also that at last he had a definite place in it. There was no doubt whether or not he had the stamina to cope with shrewd, wisecracking boys like Stud or Pete. He had almost wished to meet them. His teacher, a somewhat practical and perceptive woman, received him cordially. Good morning, Gaylord. She closed the book she held. With the same brightness as the large pen between her flat breasts, Gaylord answered, Good morning, Miss Gray. She glanced at her watch and wrinkled her crisscross face. You're a little early this morning. She had a strained look as though she had been in too many chalk-filled rooms. The pen blazed like cat eyes in the dark, but her smile was natural, untouched by artifice. It made Gaylord think of friends and good people, and the scent of bluebonnets blooming in the short grass. Am I the first one here? He noted the vacant room. You surely are, she answered, 
glancing at her watch again. They had a few pleasant words before the door to the hall opened, and a new student, wearing creased trousers and a tie over a starched shirt, came by degrees in Gaylord's direction. Serenity was in every line of his face. It shone from his calm eyes. Only the pulse that beat in the lump in his throat betrayed the emotional strain he was going through. Gaylord's fleeting moment of triumph was gone. He experienced a sensation of being caught, felt the old hot blush of guilt on his face. He was afraid this boy knew about what had happened last night. He could feel a warm flush on his face, and as if to get away from the pressure, he fumblingly shifted the books under his arm. Oh, here's Glenn. Good morning, Glenn. Then, as if struck by a sudden thought, she added, Did you meet Glenn yesterday, Gaylord? No, ma'am, I didn't. I'm nuts, Gaylord thought. He couldn't know. He's just nervous because he's new here. He is nervous. Look at his Adam's apple. Gosh, he's got pretty dimples. With new courage, he smiled and held out his hand. I'm Gaylord LeClaire, Glenn. I'm Glenn, he spoke hesitantly at first but with growing assurance, went on. Glenn Rogers. He shook hands with Gaylord. Miss Gray, the teacher, went on. Glenn's going to be with us now, and I'm sure he'd appreciate your showing him around, Gaylord. The tired eyes tried to smile. Yes, ma'am, I'll try, Gaylord said. Tardily seating himself on the varnished seat, Gaylord glanced at the desk opposite him. The muscles of Rogers' face twitched and gave him a look in which respect and a kind of veiled pleasure were mixed. He put his books inside his desk, smiled back, and the two deep dimples formed again in the brownish cheeks. Why had he thought Glenn Rogers would know about last night? It was absolutely silly, Gaylord told himself, and a little of the newly formed courage crept back. You'll like it here, he smiled. I think I will, Rogers answered. Gaylord watched the dimples grow. I saw you yesterday. And I wanted to introduce myself, but I was so late. And then, when the bell rang, I had to get some books together quick, so I forgot. I looked for you, but you had already gone. He stirred, and the scarred wood creaked beneath him. Did you make out all right yesterday? I guess so. Of course, everything's new and different. I, you'll get used to it in no time, Rogers confessed. Kind of makes you nervous, though. What's your first class? Gaylord inquired. Geometry. Rogers grumbled. Mine's Jim, Gaylord said. He continued. From the way you said geometry, you must like it about as much as I do. I hate it. There was no mistaking the finality of his words. Gaylord grinned and put a pencil into his pocket. So do I. He almost laughed. The dull, depressing feeling that had seemed destined was gone. He liked Glenn Rogers. Felt comfortable talking to him. Now they were not alone. One by one, the students who had been loitering in the hall came into the room. A confused murmur of voices filled it quickly. Miss Gray appeared annoyed, and every now and then glanced up from her book. She was about to say something, then, changing her mind, continued the love story she was reading. Hello, gay. The sentence was a treble arpeggio that ended in a twinkle of warm laughter. Hello, Joy, Gaylord said, looking into the pretty face with the wrinkled up nose. Gosh, she's pretty, he thought to himself. I thought I was going to be late this morning, she turned from Gaylord to Glenn Rogers, smiled and asked, And how are you doing this morning? Oh, Rogers looked from the book to the girl. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. That's good, she went to her seat. A savory odor, a mixture of hair tonic and soap, tinged the early morning air around the boys in sweatshirts, tieless collars, and dungarees. There were girls wearing low-heeled shoes and gaily-colored skirts, and bare-legged girls with soiled blouses, carelessly ironed over their drooping shoulders. Some of them looked eager and some looked bored. Most chattered unceasingly. Some sat in silence and some buried themselves in their books. What you writing, Clara? A girl whispered. Letter, Clara muttered, absorbed. Have you got the answer to problem 12? I can't get it. Neither can I. Ask Lucille. Where'd you go last night, Stinky? Asked a gruff voice. I ain't saying. Keep it then. I just had an extra girl with Florence last night. You did? Who? I ain't saying. Why? I ain't saying. 
You don't need to get mad. Some of them murmured and others tittered. Did you see your father, I mean Bob, this morning? stammered Joy. No, I didn't, Joy, Gaylord answered. He thought, now why did she ask me if I saw my dad this morning? The bell rang for the first class and someone yelled, There she goes, slaves. Practically everyone stood and vanished as if by magic. Gaylord gave a deep sigh and gathered his books. What would happen this morning? How could he face the three in the gym class? Why was he suddenly afraid? What would they try today? Should he speak to them or not? Thoughts, thoughts. When he looked up, he saw Roger standing beside him. Be seeing you, Gaylord. Sure, he replied hastily. Maybe we can have lunch together. Now why did I say that, he pondered. If he says yes, I won't be able to see Bob until this evening. Gaylord glanced at Rogers, hoping he'd have other plans. That'd be swell, Rogers grinned. Rogers spoke with a convincing sincerity. There had indeed been a great change in his attitude since that first handshake. I'll meet you at the front door, Gaylord said, closing his loose-leaf notebook, replacing some of his books in his desk. All right, I'll be there. They walked together to the door and out into the buzzing hall. In the hall, they parted, going in opposite directions between its brownish ivory-painted walls. Just a few minutes, Gay was thinking. A very few, since he came into the room and spoke to me. Time. Weeks. Days. What does it matter? What matters, he answered himself honestly, is that he's friendly. I know I'm going to like him. I knew I'd like Bob, too, but it took so long to know him. Years. And this has only been a few minutes. Funny. He cut between his classmates and for no reason glanced back over his shoulder. Beyond and over the sea of moving heads, he saw Rogers turn and wave. He sensed a piercing intimacy and wondered why. Wondered if the other boy felt it too. Then Rogers turned and was lost in the moving sea. Gaylord let himself be pushed passively along until he stood against the gymnasium door. It wasn't hard to enter this morning. For some reason, he wasn't thinking about those on the other side. He was thinking of the boy he had just met, and of two deep dimples. A girl had described Glenn Rogers to perfection when she had cried excitedly, Gosh, mother, doesn't Glenn make a handsome cowboy? Isn't he cute? She had said this to her parents one Sunday afternoon on the Rogers farm. Rogers straddled across a lively brown horse, romped over grounds laid heavily with cow manure, and a large loop of rope circling his head had come down and caught the front foot of a calf. He had jerked the rope quickly, bringing the animal down to the ground. A thrill had rushed through her as she watched the boy quickly dismount and walk nonchalantly toward the wheezing animal. He had looked at her, grinned modestly, and tipped his stained cowboy hat, showing a pale streaked forehead and damp, dark plastered hair. The flexed muscles in his slightly bowed legs showed beneath the skin-tight blue jeans, and his hands, she had noticed, were large with long, lumpy fingers. His nose, wide at the nostrils, had a little hump. It didn't detract, only added to the sparkling blue eyes, and while the upper lip was narrow and tightly drawn, the lower rolled out in a heavy curve, almost meeting the deep dimples in his brown cheeks. What had happened next happened so swiftly that it was a blur of movement and sound. Then he had gone in the barn without even saying hello. From the air, the high school building of Cotton looked like a large figure H sprawled on the ground below. The two-story center roof section was red tile and looked pretty from a plane, but the side wings were flat and covered with black tar. The many long lines of steel-framed windows didn't show from here, nor did its three front entrances. All one could see was a rectangular plot of red with a black, dry riverbed at each side. When the last morning bell had rang, Gaylord had gathered his things and hurried down the already crowded corridors toward his room. Gosh, he was glad the morning was over. He paused at Blake's homeroom and looked through the square glass in the door. The room held no bronze god, and the faces he saw were uninteresting. In his own homeroom, he quickly put his books away and combed his hair carefully. A pimply-faced boy was watching, but he didn't care. Gaylord thought, He's just jealous because he doesn't have wavy hair. I don't care what he thinks. Nobody likes him anyway. 
He's such a sneak. Always trying to find out something on somebody so he can blab it all over school. Well, let him blab about me. I don't care. He cleared his throat, looked at the boy for a second, then walked out of the room without glancing back. Rogers was not waiting for him. He went outside of the right wing and stood in the sun. Damn, it was hot. He glanced in all directions and, not seeing his date, walked back to the side of the building. He looked at the Catholic school across the street and, through the softly lighted windows, could see the nuns in their starched white. It made him feel good inside, and he wished the school had been built when he had started. He thought of his first Holy Communion, coming into the church slow and all trembly and carrying a lighted candle. He remembered the girls in sheer white veils and the smile of his priest when he told him he had chosen the name Michael for his saint's name. So Michael's your favorite saint. He was a good saint, Gaylord, and you've chosen my favorite too. How tenderly the wafer had been placed on his tongue. How warm the host had felt as he thought all the time of Jesus, his sufferings. I should go to church, he now thought. Why haven't I been in months? Even if mother and dad don't go, I'm going to start going again. Everyone should. Makes you feel good. It's good for you, too. Gaylord pulled at his shirt. He wished Rogers would come. Somewhere, a sparrow chirped, and the tongue of the Catholic school bell tolled solemnly across the street. The door opened and closed, and Joy Clay came up to him. Her cheeks were rosy and her lips smiled when she saw him. Hi, Gay, she said brightly. Mother's packed me a wonderful lunch today. Want to join? He stood, twisting his toe inside his shoe. It took all his courage to answer. I love to, Joy, but I promised Glenn I'd have lunch with him. He should be along any minute. Glenn? She asked, puzzled. Oh, Glenn, I know, the new kid. Cute, isn't he? He held his head down a little. He did agree with her, but should he say so? He was glad she didn't give him a chance to answer. She said, I'm sorry you can't have lunch with me, Gay. Maybe some other time? Thanks, Joy. I'll see you. Bye. Come over some evening, Gay. You haven't been over to my house in such a long time. I love to. Gaylord's eyes kept going up and down. He was uneasy and bashful without knowing why. Maybe it was the bright sunshine. Maybe it was Joy. Maybe it was his secret about Blake that made his ears burn. Surely Blake hadn't told her. Still, she was his girl, and boys do tell funny things to their girls. She was sweet, sort of different today. She hadn't been like this in a long time, and he wondered why the difference. He forgot about Joy and wondered what was keeping Rogers. If he didn't come pretty soon, he'd... Boo! He stood, scared, feeling large hands on his ribs, and turning with a toss of his head, was ready to defend himself. It was Robert Blake. Oh. Gaylord sighed deeply. Hello, Bob. You scared me for a minute. He was glad Joy had left. I'm sorry, Blake answered dramatically. And just because of that, how about some lunch? Gaylord frowned, and Blake added, Not only because I scared you, Gay, but... He spoke more softly. I want to, very much. He couldn't stand it. Outside, he couldn't put into words. But thoughts kept running around his mind. How can I say no to him? After last night and what happened in the shower, how can I? Should I go on and leave Glenn? He should have been here by now. I wonder what's keeping him. I wonder how Bob feels about last night. He looks happy, but he always looks like that. Gosh, he's wonderful. I think I'll go. No. I'd better wait. Maybe Bob would join us. Should I ask him to? I'd love to, Bob, but I told Glenn I'd have lunch with him. Glenn? Blake questioned. Glenn Rogers. He's new here. Only been here a few days, and he's in my home room. He's awfully nice. Now, why did I say that? He thought. He looked up at Blake. Why don't you come with us? I'd like you to meet him. I want to have lunch with you. What the hell do I want to meet him for? Blake grinned. That doesn't sound like you, Bob. You'd like him. You like everybody, and everybody likes you. What are you trying to do? Pull my leg. I just want you to like me. And you said you did last night. Blake ruffled his eyebrows. Remember, last night you said I was your best friend? 
You are, Bob. You know that, he flushed. I'd love to, but... Blake interrupted. But you promised him. He saw the broad, square face, all bronze-like. Saw the shaven cheeks still showing traces of beard. He looked at the strands of hair across the forehead, falling carelessly over it. He wanted to say he would go, but he couldn't. You understand, don't you, Bob? Come with us, please. Blake looked down at him with a grinning, suspicious look. He wanted to play a little more, but on noticing Gaylord's quivering lips, said warmly, Don't you know I'm only kidding? Don't take things so seriously, Gay. I wouldn't break your date for anything. I sure wouldn't like you to break one with me. And if I had more time, I'd be glad to come with you. I'm supposed to see Joy. Have you seen her? She was just here a minute ago. I don't know where she went. I'll find her. By the way, how you feel? Fine. Me too. I had fun last night. I'll see you soon, huh, Gay? Anytime. Bye. And keep your nose clean. He turned to go, but stopped and looked back, grinning, and I hope you have a lousy meal. Blake lunged down the sidewalk and propelled himself across the campus. His body swayed in perfect unison with his legs and muscular arms. Gaylord stood there with an air of glittering triumph. He noticed the back of the head. It was the most beautiful head he had ever seen. As the light overhead caught the oiled hair, an unexpected flash leaped obliquely from it, sending out a tremor of sensual pleasure to Gaylord. That's my friend, Gaylord mused. I'm going to do everything in my power to keep him so. His eyes narrowed against the bright noon hour sun, but in his heart was almost a natural air of arrogance, and he found this drab world of land and gulfs delightful. Rogers came up out of breath and panting. Phew, he sighed, wiping his forehead. At last. Bet you thought I wasn't coming. I've been waiting at the middle door, he sighed again. I've been to all three of them. I would pick this one last. Ooh, I'm out of breath. Have you been waiting long? No, Gaylord grinned. I just got here. I should have made myself clear. No wonder you didn't know which door I meant with all of them around here. He was glad he had waited. My car's over here. It was a lie, but he knew in this small matter it was better than the truth. Morally, his conscience did not rebel at this white falsehood, since it was really his fault. In any event, he would not tell Glenn Rogers he had almost given up and gone on without him. It was all his fault, but he felt no personal guilt at all. The delay was a lucky stroke. He had seen Blake and Joy, and Blake was put in still a better light. He was happy as they walked toward his car. When they came up to his car, Rogers said, Boy, is this your car? Uh-huh. Like it? Rogers squinted his eyes. Like it? It's keen. What kind is it? Buick, isn't it? Gaylord nodded and both grinned at each other. They got in and sat on the leather seat. Dad has a Chevy. It's old now, but it still runs good. Boy, this really is a keen car. Does the top go down all by itself? Sure does, Gaylord explained about the cloth top and how it worked. Then he pressed on the starter. He said, Dad gave it to me on my birthday. When was your birthday? March 20th. That's funny, giggled Rogers. Mine's the 20th of June. How old are you, Gay? 18. That is, I'll be 18, he grinned. How old are you? The same. But I didn't get a car. Come to think of it, I don't think my dad gave me a darn thing. He laughed and wiped the dust from the chrome dashboard with his hand. Your dad must be swell. He is. What does he do? Own a bank? He's in the oil business. Leases and royalties. Drilling oil wells. Something like that. He shrugged his shoulders. He sure made money, but he's worked awfully hard, too. Wants me to get interested in it, but I don't like it a bit. So darn boring. Making money to buy cars like this doesn't sound boring to me. To be an oil man, he'd rather enter a dark room and die than submit to that. He understood his reasons well enough. He had much to hide from the type of men his father worked with, for one thing. Second, his superiority complex was something that was terrifying. Third, 
the strange feeling he always got seeing the men changing their clothes at quitting time. Fourth, their language was completely distant. To be left alone, Gaylord knew that was the only way out for him. Around strangers with words and names for everything, anything might happen. And perversely enough, Rogers was now saying, I guess you gotta be a hard-boiled and rough to get anywhere in the old business. I don't think I could do it. I know I couldn't. I bet you could. I couldn't, and it's no use kidding myself. They were on a wide paved street, and the harsh glitter of sunlight reflected from the car hood and danced over the chrome trimmings. Gaylord felt good behind the wheel, and Rogers was enjoying the different gadgets, asking the purpose of each one. Gaylord complained about a rattle behind the dash, and Rogers tried to find it. Can't, Gay, he said, his head beneath the dash. I can't locate it. It's not too bad, is it? No, leave it alone. You'll get dirty under there. In this pretty car? Gaylord laughed as Rogers returned to his seat. Do you like hamburgers, Glenn? Sure do, and I'm sure hungry. He rubbed his flat stomach. We'll go down to the Roxy. They make good ones there. Is that all right with you? Rogers didn't know where or what the Roxy was, but he never asked. He said that would be fine. They turned down another street. One he had never been on before, and he saw it. It was a small but attractive drive-in. They parked alongside another car. In it, four boys were busy devouring large dishes of ice cream covered with different kinds of fruits and nuts. Hello, Gaylord, one of the boys cried in a long, drawn-out voice. Stud. Gaylord knew the voice and turned pale. Hi, he answered. God. Don't let them say anything, he prayed. Please, don't let them say anything. He slipped deeper in the seat, and in his eyes was fear. Rogers noticed the look and asked, What's wrong, Gay? You all right? I just got an awful pain in my head, he answered, rubbing his eyes. The sun is right in my eyes. Maybe we can get out of this glare if I pull up to the other side. Gaylord couldn't meet the eyes. He started the car without delay. He must get away from this boy who had called out to him. This boy who had tried to drag him into God knows what. He could almost feel his naked body against his again and hear the names. He didn't want Rogers to hear those names. Names he was certain the hateful looking lips would soon utter. He didn't care if Rogers did think he had just gone haywire for a minute. At least he'd be away. Away from those stained ugly lips. A pretty girl with straight hair and business-like eyes came up to the car after he had stopped. Hello, Gay, she said in a friendly way. Hello, Marie. How are you? Fine. What you want, Glenn? I'll have a hamburger and a root beer. I'm sorry, Glenn. Marie, this is Glenn Rogers. Hello, Glenn, she said, smiling. Nice to meet you, blushed Rogers. I just want a Coke, Marie. Is that all you want? I thought you were hungry. You'd better eat a hamburger, too. I just want a Coke. You do feel bad, don't you? Want to go? I'll be all right. I'm just not hungry. He could have told, but why should he? After all, it was sort of embarrassing. He tried to smile and said, Do you want onions on your hamburger? Please, I like onions. Gay, are you sure you're all right? I'm fine. He watched Rogers eat and drink. He was sure going after that hamburger. When he asked, Want another one? Rogers said, Yes. He sat watching the face as though his life depended upon every flicker of expression, every movement of the head as Rogers looked from the hamburger up into his eyes. Rogers was enjoying his food and talked between mouthfuls. He spoke endlessly of various things. Gaylord sat listening and agreeing. The grin on the sunburned face was becoming. Rogers felt the intent look and said, I'll be glad when the rest of my forehead gets brown. This white mark is from wearing a hat all day. Why, I've never even noticed it. You haven't. I'm not going to wear a hat anymore. You don't wear one, do you? I don't even own one. I had to wear one on the farm. Boy, that sun really beats down. Why couldn't everyone be like Glenn? Gaylord asked himself. Silently, he admired the good-looking boy with a drop of mustard on his lip. He looked so young and healthy. 
He caught himself looking down the legs and up again past the thighs and blushed. He noticed the developed chest, how it made the buttonholes of the shirt stand open. He looked at the legs again, noticed the drawn trousers around the groin, and wondered how the whole combination of all he saw looked naked. He had completely forgotten the pack of wolves in the car he had moved away from. Stud, whom he did not like, the brutish Jack, with his skinny fingers ready to plunge into his troubled brain and bring forth an eyeball. The others, a bunch of rotten twigs on a bad limb of the family tree. He had forgotten them all and was now deeply engrossed in Glenn Rogers. He wondered what Rogers would have done in the shower. Would he have kissed him? Would he have taken up for him the way Blake had done? This he couldn't answer for sure, but he was almost sure that Rogers would have acted the same as Blake. Perhaps he wouldn't have kissed him, but he was certain that he would have helped him escape. Gaylord was playing a new role. He was trying to learn Rogers' world. He knew Rogers could never secede Blake. Yet, beneath his gentle ways, Rogers was appealing, almost exciting. He would have loved to have Rogers hold him in his arms at that moment, to feel his lips and body against his. Yes, he was afraid Rogers could make himself an obsession, one that would take a long time to break. He was also afraid that he would not want to break it after it was once started. He was relieved when Rogers broke in on his thoughts. Gosh, I'm stuffed. Why did you let me order that second one? Without looking away, Gaylord said, frowning a little, You wanted it? Instinctively, Gaylord's hand went to the freshly pressed trousers. Now, you know two hamburgers didn't fill you up. To Gaylord's amazement, Roger's hand went down and covered his. I guess you're right. He grinned. Gaylord grinned back, but said nothing. He only thought, I'd still like to see you naked, you fool little devil. The school campus was deserted, and there was no sound on it but that of their own hurrying feet. They walked rapidly down the hall, and it was ominously empty as the sidewalk they had left. I hope we're not late, Gay. I don't think we are. It was worth it, though, said Rogers. Thanks for asking me. His right hand dug nervously in his pocket. Lose something? I can't find my locker key, Rogers said nervously, his hand still digging. Then he sighed. Oh, I've got it. Good, said Gaylord. He was appalled at himself for feeling so free. All the blind stirrings, wantings, hungering for friends, awakened and seemed to embody themselves in this boy. Say, Glenn, he went on, meet me at the car after school and I'll take you home. Sure it's not out of your way? Oh, now, after all, I didn't want to put you out of your way, but I'll be there if you mean it. I don't say anything I don't mean. I'll be there then. See you after school. And thanks again, Gay. I sure enjoyed it. So did I, Glenn. See you after school. Bye. Bye. They lengthened their strides down the corridor. End of Chapter 9 Chapter 10 At four o'clock, Gaylord had closed another day at school. He put away his books, again, dreading the moment he must turn down the long hall and be caught there in the crowd of students. He began to reason. This was his school. There was no need to be afraid. Surely, if he did meet Stud, nothing would happen. No razzing or filthy names. Stud and the rest had probably left earlier anyway. He wondered if Blake had. He remembered the bronze arms that had held him and wished for them again. Yes, it would be nice to run into Blake. Just to see him would be nice. He walked down the hall among the straggling, chattering throng with an uncomprehensible gaze in his eyes. But if anyone had asked him what they said, he would not have been able to answer. For through his eyes were upon them, he did not hear their conversations at all. Avoiding the main entrance, he went around to the side door, held it open for three girls to pass. Thanks, Gay, one smiled. You're welcome, he answered. The door swung open behind him and opened again before it had closed. The air over the campus was noisy and warm. Shadows hazed it and changed the leaves of various shrubbery to angular greenish shadow boxes. The confusion broke out about him 
and as he edged his way through, he was thinking, I don't see Stud. Guess he's gone. A new wave of laughter broke to the right. A wrestling match was in progress. Gaylord moved to the left, avoiding the jostling, laughing crowd, and, unlike the others, did not laugh with the wild abandon about the wrestlers. Their fists hitting hard flesh set up answering rhythms in his mind, and his thoughts moved in remembering oblique tangents. That awful stud, he thought. I hope he gets it good. He's such a bully. If I was a girl, I couldn't even let him touch me. He's probably only bragging about all the girls he's had. I don't see how they could stand him. He's got an ugly body. And that thing of his looks like an earthworm. He gave a slight shudder, remembering Stud's flesh against his. A bus was there along the edge of the walk waiting for its passengers, and there were also parents in cars waiting for their children. Gaylord nodded at several he knew as he proceeded toward his own car. He wondered if Rogers was there. Yes, there was his arm resting on the car door. His steps were long now, straight down the sidewalk toward his car and Rogers. He did not speak or glance at those he passed. Unconsciously, he increased his pace until, to his chagrin, he noticed he was almost running, and as he rounded his car was surprised by the rapid beating of his heart. Here I am, beamed Rogers. You're going to get tired of seeing me around before you even know me. He bent over and opened the door for Gaylord. Hi. Whew. What a day, breathed Gaylord, sliding behind the steering wheel. Then his face cleared and a decisive line showed about the corner of his mouth. Where were you all afternoon? I looked for you between classes. He pressed the car starter. That's funny. I was doing the same thing. I was looking for you and wondering if you had gone home early. Gaylord looked at Rogers and saw the friendly grin, the deep dimples. They both giggled, like the girls in the corridors when Gaylord passed. The sound of the car motor seemed to giggle too, loving the gas going into its hungry stomach. Guess we just miss each other in the mad scramble. Did you ever see so many darn kids? Sure haven't. Remember, I went to a country school. It wasn't this bad a couple of years ago. I don't know why people moved to this rat hole of a town. Still, they do. I'll be glad when I can get out of it. My dad says it's a good town, Rogers replied. So does mine, but that doesn't make me like it. Gaylord passed a soft hand over his brow, feeling tiny drops of perspiration. Darn, it's been hot today. Sure has. They passed a couple strolling down the sidewalk. Looking at them, Gaylord returned their wave with a snappy bend of the wrist. Who are they? Rogers asked, glancing back at them. Elsie Barnes and Julius Bellew. She's pretty, isn't she? Kinda. They're in love. He turned toward Rogers, said, Ever been in love, Glenn? Hell no, he responded quickly. Have you? Gaylord considered the question, and a slow, warm feeling curled down through him to the tips of his toes. I don't know, he finally said. I think a whole lot of one person, but I don't know if it's love. I don't know if it could be. It's a problem. He looked at Rogers, who in turn looked back at him, as if he were studying an unusual problem. What's the matter? Is she married? Oh, now, you know better than that. They're not married. Well, you mustn't be then, because when you're in love, so they tell me, you'll know it. I know it when I'm with, with them. With who? Somebody you don't know. I didn't mean to be personal, Gay, Roger smiled, a slow, quiet smile. You're not, Glenn. He stopped short, feeling Roger's hand resting on his thigh. You're worried about something, Gay. Don't be. You shouldn't have a worry in the world. You're sweet, Glenn. I'm not worried about anything. Just kind of tired and hot. I know one thing. I'm glad you live here. I'm glad I got to meet you so soon. So am I, perked up Roger's. How about a drink? Let me buy this time. You paid for lunch and everything. At least let me buy you a drink. Let me do something. That's a good idea. My throat feels parched, and I think a Coke would taste wonderful. We'll go to the Roxy. At the Roxy, Gaylord sipped the Coke, wondering what feeling had replaced his fear. Rogers drank his root beer, shanking it furiously to make it foam, 
still careful not to soil the leather seat. Then he drank heartily, cupping it between his rough hands so that his face was caught in the foaming pool of brown. Watching him, Gaylord knew what it was he had felt. It was, he realized with a stab of happy recognition, friendship. This realization actually seemed to ease the tension in his mind. At last, I've got friends, he thought. Now I've got two, and last week I didn't have anyone. How lucky am I to have Bob, and now Glenn? He shook his head to clear it of the happiness of his thoughts, and resolved to thank God tonight for his good fortune. Rogers turned to him. Want another? No, he faltered. Unless you do. I've had enough. Darn, I've had so much fun. I hate to go home. Gaylord sat bolt upright. Let's go for a ride. Let's do. I don't have to go home right away. I just love this car. Rides so easy. As they drove past a large two-story colonial mansion, Gaylord said, Isn't this a beautiful place? I just love it. He looked at it, admiring its huge columns. I'd love to get in it and fix it up. It's a mess on the inside. I just can't understand it, especially since the people owning it have money. If it was mine, I'd redo the inside completely. I'd hang new drapes and carpet and have more fun. They do have some lovely antique pieces, but they need recovering and a new paint job. They have one little chair that I'm just crazy about. I think it's French. It's so dainty, you'd almost be afraid to sit in it. But it needs a new cover. It's all in shreds. Who lives there? Rogers inquired, looking at the house. Mr. and Mrs. Steves. He's the president or something of the Second National Bank. Mrs. Steves' father built it. When he died, he left it to Mrs. Steves. She was an only child, and he left her a fortune. He died a long time ago, and when they moved in, they left everything just like it was. Still has real dark varnished woodwork and the darndest looking light fixtures. Ugly, huh? They sure are. I think they used to be gas, and then they had them wired. Lord, I would have taken them all down and gotten some beautiful ones. You've never seen anything so ugly. Ugly as their daughter. I shouldn't say that about her, but gosh, Glenn, she is ugly. She's awfully nice, though. I've taken her to dances, but when I do, I've got to dance with her all evening. No one ever cuts in, Gaylord grinned. Good dancer, too, and a nice personality, but she doesn't click with anyone. She's awfully smart. I like to be around her because she knows what she's talking about. She's been to Europe and can tell you more interesting things about Paris, Rome, and London. I go over real often. We just sit and talk. She's awfully thoughtful and kind. What's her name? Wanda. Wanda Steves. Pretty name, isn't it? Yeah, sounds like she ought to be beautiful. Just goes to show your names can be deceiving. Yours isn't. Isn't what? Deceiving. It isn't? Gaylord asked inquiringly. No, said Rogers. It fits you to a T. Gaylord's hands rested lightly on the wheel. For once in his life, was a boy going to say something nice about him? He was almost afraid to risk asking, but he did. He asked, How? How does my name fit me? Roger shrugged. Well, the car rocked across the rough railroad tracks, and there again was the long line of dirty buildings. Shirt-sleeved men idled about their entrances, and groups of heavy-breasted women in cotton dresses, dragging screaming children by the arms, hurried down the sidewalks to some unknown destination. Gaylord watched the scurrying figures, grinned at them quietly, complacently, without even seeing, and his hand moved over the black plastic steering wheel. Across the street, seated on park benches under the tall cottonwood trees, old men sat whittling and talking, spitting tobacco juice on the mossy green carpet, and young boys in soiled shirts wove in and out of the railings surrounding the large porch of the auditorium, playing follow the leader. And in a rocking chair sat an old man, drawing heavily upon a corncob pipe. The smoke moved upward, veiling his wrinkled face like a cloud around a cliff on top of a mountain. Gaylord saw nothing, but his soul was as happy as the young boys on the porch. He stuck a playful thumb into Roger's rib. Come on, Glenn. Well, what? he challenged. Rogers tried to grin. 
Well, your name sounds pretty, and you're pretty. I mean, good-looking. Gaylord giggled with delight. I didn't know you cared, Glenn. Oh, hell, blushed Rogers, giving his companion's shoulder a slap. You know what I mean. The dimples formed deep. You are good-looking, Gay. I heard some girls say so this morning. You're a kidding me. I'm not either. She said she wished that good-looking Gaylord LeClaire would ask her out for a date sometime. Who was she? I don't know her name, but she was sure pretty. She wasn't the only one either. Another one with her said she wished you'd ask her for a date. You should talk. Those girls have you spotted too. One told me she thought you were so cute. Oh, hell. Really, I feel sorry for you in a couple of weeks. They'll pester the hell out of you. You are cute, Glenn. The words came free and easy. Gaylord glanced at Rogers and noticed for the first time that his left eyebrow was crowned with a faint scar. Glenn, what caused that scar over your eye? Calf kicked me. Here I thought you were a good cowboy. Calf was better than me. Rogers glanced at Gaylord, and when he spoke, laughter bubbled up through his voice. Got away, too. Gaylord brought one hand up and stroked his hair without thinking. I don't see how anyone can rope. It's not hard. Of course, it takes lots of practice. Pointing, he added, That's the dance hall over there, isn't it? Yeah. It used to be the Southside School. I used to go to it. Of course, it wasn't there then. They moved it here a couple of years ago. I sure was glad when I got transferred to the north side. It was closer to home, and the teachers were so much better, and the classrooms bigger and cooler. It wasn't as big as it is today. When I started there, those side wings just went up to the center building. We never had a gym then. They've sure got a nice one now. You know it, Gaylord admitted. I never was around so many naked kids. Sure is a big class. I was a little embarrassed standing there naked. A lot different from swimming naked in a creek. I'd like to see you naked, Gaylord thought again. I shouldn't, but I would like to. This he kept to himself, but he did say, I'm still embarrassed. Rogers said, Hell, the first day I didn't know whether to take my clothes off or not. Then sheepishly, I didn't even have any trunks. What did you do? Go naked? No, I wore my shorts. Luckily I had those on, huh? You are lucky. Gaylord thought. You're fortunate without even knowing it. I wish I were like you. They passed under a metal sign extended across the road. Gaylord read the lettering. You are now leaving Cotton, Texas. Come back again real soon. He turned to Rogers. Isn't that silly? Come back real soon. Isn't that something? Does sound silly. He looked at Gaylord. Must have been a farmer that worded that sign. They're hicks. I know. I was one. Still am. You're not either. I think you're swell. He uttered the word so seriously and with so much force that Rogers was startled. That's right. I'm a city dude now, ain't I? You sure are. Rogers frowned and holding his nose asked, What's that awful smell, Gay? Okay? It's that darn sewage plant over there. He pointed left to a flat white slab with a small building at one side. Where? See, over there between those negro shacks, I feel sorry for those poor Negroes living so close to it. Yeah, must be kind of bad smelling that all day and night. Of course, niggers smell anyway. Not all of them, contradicted Gaylord, remembering the neat colored girl that helped his mother. Those I've been around do, they smell worse than this. Of course, after working in the sun all day, anybody stinks. I guess they would, but they ought to do something about this sewage. The shit's gotta go someplace, Rogers replied jubilantly. Gaylord's eyes beamed with mischief and joy. The expression was so sudden and coming from a quiet boy, it had both shocked and amused him. He threw back his head and laughed merrily. I agree, he announced. It's just too bad they take it out on these Negroes. Guess someone had to get it in the neck. Someone always does. You're not just a kid in there. Say, Gay, do you like to hunt? Don't know if I do or not, Glenn. I've only been a couple of times, and I don't think you'd call that hunting. Shot a few quail and doves along the road with an aunt of mine. She's a good shot, and I'm not too bad. I did hit one once in a while. For no reason at all, he remembered the time he had thrown a rock at a chicken busy scratching in his mother's rose bed. 
The rock had struck hard on the bright feathered head. He was so shocked it had taken seconds to realize he had hit it at all. Then he had quickly drenched it under a water faucet, but the bird was quite dead. It had made him both sad and happy. Sorry he had killed it, but glad that his aim had been so perfect. That's one thing I'm going to miss living in town, Rogers added remorsefully. What? Hunting. Oh. I wish I had a nickel for every squirrel I've killed. Possums, too. Did he ever see an armadillo game? Gaylord shook his head. They make baskets out of them. Baskets? Out of what? Questioned Gaylord. He glanced downward at the young man's hands. They were clean and strong, firm and entirely capable. Against his will, he was forced to look at his manicured feminine ones. True, they were graceful and long-fingered. But now he wished they were a bit rough, more like Rogers. Armadillos. Didn't you ever see one? asked Rogers. I think I have. I'm not sure. They've got an armor-like hide, something like an alligator. Still, it's a lot different, but just about as tough. I had one that I killed made into a sewing basket for Mother. Sure did turn out pretty, too. Oh, yes, I think I've seen them. They've got a little face and beady eyes, little short feet. That's right. And with a tank-like shell? Yeah, that's the one. Well... When they make a basket out of the shell, they clean out all the guts and stuff and cure it. I mean the shell. And then, when it's dried, they line it with cotton and cloth. They take the tail and make a handle out of it. Simple, huh? And they're darn pretty. Mother's crazy about it. Didn't sound so pretty to Gaylord. He couldn't understand why anyone would want that around the house. So, that's how they do it. That's it, Rogers answered. I used to kill a lot of them when I was out in the woods picking dewberries. Gosh, there's lots of dewberries in the woods. I could pick a couple of gallons in no time. There's nothing better than dewberry jelly on hot bread. And Gay, I'm telling you, my mom makes the best bread you've ever tasted. You like homemade bread? Sure do. I don't like this bakery stuff. It's too soggy. You'll have to eat some of my mom's bread. You'll never like that bakery stuff after eating hers. It's tops. He took a deep breath. Yeah, it's going to be different living here in town. I used to ride my old horse all over the woods, shooting, fishing, looking over the cattle and fences, seeing what cow dropped a calf and how it was, pulling calves and even cows out of mud. Seemed like there was always a fence down, and I just hated fixing fences. I'd rather do almost anything than fix fences. We had a nice place. You could go fishing or hunting. I'm going to miss it. It was fun to hunt and fish. I bet it was. But I sure used to get lonesome sometimes. Only my horse to talk to. He let out a chuckle. I'm glad he didn't talk back to me. He did about everything but that. I'm going to miss him. He sure took me lots of places. He looked at Gaylord, who had just yawned. Damn, Gay. Why didn't you tell me to shut up? Gaylord was taken aback. Shut up? Why? I've been blowing off like a windbag. You're not interested in fishing or hunting. You have not, and I have enjoyed listening to you. I've never blabbed so much in my life. Guess I'm taking it out all on you. You think I'm full of hot air, huh, Gay? Of course not. I've enjoyed hearing about your home and what all you've done. I'd like to know about what you like to do. I only wish I could have done them. I sort of envy you. Envy me? With all you got? This good-looking convertible and everything? Hell, you don't envy me, he grinned. I should envy you. Gaylord straightened up with emotion like a ballet dancer. Then he sat very still, studying Rogers through long lashes that were longer than most girls. So he said to himself, Yes, I've had it easy. I've been called names all my life, been pushed and made fun of too many times. I've never been hunting and a horse would scare me to death. But you have. You've done all these things. You've never been called names. You haven't laid in bed and cried yourself to sleep because some boy had kicked you. No, the kick didn't hurt. It was the way he did it. The sneer on his face. The names he called. Don't ever envy me, Glenn. I've had it pretty rough sometimes, Glenn. I've had a lot, and still I've had nothing. You were thinking of something, Rogers almost whispered. Something unpleasant. What, Gay? You're right, Glenn. 
and a slow flush stole over his handsome face. I was thinking of something, something I can never tell because I cannot explain it. Maybe someday I can tell you, but I can't now. That's all right. I hope you can tell me someday, if it'll do you any good. He must think of something pleasant. Gay, and the tones were full of life. Let's double date some night real soon. All right. Who do you want to date with? I don't know anyone here. You don't? I know a couple of girls in the country, and they're not bad, he replied with a big grin. I used to take one up in the hayloft. You did? Gaylord suddenly became interested. Was it good? Not bad. Girls are okay, I guess, but I don't know. I don't know much about them. You probably found out about them in that hayloft? Rogers laughed at this, then said, Yeah, I sure did. This one I was telling you about was a corker. Told me she was a virgin, but I knew better. I knew three boys who were getting it regularly. She was a pushover. Just laid back and took it without a grunt. I shoved the whole damn thing in at one push. She just laid back and took it with a wiggle, like she wanted more. Maybe she did, grinned Gaylord, seeing in his imagination Glenn's naked body over the girl. She had all the hose I had. Maybe she wanted balls and all, huh? He tittered, and one arm slapped Gaylord's shoulder. Gaylord giggled, too. Yeah, that's the way some girls are. I'll never forget the one I went out with. She picked me up one night in her new car. I was walking home from the show, and she said she'd take me. Well, instead of taking me home, we drove out in the country and parked. She finally stopped the car and bent over close to me. I just sat there and played dumb. She put her lips close to mine and asked me if I didn't want to kiss her. Imagine asking a question like that, interrupted Rogers. That's what I thought. So I just gave her a good juicy one right on the mouth, he remembered last night. She put her tongue down my throat like she was going to get my tonsils. She sure got hot, grabbed my hand and put them on her breasts. I really squeezed them and she almost threw a fit. I think she was surprised and so was I because she wasn't the type of girl I'd enjoy being with. But when you get in a position like that, you don't care. You sure don't. Then what happened? We messed around for a while. I had a hard on and she felt it. Even opened my pants and pulled it out and squeezed. She squeezed it until I thought she'd kill me. It hurt. Then what? Gaylord looked at his companion and wondered if he was sounding convincing. He certainly didn't want Rogers to think of him as a sissy, God forbid, even if he did lie a little. He continued, Then she just laid back on the seat and pulled up her dress and I crawled on. Didn't even have any pants on. He was convincing himself, for the blood was already rushing around his groin. Not from what he was saying, but from the throbbing in Rogers' trousers. He looked back into Rogers' eager eyes and continued, I bet I was on her for a half an hour. I pumped and pushed and she pushed back like she knew all about it. And she did too. She knew her stuff. Boy, she could wiggle. Had lots of practice, I found out later. Rogers, feeling of his groin, smirked. You got me all hot and wiggly just listening to you. I have, giggled Gaylord. You sure have. Look, I've got a hard. You're not by yourself. Christ, you said it. Rogers roared, carelessly flapping Gaylord's tent-shaped trousers. Ouch, screamed Gaylord. That's me, he did likewise. Hey, laughed Rogers, and that's me. Now you know all about me. And you know all about me, too. I guess I do. One thing you don't know, and that is I couldn't stay on a dame a half an hour if my life depended on it. I get so damn mad at myself. Just when I'm about to start, hell, it's over. You mean like a rabbit? laughed Gaylord. That's right, just like a rabbit. One push and I'm finished. Not me. Sometimes I wish I were. I wish I could hold out. I don't see how anybody can put it off. I get so excited. I just about get there and hell. I know some boys who can go on and on, just like you, but I can't. How do you do it, Gay? That's something I don't know, Glenn, Gaylord grinned. I only know it takes a long time for me. Say, what time is it? Gaylord looked at his watch. Almost six, he said. God, it isn't six, is it? Just about. Why, did you have something to do? 
I should be home, Roger said with alarm. I've got a cow to milk, and if my dad is home before I am, I'm going to catch holy hell. It won't take us long to get back. I'll step on it. Gaylord turned around and headed back for Cotton. He grinned at Rogers, but his mind was on last night. Last night, when he and Blake were parked along the country road, and the moon had just come up over the trees, he felt again the warmth and fragrance of bronze arms around his waist and full lips on his. He drank again the warm milk of this existence and tasted its sweet-flavored honey. Damn, grinned Rogers, innocently slapping Gaylord's trousers again. Have you still got a heart on? He felt his own groin, said, Hell, mine went down a long time ago. Guess you are long-winded, huh, Gay? If you only knew, Gaylord thought. If you only knew what I was really thinking. But I can't tell you now. Maybe tomorrow, maybe later, but not now. You're awfully sweet, but you're not like Bob Blake. You're not as... But you might be. How do I know you're not? I think you're awfully sweet. One of the sweetest boys I have ever met. And you are good-looking, real good-looking. I'd still like to see you without any clothes on. I can't help wishing to see you stark naked. End of Chapter 10 Chapter 11 When Glenn Rogers left Gaylord's car and walked towards his house, he was confronted with the grim realization that he was very late. If his father had had to milk, Dern, he'd certainly be in a bad mood. Sheepishly, he looked around the side of the house toward the barn. But his father was not in sight. Maybe he had gone to town. His anxious glance fell on his mother, who had just opened the back door. I'm sorry I'm late, Mom. Did Dad milk? I didn't realize what time it was. Did you say Dad milked? No, dear, his mother smiled. I did. Dad had to go back to the farm about four o'clock, and he hasn't come in. Come on and eat your supper. I left everything on the table. I was beginning to worry about you. Where did you say you've been? Gay and I went for a ride, he said. Gosh, Mom, he's got a keen car. Did you see it? Yes, I saw it. It is a beautiful car. But honey, now on, don't stay out so late. Your father, I won't, Mother. I'm sorry you had to milk. It's all right, dear. They both went to the kitchen, and Rogers heartily seated himself at the oilcloth-covered table. The supper was strictly a one-dish affair, a solid working man's meal with no fancy trimmings or nonsense about it. And usually, when Glenn Rogers sat down at the table, he ate heartily. But this evening, his appetite was gone. He raised the top of a large dish, replaced it without disturbing its contents. In a dizzying rush, memory of the afternoon came back to him. He remembered the look on Gaylord's face at noon, remembered him saying, I'm not hungry. This glare is too bright. I've got a headache. He remembered the look on the boys in the opposite car, too. There was something wrong there. Something very wrong. Why had Gaylord wanted to move so quick? The sun was not in his face, but he hadn't said anything. He saw Gaylord in his thoughts as he had seen him then. What's the matter, Glenn? His mother asked. Aren't you hungry? The stew's real good. I made it because you like it so much. There's some fresh bread, too. I know it's good, but I'm just not hungry. Gay and I had a Coke and a candy bar after school. Had two hamburgers for lunch. Gay took me to lunch. Guess I'm still full. I'll get you a glass of milk. She started for the icebox. I don't want any, he said quickly. Honest, I'm still full. It was useless to suggest it again, Mrs. Rogers knew. But she was not angry, only a little concerned. She had prepared the stew because it was one of his favorite dishes, and during the long wait for his arrival she had heated it over and over again. Something was wrong, for he had never turned down stew before. How was school today? she asked. Fine. Gay must be a very nice person, taking you to lunch and riding. Rogers felt the eyes of his mother upon him. They knew when he was troubled. They knew his bliss and his agony. They knew his dreams. Did they also know about the strange feeling within him now? About him were things for which he had grown up. Even the plate before him had been brought from the old home. So had the table, chairs, and all the furniture around him. The glare from the electric light lay on them strongly. 
but the air that drifted through the open door and window was cool. So was the scent of blooming tuberose. It reminded him of Gaylord. Tuberoses and Gaylord seemed to go together. Silence drew his mother closer, and as he felt this and sought the release of conversation presently, he said, Gay is nice, Mom. He's one of the nicest fellows I've ever met. He's got everything, and still he's not a bit stuck up like some of the fellows at school. I'm sure he's very nice. His dad gave him that car for a birthday present. It must be wonderful to be able to buy things like that. And then she added, You'll have to ask him to come over some evening, or would you want to? He smiled, understanding what she did not say. I'd like to, Mom. I'd like to very much. I want him to meet you. Told him about your bread. You didn't. Yes, I did, too. He wouldn't like my bread. Yes, he would, too. Even if he's got everything, I bet he never has had bread like yours. His dad must be very wealthy. I guess so. He sure wears nice clothes. I wish I had some new clothes. We'll get you some new clothes. I'm not jealous, Mother, but I... I know you're not. She patted his shoulder, quickly understanding. I wish I had a car, though. It don't hurt to wish, does it? No, it doesn't hurt to wish. Maybe Dad will let you take the car to school a little later on? I can see that, he grinned in amused appreciation. He'd never let me do that, but I don't care. I know you don't, she answered, touching his arm in an affectionate reassurance. You must be patient with Dad. He's worked so hard all his life. He doesn't mean all he says. Rogers nodded soberly, and she continued. He just wants you to know the value of money. Don't worry, he told her. I do. But if I ever have any, I'm going to know how to enjoy it more than Dad does. Every time I ask him for money, you'd think I was asking for his last cent. I've done a lot of work for him, Mother, and I don't know why he's the way he is. He'd have to pay somebody else, but no, he won't pay me. You know how he is. When I get to making money of my own, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to buy you some things you need, too. You never spend anything on yourself. I don't need anything. You do, too. You know you do, Mother. We can't afford everything we want right now. Once more, an old fact was brought sharply before him. It was one that his father had been saying as long as he could remember. Now he thought of his father either timidly or morosely, but as frankly as he knew how. His father was a shrewd man. In his conversations a few seconds before, he had been surprised that his mother still took up for him. His father was a farmer, a German, and something of a dictator. The sound of these stuck crossways in his mind. They sounded right for this man who had always held the upper hand over him, never giving but always demanding. Well, he wouldn't be under his firm rule forever. He'd make his own way in the world and buy what he wanted. He'd buy his mother anything she wanted, but his father could buy for himself. Glenn Rogers departed from his mother and went to his room bearing his school books. He did not open them, but lay on his bed for some time dwelling resentfully on his father's attitude. Simultaneously, with masculine inconsistency, he told himself that if his father had been possessed with a single token of love, he would have suggested his using the car sometimes. After all, he used the pickup most of the time and his mother couldn't drive. He had never taught her but it was clear to him that he would never ask for it. It would have to come from his father's lips before he'd take the darn old car to school. He gazed around the room, not seeing the iron bed, maple dresser, the large, worn artificial leather chair, or the gingham curtain in the corner behind which he hung his clothes. He turned on the small radio he had bought with cotton picking money, and then off again before a sound came from it. He opened a book, tried to dismiss his father from his mind, and settled down to hard thinking along more objective lines. Obviously, the car was not the best means of bringing alien elements harmoniously together. It would be folly to attempt such a request. On the other hand, his dad hadn't been too bad. He had worked hard. At least his mother would have it easier now that they lived in town. He looked up from his book, stared at the wall of his little room, felt he had no reason to hate his father and felt slightly ashamed. Gaylord was just lucky to have a rich dad, and even with the new car, Gaylord didn't seem too happy. He was almost sad at times. I wonder if Gay likes me, 
he thought. I wonder if he does. I hope he does. I hope we become good friends. He sure is pretty. I've never seen a boy so pretty. He looks just like a girl. He licked his lips and swallowed hard, and for a moment he was just a flustered sick little boy because his whole life had been changed. Three hours of trying to study and listening to the radio did nothing to assuage his agitation. He had never felt particularly interested in boys, but he was now unable to forget the young curly-haired boy who had taken him for a ride and whose appearance indicated that he was of the nervous and emotional type. He had never known a boy with such translucent skin through which deeper flesh tones showed, or seen eyes so mysterious and blue. He smiled at his own fancies, and long after he had undressed and gone to bed, he tossed and turned, his mind full of millions of things. The world hereabouts seemed to be made of vast plane surfaces which met at angles almost imperceptible. Sometimes they seemed close at hand, other times fifty miles away. Once he saw a group of farm buildings, and then his old school. He pounded his pillow, trying to free his brain, wrinkled his closed eyelids, and pulled them hard. But sleep would not come. He tried to dismiss everything from his mind, but couldn't. The old schoolhouse remained vivid. He thought of the time he had caught a boy whipping his horse. He set his jaw, remembering the long, thin stick falling on its fat flanks. How infuriated he had been, and what a beating he had given the youth, the long run before he had caught him. Don't you ever come around my horse again, or I'll kill you, he had yelled over a bloody-nosed youth sprawling on the sandy ground. I won't, Glenn, the boy had cried. I won't. Rogers grinned weakly and stared in the darkness and for a moment he again had that terrible sense of aloneness which had oppressed him when he had left his old home and his horse. He hit his closed fist that had brought his horse revenge against the palm of his open hand. He could almost feel the sticky blood on it. He didn't like to fight, and he hadn't meant to hit so hard, but he wasn't the type to allow anyone hurting anything he loved. He remembered his horse now, saw its large brown glassy eyes, and hoped the renters would take good care of him. Blackie was a good horse, but he was scared of strangers on his back, especially if they wore spurs. He never had, never had to. Yes, he was going to miss Blackie, going to miss the long ride in the woods, the good smell around the farm, his swimming hole in the creek. The creek lingered, all drenched in greens and blues. He had swum in the beautiful pool where stately trees dripped moss and colored leaves to the ground and water. And somehow, that life was sacred. It became beautiful and important to him now. Now, in his dark room, Glenn Rogers was carried over the plowed fields by his faithful horse, over the grass-covered earth of his father's farm which stretched to the majestic trees in the woods where lurked squirrels and strange-moving insects. Gaylord must see all this, all this beauty that had been his. He even visualized Gaylord's hands around his waist while he clutched the leather reins both astride his galloping black horse, feeling the sweet fresh air on their face, the cool caress of the pool on their flesh. No, that was only a dream. Gaylord was not the type to like those things, and with his thought, that glittering pool was lost, his childhood was over, or rather, that boy there in the water had been subtly changed and lost by a veil of natural changes. That first day at the new school burst into his mind, that morning he had gone to see the principal demanded to be remembered. It had taken about fifteen minutes before he had gathered enough courage to knock. A voice had asked him to come in, and with a lump in his throat, he had entered the principal's office and asked to be enrolled. Again, he remembered the principal saying, Glenn, country schools are a lot different from ours, and it might take a little time for you to get used to us. New teachers, new friends, and new methods are always hard, but... It won't take long for you to adjust yourself. You're a fine-looking boy, and you've a good card. I think you'll be right at home in a very short time. I remember when I first came here four years ago. I regretted making the change after the first week or so. But I'm still here, and would probably feel funny if I were to go back to the old place. We've got a wonderful staff of teachers, and you, being from the country, will sure enjoy our gym. It's a really fine one. If you need any help at any time, feel free to call on any of us. I want you to like it here. That's my job. 
to make you and other students enjoy coming to class. In a school convulsed with new faces, strange rooms, and shrill voices, Glenn Rogers had become a student, had walked shyly down its long halls, looked timidly for his home room. His face had peered furtively from door to door, passed the mob of young figures, crossed the hard floor with doubtless steps. His landscape had changed, and inside he had felt tangled up. He had collided with someone, blushed, and pushed forward into the strangeness. The pillow pounding continued, and for an instant cool reason locked his feeling. He saw them all aloof, their faces unfriendly and unwilling. No one had tried to make him feel at home. Then he remembered Gaylord, remembered leaning forward and picking up the pencil Gaylord had dropped. He had accepted it, speaking a quiet, thank you. For a moment, when he spoke, he met his eyes, and he saw them widen in a quick but friendly surprise, and when he opened his book again, he felt Gaylord watching him. He remembered his own thoughts of Gaylord and wondered if there had been any similarity in Gaylord's. He remembered Gaylord's eyes. They had explored his searchingly and deeply with a sort of longing in them. He liked the sincere face mingled among the vehicular tangle of dreams. He liked Gaylord, and something within made his pulse race. He felt as though he had never been alive before. We're going to be good friends, Gay, he said softly to himself. Good friends. And when this was decided, he punched the pillow again and went to sleep. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The following morning after, Gaylord had finished his breakfast. He continued to sit at the table and idly run his fingers across the edge of his water glass. His athletic frame was clad in gray trousers and a dark royal blue sports shirt. His sensitive face was handsome, but his eyes were strangely sad, forlorn, yet somewhat wistful. There was some unusual quality about him that made his mother pause and watch him for a second before she interrupted his thoughts. She stood in the doorway and fingered the pale blue satin robe she wore. It was smartly tailored and had her initials embroidered in bold letters across the left side. It had been a present from her son on her last birthday. Mrs. Scott had told her all about the lengthy details Gaylord had gone into when he had taken the shiny material to her house. Mrs. Scott did fancy sewing for several of the women in cotton, those that could afford her prices. Still, she was kept busy sewing for this selected clientele, busy making garments that flowed willily and gracefully. Let's make this simple, she had said after Gaylord suggested flowing lines. Your mother is such a lovely thing, Gaylord. Let's make it... No, simple isn't the exact word I want to say. Let's make it tailored. Smart. Trim cut. I'll personally embroider three large initials on the left side, above her heart. Above her heart had struck Gaylord like a blow from a sledgehammer. Yes, he had answered. That's it. Just what I want. Carol LeClaire, watching her son, thought she had never seen on anyone's face such a perfect distribution of handsomeness. How's my baby? she asked. In a voice low and musical, she bent over and kissed his forehead. Did Irene fix you a nice breakfast? Gaylord accepted the kiss with an unusual nod. Irene? he questioned. I fixed it myself. She hasn't shown up yet, and I'm not a baby mother. You'll always be mother's baby. She sauntered towards the stove and poured herself a cup of steaming coffee. Wonder what's wrong with Irene this morning. She's always on time. Mother... Today is Thursday. Remember, Irene doesn't come on Thursdays. Of course, it's Thursday. This week has gone so quick. I haven't done a thing. Absolutely nothing all week. She sat down at the table across from her son. She had hardly seated herself when Gaylord said, Mother, do you mind if I don't go to school today? Don't you feel well? I feel fine, but I'd just like to stay home today. I really haven't a thing to do today. It's so hot, too. Well, if you know your lessons, I don't know. I don't know why you can't take one day off. Sure you feel all right? I'm all right, but I just don't feel like I could stand sitting in that old schoolhouse all day again today, he said with a challenge. She watched him through the entire statement. There was a character in each word, 
a sense of loneliness in his clear blue eyes, and a determined ruefulness in the curve of his lips. Well, dear, if you feel that way, stay home and rest. Thanks, Mom. His solemn face lighted up with a childlike smile. He idolized the pretty young woman in the satin robe. He loved the honest eyes that looked straight into his, and he appreciated the words that the soft lips had just uttered. Carol raised the cup and sipped the steaming coffee. Phew, she cried on tasting it. Your father must have made this taste like lie. Carol smiled again. That reminds me. Your father wants me to go out to the oil field with him this morning, but if you want me to, I'll stay home and be with you. Gaylord looked at his mother. Not at her eyes now, but at her firmly rounded chin and her lips, which seemed to express himself. Pride, honesty, courage. No woman's lips could be curved that way unless she had faced days of loneliness and deprivation, unless her mind had known bitterness and heartache, and yet she had remained sweet by knowing it. It occurred to Gaylord that he had a wonderful mother, a mother who loved him above anyone, and whose only incentive in life was for his happiness. Still, he didn't want her around today. He didn't want anyone. Today, he wanted to be alone. Oh no, mother, you go with dad. I'm just going to mess around the house. Dad hates to go by himself. I think it would be nice for you to go with him. I know he likes me to go with him. She took another sip of coffee. Darn, this is strong. Guess Dad did make it, because it was made when I got up. He hasn't been in, though. I heated it up and boiled it before I knew it. Guess that's why it's so strong. I tried to drink a cup, but gave up after a sip. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give up, too. They both laughed. The outer door opened, and tall Clayton LeClaire came into the room. He was wearing a pair of gray tropical wool slacks, white shirt, and a gray gabardine jacket. The plain blue tie was held in place by a gold clasp, and a miniature oil derrick made of the same shining ore dangled from it. On his right hand, he wore a three-carat diamond solitaire, a present from his wife last Christmas. He didn't care for diamonds, but this one he liked had liked the words uttered from Carol when she had given it to him. Just because I love you, she had said, and he had loved each word. He looked around now as if the surroundings were not familiar, then said, Carol, for Christ's sake, aren't you ready? He was peeved, noticing the robe. I have a hell of a lot to do. I should be there right now. I thought sure you'd be ready by now. Where are you going? It won't take but a minute, dear, she cried, springing from the chair. You watch and see. She ran for her bedroom. Damn it better not, he yelled. He shrugged his shoulders and winked at Gaylord. That's the way you handle women. Make them jump when you yell frog. He went to the cupboard and got a clean cup and poured himself a cup of black coffee. Then sat down at the table and enjoyed it. Said, isn't there any school this morning? Gaylord's heart figuratively stood still. The moment his father asked him the question, he was nervous. There was no need for this, no need at all. His father had always been wonderful to him. He often asked himself what was the reason. Why couldn't he feel free around his father? His mother didn't bother him, but when his father was around, he always seemed to freeze up. There was no use lying about it. He might as well just tell the truth. So he said, Yes, there is, but I've got some things I want to do around here this morning. I've got all my lessons. So, you're going to play hooky today, huh? And then, in sudden inspiration, Leclerc's tones lifted. How'd you like to go with your mother and me? They're supposed to bring in number eight today. They are? Uh-huh. Cunningham called me last night. Gaylord interrupted. Who's Cunningham? He's the driller. Called me last night. Said they had about a 15-foot oil sand. Looks like we're going to have another good producer, son. That's good. With a 15-foot oil sand, it should be. It will be. It's in the same vein as number six, and six is the best in the whole damn field, Leclerc said with a definite air. Leclerc, whose humble origin and lack of education had been the butt of numerous jokes at first, was now sought after by larger oil men than himself. He was a natural wildcatter and seemed to be able to smell the oil under the ground. He had never dug a dry hole and each location had been made by himself. Now, when he was about to launch his eighth wildcat, he wanted his son to be with him. Gaylord tried to be interested. 
Guess that will teach Mr. Hardy. LeClaire laughed. I can just see his face when I tell him. He bet me a $50 hat this one would be a dry hole. LeClaire lit a cigarette. Come with us, Gay. They are going to be yours some day. You're going to have to know how to take care of them. What time will you be back? Oh, it shouldn't be too late. You know how it goes. There's always something coming up. Shouldn't be any later than eight. I've got a date at seven. Seven? Uh-huh. We'll probably be home by then. Maybe you won't. I know how it is when you get around an old Eric. He didn't want to lie, and it disturbed him. He watched his father puff the cigarette. Did his father guess it was a lie? No, he didn't want to go with them. He knew that LeClaire was wanting him to go along, trying to shorten the gap between them. He also knew he could learn from his father. LeClaire's name meant something to the major oil companies, and his judgment and words were respected. Perhaps he could learn why LeClaire was liked by everyone. He had made many new friends. Old friends had continued with him in spite of his good luck. Perhaps he could become like his father. He had never been happy in his new home, but his father was. The new home had become as homelike as the shack in the oil field. The wealthy oil men as real as the roughnecks, and the imported gabardine slacks as easy to wear as the tan dickies he remembered his father wearing before they had moved to cotton. And now, as Gaylord watched the smoke rising from his father's cigarette, he was thinking how hard it must have been, toiling over conference desks, oil maps, leases, going on long trips. All this because of them. How else could he have been able to buy him all the things he had? Clothes, furniture, car. Yes, his beautiful car. And he had repaid all this kindness with a lie. Now, like sand from a clenched fist, he was slipping further away from his father. And his dad had tried so hard. He had to say something and finally managed to get out. I wish I could go with you and mother or dad. If I didn't have other plans tonight. That's all right. There'll be lots of other times. Guess it is better you don't go today. We'll be late, sure. It always works that way. I'll go next time, even if I have to break a date. LeClaire glanced at his watch. He stood up from the table and went to the sink. Turning on the faucet, he rinsed his cup and watched the water run down the drain to lose itself in the chrome hole. A part of him was slipping away, like water down the dark hole, and he wondered how he could regain it. Looking at Gaylord, he said, Remember, we're going to New Orleans this weekend, so don't make any plans. I won't, Dad. I'm looking forward to it. I don't remember too much about it, but I do remember it is sure full of interesting buildings. I just love New Orleans. I had a big time there when I was about your age. Me and a fellow stayed there overnight. We sure had a time. He grinned, remembering. Wonder whatever happened to Travis. Dad. Yeah? Can I take a friend along? A friend? Why, er, uh, had he said something he shouldn't? Had another magic circle been broken? Why did his father look at him like that? He had to go on. I just thought I'd ask Bob Blake to go with us. He didn't want to go to New Orleans alone. Didn't his father realize that? Didn't he know he could have so much more fun with Blake than he could tagging along with his parents? They didn't like what he liked. Just like going to the oil field. Why his father was in paradise on a rig floor. Gaylord was in hell. He knew he had been there before. Sitting for hours in a hot car, waiting, walking through slush and mud that surrounded every oil derrick. It had been thrilling for him the first two or three times. Thrilling to watch all that went on around the skeleton tower of steel the men in their dirty overalls, their large muscles under the mud-scarred flesh, the whistling of the steam as it was released through the main valves that held it captive, and the singing as it whirled itself up to the sky for freedom, the loud clanging of the endless swinging iron pipes that were clustered in a corner of the steel encasement. It had been thrilling. He had thought of Egyptian slaves with chains around their legs being made to pull a huge stone block, had seen long black whips, lashed across their naked backs when they stumbled and lay exhausted in the path of the moving boulder. The pyramids, surrounded by burning sand, spinning and gnawing into the blood-soaked backs of the half-dead men, was the sound the long pipes made as they whirled into the revolving hole, vanishing from sight in the middle of the derrick floor. The huge boulder silently moving on, crushing the body of a screaming man, rolling noisily on, 
not feeling the bones or flesh under its large rollers. He remembered the muddy-like slush pit on the side of the derrick, the small stream of water and clay that had filled the large dredged-out hole until it ran down the sides of black earth like flowing lava from an erupting volcano, covering the bottom of the pit and slowly rising to its brim, killing everything, leaving a white scum behind that cracked from the heat of the burning sun. Deep canyons and flat top mountains. Nothing living, nothing growing. His imagination had run on a wild rampage while waiting for his father. He had roamed around the boilers, looked into the flabbiness of the slush pit soon to turn a hard crust, had tried to talk to the men under the deafening noises, the loud, wild noises ever present. Gaylord now looked at his father. He must try. He must not let his father know he'd rather be with Blake than with his parents. I thought it would be nice to have someone to run around with in New Orleans, Dad. Then I wouldn't have to tag along with you and Mother. And Bob knows New Orleans. Sure, his father started saying. Hell yes, take Bob with you. That's a damn good idea. Take anyone you like, son. I want you to have a good time. It was a lovely afternoon. Not too warm, not too cool and the sky built a vault clustered with drifting clouds above the rustling tall pecan trees around his home. It sounded good to Gaylord squatting by the side of a camilla bush, pulling out tiny blades of grass. What made the earth so many different colors? How did these delicate stems find their way between the coarse pitted soil? He had held a part of the world in his hand and allowed it to fall through his open fingers, wondering what miracle it possessed to be able to give life to the invisible seeds. He examined the thousands of spiderweb roots and thought of a fish backbone he had stepped on one evening while walking along the bayfront. Take back the unhappy moments and leave me only the good. Fly away words that make me sad and give me the ones I want to hear. Leave me alone, you people who do not understand, and surround me with those who do. Gaylord Leclerc was not Gaylord Leclerc at all. He was part of the earth. Part of a legend beautiful and mysterious, part of a sound of winds and images, part of an origin of things and their occult relationships to each other. A sparrow chirped, followed by others, a flutter of wings shook in the trees. Hi, you. A penny for your thoughts? Abruptly, Gaylord looked up into the sober eyes of Joy Clay. She was standing, smiling, behind him. Oh, Joy, you. What a pleasant surprise. He straightened his folded knees and arose. What are you doing out of school? I went this morning. I thought maybe you were sick when you didn't show up, so I just skipped my last two classes to come see you. I'm glad you're not sick. Never felt better. Just messing around in the yard a little. I was pulling out some of this winter grass. Your yard looks so pretty, Gay, she said, looking around. It does, doesn't it? We've got an awfully good gardener now, and he really knows his job. I love to mess around in the soil. I know. Remember our mud pies we used to make? Sure do. Kind of silly, weren't we? I don't think so. Looking back now, I think those were my happiest days. You and I making mud pies. He looked at her, and his whole life swept before him again. Over and over, memory shaped and spun out of the substance of the past years. Spun out of the world of names. Names of the different ones who had disliked him. The name of the one who had rescued him from the feeling of being lost in a void of misunderstanding and darkness. Robert Blake was more than a name, and Gaylord blushed from the vision. Uh, stammered Gaylord. Do you like strawberries, Joy? Love them. We've got some beauties in the backyard. Come on, I want to show them to you. Some are so big and sweet. They're so much better than the ones you buy in the stores. They walked to a small patch of straw-covered ground. Large green clusters of leaves dotted the straw. Close to the center of the green, clusters of red and pink berries peeped through, trying to find their way out of the shadows so they could lay naked in the warm sunshine. He bent down and picked up a large red one. Handing it to Joy, he said, Here, here's a great big one. Isn't it a beauty, she sang, biting into it. Oh, they're yummy, too. Got some more in the refrigerator. How about a dish full with some real cream over them? No, oh, no, you don't. I've had one big lunch. Girls gotta watch yourself, you know. She grinned, running her pretty hand over her flat stomach. You should talk about a big stomach. Look at this one. He grinned at her, 
making his stomach protrude. They both laughed heartily. How pretty she had grown, he found himself thinking. She had always been pretty, though. Those past years, when he had gone over to her house and they had played together, she had been so. Joy was an only child, too. He remembered the day her father was found dead in his room. How they had cried together when they had found her mother weeping. Their parting when Mrs. Clay had taken her daughter to a distant city, back to her mother's family in the West. And they were separated for almost a year. They returned to Cotton, back to the same White House, and Joy introduced him to her new father. Funny, Mrs. Clay had married her dead husband's brother. It had seemed funny to Gaylord then. Now he looked at her a little more seriously. The childlike features he remembered were gone. Joy had cut her hair like a woman's. It showed her soft white neck. A sort of crazy patterned skirt hung in tight gathers around her waist. Her face, which was rather round, was soft and velvet. The chin puckered, the large yet lovely lips partly opened. She had on a white sheer blouse with short puffed sleeves, and the neckline was low and off the shoulders, just covering the beginning of her budding womanish breasts. The many gathers around her waist made her hips look even larger, although in a bathing suit they were of perfect proportion. Her red shoes had high heels and were made of narrow strips of leather that wound around her small foot and up her well-shaped ankles. Flesh-colored hose of sheer silk added grace to the comely legs. He found himself wondering how many times Blake had felt the breasts, how many times he had kissed those lips. He could see her in Blake's arms, could see the large brown hand creep over the soft pink skin, lingered near sacred spots. The shirtless brown back bent over and hid the scene, leaving a bronze blur before his eyes. The blur moved in a slow, lazy way, and as he looked at reality, he shuddered. Why, Gay, you're shaking, Joy said with alarm. Gaylord shook his head sharply, tried to smile. Just one of those sudden chills you get sometimes. Really, I'm fine, he assured her. I hope so, Gay. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. There was a moment's silence and an exchange of glances. Let's go in the house and have a Coke, Joy. I really should be going. I just came by. You've got time for a Coke. I'm dying for something cold. You're not in that big of a hurry, are you? Where do you have to go? Well, she smiled. All right. We haven't had a Coke together in a long time, have we, Gay? We sure haven't. You never come around anymore. Try to keep me away from now on, she grinned. I won't. I hope you do come real often. They walked into the large living room. In one corner was a baby grand piano. Joy remembered it well. She also remembered the mahogany break front, filled with books and Dresden figures. The comfortable divan they had played upon, long enough for a six-foot man to stretch out on. The traverse-drawn damask drapes they used to hide behind still graced the windows. There was the porcelain base table lamp that she had knocked over years past the time she had run after Gaylord. Looking at its beauty now, she sighed, glad it had been saved by the heavy carpet. The mahogany radio combination, its doors standing ajar, was new. So was the small antique chair, its seat and back covered with an expensive hand-woven tapestry. But the rug, bulky and beautiful, covering most of the polished parquet floor with its oriental design, was like an old friend that had cushioned her many falls. There was the coffee table she and Gaylord had set their china dishes on. In their place now was a cut glass vase, holding some tired red roses, looking like wrinkled faces that had lost their youth. Make yourself at home, Joy. I'll get us a Coke, said Gaylord. He started for the kitchen, stopped and asked, Sure you don't want a dish of strawberries and cream? Just a Coke, please. Sure looks familiar in here. Where's Mrs. LeClaire? Mother and Dad went to the oil field this morning. Won't be back until late. Dad wanted me to go, but I told him a little white lie. Said I had a date. Have you? asked Joy, walking over to the piano and hitting the ivory keys. No, I just didn't want to go. He started for the kitchen again. How about a tune? he cried at her. Can't, darn it. She yelled back. She was left alone. Alone among memories. It had been a long time since she had been here. Yes, a very long time. It looked different. She couldn't understand why. The same furniture was still there, but there was something about it that was different. 
Leaving the piano, she walked to the radio and turned it on. Gaylord entered the room with Cokes. Here we are, he said, handing her one. Thanks. She took the paper-wrapped bottle. I was trying to get some music, she explained. Nothing on that thing but hillbilly stuff. I've got some wonderful records. He stopped short as a love duet from Tristan and Isolde softly came through the speaker. Well, he said in amazement, you're better than me. I never can get anything on there when I want something. Hillbilly stuff or one of those soap operas. Gosh, isn't that lovely? Divine, whispered Joy. They sat on the divan, their heads resting on the soft back cushion while the vibrating strains of Wagner's masterpiece commanded the room. After a second, Gaylord spoke softly. Wonder who's playing that violin? Isaac Stern, isn't it? Sounds like him. I think so. No one can play like he does. I love this part. It's so beautiful. He barely breathed. Joy nestled back into the mohair pillow. She took a small sip from the bottle and looked around to each side. Gay, she whispered. This room looks different than it used to. What did you do to it? Like it? Oh, yes. I think it's lovely. Did your mother have a decorator? I'm the decorator. I've rearranged this furniture so many times, but I think this is about the best way. I didn't know what to do with the piano. You mean to tell me you arranged this room? Uh-huh. Why, Gay, I think it's wonderful. It's so homey and comfortable, and yet so elegant. I like the piano where it is. Thank you. Gaylord felt his face growing warm, almost hot. You should be a decorator, she said. She noticed the red ears. My gay, you're blushing. Why? I don't know. I seem to blush at the darndest times. I'm sorry. He laughed in amused appreciation. I think it's cute. She smiled again, her eyes sparkling. She raised the bottle and took a long sip of the cool cola, sighed. This is just what I needed, with contentment. Me too. I was famished for a drink, but didn't want to take time out to stop for one. I wanted to finish the yard. Now I'm taking up your time in here when you wanted to finish the yard. I'd better go so you can. You will not. I've done all I'm going to do. You don't have to go, Joy. Oh, listen to that violin, he paused, listening. That's my favorite part. It breathes loveliness, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Both relaxed and closed their eyes. Dreaming, he relived that evening with Blake. He remembered every moment, every word that had passed between them. He saw the thick trees through which moon rays tried to penetrate, and he remembered the distant croaking of the frogs. Dark gray moss seemed to hang over his eyes. It became the chest of Blake. His head rested on it. The world had been forgotten, and he had even forgotten his own name. The special name was Blake. Blake with the bronze, gold-like flesh. Blake with the two strong arms that had drawn him close, close to two open lips. If he was only there again, could return to where the slant rays touched with gold, the sitting figure topped with glistening blackness. Then, perhaps, he would discover in the moonlight the secret recognition to all his longings. He looked at Joy, at the bare shoulders Blake's hands must have touched. Surely they had been around them. Wasn't that some of the bronze from Blake's arms shining over the pale pink flesh? Surely those lips he now was gazing at had tasted the sweetness of Blake's, and drops of his own readiness still lingered upon them. She looked at him, and her eyes were kind, like Blake's. Blake's that were so dark and understanding. Yes, Blake was there in her eyes, on her shoulders. He was there within her. You're sweet, she whispered, and it sounded like another voice. She moved closer to him, so close that he inhaled the fragrance of her hair. He drew her to him, touching the shoulders with his fingers, rubbing Blake's golden bronze into his own open palm. He kissed her lips, drinking deep of the sweet honey. They moved and made a bell-like sound, lingered breathlessly on the name Gay. The hair fell back and showed little shell-like ears. The lips spoke. Oh, Gay. I've wanted to do that for so long. Her arms went around his neck. She had him again. This time, she would not let him go. They were grown now, and she had him. Small tears came to her eyes. Why had she stayed away so long? 
so long. And still, it seemed only yesterday they had been children. The swells in her bosom ached with release. Her heart leaped with happiness, almost bursting the tiny brassiere which seemed to be the only thing that was holding it within her. She thrilled at his touch. How odd! The touch from Blake's hands had not excited her as these did. These hands, that had played in mud with hers, building sand castles, mud pies, sewing doll dresses, even fastening her clothes, unfastening them. They had been so close, so far apart. An entanglement had separated them. She had escaped, but he had been lost, lost behind the high stockade that had sprung between them. Gaylord was watching her steadily as if she was something unreal. She stared back, her heart pounding, and there began to steal over her a slow weakness and languor so consuming that even her hands felt heavy. Every part of her was burning with longing. She touched his arm in affectionate reassurance and looked into his eyes. They returned a childish frown she remembered so well. There was no barrier now, and yet she was half scared uncertain of what they said. The restraint he had shown thus far now vanished, and his arms reached out, went around her waist and drew her slowly toward him. Joy, inexperienced but not innocent, met his lips and returned his kisses eagerly. She slid both her arms around him. Somewhere far back in her mind, she thought of Robert Blake, but the sound and the image grew fainter, dissolved. Gaylord did not have to force her back onto the sofa. In fact, it was her move. She glanced at Gaylord, a wondering glance and a sweet tumult beat within her, saying something mysterious, almost forbidden, must lie beyond. An opalescence of soft light and peace and beauty was over the room. Gaylord pulled himself together. His hands moved upon her blouse, and a strange sense of intoxication rose to his brain. His hands trembled as she helped him remove her wrinkled blouse tight brassiere. She lay half mad with passion and longing under the curly hair over her eyes. She let herself relax under his trembling and shivering body. She wanted to say she loved him and wished he would say he loved her, but he only bent down and kissed what seemed to him like gold dust from her pink nippled breasts. Her round, faithful, adoring eyes were upturned, and every movement quivered with love and readiness to obey his smallest command. He pulled at the flowered skirt, the lace pink panties. He saw the wide, smooth belly and tufts of hair. Sweat stood in translucent beads between her small, pointed breasts. She lay there, naked, in his arms, trembling, her eyes closed. He was shaking with both passion and fear. What should he do? What step should he take? Then, as if obeying a command, with shaking hands, she unbuttoned his shirt, felt of his warm body. Gaylord had time for breathing space, and to consider whether the course he was pursuing was wisdom or not. That it was madly exciting, he knew, but where it was leading to? What did she mean? Did she feel it all? Or was she one of the clever coquettes of her sex, a more refined Thumble White, just going to lead him on into showing his emotion for her, and then going to punish and humiliate him? He must put a firmer guard over himself. But the cruel fact remained. That it was too late now. He caught her again, brought her against him. Visions flooded his brain. He saw Blake naked and strong, pressing her back before his desire, bearing her under the living weight of his passion. With a sudden impulse, he unfastened his trousers and kicked them off. He caught her again and held her close. Bob, he thought. This is part of Bob. And the hand now moving over his abdomen, over his wiry hair, touching between his legs, felt rough and brownish. It grabbed at his body as if it had done once before. He closed his eyes, and the golden legs beneath clamped him. The country road and the divan became one, here where only a faint moonbeam shone, while all around them were trees and skies. They had become naked, and their desire of pulled-up anguish, clothed in eager flesh, would melt into each other. He was like a gambler who has lost his last stake, and who still means to take what joy of life he can before the black tomorrow dawns. He felt dizzy and shook his head, trying to shake it clear of the whirling sensation and the images. He grabbed her then, hard and ferociously, opened his eyes and looked down between their bodies. 
He saw her breasts and his own naked flesh rigid in her hand. For a brief instant, Gaylord was frightened, felt he was simply driven by something beyond his control. He pressed downward. Her arms went around his neck and their mouths remained together. Joy rubbed her hand over his curly head and whispered, Gay. Easy. Oh, gay. Bob, he breathed silently. I love you. Their discarded garments lay in a heap on the rug like a pile of drained wet clothes. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 It was dusk when the boy and girl got in the Buick convertible. He watched her get in and saw her face a moment looking out at him through the glassless car door. She had tried to talk to him, but he had remained silent. The golden bronze had vanished. The flesh had become pale and sunless, and the hands smooth and soft. She was Joy Clay again, a barbarous creature who had tricked him. She candidly studied his face as he closed the car door, waiting for some word. Just one word would have been plenty. If he would have just called her by her name. He knew this and was embarrassed because he could not speak. Every look she spoke with her eyes was an alien way of life, a life of pointed breasts and blood-red lips. Again, he felt sick. Trembling, he walked to the other side of the car and silently slid behind the wheel. Automatically, he started the car and backed down the driveway to the street. He heard a dog bark. It sounded mournful and dismal. The same sound was within him, and he bit his lip hard on turning into the street. The streetlights had just turned on, and layers like transparent plastic, deepening red, swept across the sky, touching the dark shadows that lay close to the outlying horizon before him. A gentle breeze swayed the bushy magnolia trees, lingered on the rose-colored flowers of the crepe myrtle, the fragrance of the mixed blossoms filling the air about him with a deadly stink. He had promised himself it would never happen again. Why had he been so weak? Why? A pounding in his head dizzied him, and a sweet sickly fragrance clung to his clothes. It was not Passion Rose. Maybe it would go away if he went fast. Fast. He pressed on the gas. With a quick lunge, the car raced forward, but the odor remained even stronger around him. A woman's face, bent slightly as if she were washing dishes, centered a small lighted window looking like a picture hanging on a dark and gloomy wall. He looked at the woman, and his eyes hurt visualizing her laying naked in bed with a man, their bodies twisting grotesquely, their actions giving seed to a future generation. He turned away quickly. Why was the creation of life so repulsive to him? It should not be that way. All the people who had ever lived had had lovers. It was life. How else could the world continue? Even the flowers seduced each other and brought forth new and different blossoms. Half shutting his eyes, he listened to the murmur of the wind passing through the leaves of the trees, listened to its whispering vocal reeds. Was this the riddle of life? Was this the riddle from which had sprung the beginning of time? He had a sharp, clear memory of bronze. The arms were interlaced around him, but there was something missing in the vision. The creation of life was as bare as the large brown feet of his vision. They approached a large brick house, and he pulled to the curb and stopped. Joy came closer and rested her head on his shoulder. There was a look of innocent guilt on her face, but her skin beamed with a new freshness under the glow of the streetlight. He looked at her and saw her as she used to be. And with the memory, there was no guilt or recollection of guilt. Again, she had a ribbon in her hair, and her hands were caked with soft, dark mud. He waited. Joy extended her right hand. He pushed her hand aside, put his arms around her, and kissed her on the cheek. Joy clung to him and started speaking. Gay? she whispered. What are you thinking of? I don't know, he replied as if in a dilemma. She didn't understand the kiss. Something far away drenched the eyes looking at her. They were strange, as strange as the soft lips had been. You're, you're not angry with me, are you? Oh, no, Joy. She felt his body quiver. Not at you. 
at myself. She kissed him, and his lips were still warm, did not draw away. A mad desire, a desire to feel him within her arose and filled her shaking body. She wanted to touch the naked flesh again, to feel his lips, to feel his arms around her as before. She loved him. God, how she loved him. She loved the bewildering silence about him, the mysterious look, his soft curly hair, his sensuous mouth. Oh, if only he would say he loved her, wanted her again. Something was wrong. Something. But what? Blake would have said the thing she was longing to hear. He would have told her life would be empty without her. That he loved her, wanted her. Why didn't Gay say these things? Why? He must love me. He must. Why doesn't he tell me? She had forgotten this was the first time they had been together, the first time in many years. They had been so close when they were children. They should be even closer now. He used to love her. She was certain. But what about that childish love? Would it continue? He might be in love with someone else. Thelma White, for instance. Thelma White? No. He couldn't love Thelma. She had given herself to him, and he had loved her then. He couldn't have kissed the way he had unless he had. She bit her lips in confusion and lowered her head. Does he love me? She asked herself. Am I going to have to ask him? Oh no, I can't do that. He must say it himself. Must say it because he wants to. I won't ask him. I won't. I... Gay? She raised her head and reached for him. You do like me. Just a little? She whispered. You love me? The air seemed filled with mist through which he saw her with a puzzled distinctness. He couldn't lie to her. She was an old friend, and he wasn't a noble hero. She waited, but Gaylord remained silent. Instead of speaking, he gave her a brotherly kiss on the cheek. She looked out over the streets, the evening shadows half revealed, half concealed. She looked over the house roofs, uneven in height, broken once in a while by a slanting roof from a house left over from older times. The gables on the roofs, and on some the shadowing looming of pigeon coats, sometimes faintly heard the sleeping cooing of pigeons. The tall trees remotely brooding over the dark houses, and at the end of the street, the highway traffic passed and was lost. Lost. Hours seemed to pass. Days flew by as she sat there next to him. She knew she should leave, but she waited for an answer. She was afraid she was going to cry. Her eyes lowered, watching him and her breath came and went in little racking gasps. Again, she bit her lip. She could not ask him the question again. No, she would not. He had heard her, but had not answered. He didn't love her. Didn't want to lie to her. She should respect him for that. Yes, she was sure he didn't love her now. She had tried. Somehow, she was like those cars on the highway. Lost. Go to your room, something dug at her. Go to your room before you throw yourself at him again. Have you no pride? He doesn't love you. Go to your room. I'd better go, she mumbled in a husky-throated voice. The blood in her veins that had been so warm felt like it had been diluted with ice water. She opened the car door, said, Good night, Gaylord. Good night, Joy. I'll walk to the house with you. No, don't bother she said dully. Thanks for bringing me home. Joy, he took her extended hand. It was cold and wet. For a moment, he felt like an imaginary demon from the antiquity of old fairy tales. Joy, he repeated, still holding her hand. I wish I knew what to say. I know you're sorry for... No, she said and smiled a tiny smile. No, Gay, I'm not sorry for what happened. I wish it would have happened before we became strangers. I loved every moment and want you to know I did. I... I seem to regret everything I do. No regrets, Gay. That's life. You can't help it because you don't love me. Any more than I can help loving you. Oh, Gay. I guess I've loved you all my life. He started to speak. No, dear, let me finish, please. 
She continued to look at him. I'm not sorry for what happened. I'm glad it happened with you. Glad it was you and not someone else. I want you to know. You were the first. Remember that. Remember me. She released her hand from his. I'll go now. No. I'm all right. Don't say anything. Don't spoil it. I don't want to hate you. Bye. She stepped quickly on the soft green grass, her mind a green pool full of moving objects. All that had surged through it a short time ago was gone. Gone like the mud pies, dolls, and the freckles that used to cross the bridge of her nose. She had told him of her love, but the words had fallen on deaf ears. Ears shut to the pleading and eyes that searched far away into unknown depths. Too deep for her to reach out and touch their meaning. She stopped in her walk and looked around at him once, looked at him from over her shoulder. Goodbye, my darling, she uttered to herself, then walked toward the dark house. Gaylord watched her, and as he did so, his name sprang sharply from floating mixed sounds. Gaylord, he listened, his ears ringing from the sneering sound. Go tell her you love her. At least tell her about Bob. Explain to her. Don't send her away like this. This is the way you've been treated all your life. Now you're doing the same thing to her. He turned from where the voice seemed to come and looked at Joy. She seemed tired. With each step, her shoulders drooped, like that of an old woman who had spent her life over a washtub. I can't. I can't. He cried to the voice. I can't tell her. He ached with the anguished awareness of the moment. Doing that to Joy was terrible. She was his friend. You didn't mess up a friend's life. God, what have you done? He could never face her again. He could never look at her or her mother in the face again. She paused when she heard the soft, low, sputtering motor. She turned and watched the outline of the car. Gradually, it grew fainter and then died completely away down the dark street. It's not your fault she cried out aloud. It's not your fault. Sobbing, she ran into the dark house. Gaylord drove for an hour over the abandoned streets, past wire fences and cedar posts, over the never-ending slabs of cement the wheels turned, turned and spun like the thoughts in his mind. The voice sprang again at him with a demand to be heard. Gaylord, you can't run away. Why don't you go back and tell her you're sorry? Tell her that you think she's the sweetest girl you know. That's all she wanted to hear. After all, you were as much to blame as she. You did seduce her. And who were you thinking of all the time, you dirty, dirty person? You evil, silly boy. You're low, real low down, mean. What would Bob think of you if he knew? Don't you know he loves her? There was a witch-like creak, followed by a ghastly loud laugh. That's how she'll get even with you, you stupid thing. Just what do you think Bob sees in you? Just because he was nice to you? Played around a little with each other? Do you think he's in love with you? He loves joy. Joy, joy, joy. No, 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 Gaylord screamed, tears running down his cheeks. He loves me. He's gotta love me. I didn't want to do what I did. God knows I didn't. I didn't want to lie to her. I like her very much, but I don't love her. I can't love, love. Oh, I love Bob. He can't love her. He loves me. The car echoed with his cries. He was sobbing, clutching the wheel of his car and driving aimlessly. He listened to hear if the voice would answer, but instead there was only the echo of vibrating moans around him. Then he was jealous of her. Jealous of the body she could offer Blake. What could he offer? Absolutely nothing except his love, and that wouldn't be enough. He knows this now, and he cried so desperately the road in front of him seemed like a rippling lake. I must be crazy, he sobbed. Oh, God, I'm so confused. Help me. Why am I so different? Why? Why, why, why do I want Bob's arms around me? Why do I want to feel his lips on mine? Why am I so thrilled with his nearness? Why do I love him and not Joy? Don't take him from me, Joy. Please, don't take him from me. 
I'm sorry. So sorry, Joy. Forgive me. I'm so ashamed. I didn't want to hurt you. I didn't. Really, I didn't. All the way home, he cried, kept seeing Blake and Joy in bed together and laced with their lovemaking. As he turned into his driveway, the heavy stillness surrounding the dark house was gone. The lights from his car had awakened it from a restful snooze, and now it appeared alive, glad the darkness had been lifted. A parked car by the curb in front of the house meant nothing to him as he walked absent-mindedly from the garage around the side and to the front of the house. A whistle, like a boy would make to a passing pretty girl, stopped him from going up the porch steps. He recognized both, the whistle and then the car. Bob, he cried and ran toward the car. Opening its door quickly, he sprang inside and with tears streaming down his cheeks, threw his arms about Blake. Well, for Christ's sake, what's the matter with you, sweetie pa? Blake asked in amazement. He quickly placed an arm around the shaking shoulders and with the other lifted Gaylord's fallen head. What is it? He looked tenderly into the tear-soaked eyes. Has anyone hurt you? He almost whispered. Tell me and I'll kill him. As the arms went around him, a feeling of peacefulness found its way into Gaylord's body. Thoughts of love and admiration shot through his bewildered mind on studying Blake's face. It was divided between the thrill of being where he was and the misery of Joy's eyes. He wanted so much to share this painful news with Blake. He well knew that the girl had not tricked him, and that only because of himself, weak and spineless, this had happened. And yet his blood ran quick with pride. He had not lied to her. Nothing could erase that fact. It was the only decent thing he had done. Blake said, What happened, Gay? Tell Bob. Why, your eyes are all bloodshot. Tell Bob what's wrong. Gaylord glanced timidly at Blake. He had a trapped look, said wearily, I'm all right, now. He knew he didn't want to tell what had happened, but to himself he was wondering whether he really should, after all. They faced each other for a moment, and there was something in Blake's face that unaccountably reminded Gaylord of past dreams. The loving condensation, perhaps, or perhaps a softness under the brightness. He felt encouraged. I'm fine, Bob, he whispered and took out a handkerchief and wiped it across his face. Sure? Blake asked. He took Gaylord's hand. Real sure. Real sure. Blake didn't take his hand away. He thought he felt a little pressure. The bronze face so close troubled him. He tried not to see it. I'm glad you came by, he said. Been here long? About ten minutes. Blake scrutinized his face kindly. Sure you didn't want to tell me all about it? I know something's wrong. Guess I was just lonesome, feeling sorry for myself. I can't explain it, Bob. That's no way to feel. You shouldn't be lonesome. After all, why didn't you call me? I was afraid you were sick. I saw Joy. Joy. A blast of lead tore into his body. His heart stopped, and the afternoon occurrence flashed with lightning speed through him. Joy. The white sheer blouse, the full bright skirt, the tight brassiere, and the hard time he had in fastening it. His naked body on hers. The sweating climax. He knows. Bob knows what happened this afternoon, he thought. Joy's told him. Gaylord's face, with quivering lips, had an imperious, tragic look though to Blake it was hardly more than a paleness in the dark, and the eyes were pools of blood. So this was the end of the world, the end of their short friendship. No more would the bronze arms help him, no more would they protect him from the boys in the showers. This is how Joy must have felt. The end of everything, finished. A return to the emptiness and frustration of his former life was here again. Through Blake, he could find the answer that had eluded him for so long. Through Blake, he might even learn to identify why and thus realize the dream that had plagued him ever since they had met. Suddenly, an image focused on the screen of his mind, and he saw it grow into two people, Joy and Blake standing close together, their arms linked, their compelling oneness shutting him off completely. For he saw, with a sense of intuition, that he had no part of them. He did not dramatize his feelings or feel sorry for himself. Right now, he felt he deserved it. For the picture of Joy and Blake together 
haunted him far less than the one of joy in himself. He had acted like a common tramp, a no-good scoundrel, pressed harder even when she had uttered a little cry of pain, sucked like a hungry animal at her naked breasts, had hurt her so badly, blood had covered his own flesh with its redness and stickiness. Seeing all this had left its mark under his eyes and around his mouth. He looked tense, tired, and desperately worried. The fragments of a hundred scenes lingered in his tortured mind, and he wanted to run, to flee to some dark intersection and die. Gay, what's wrong? Blake asked, looking into the pale face that had pictured death the only solution. No good, Bob, he said simply. I have no right to live. I'm always doing the wrong thing. I always have, and I guess I always will. Now who in the hell put that in your head? It's the truth. And with this, Gaylord caressed the other's hand. Everything I do is wrong. It's been that way all my life. His voice made a thin, hollow echo in the car. That isn't so. Joy and I were talking about you at noon. She told me you didn't come to school, and she was worried. Everybody likes you, Gay. I know Joy does. You don't think I'd be here if I didn't like you, do you? I was afraid you were sick, too, so I came by. Had a million things to do this afternoon, that's why I'm so late. His grip was firm, yet soft, and his voice strong, understanding and soothing. You want to tell me what's wrong? No? Don't. I don't want to hear it if it makes you unhappy. Forget it. There was so much Gaylord wanted to tell Blake, and so pitifully little he could say. Their eyes met, and under Blake's compassionate and intense gaze, he felt his frustrations, his pitiful egotisms, wash away as the innate purity of his love for him emerged, lucid and durable. How simple it would be for him to deceive Blake by admitting illness. He tried valiantly to smile. No, Bob, I'm not ill, he said. I've done something I'm ashamed of. I'm so disgusted with myself. We all do things we're ashamed of afterwards. It's only human. But this was... What? I can't tell you. Why not? I'm broad-minded. I wish I could. You'd hate me. Oh, gay. What's the matter? Were you out with this fellow Glenn? Glenn, what's his name? No. Oh, no, Bob. He almost screamed, shaken, afraid a second would be too late, afraid the other would vanish in the mist before his eyes. I wasn't out with Glenn, please believe me. He didn't like Blake's air of inner calmness and strength. Don't be mad. Yeah, I'll die if you are. Not mad. Should I be? Blake reached out and drew the other closer. Come here. See? Now do you think I'm mad? No, Pop. Your car wasn't here when I drove up, so I just thought I'd wait a few minutes. Kind of felt you'd be right back. Been gone long? He raised his head and looked into the red pools. The few minutes you waited too long. I wish I'd been here when you drove up, he sobbed. Blake tightened his arm. I don't like to see you cry, Stinker, he announced sorrowfully. Don't smear that pretty face with tears anymore. Why, your eyes are all bloodshot now. Don't get them any redder. Blake kissed the tear-soaked cheek. Oh, Bob, is it wrong for me to love you? I don't think so, Blake grinned. You'd better like me or I'll... He tightened his arm. Break every rib in this torso of yours. Gaylord was not thinking of his ribs or caring what happened to them at that moment. They moved toward each other at the same time. Blake's big hands came to meet him and were the first things that touched him. He could feel them pressing hard and big around him as Blake took him in his arms. It was as if they were obeying unspoken orders. Their mouths met again, and when they parted, Gaylord began to tremble. He clung to the other as though for support. They embraced again, and his trembling increased. He seemed unable to control it. He might have been afraid. You don't have to go in, do you, Gay? No, Gaylord whispered. I don't. I want to be with you. Just you. You do? You know I do. Want to take a little ride? Anything you want to do. I think a ride would be wonderful. Now. He did not need to look at Blake to see him. Once he had looked at him, his image remained in his mind's eyes. It had never left him. They drove off, leaving little Claire's home behind. The cold had disappeared. 
The moon shone strongly, and it was gloriously warm again. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Gaylord, a short pause, and then again. Gay, darling, are you up? A feminine voice called and rang up the stairs into the ears of the sleepy boy. Phone, can you come down? Bob, he grinned with delight. I'll be right down, mother, he yelled. He jumped out of the bed with a bounce, grabbed a robe from a chair, and almost flew down the carpeted stairs. My goodness, it's not a matter of life and death, his mother said to him as he whizzed by. Morning, mother, he cried, running past her. He was out of breath when he snatched up the phone and said, Good morning, Bob. I was still in bed. Bob? This isn't Bob, said a voice on the phone. This is Glenn. Oh, he said as if someone had struck him. I thought you were Bob, Glenn. No, I'm not Bob. Well, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Fine. I just called to see if you were sick. I missed you in school yesterday. Called you last night, but no one answered. No, I'm not sick. I feel wonderful. Played hooky yesterday. I'm glad you're not sick. I'm all right. Glenn repeated. I called last night, but no one answered. You must have called when I was uptown. Mother and Dad were gone, too. Yeah, guess you were. Are you going to school today? Sure. Well, I'll see you then. Glad you're not sick. Bye. Wait a minute, Glenn. Yeah? I'll pick you up. Oh, I don't want you to go to any trouble. I can walk. Why should you? No trouble. I'll be there at a quarter to eight. How's that? Sure it's not putting you out? Of course not, silly. You be ready. Okay, Gay. See you at a quarter to eight. See ya. Bye. Bye. Glad you're not sick. Gaylord hung up the receiver. His eyes sparkled and last evening's feeling of guilt was gone from them. Instead, he lost himself in this achievement with pagan identifications. Went to his room drunk with the good fatigue of a strong young man, his mind full of tranquil images. And thus, in the early morning, the world was wonderful. It was wonderful to be alive. The nude figures under the red silk shades seemed to smile as he pranced around the room dressing. A soft humming, filled with a triumphant ring, came softly from his closed lips. He ran his hand across the flat abdomen after he stepped into a pair of tight blue shorts. Damn, must be getting fat, he said to himself, glancing at his reflection in the door mirror. These shorts are sure tight between the legs. He rubbed his groin and remembered the past evening. Okay, you, he grinned. Get down and stay down. I'm not taking any chances with you this morning. He drew out a fresh white shirt from one of the large drawers of the chest. It squeaked and seemed to say, You lucky dog, as he closed it. He almost lost his balance pulling the tan gabardine slacks up over his slender waist. He zipped the flap shut with one quick jerk. You're closed up now, so you might as well just forget about sex. Go on, relax he said to his image as he ran a tan belt through the loops of his trousers. He opened a leather box and put a handful of change in his pocket. Backing away, he looked at himself again. The room became brighter, as bright as the thoughts that danced within him. No memories of sleepless nights, pointing fingers, cruel slaps, and remarks entered his mind. The old feeling of wanting to be alone was gone. He was remembering last night. Those lost nights before there was any Robert Blake, Nights of his boyhood and loneliness were gone. He carried the golden myth before him, and it kept him warm and happy. New Orleans. It was a word, romantic and full of legends. Tomorrow night he would be there with his parents, but his bronze god could not be with him. I've got to practice, Gay, Blake had said when he had asked him to accompany them to New Orleans. I'd love to go. If I wasn't captain, I'd go, but Gay, I just can't. I don't want to go either, then, Gaylord had sighed. No, nah, don't be that way. You'll have a good time without me. There's so many things in New Orleans. I'll have to tell you about an experience I had there sometime. What? I'll tell you sometime. You're too young to hear tonight. There are some places in that old city I'd love to take you. I'd just love to see your reaction. What kind of places, Bob? Places for fellows like you and I. Places, oh, you'll find out. Maybe you'd understand yourself more if you went to a couple. You'll find them. 
I don't know what I'll be looking for. Places? There are so many places. Just go down Bourbon Street. You'll find them. You better not like them too much and forget to come home. If you do, I'll come and get you. He treasured the statement. It lingered now, and he wondered if Blake would come and get him if he stayed. He had been there three years ago, had loved the strange old buildings drenched so deep in history. He had vivid memories of them, all drenched in rusting iron and bricks decayed from age. How grand it would be to have Blake by his side, walking down the narrow streets, explaining things that would make him understand himself. What were those things? He was almost sure he would never find them alone. How could he? In a city convulsed with people, miles of winding streets, where could he find what Blake had meant? At least he would try, he told himself. He was older now. Yes, he was grown now, and he could walk alone and try to find what Blake had meant. Alone. Always alone. How much better if Blake could be at his side. He did never want to be alone again. Glenn Rogers was standing on the front porch of his house when Gaylord drove up. He lunged toward the car, smiling, and the deep dimples formed in his cheeks. Gaylord sure was nice to come and pick him up. He must do something nice for him. He didn't know what it would be right now, but he was not going to forget it. Hi, Gay, Rogers beamed. You're right on time. I always try to be on time, Gaylord said to him as he sat down. They left the curb and headed for the middle of the street. Rogers turned to him. Called you last night. Thought maybe you were sick, but no one answered. No, I wasn't sick. Didn't I tell you on the phone I wasn't? Gaylord grinned. That's right, blushed Rogers. I'm repeating myself. I didn't mean to be nasty, Gaylord said, noting the shy glance. What time did you call? Uh, I guess it must have been around seven. Rogers looked into the bright and mellow eyes. They seemed brighter than he had ever seen them. Even the way he sat behind the wheel was different. He seemed to have more confidence or something. I must have been uptown. You must have been. Sure don't look sick this morning. How do I look this morning? You look full of piss and vinegar. What'd you do last night? Or should I ask? Gaylord gave out a little giggle. Nothing, he said, making his little nose wiggle. Oh yeah, like hell you didn't. It's written all over your face. He shifted in a seat and placed a crooked elbow over the back of it. He looked grinning at Gaylord. You've got more darn girls in this town, I bet. Was it good? Gaylord laughed at the accusations. I wasn't out with any girl last night. I just feel good this morning. Did I tell you we're going to New Orleans tomorrow, Glenn? Unconsciously, he spread his legs and rubbed between them. Darn these shorts, he said with disgust. What? asked Glenn looking at the hand pulling at the trousers. Oh, I've got on a pair of shorts that's tight as all get out. I should have put on another pair. Did you ever wear a pair that cut? I sure have. That's exactly what I've got on right now. Feels like I've got ants in my pants. Maybe they're not ants, but something else? What? Crabs. Crabs? Maybe you caught some crabs last night. They're easy to get. Glenn Rogers giggled Gaylord. I told you I wasn't out with a girl last night. You don't have to be out with a girl to get crabs. They both laughed heartily, but Gaylord did not go into the subject anymore. In fact, he changed the subject. Students strolled down the sidewalk that ran parallel with the street. Some carried stacks of books under their arms, a serious expression in their eyes. Others seemed carefree, their empty arms swinging carelessly at their sides. A door opened, and a girl with flaming red hair emerged. She stepped from the wooden steps onto the long slab of cement that continued down the street. A pimply-faced boy riding a red bicycle passed them. He waved and laughed with glee, said, Race ya! Gaylord grinned back, but said nothing. So, you're going to New Orleans tomorrow, broke in Rogers. Who with? Mother and Dad. There was the boy that had grabbed him in the gym, the one who had slapped him across his naked buttocks. He was walking with some girl his hand in hers, and a cigarette dangled from his ugly mouth. He saw the car and screamed, Oh, hello, Gaylord. He waved his free hand. Hello, Shorty, Gaylord yelled back, hoping it would remind him of personal matters. There was no shyness in the way he said it. He wanted it to hurt. 
if it was possible to hurt a bully's pride. He thought of last night, and firm, warm, throbbing flesh lingered in his palm. He clutched at the wheel and squeezed his hand around its hardness. Do they call him Shorty? asked Rogers. What? Who? That guy you just called Shorty. Is that his name? He doesn't look very short. You never seen him naked. Why, what difference would that... Oh, I know what you mean. I get it. He smiled his affectionate smile, and the dimples deepened. Gaylord grinned back at him. What would he think if he told him about Blake? The things they had done together. He wanted to tell someone about the feeling in his heart. He was so happy, he wanted to tell someone, and who better than Glenn Rogers? Would he understand? Would he think it awful he loved a man? It had never happened before. But so many things that had never happened before were happening to him. Had all his life. That was the difference between him and the others. He was the only boy in the whole world who had fallen in love with a man. He wondered at this now. Wondered what Rogers would think about him if he knew. New Orleans, dreamed Rogers. God, I'd love to see New Orleans. I haven't been any place. Just around here all my life. New Orleans, it's on the Mississippi, isn't it? A strange madness akin to joy ran through Gaylord LeClaire. He gave Rogers a tremendous slap on the thigh. That's it. Why don't you come along? We have plenty of room, and we could have so much fun together. Rogers' eyes beamed with excitement. Gosh, he said, if only I could. But your mother and dad. Dad asked me if I had a friend I'd like to take, and you're it. Oh, Glenn, we can have such a good time. I know we could, Gay, but my dad would never let me go. Why not? We're supposed to go out to the farm tomorrow and vaccinate. Hell, what difference would a couple of days make? He'll let you go. The hell he will. You don't know my dad, Roger said seriously. He can sure be a mean old bastard at times. Hard-headed as hell, too. I get so mad sometimes at him. It won't hurt to ask him. It won't do any good. You don't know how bullheaded he is at times. I can just hear him. No, Glenn, you know we're vaccinating tomorrow. You can't go running all over the country. It costs money to travel. Money. Damn him. Old tightwad. Glenn Rogers remembered how his dad had raved when his mother received a magazine through the mail. She had subscribed for the cheap little magazine from a neighbor's child. God, how his father had shouted about her spending money foolishly when he had found it in the mailbox. It was all right for him to subscribe to the Country Journal and the numerous catalog magazines that crowded the mailbox at the first of every month. Yes, that was all right. But for his mother, that was different. His mother had cried after he had left, mumbling curse words to himself, and at that moment he had hated his father. Anything that wasn't used in farming was useless. He had even raised hell the time Glenn had ordered himself a fountain pen. Didn't need a new one. What's wrong with the old one? The old one. Leaky old thing he had carried so long. And his mother had to wash their clothes by hand. Couldn't afford one of those washing machines. Cost too much. Still, he could afford to go out and pay several hundred dollars for a damned old bull. No, he could never ask his father for money to go to New Orleans. And he didn't have any, unless he did. Won't cost you a cent, said Gaylord. I've got enough for both of us. The trip's on me. Damn swell of you, Gay. You don't know how much I appreciate it. We can ask him. Maybe he'll be in a good mood. But I couldn't go unless I paid my way. Why not? I just couldn't. I don't know why not. I won't have any fun by myself, and I've got plenty. I'd just love to have you come along. You can pay me back. I don't know how. I was just saying that. Please come. Well, I'll, Rogers sputtered. New Orleans mingled with the words. Pictures he had seen of the city became reality. Old buildings, Napoleon, pirates, iron verandas with beautiful girls looking down from them. The Mississippi River. He could see the mighty father of all waters. The old St. Louis Cathedral his mother had told him about. The Cabildo, with Jackson Square in front of it. Andrew Jackson on his horse, all in bronze. That's what the postcards showed. He thought of where he had actually been. Cotton and a few surrounding towns, and that was it. He had been to San Antonio once. 
His uncle had died, and they had gone to the funeral, but they had not even gone to town. He had seen the high buildings and had longed to walk past them. Gaylord wouldn't admit defeat, said. We'll ask him, and he'll let you go. I just know he will. You don't even have to ask him for any money, and it won't cost any more than if I went by myself. We can share room at the hotel. I always get one. That is, if you don't mind sleeping with someone. Me, for instance. Mind? I love it. Gaylord wondered just how he meant it. There's some nice hotels in New Orleans. You don't snore, do you? I don't think so, Gaylord grinned back. But who knows what one does when he's asleep. I wouldn't care. I'd sure like to go. I've never stayed in a hotel. Gaylord watched the dimples grow in the smooth tan cheeks, the clutched fist go under the sturdy chin, and now he indulged in the exquisite dream of repeating with Rogers what he had done with Blake. He thought of lying next to Rogers in bed. It would be the first time he had ever slept with anyone. He wished it could have been Blake. Blake with the golden skin and the strong bronze arms. He was not at all sure he could force himself to touch Rogers. The feeling for Blake, which had taken the first young giving of his love, had a powerful enduring claim upon him. He didn't object to this claim, for it had been a mutual seduction, one that he felt he had enjoyed more than his seducer. Well, Gaylord began, you're going to stay in a hotel tomorrow night if I have my way about it. His boyish face took on a peculiar inner smile, a mere glow around the eyes. He held his head bashfully sideways looking at his fingernails and back at the other youth. It's time we do something together, and this is a perfect trip for the both of us. Do hotels have showers? Sure, why? I was just wondering. That's the only thing I like about that gym. I just love showers. And I'd like to see you under one, Gaylord silently thought, but he only grinned back at the dimpled cheeks. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Enveloped in a compounding haze of glaring colored lights, New Orleans, fabulous city of the South, spread out before Gaylord from his twelve-story hotel window. He gazed down on the rolling reverberations of cabs, streetcars, and people. I'm yours tonight, the squeaking cab horn screamed and rambled over the uneven streets. We won't hurt you, the tops of the queer-shaped buildings groaned, their voices old and toothless. Come down and dance with us, yelled the jazz bands from the dimly lighted cracks. I'm really the old man of the river, who did the steamer from the mighty river. We'll show you the way, blazed the dazzling array of different colored streams of lights. I'm old, wailed the high steeple, but I'm strong. I was built of cypress and pine. I won't fall on you. They all joined in with one exploding shout. Come on, join us. Enjoy us. We're here for you. Each and every one of us are here for your pleasure tonight. Gaylord heard all this and loved it. He was excited and anxious to be among them. The drive had been long, hot, and dusty, but after a quick shower and fresh linens, plus a delicious dinner with his parents, he felt refreshed and eager. His parents had gone to their room after giving Gaylord permission to go out sightseeing. Don't stay out too late, Gay, and be careful, Clayton LeClaire had warned him. I won't, Dad. Gaylord had answered. Gaylord took one last look and walked away from the window. He stopped at the dresser, took another look at himself, then left the room. When he reached the hotel lobby, it was crowded. Bellboys and waiters were screaming names, carrying luggage and large trays of food. For him, this wild confusion was an earthly paradise. He loved to be among crowds he did not know. He loved New Orleans. From the first time, he could first be trusted to wander off by himself he had loved any city, exploring its large buildings and its mysteries. He had never been afraid. In fact, on the streets he had always felt more at home than he did on the streets of his hometown, Cotton. Always a daydreamer and solitary, he could walk down a strange street without feeling someone was watching him or going to call him a sissy. No one paid any attention to you in the city. He glanced at the clock. Twenty minutes to ten. He'd better hurry, he thought. I won't have too much time. A man seated in back of a desk marked sightseeing tours smiled at him. He was extremely youthful looking with dark hair, sallow skin, and sharp sensitive features. His eyes were bluish green, deep set, large and penetrating. There was something of the fanatic in his look. He was quite handsome. He spoke. 
How are you this evening, sir? Fine, thank you, grinned Gaylord. Going out for a big time? I hope so. We have a tour leaving in about ten minutes. You have? Yes. Would you like to go on it? It covers the city and takes you out to the beach and back. It's about an hour trip. Not tonight. Think I'll just walk. Tomorrow? We have several during the day. Maybe. Maybe tomorrow. Have a good time. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Standing outside the hotel, he watched the congested cabs unloading men and women dressed for an evening of excitement. He looked at the busy restaurant across the narrow street. There was a man watching him, or so he thought there was, but it didn't bother him. Everyone was alive, glad they were in this wonderful old city. He had a fleeting impulse to yell at the man, but instead, he only grinned and walked down the steps. Gosh, everyone was so friendly. He wished Glenn Rogers could have come with him. He certainly would have gotten a big kick out of all this. Poor Glenn. He had wanted to come so bad. His father had been so mean when he had asked. What difference would a couple of days make? Couldn't he vaccinate his old cattle when they got back? Oh no, it had to be today. Not three days from now, but today. Glenn's father had been firm in his reply. He would not give in to Gaylord's pleading. Glenn had been right. He did have a selfish old bastard for a father. Never even said he wished Rogers could go. Never even thanked Gaylord for asking. In fact, he looked as if he was mad. Right then and there, Gaylord decided he didn't give a damn if he ever saw Mr. Rogers again. How different his father was. How good and thoughtful his dad was. He felt of the wallet in his hip pocket, making sure it was still there. Inside it were four $10 bills. His dad had given him two of the bills right after dinner, saying, Here's a little change. Go out and spend it all tonight if you want to. If that's not enough, there's some more where those came from. But be careful, son. There's a lot of cheap people here in New Orleans. Men and women who will do almost anything for money. So don't flush it around too much. People have been killed over a few dollars. And this town is full of hijackers and pickpockets. So just be careful. But have a good time. Don't take up with anyone unless you think they're okay. And I think you can judge people. Just be careful. He left the front of the hotel and walked down Rue Royal toward the brilliant lights of Canal Street and felt funny to be walking on the uneven sidewalk again. He remembered the time he and his parents had walked down it years ago, remembered how he felt. He stopped and looked about. For a moment, he longed for Blake or Rogers, either one. But his courage came back as he started down the street again. A car passed quite close to him, almost touching him. It was good to be among people, to have perfect strangers pass close to him. He did not shy away from them as they passed, as he did in Cotton. He looked and watched them with fearless eyes. From every type person to variations in color, these people stormed past in a disorderly array down Royal. They clamored and pushed, determined at any cost to get to their destination. Some were youngsters, on their way to a party or show. Some were old, selling papers, gum, pencils, souvenirs. Some were rough-looking truck drivers, sales clerks, ushers, hostesses, pimps, whores, all making a meager living in the city. Some had taken steps to equip themselves for their jobs, and there were many, many others who had just taken a job, any job, to earn money. Money, what a necessary evil it seemed to most. Gaylord looked up at the stars, bright, close, and profuse in number, some blue, some white. They all twinkled as though at him personally, sharing the secret sweetness of his freedom. He was so entranced with the night and the sights around him that he didn't hear a girl speak to him. In fact, he would have walked right past her if she had not grabbed his arm. How good looking, she said. Gaylord turned and looked at her. She had straw-colored hair and her jaws were busy chewing gum. A sweet aroma of jasmine surrounded her. He smiled, said, Hello. Want to have some fun, handsome? The girl invited, looking down below his waist and then up again into his eyes. Not tonight, Gaylord offered tentatively. Why not, good looking? The girl put in. I'll bet you won't be sorry. I just live down the street. Gaylord didn't mind. He wasn't dashed at all. It's kind of fun, he grinned. I can't tonight. I'm meeting some friends. He knew what she was. Sort of felt sorry for her. 
She couldn't be very much older than himself, and she had come to this. Gaylord started to go, but she caught him by the arm again. You could buy me one little drink, couldn't you? Won't take long, and then you can meet your friends. Gaylord blushed like a schoolboy. He didn't like having her force herself onto him. Still, he didn't want to be rude. I've got to, he started. Just one little drink. You won't be sorry, honey. Gaylord frowned cocking his head slightly to one side. The first faint signals of alarm came to him, yet nothing could happen to him on the street. She now stepped along with him, matching his stride. He didn't know just how to get rid of her, perhaps one little drink. He stopped and said, I really shouldn't. It's quite late and I should meet these friends. I'm sure they're waiting for me. Maybe some other night. A cop, pudgy man, whose head and shoulders hardly came up above Gaylord's shoulders, asked, What's going on, Flo? Nothing, she murmured. This young man's just about to buy Flo a drink. Didn't you, honey? No, I really have to go, stammered Gaylord. She came back. Now, honey, you know you ask me. I don't think you did, Flo. If you don't stop going for quail, gal, I'm going to have to run you in, yes? I told you not to hustle on my beat. Now, this is the last time I'm going to tell you. He said he'd buy me a drink. I'm not hustling, honest, Pat. Don't give me that crap, he said without any manners. Y'all like, go on, Flo, move on. Pat, she whined. Go on, you want me to run you in? Just stay around a second longer. Well, she said as she was on the point of departure. Can't blame a girl for trying, can you, copper? Then she turned and glided down the street, swaying her hips in perfect rhythm to the swinging of the large purse in her hand. Thank you, officer, said Gaylord. I didn't offer to buy her a drink. The officer looked at him speculatively again and broached, I know you didn't, but some of these women don't have to be asked. Gaylord agreed. Live here? The officer asked. No, sir. I live in Cotton, Texas. Well, what are you doing here? Asked the officer, eyeing him carefully. I'm here with my mother and dad for a few days. Where are you staying? Down the street at the hotel. Where are you going now? Just walking. Just walking? Yes, sir. Gaylord wondered just exactly what the officer was getting at. The officer stared for an instant at Gaylord and then announced, You're not going to one of those queer joints, are you? Queer joints? Yeah, queer joints. No, sir, I'm not going to a whorehouse, if that's what you mean. I'm just walking to Canal Street, and then I'm coming back to the hotel. Okay, Sonny, don't stay out too late. This town is full of women like the one you just left. Be careful, and if you need a help, just call a cop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, breathed Gaylord with a sigh of relief after the cop had gone and he was again on his way. The evening has certainly started out with a bang, he thought. Queer places. Wonder if he did mean whorehouses. Guess he did. Yeah, that's what he meant. He turned to the right when he reached the broad street. God, how beautiful, he mused fascinated by the large moving signs, the heavy traffic, the clanging of the streetcars down the wide center of the street. He stood there just looking, his eyes wide and round, his lips in a broad grin. He wished for Blake or Rogers again. He stopped at the show windows and looked at their displays. A stout woman carrying two suitcases passed him. She was uttering cuss words to herself. She paid no attention to his gaze, passed on as if she hadn't seen him. Gaylord was just as glad to have her pass. He walked on slowly. He noticed two young men walking toward him. One was masculine-looking. His hairy chest showed behind the unbuttoned shirt, opened almost down to his waist. He was very dark, and his eyes seemed to dance as they met Gaylord's. The other boy was frail. A femininity covered his every movement. His thin eyebrows made a high counterfeit arch over the blue-tinted eyelids, and his hips swayed unnaturally as he walked. When he noticed his companion smiling at Gaylord, he glared back at Gaylord as if he hated him. Get a load of the cute new faggot in town, the masculine one said, punching the other's side. You ought to like him. Look at his basket. He looked at Gaylord again, said, Hello, babe. Where are you going? The feminine boy grabbed the other's arm and demanded, Stop flirting, Jim. You know I'm not interested in anyone but you. But I've got my doubts about you. He looked at Gaylord, who had said nothing, and said in a high falsetto voice, Run along, Mary, 
Get yourself another husband. This one is mine, and I'm going to keep him, too. He put an arm through the others, and with a little push, said, Come on, Jim. Don't push me. God damn it. He pulled away from the dainty boy's arms. I guess I can talk to anyone I want to. You new here? Huh, babe? He grinned at Gaylord. Poor Gaylord, it would have relieved his feelings if he could vanish from the spot. He tried to by walking away. Hey, the masculine boy yelled at him. Where you going? I've got a date, Gaylord said and walked on. But he heard the feminine one say, I just don't know what I'm going to do with you, Jim Page. You're after every bell in town or they're after you. You're just after. Gaylord heard this much before the voice trailed off into space. He looked around to see if they were still there, but they had vanished in the throng of people. The incident had not caused him to become frightened. In fact, he had rather enjoyed it. He wished he had enough nerve to wear eyeshadow. It sure did make one's eyes dreamy. Still, he didn't want to look like the boy who had just passed. Then he decided that eyeshadow was for girls, and he would be lots better off without it. Faggot, he thought, perplexed. That boy called me a cute faggot. I wonder what he meant. I wish Bob was here. He'd know. I don't think Glenn would. He's dumb like me. From Canal Street, he turned down Rue Bourbon. It rang loud with the noises of Dixieland jazz bands and barkers and smelled of urine and beer. He looked into the crowded absinthe house, noting the millions of cards that cluttered its walls. He gazed in admiration at the old doors, the patched plaster walls. He stretched out his hand and felt the old wood, wood that others, long past dead, had put there. In his imagination, he saw Jean Lafitte counting out gold to his fellow pirates, squatting around an old metal chest filled with precious jewels, drinking rum out of old broken bottles. Jean Lafitte, just think, Jean Lafitte used to come here. Maybe he used to stand on this very spot. He looked down at the stones he stood on. What a man. What a brave, carefree, reckless pirate Jean Lafitte must have been. What a life he must have had, he thought. I'm glad he was pardoned. Wish I could be just like him. A cab pulled up beside him and stopped. Looking for a go, buddy? The driver asked. Get in. I know a real young one. I ain't been in the business long, no? He stretched his neck and winked at Gaylord. No, thanks. Not tonight. I'm waiting for a date, he smiled back. Some other night, yes? Maybe. Here's a good address. They've got any type you want, buddy. And any way you want it. He handed Gaylord a card. Just give him this card. Tell him Beat sent you. Gaylord took the card and grinned back at the driver. He watched the cab plow down the busy street. Then he put the card in his pocket without even reading it. Suddenly, the cab horn blasted at two drunks who stepped out from the curb and almost in front of it. The car swung around, barely missing them. You son of a bitch! You almost hit me, pal! yelled one of the men, waving a clutched fist at the moving vehicle. Come on back and I'll beat the goddamn shit out of you. He turned to the other, throwing his arms around the weaving shoulders. You all right, pal? He looked into the face that was rolling around on a thick neck. He patted the shoulder and said, We need a drink. Come on, pal. They staggered back into the bar they had just come out of, their arms around each other. Gaylord laughed as he watched them, giggled out loud to himself. That's the kind of buddy to have. He put his hand in his pocket and felt the card the cab driver had given him. He started to pull it out when a voice behind him spoke. What kind of buddy is that? It was a deep, soft voice. He turned around quickly to a face hidden in shadows, but the voice was familiar. Somewhere he had heard that voice. He saw the outline of a tall man, and in the moving shadows, it looked golden bronze. End of Chapter 15 Chapter 16 Gaylord Leclerc stared into the face in the shadows. He had the poet's insatiable appetite for imagining, and the mystery of New Orleans distilled it. There in the shadows was a bronze face. Bob, he cried with a sudden burst of joy. He reached out his hand. It stopped suddenly in midair. Bob? Paul's the name. Came from the shadows, and the hand reached out and took the extended one. I thought, Gaylord began with dismay and alarm. I thought you were a friend of mine from back home. No, I'm afraid I'm not. I wish I were, though. You seem so disappointed. Paul Boudreau, 
and have lived in New Orleans practically all my life, he answered, still holding hands. You look so much like a friend of mine. Just knew you were Bob, he grinned and added. I'm Gaylord LeClaire. They shook hands. Gaylord LeClaire, nice to know you. You've got an awfully pretty name. French, aren't you? My father is. My mother's German. Then, with another grin, I guess I was talking out loud to myself when you came up. I was wondering what kind of buddy you wanted. Did you see the two drunks? One was sure taking good care of the other one. Yes, I saw them, Paul laughed softly. I was afraid for a moment they were going to end up under that cab. So was I. Sure scared me for a moment. Gaylord looked at the man. He did look like Bob. Had a pleasant, keen expression. The eyes were mysterious and shadowed, and the plentiful dark hair was the same as Blake's, even to the strand glistening over the forehead. His skin was darker, almost chocolate, there in the shadows, and when he smiled his teeth were even and very white. His grip had been firm and warming, his voice good-natured and attractive. I'm sorry I'm not your friend from home. You sure do look like him. Bob's about your build and has the same coloring. I hope he's a good friend. He's the dear... Gaylord stopped. He's the best there is, he stammered. Then I'm glad I remind you of him. It's wonderful to have dear friends. They are so hard to find at times. They sure are. Paul Boudreau pulled out a metal case, opened it, and handed it to Gaylord. Cigarette? No, thanks. Paul took one from the case and lighted it. He smoked in silence for a second while he studied the boy frankly. Then he said, How about a drink? A drink to this friend of yours. You said his name was Bob? Yes. How about a drink to Bob? Okay, I'd like that very much, Mr. Bob. Gaylord laughed. I've forgotten your name. Boudreaux. Paul Boudreaux. Forget the last name. Everyone else does. Paul's fine. Just remember Paul. He grinned. He let the cigarette smoke cloud his thoughtful eyes a moment. I'll remember Paul all right. He took this information into his mind carefully as if he were afraid he'd forget it. Gaylord asked, Where shall we go? In here? He pointed to the absinthe house. My favorite spot is down the street, about three blocks. I believe you'd like it better than the absinthe house. It's kind of dull, but this favorite place of mine is always interesting. Again, he puffed at the cigarette. Would you like to go there? If you'll let me buy the drink. If you insist. But if you do, we'll have to have another one so that I can buy you one. That's well. Shall we go? Shall I call a cab, or would you prefer to walk? Let's walk. You said it's not very far, didn't you? No, it's not far. I'd love to walk, if you don't mind. I don't mind. They started down the street. Gaylord looked at the moving traffic. He tried to catch glimpses of the faces inside, but it was difficult. For the tops of the cars hid them. It didn't really matter. He was just interested in the passing parade. Interested in the buildings they were passing, restaurants, laundries, a small flower stand, juke joints, hotels. Mostly it was bars from which loud, brittle music blared. This life was fascinating to Gaylord. He noticed a buxom, dark girl come from one of the bars with a man's arm around her waist, her big, solid breast pointing the way to her widely swinging hips to follow. Paul noted the girl also, said, Well, it looks like she's going to have fun, doesn't it? Sure does. She's not very pretty, is she? She certainly isn't, Paul agreed. Is this your first trip to New Orleans, Gaylord? The first in a long time. And call me Gay, Paul. Gay. Paul pronounced the name very dramatically, then said, That's a perfect name for you, Gay. You look gay, he grinned. I feel gay tonight. You do? It's so much fun to be here in New Orleans. I just love it. His gaze left Paul and turned to the buildings. He noticed the pictures of nude girls in front of the places they passed. He listened to the sounds of jukeboxes, pianos, and singers that came from the open doors. He looked back at his new friend and decided again he liked him. He looked so clean, so well-dressed, and his person had such a good healthy scent. Tweed, he speculated. He liked the way he told the history of the buildings they passed what they had been in the past, and some, even the name of the ones who had built them. He made them sound romantic, so full of adventure. He was lucky he ran into Paul. 
all who knew and was part of this wonderful city. He did know all about New Orleans. Why shouldn't he? He was probably born here. I like New Orleans, Paul began. Sometimes I get awfully lonely here and leave, but I always come back. I was beginning to get lonely, too. That is, before you came up. It's no fun to go around by yourself. No, it isn't. I was a bit lonely myself. New Orleans, with all its gaiety, can be mighty lonesome. I guess you're right. You want to know something? Something maybe I shouldn't tell you. What? Promise you won't be angry. I won't be angry. What? I've been following you. Following me? Ever since you left the hotel? Gaylord grinned without any reason. Why? He asked innocently. I wanted to meet you. Didn't know how to start a conversation. Then when you said something about a buddy, it gave me an opening. I'm glad it did, Gaylord grinned. I'm awfully glad. This is the one time I got a wish. I wished I'd meet someone. And sure enough, here you are. Did I do something to attract your attention? Paul put his hand around Gaylord's waist and gave his hip a firm pat. Just wanted you, Gay, he said. It's such a beautiful night. Too beautiful to spend it alone. I guess you did do something to attract my attention. I can't say what it is. But it was something, Gaylord. I mean, Gay. A little thrill leaped through Gaylord, leaped with the same raucous rhythm of the jukebox playing 12th Street Rag. The whole street rang with it. It pounded so that it seemed to vibrate within him. It was a good, healthy feeling. Together, they walked along the Rue Bourbon, and Gaylord gaped at the fresh barkers in front of some of the bars, so characteristic of the Vucari. They certainly made it plain what was inside. He hoped Paul wasn't taking him to where there would be nude women dancing and shaking their bodies at him. And for a moment his heart beat wildly with anticipation. Then he shied from it. He told himself Paul would not take him to such a place. Well, here we are, Gay, Paul said. He smiled at Gaylord appealingly, winningly. This is my favorite dive. What do you think about it? Gaylord nodded his approval. Looks really interesting he said. He stood elated looking at the worm-infested wall. The iron bars protecting the dirty, cracked windows and the faded drapes were green with age. Flashing neon surrounded the small awning over the door. On a large billboard just to the side of the door was an array of pictures. Beneath each one, sprinkled with glitter, were bold red letters. A shadowed light beamed down upon them, making the names of the entertainers alluring and alive the glitter making them dance and sparkle. Paul held open the half-door for Gaylord and then followed him in to the dimly lighted club. The buzzing of constant chatter and laughter, the opening of bottles, and the deep loud tones from the keys of a piano all mixed with the voice of a girl singing, greeted them. Slowly they stepped past the crowd and Gaylord was reminded of a movie with just such a setting. He felt Paul's arm around his waist, he looked around at the walls, at the faces seated by small round tables, the sight of the place, the bar with people seated at it, the soft lights, the girl singer, the talking, excited him. Paul broke into his thoughts, saying, See any vacant tables? They're all full. Oh, there's one, he pointed to one close to the grand piano. Let's grab it before someone beats us to it. This crowd has no manners, he laughed, took Gaylord's hand and proceeded toward the table. Gaylord followed, holding on to the hand, walked past the other hands that reached out and felt of his legs, his thighs, and almost between his legs. He retraced Paul's steps even closer than before. At least they couldn't paw him. Hello, good-looking, a boy with bleached hair grinned, at the same time trying to grab his hand. Hello, grinned Gaylord. You can share my table. Paul looked back and heard, said, No, thanks. Get you, Mary. I was just trying to be polite for a change. Thanks, but we have one, put in Paul. Thanks, Gaylord grinned again, conscious of the many eyes upon him. He was glad then they were seated at the table. She was singing, and a long silk handkerchief flew through the smoky blur from her ever-moving hands. After they had sat down, the frail piece of silk touched Gaylord's cheek, and the girl smiled. Hello, honey. Then back up in the air it went, toward the girl who had spoken and winked at them. Hello, grinned Gaylord, impressed by the informal flirtation. Want a cigarette? Paul asked. Please, he answered. Paul handed him a lighted one. He took it and prayed he wouldn't cough. 
He was not used to cigarettes, but he should smoke. Everyone else was. He puffed at it. It tasted mild and sweet. He looked at its foreign name, stenciled on the thin white paper in red letters. He had never seen one of these before. What kind of cigarette is this? Don't you like them? Paul asked. Oh, yes, they're good. I've never smoked one before. In fact, I haven't smoked too much any time. They're an imported cigarette called Empress. Paul grinned at his young companion. I like them because they're so mild. You can smoke them all evening and they don't burn your tongue. An ugly boy with thick glasses over pale watery eyes came up to their table. He held an empty tray and a small towel was thrown over his arm. Hello, Paul, he said with a bored expression. Something new's been added. His glassy eyes looked at Gaylord. Something cute, too. Hello, doll. Paul was quick and sharp. Hello, Freddy. How about a couple of bourbons? He looked at Gaylord. Bourbon, all right, Gay? May I have mine and Coke? He asked Paul. Freddy said in a whine, Honey, you can have anything you want. You're a doll. Freddy, mumbled Paul. Well, he is, he smiled at Gaylord. Gaylord smiled back, but was silent. He didn't know what to say. Okay, so he's a doll. Now, may we have our drinks? Sure, girl, coming up. He started to leave, but turned and faced Gaylord. Say, doll, how old are you? Paul was quick again on the answer. He's old enough. Just bring us a couple of coke highballs, Freddy. Freddy let out a long sigh. Looks awfully young. Oh, well, don't care or give a damn if they do close the joint. He shrugged his shoulders and left. Scared you're too young to serve to. Not that it matters in this dive. By the way, how do you like it? I like it fine. Is, um, Freddy a friend of yours? I just know him from coming in here so often. By the way, Gay, how old are you? I'll soon be eighteen. Gaylord looked into Paul Boudreaux's eyes. He twisted on the seat, thinking that the eyes looking back had a suspicious look in them. Paul Boudreaux did have thoughts about Gaylord. In that split second of silence, he wanted to kiss the childlike lips, wanted to caress the bright, wavy hair. He looked so innocent. The cleanness of the country springtime. Youth. That was the lure. A delicate plant among weak and spineless weeds. How different he looked among the hardened crowd. Chunky of body, blank of face, shifty of eyes. They glided their steps among each other with an artificial precision. They were dreamers, weary and lifeless as the gray smoke that spun around them. This was their club, their place of retreat. The place where they could be themselves. The place they could scream, love, and find new conquests. Every few minutes, the door of the club swung open to admit more men, more servicemen, women with too much muscle, and youths with too little. Think I'd forgotten you? It was Freddy with her drinks. No, I didn't think it'd forget us, Freddy, said Paul. Gaylord smiled and took a puff from his cigarette. The waiter continued. I thought you'd be at Miss Lambeau's party, Paul. He placed a small glass in front of each. I hear it's going to be a mad affair. I'm going over after we finish with these bastards here. The place is full of tours tonight. Don't know why they come to a place like this. Guess they like to see the freaks. I told Pete he ought to rename the joint to Freakland, or the Sand Pit. He took the bill Paul handed him. Keep the change, Paul said. Thanks, doll. Some broad asked me if I was gay a while ago. Gaylord heard the word, but didn't interrupt. Just came right out and asked me. Are you one of those gay boys I've heard about so much? She says to me. Looked like a sex maniac. You know the type. Lays back and wants you to do all the work. Not the normal way either, honey. Well, I certainly shut her up. You should have seen the expression on her fat face when I told her I had six children, been married and divorced three times, and sleeping with a negro whore now. She put a paw on her fat tits and almost swallowed the cherry out of a drink. Gaylord glanced at Paul for some hint, found none in the frowning face, and dropped his eyes. Freddy kept on talking in a way he could not understand or intelligibly shape to his own ends. The thought of sleeping with a negro whore was degrading to him. He gnawed the inside of his cheek nervously for a few seconds, glanced at Paul again, and then mashed his cigarette into the tin ashtray. Freddy continued, but Paul's voice stopped him. Shall we try our drink, Gay? he asked, raising the glass from the table. They clicked their glasses and took a sip. Freddy left them alone. Inside Gaylord, a continuous flicker of excitement like electric shocks played within him, causing the muscles of his arms to grow increasingly tense and his hands on the glass to tremble with concentration. 
Paul spoke first, making a sweeping gesture with his glass over the table. Our first drink together. I hope we shall have many together. I hope so, too. Want a cigarette? Please. Again, Paul handed him a lighted one and asked, How's the drink? Fine. Drink up and we'll have another. All right. Paul was silent a while, expecting Gaylord to speak, but Gaylord was tongue-tied with all the strange surroundings. Faces rose through the gray fog like images on pages turning over and over in muddy river pools. A loud girlish scream came from the bar and echoed in Gaylord's ear. He turned and glanced from where it came just in time to see a tall blonde boy throw his arms around another. Jack, baby, when did you get in town? screeched the blonde boy to the dark-haired one standing at his side. The incident looked cheap and common to Gaylord. He thought of the times he had thrown his arms around Blake and wondered about it. Was this really cheap and common? He was guilty, too, if the blonde boy was. The comparison struck him and stayed with him until he was yanked back into the present by another sudden screeching. I'm drunk. Yes, you're damn right I'm drunk. But I'm not drunk enough to go home with you, Mary. The youth who had just spoken got up from the table and weaved his way between the aisles. A gray-haired man he had just left watched him. Gaylord was among people playing strange roles. He seemed to be trying to learn their world. There was no secret to their feelings, and still he found the whole pattern too complicated to follow. It was like a circus, too many things happening at the same time. A low murmur from a side booth caused him to turn again. In a booth, two girls were in each other's arms. The one with the short hair had just bent down and kissed a frail, rather pretty one. He had seen girls kiss each other many times, but not like these two were kissing each other. The one reminded him of a truck driver. From them, he gazed at the singer under the blue light. She smiled at him a long moment, her eyes running over his face. He couldn't help watching the handkerchief dangling from her hand. It seemed sad. Sad as the artificial eyes watching him, strange as the smile. Was this what Blake had meant? Was this the type of place he had wanted to take him? One that would show him he wasn't the only one in the world desiring his own sex? Was he one of these? Did they feel the same way he did? Was this what the cop had meant when he told him not to go to any queer place? Was this the kind of place he had meant? The girls singing, the high voices, the pale-looking faces. Boys in each other's arms, girls kissing their own sex, boys with plucked eyebrows, the swishy way they walked as they passed going to the restrooms, the way they felt each other's body. Yes, it was sort of strange. Queer. Hello, Paul. Hi, John. Paul answered the man who had just passed. Then to Gaylord. Friend of mine. Are you having a good time, Gay? Why don't you drink your drink so we can have another? All right and he finished the drink. They had several more drinks. Gaylord listened for the most part. The face before him was behind thin silk and moved like a leaf from an unseen breeze. It was transformed into a mask of tenderness and love. With a finger, Paul tilted the boy's face gently. Gay, are you all right? Gaylord gave a little giggle. I feel fine. He finished another drink and grinned back at Paul. This time, I'm going to pay for a round, and don't you dare say I can't. He grabbed the waiter, who was just passing. Freddy, he cried, bring us another, and don't take Paul's money. This is on me. Okay, doll, right away. Gay, think you should? Should? Have another drink. One more, huh? He smiled, his affectionate smile. I feel wonderful. I like this place. I don't want you to get sick. I won't. I hope I can make it back to the hotel. I'll see that you do. Okay, Paul. People began to clap and shout. Everyone was having a good time. Gaylord began wondering if there was really anything wrong with him at all. Maybe it was his imagination. Everyone here was all right. They didn't seem to have a care in the world. He was just like any other man. He wasn't, or they weren't any different. People were people, but each had his own individual desires. May I have another one of those long cigarettes, Paul? Gaylord asked after Freddy had placed another drink in front of him. After he had paid the pale boy, after the boy had patted his warm cheek and said, Thanks, doll. Another cigarette? Sure. Paul lit and handed it across the table. I hope you're having a good time. I'm having a wonderful time. I love this place. I feel so good and free. It's only a dump, but I have fun here. I'm glad you like it. 
I've never been to a place like this. Everybody does just what they please, don't they? They try to. Gillard grinned. They're doing a good job of it, aren't they? He was sipping his drink when he noticed the singer standing in back of Paul. She was blue-eyed, like him. Her lips were full, and the dress that clung to her excellent figure revealed pointed large breasts. She threw her handkerchief with a gesture of friendliness and greeted them in a low, rather husky voice. Hello, you two. She placed a hand on Paul's shoulder. Hi, Dusty, Paul said. It's about time you came over and spoke to us. Dusty, this is Gay. Gay, Dusty. Gaylord arose from his chair. Hi, Gay. And don't get up, honey, she grinned, pushing him back gently. Sit down and have a drink, greeted Paul. Thanks, Dusty grinned at Gaylord. You know, Paul, makes me feel real young again having a good-looking boy stand up for me to sit down. That hasn't happened to me in a hell of a long time. You're so pretty, too, honey. She patted Gaylord on the cheek. Paul motioned to Freddy. He came immediately. What are you drinking, Dusty? Bourbon or scotch? Oh, better make it a bourbon. I've been drinking it all evening. Scotch might poison the old frame. She turned to Freddy and said, Listen, girl, you tell that bartender this ain't a bee drink. Tell him to give this actress some of that good stuff he drinks himself, or I won't sleep with him anymore. She turned to Gaylord. I've been drinking phony drinks all evening. Girls gotta make a living somehow. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between a bee and a real one. They're both rotten. You said it. The stuff they've been serving tastes like tea. Mine's strong, broke in Gaylord. Dusty grinned at him. You know, she whispered, you're the cutest thing I've seen in a long time. What do you mean running around with an old bastard like Paul? He's sweet, too, piped in Paul, and I'm not as old as you, Ducky. So you're younger. He's only two months younger, Gay. Live here, honey? No, ma'am, I live in Texas. Texas? A man from Texas. Honey, I just love men from Texas, y'all. They all laughed. Paul said, Now, Dusty, don't get carried away. All right, I'll be a lady if it kills me. She felt of her breasts, moving her hands over them as if to adjust them to a better position. She looked and waved at someone who had just called her name and then back at Paul. I'm sure glad you two are here. There's been nothing in the joint this evening but jerks. I had to get blind in the dressing room before I could even sing. Now I don't give a damn. Bunch of peasants. They must have let them out of the cow pastures today, and they all came here, I believe. I've never seen so many in one spot in all my life. And honey, that's been a, well, it's been a hell of a long time. She took a deep swallow from the glass Freddy had left in front of her. Good for the soul, ain't it? She took a huge sip and looked to Gaylord. What well, part of Texas you all come from, sugar pie? Cotton, he grinned at the southern draw. It's not too far from Houston. Don't give a damn for Houston. I opened and closed in a show there several years ago. One day. Shortest engagement I ever had. Cute show, too, but hell, there were too many complications. Houston's sort of hickey. Hasn't gotten the hayseed out of its hair yet. And you know, the joint was jammed. I can't understand why a town don't have a couple of gay clubs for the kids. At least it keeps them off the street and out of the dives. This club was a really smart place, and you know the gay kids all love an elegant place. So they close us and leave open the dives. I can't understand it. Well, that's enough of Houston. How long you been in New Orleans, gay? And why in the hell didn't you bring him here sooner, Paul? Trying to keep him to yourself? Well, I don't blame you. He's so cute. You've said that before, grinned Paul. I know it, but he's still cute. She looked at Gaylord. Honey, you should live in New Orleans. There's no place like it. I wish I did, Gaylord said, and meant it. You wish he did too, don't you, Paul? I can read that look on your eyes. Guess you're right. I can't keep any secrets from Dusty Gay. Too smart for me. Aren't you? No, dear, I'm not too smart. We've just known each other a long time. Let's see. She put a red-tipped finger under her chin for a second. How long has it been? Paul started to speak, but she stopped him with, Don't answer that. I know how long it's been. She wrinkled her powdered brow in a process of thought. Then she smiled at Gaylord, said, You know, honey, this handsome devil used to be in love with me until someone like... She stopped when Paul's finger went to his mouth. She coughed, trying to cover it up. 
Damn, the smoke. Well, anyway, this dog left me for someone more refined. I cried and screamed, and it didn't do a damn bit of good. He left anyway. She looked from one to the other. Didn't you, darling? Dusty, you're a card and I love you. You'll always be in my heart. How about another drink? I need more than your heart, honey. You know what a sexy bitch I am. Know anybody who wants to sleep with an actress tonight? And I'll take another drink, since you're such a gentleman, darling. She looked away again and called to Freddy across the room at another table. Hey, Freddy, this actress needs another drink, and so do these two smart gentlemen. Make it quick. I haven't got much time. Dusty pulled between her legs. Damn, this G-string is killing me. Shouldn't have washed it. And these damn rhinestones pinch like the crabs. Damn things bite. Gaylord was only human, and even with the wonderful glow inside, he looked at Dusty with alarm, interest, and admiration. She didn't seem to care what she said. It was fun to watch her, hear the rustle of her dress, watch the dancing eyes. She saw the bewildered look in his eyes. Here I'm rattling like a common bitch, she said to him. You think I'm awful. She puckered her mouth into a cupid bow and looked at him from under heavy beaded eyelashes. I think you're wonderful, Dusty. He didn't know her last name. It didn't matter, for none was needed. Paul, cried Dusty, handing him a large square of silk. Go do my number. I'm going to sit right here and make love to Gay. Then I'm going to take him to my crib, and I'm keeping the rest a secret. Oh, no you're not, Paul laughed. In fact, they all laughed. I thought you said you were going to be a lady. It's so hard for me. I know that. He lifted his glass and swallowed his drink. The liquor was bad. He placed the empty glass on the table, said, How about Jean's party? You going? I'll probably make a late entrance, she answered. That is, if you let me make love to Gay. Will you let me make love to you, Gay? Her eyes misted over. It's all right with me, he grinned and meant it. She seemed so different from other girls. She was common, but still she wasn't. That's the only reason I'll go, then. You don't know what you let yourself in for, honey. Her voice was low and sexy. But when I make love, I really put my soul in it. She looked at Paul and winked. But what in the hell are we going to do with you, Paul, honey? Female dog, grinned Paul. They all three laughed, and Dusty and Paul talked while Gaylord listened attentively. He was enjoying every minute. The warm glow within made him view everything with renewed interest. He knew she was kidding, but he liked the way she did it. After a few minutes, Dusty picked up the handkerchief from the table, adjusted her breasts again, rose from the table and said, Well, my pets, this broken-down Folly's beauty had better go belch out another hymn, or she'll be out on her ass. Thanks for the drinks, kids. It's been charming. Gay, don't let me scare you, honey. I'm perfectly harmless. Huh, Paul? She laughed and started to go, turned to Gaylord and added, By the way, got a favorite song? Or would you prefer not to hear this prima donna ruin it? Do you know tonight was made for love? And as he thought of the song, the clouds of graying haze opened wide. Sun swept down in great golden whirls, and a glistening blackness was added. And it was in this that he again saw Blake. He stood there, out in the golden whirls, as if he was really part of it and had been tossed there by the mere mention of their song, stood there grinning his old familiar way, his short hair glistening, his lips smiling. The lights seemed to dance on his bronze naked body, and he waved. He called out in his vibrant voice, Have a good time, you little rascal. And then the bronze figure melted away in the shadows, and in its place, Dusty and the smoke came back. Have a good time, he had said. Dusty broke in on the illusion. Tonight was made for love is so right. It's one of my favorites, too. And if I forget the words, I'll compose some just for us. She walked to the piano. Everyone began to applaud as the blue spotlight suddenly illuminated her. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, she began in a hoarse voice. I call you ladies and gentlemen, but you know what you are. She raised her thumb and goosed the smoky blur. The audience screamed. Listen, you two over there in the marijuana section. She pointed to a couple in a booth. They remained silent. The man frowned, but Dusty went on. Lay your hair down. Have fun. What the hell did he come in the joint for, anyway? A prayer meeting? Y'all under suspicion, anyway. You know that, don't you? You might as well have fun. Enjoy yourself. She shrugged with a grin. I'm having fun. I want everyone to have fun. 
You know why? I'll let you in on a secret, ladies and gentlemen. I just fell in love. Everyone giggled. Really, I did. It's the first time it's happened to me. Today, that is. Another roll of laughter filled the room. Last night, I slept in the arms of the cutest sailor you ever saw. But tonight, girls, to hell with the Navy, because I've got a doll. Brace yourself, kids. You know what I've got for tonight. No, what? rang through the crowd. Tonight, I've got a real honest-to-God Texan. And you all know what they all say about those cute little old Texans, don't you? She held out her hands about twenty inches apart. And I'm not dreaming, either, girls. Everyone started clapping and loud laughs floated to the ceiling. Almost apologetically, Dusty, after tossing the handkerchief in the air, stated, "'Course, I'm not going to tell you all who he is, all the rest of you bats. I said the rest might beat this working girl's time.' She paused and looked around the blurred faces. She spotted a bald-headed man seated with a group of other men. His hands were in his pockets, and he was getting a big kick out of her. "'You, dear,' she cried at him. "'Take your hands out of your pockets. Don't you know you'll go crazy playing with yourself?' You can go home with me for five bucks. I've got five bucks, he shot back at her. Honey, you're too damn anxious. You look like a Jenny woman. I'm scared of you. I'm harmless, he laughed. That's what I mean. I used to keep my hands in my pockets all the time when I wore pants. Now look at me. If you don't be careful, you'll end up like me. And you wouldn't want that, would you? Yeah, several shouted. Damn, the competition is terrific tonight. I think Dusty's wonderful, don't you, Paul? Gaylord grinned softly, and Paul came back with a, Yeah, wonderful. Dusty continued, I wish my husband Jasper was here tonight. But the bastard left me, told me someone was going to give him a trip around the world. A high falsetto voice screamed with delight. What's the matter, dear? Sit on a feather or something? Or are you a traveler, too? She paused, fingering the piece of silk. I took a trip around the world once. I said once, girls. I really had a marvelous time. London, Rome, Venice. But you know, kids, I got the large news for you. I was blue in Paris. She paused for the laughter to die down. She waved her handkerchief at Gaylord and Paul. Enough of this carrying's on. I'd like to belch out a little number. But before I do, I want every one of you faggots to stick your fingers in your ears. I said, ears, Mary. She screamed at a boy who had just placed his hand on the leg of another boy. Another round of applause. This little hymn is going to be for only one person. It's high class, and you bitches won't know what the hell I'm singing about, so why in the hell don't all of you leave? The joint's hot anyway. Did you know we're expecting a raid? She giggled. Someone yelled, Who in the hell cares, Dusty? I hope I'm put in the same cell with you. I can't see you from the sound of your pipes. I know you're alive. Then to the crowd. As long as they're alive is my motto, girls. Of course, sometimes you find some walking around that should be buried. Or Dusty. Okay, baby, give the old broad a little time. How about, you always hurt the one you love? Or, who put the sand in the Vaseline? A voice shouted, or... Or, laughed Dusty. Take the dice away from the baby before he craps on the floor. Or, or, she was only a woodman's daughter, but you should have seen her rest hole. Or, she was a wrestler's daughter, but you should have seen her box. Or, or hell. Too many oars in the house tonight. Sounds like all the oars from Basin Street are here tonight. More giggles and applause. Or, or who lit the fuse on Mrs. Murphy's tampax? Or, 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 they shouted. Dusty laughed, a throaty laugh. Now, as I said before, I've got this cute trick from Texas here in the audience. And he asked me to do a number for him. Please be very quiet while I get in the mood. As if I'm ever out of it. She giggled and wiggled. Of course, you all know I'm going to try to make the kid tonight, don't you? She paused, then, don't explain it to her, Daddy. Show her what I mean, she cried to a boy and girl who were holding their sides, their faces beaming with laughter. How does she think of all those things to say, grinned Gaylord to Paul. I don't know. It goes on like this all night. Dusty turned to a pale-faced boy seated at the piano. How about some real sexy music, Camille, to get me in the mood? He smiled back at her and ran his fingers over the keyboard, playing A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody. I'm not going to a parade, number Clarissa. I'm trying to make the kid, remember? With both hands, she ran them over her breasts. Pretty, aren't they? For fifteen cents, I'll tell you where you can buy a pair just like them. 
Again, the crowd laughed. Show sure feels sexy tonight. You're the same damn way, Mary. She pointed to a fat man seated with a pretty young boy about the age of Gaylord. What the hell are you laughing about? Heads turned and glanced the direction of her eyes. Everybody laughed, even Gaylord. Enough of this bitching, Dusty said. I'm pooped. I've been evil long enough, haven't I? No, cried a girl. Dusty smiled. Anyway, I hope I haven't offended anyone. Everything was said in the spirit of fun. You'd probably throw me out on my can if I acted like the real lady I am. She paused for the applause. Thanks. Thanks for being such fun to talk to. And now I'd like to get a bit serious. The laughing ceased almost instantly. Thanks, she said, then clearing her throat again went on. I'd like to sing, with your permission, a favorite song of mine for a very nice boy. He's visiting here in New Orleans, and I hope he enjoys the song and his stay in our beautiful wicked city. She turned to the boy at the piano. Okay, Joe. Hit it pretty, honey. Joe ran his fingers over the ivory keys. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 About five blocks from the bar where Paul had taken Gaylord was the apartment of Jean Limbeau. It was in the heart of the old French Quarter, nestled there close to the cathedral and whitewashed cafes. He too had lived life's gallantries and its despairs, its varying tides, its random collisions, and its shifting incidental terrains. But here, amid the blend of many races, French, Creole, Negro, and Irish, he had found his place to live and grow old. Jean Limbeau was half French and half Jewish. He was short, and his moon-faced countenance was as plump as a stomach. His skin was fair and hairless. His womanly eyes were encrusted with deep crow's feet, and his lips were very thick. He didn't look his forty-five years, even though his brown hair was quite gray around the temples. He wore a pair of nile-green lounging pajamas, and around his expanding waist was a long gold cord with tassels almost touching the carpet. He was alone in the bathroom, curling his short eyelashes with a lash curler when the phone rang. At the sound, he threw his hand against his flabby chest and shrieked, Ah! Oh, as if frightened. Coming, Mary! He sang out loud. Going to the phone, he drew in his stomach. God! He cried, getting fat. And with disgust, he felt the roll of flesh around his waist, picked up the receiver. Common speaking, he sputtered in a high voice. Oh, Paul, it's you. How are you, darling? I was just making myself beautiful for you. Oh, you have. You're lucky. Bring him along. Maybe just my type, he giggled. Oh, you do, huh? Here, I thought you loved me. He smirked a silly laugh. You're a dear. I knew I could get a little compliment out of you if I tried hard enough. Where are you? That's marvelous. He turned the large ring on his little finger. Darling, you come right over and bring your friend. I'll light a candle and stick it in the window for you. Another cry of giggles. Stick it where? Now, honey, you know me better than that. Strictly a French artist, that's me, he cried with delight, like a flustered old maid who had just been pinched on the cheek for the first time. All right, baby, you all come right on over. I'll be waiting. Bye now. He hung up the phone and hurried back to the bathroom, humming in a high falsetto voice. Standing in front of the purple door, Gaylord touched Paul's arm. Are you sure it's all right? He whispered. I'm sure, and if I'm any judge, you'll like Jean. Paul smiled and knocked. The door opened slightly. Jean cried, Paul, and flung it open. Come on in. I'm so glad you two are here. There's no one here yet. We can sit and dish. I haven't seen you in centuries, he smiled at Gaylord. I'm glad you could come too. Jean, this is Gay, Paul said warmly. So glad Paul brought you, Gay. Come on in, you two. They went inside, and Jean asked, Do you live here in New Orleans? No, ma'am, he grinned shyly. I... I live in Texas. Texas, huh? Jean grinned and looked at Paul and said, Come on in. I don't know what in the hell we're standing here for. Sit down and I'll fix us a drink. Gaylord didn't look at Jean, though he knew he was still looking at him. He stared around the room. Shadows fell and moved across the furniture as the candles flickered slightly. The room was large and full of antiques. Marble-topped tables covered with hand-drawn doilies dominated the French chairs and the arms of a worn divan. On each end of the divan was a marble-topped commode, 
They were low and each graced a tall silver candelabra. Eighteen-inch candles stood erect and majestically in their sockets, their flickering glow falling on a marble fireplace and an elaborate goldly framed mirror with two cherubs on top center. The walls were lined with paintings, some good, some bad. All were nudes. From the center of the high ceiling, a crystal chandelier glistened, not from its own light, but from the flickering lights of the many candles. It was all beautiful to Gaylord. He had a confused impression of flowing silks, glittering jewels, scepters, and other symbols of royalty, of exquisite flowers lavishly adorning the tabletops of fine porcelain. Then, as he stood hesitantly, Jean said again, Sit down, you two. Get comfy. Take your clothes off if you want to. What do you want to drink? Your mother's got scotch, gin, or bourbon. We've been drinking bourbon, Jean, said Paul. They sat on the divan. What or a Coke? Jean asked. Both with Coke, replied Paul. It was only a few minutes until he was back in the room carrying three ruby tumblers. Here you are. One for you, Paul. Gay. And one for the old madam. Whew, he said on a chair. I'm pooped. Came home from work and had to clean the apartment. You've got a beautiful place, Gaylord said. Like it? Jean was slumped on one of the pillows, breathing heavily. It's a mess, but thanks for saying so anyway. I worked until quite late, then came home and cleaned up this whore's nest. That black bitch Gertie promised she'd clean this afternoon. Didn't show up, though. Just like a damn nigger. He caught his breath. So, honey, your mother's been working like mad ever since she came home from the office. You've some lovely antiques, grinned Gaylord, admiring a French table. Just a pile of junk. Now, Jean, you know you love ever peace in here, spoke of Paul. Guess I do at that. Then he burst out. Love ever peace I've had here, too. Jean and Paul laughed. Gaylord didn't understand, but he followed suit. Thank God he felt a little better than he did in the club. He was afraid he was going to be sick, but the night air and the walk had done miracles. Where in the hell have you been, Paul? I haven't seen you for weeks. No place. Been home nearly every evening. Didn't feel up to pa. But I've called you practically every day. Yes, I know you did, but I still want you to come by, Jean said seriously. I was so upset when I heard what Arnold did. Let's forget about Arnold, Jean, Paul almost whispered. Then, looking at Gaylord, he winked. How's the drink? Better than those at the club, Paul laughed said. They sure are. He took out a cigarette, lighted it, and handed it to Gaylord. Then he drew out another and smoked contemplatively. He seemed to be considering something. He shot Gaylord a glance or two and then asked rather suddenly, Do you like me? A little? I like you a whole lot, Paul. He took a puff on his cigarette and blew the smoke out through his mouth. Jean began blabbing about getting too fat and Gaylord sat watching his two new friends. He almost giggled when he thought of Jean calling himself their mother. It sounded funny coming from the fat little man in green pajamas. There were so many things that had been said that he didn't understand. Their phrases were so strange. Still, in this museum setting, he felt relaxed. A little dizzy, perhaps, but at ease. How long are you going to be at New Orleans, honey? Jean asked. Until Monday, I think. I'm not sure when Dad is going to leave. You and Paul come by them off cocktails. That is, if you don't have anything else planned. I'm going to show Gay the town tomorrow. Would you like to come along? Paul asked. Your mother had better stay here. I'll probably be up all night. You know how these parties are. But if you're around tomorrow afternoon, come on up. There's always a drink around. We might do that, thanks. Paul turned to Gaylord. Didn't I tell you this old dear was a peach, Gay? Please, he shrieked. I don't mind the deer, honey, but don't ever say old to your mother. Gene tossed his head back. Moisturizing a finger between his lips, he ran over each eyebrow. Gaylord remembered he had done the same thing many times. I'm not old, honey. Just been used a lot. Here, let me fix us another drink before... The doorbell screamed. Too late. The faggots are here. He grinned and walked to the door and opened it. Entrevoy, screamed Gene at those in the hall. Looking back at Gaylord, he said with a chuckle, Isn't my French lovely, honey? Gaylord laughed and looked at Paul, who moved toward him at the same time. Mother, darling, how lovely you look, shrieked a feminine voice, but it belonged to a young boy who had just entered the room. He glided over to Jean, who was holding out his hand majestically. 
Cleo, baby, come kiss your mother. God, do I have to? Listen, bitch, kiss me and shut up. Oh, well, Cleo kissed Jean's fat cheek. Don't put yourself out, whore. Okay, mother, we've made an impression. Now I'll kiss you the way I should. He gave Jean a loud smack on the lips. Mmm, laughed Jean. That's better. Come here, girl. You know Paul, and this is gay. Hi, Paul. Where in the hell have you been? In jail? I haven't seen you in months, he cried, going over and shaking his hand. He came to Gaylord and held out his hand. Well, Miss Limbo, where did you find this handsome lover? He patted Gaylord's extended hand. I'm sorry for you, laughed Jean. I wish Gay was mine, honey, but he belongs to Paul. No wonder you've been in hiding. If I had your honey, I'd keep you locked up. A cunning frown circled the light green eyes. Live here? No, stuttered Gaylord. Cleo smiled at him and went over to Paul, sat on the arm of the divan. I've missed seeing you around, baby. What happened to that awful Arnold? I couldn't stand, huh? Jean spoke quickly. We're not going to talk about the past this evening, so you keep your big mouth shut, Theodore. Theodore, she calls me. Cleo looked at Gaylord. You know, honey, my real name is Theodore. Isn't that butch? It's too much for me. It's too much for anyone, laughed Jean. Well, then, why don't you forget it? It shuts that big mouth of yours. Come on over here and I'll fix you a drink. I want to grope you anyway. Come on, Theodore. Again, she says it, laughed Cleo. All right, whore. You mean my profession shows that plain? I'm an expensive whore, though, Miss Limbo. Got any scotch? Sure, I've got some scotch, and here's a penny, too. It's more than you've ever gotten for that snatch of yours, cried Jean, twisting the ring on his little finger. Can't get ahead of that girl, Cleo grinned at Gaylord. She knows all the answers. She should, though. He's old enough. Cleo took out a cigarette, lighted it, and walked over toward Jean. I wish I had some quick poison to put in that drink, Paul. Wouldn't bother a bit. Did you say scotch, honey? Jean asked. Yes, girl, you know me. Love that scotch. You would, bitch. Jean snickered as he mixed the drink. First class, all the way, or nothing. Nothing, huh? And Jean burst out in a loud laugh. It was the first masculine laugh he had uttered. Are they mad at each other? Gaylord whispered to Paul. Lord, no. They go on like this all the time. Oh, very good friends. You'd never believe it to hear them talk. How do you feel, Gay? Paul asked, touching the other's thigh. Think I'm getting dizzy again. Don't let me get drunk, Paul. I won't. His hand lingered on Gaylord's leg. Will you get me back to the hotel? Sure. Don't worry. Have fun. A loud knock on the door almost made Gene drop the glass he was holding. Mercy, he cried. These manly faggots are driving me crazy. He wobbled to the door, and Gaylord noticed, for the first time, he wore golden sandals. What's going on in here? questioned a deep, masculine voice from the hall. We're just having a mad daisy chain, officer, laughed Jean. You wouldn't arrest a girl for having a little fun, would you? He looked back into the room, into the half-frightened faces of Cleo and Paul. Then he laughed with delight, crying, don't look so death-like, girls. I'm only fooling. Come on in, kids, before Miss Cleo has a miscarriage. Three youths of about the same age walked into the room. Cleo walked up to them. Tom, you wicked doll, scam me half to death. I thought you were Tilly Law. Going to the smallest of the three boys, he said, Jerry, how gay you look in that blonde switch. It's lighter than it was, isn't it? No, it's the same shade it's been for months, replied Jerry. After a faint embrace, Cleo's hand slipped from the tiny waist of Jerry and grabbed the hand of the third boy. He was very masculine, very handsome, and the muscles of his body showed plainly beneath the thin shirt. The expression on his chiseled face was one of keen interest as he looked at Gaylord. Claude, you handsome darling, Cleo cried at him. You in that deep voice, he laughed, patting Claude's large bony hand. How are you, Cleo? Claude said in his deep grave voice at the same time giving the hand a tight squeeze. Damn, not so tight, squealed Cleo. I'm a frail girl, remember? Hello, Paul, they all three greeted. Hi, kids, grinned Paul. He moved a little on the divan. Paul then introduced them to Gaylord. 
They shook hands, and Jean mixed them all a drink. It wasn't long before they occupied the large red pillows scattered on the floor. All were laughing and talking at the same time. Claude put down the magazine he had been looking at and walked over toward Gaylord, said to him, Having fun? I'm having fun. Jean always has such good parties. Makes everyone feel so much at home. I love to come here. He took a drink from the glass he held and sat on one of the pillows close to Gaylord's feet. Gaylord stared idly at him. He looked at Jean, but preferred the scene below. Looking at Claude seemed to put him closer to life than looking at Jean. He looked at Paul, who was talking to Cleo, and then back again below. Jean's got a nice place here. He sure does. Do you live here? Here? I mean New Orleans. No, I live in Texas. Paul brought me here. Oh, I'm glad he did. I am too. I don't know anyone here in New Orleans. You do now. Gay? It was Paul. How's your drink? Half full. I don't think I better drink any more. I'll take care of you. Have fun. Paul pressed himself closely against him. What have you been doing, Claude? Nothing, Claude answered. Same old one and two. Several more men entered the room, and then some more, until the room was quite filled with the shrill voices, heavy scented perfumes, long fingernails, painted faces, plucked eyebrows, swishing hips, and cigarette smoke hanging between the laughing, chattering, drinking, moving figures. Claude, how about playing the piano, huh? asked Paul. Do you play? questioned Gaylord. He looked down at the youth on the red pillow at his feet, looked down into the pair of eyes that were staring back. A little. Claude said, still gazing into Gaylord's eyes, his hands gently caressing Gaylord's ankle. Would you like me to play? he asked, his fingers digging deep into the soft skin. I'd love to hear you play. Your wish is my command. He didn't even look at Paul, but kept his gaze on Gaylord. What do you like? Anything. Claude arose and went to the piano. He ran his long fingers over the ivory keys. The room suddenly became quiet. He began to play Wagner's music then Chopin. He played beautifully and seemed to live the music. He closed his eyes, as did some of the others. Nothing but the strains of Chopin could be heard in the room. Paul drew Gaylord closer to him and pressed his arm firmly around his waist. Gaylord didn't think it would be polite to separate himself from him, so he remained still. He didn't want to hurt his feelings. He hardly knew what to do, but he didn't mind. The music was so lovely, so loving. Jean sat dreaming of the past on the arm of a chair, stroking the blonde-headed Jerry. Others squatted on the large red pillows, their hands stealing over the nearest figure, feeling groping in the candle-lighted room, searching for hidden secrets, treasures. Gaylord didn't look into the face so close to his, but he felt the warm breath on his neck. He knew without looking that it was Paul's breath. It was as if they were obeying unspoken orders. Now there was nothing to do except the one thing that was in both their minds. He felt a stiffness within him when his lips almost met the others, a little shudder when a strange hand began to run up his leg under his trousers. He didn't want Paul to kiss him, but what could he do? A loud knock on the door broke the silent spell the music had brought to the noisy room. Paul sat up and Claude stopped playing and walked over and sat at Gaylord's feet again. Another knock. Jean, the door, someone said. Come on in, dear, the shrill cry of Jean came from the dock corner. I'm busy with a guest, he shouted, still fingering the blonde-haired boy, the other hand on the boy's lap. The blonde boy cried, Jean, you're running up a bill? Got some money? Commercial money. Everybody wants money, he laughed, then shouted again. Come on in, the door's not locked. An elderly man came in accompanied by a youth, said, You're a hell of a hostess, Jean. Mary, get you. When did you ever come to the door for me? Never. Stop acting like a queen, then, and come on in and get yourself a drink. All right, the man said. Hi, everybody. Hi. Everything's on the bar, darling. Help yourself. The man, followed by the young boy, went to the bar. Suddenly everyone was talking again. A buzzing came from everywhere. Someone turned on the radio. Girls, when Claude plays, I get so carried away. I just could cut my wrists. Here then. Ah, take away that razor. Mary, you don't have any blood left in those veins anyway. Nothing but gin. Someone asked, Honey, get this actress a drink, will you? 
Get it yourself, scandal girl. I'm busy. Well, I said to her, I said, Mary, if you think I'm going to go to bed with a sister of mine, you're out of your mind. Well, honey, I was so upset with that faggot. Imagine me with a sissy bitch like her. She knows I go for truck drivers. When we came into the room, they were having a mad 69 party. So, honey, I got undressed and carried on. It was simply wild. There's a new glory hole over in the bus station, and it's grand. You can get the best-looking things there. Why, I had four in no time. I met the cutest Marine there. He just got in from Korea, and was he loaded? I wanted to keep him, but he had to leave. I go out of my mind just thinking about him. I met another one later, but he wasn't so hot. That place is red hot, Mary. You better change your cruising grounds. Is it? I didn't think it was. Mary, that's the hottest place in town. My God. And it's such a gay place. Are you sure? Certainly I'm sure. The Vice Squad practically lives there. Bunch of bastards. They hang around there like a bunch of vultures. You know Jill, that big red-faced bitch. She has a face like a wet sponge. He smacked his lips. I can't stand her. She's such an evil thing. Anyway, she was with some sailor. Cute too, honey. And big. He held his hands out about ten inches apart and heaved a big sigh. She introduced him to me. I took him home with me and he's been back for curtain calls. Well, the vice squad got Jill. She's been in jail over a month. She don't care. Says she has a mad time in jails. She's been in I don't know how many times. Used to have a cop. Cute thing. But got tired of her. Think they had a fuss over a cab driver. She's really a mess, but damn, she certainly can get the cute things. I don't know how she does it with that face. But she drags home some dreams. I can't do that. That's one thing I simply can't do, and that's cruise. Probably scared of you. You look so tall and talk so manly. Remember the first time I cruised you? They both screamed wildly. I thought you were a piece of rough trade when I asked you for a match. And when you said, Do you want the time to, Heloise? I almost dropped my plate. Girl, as soon as you opened that sissy mouth of yours, I had your number, he said, holding his sides and doubling over with laughter. They both took a big swallow of the bourbon that almost ran over the rim of the glass they were holding. Dance for us, Gilda, someone yelled out. Yes, Claude, I mean Gilda, to your number, baby, echoed in the smoke-filled room. All right, if you insist, Claude laughed, rising from the pillow. That bitch would do her number even if she wasn't asked. I don't know how she's kept still this long. I think she's in heat for Paul's friend, whispered one to the other. I don't have to think so. She's almost got a heart on now. Look. Claude adjusted his trousers. He bent down, almost kissing Gaylord's lips, whispered, This is going to be for you. Gaylord did not answer. He only smiled and gave Paul a quick glance. Claude was very nice, but he sure was a fast worker. He didn't like the expression in the eyes, but he couldn't help it. Put gate on, Jean, Claude said, looking at Jean, who was changing the records on the radio combination. Honey, your mother knows your number. I've already got it, Jean cried, holding up the 12-inch disc. Everyone giggled and clapped their hands. As the music began, Claude, standing in a posed position, kicked off his shoes. Take off your clothes, Claude, a shout rang out. Show those beautiful muscles, screamed another. Okay, he grinned. You ask for it. Claude walked gracefully to the middle of the room, his hands held high above his head. Bringing them down, he began to unbutton the thin sports shirt he was wearing. Lovely, someone yelled with exultation as the shirt opened, showing a smooth and masculine chest covered with a layer of curly black hair. Someone blew out a candle after he had requested it. Another went out, then another, and another until the room was quite dark. With willowy movements, he pulled his shirt from his shoulders held it a moment and then let it fall. He ran his hands over his spasmatic chest, circling the upper body with restless gestures, a hand flying up as if to reach the smoke-covered ceiling, then coming down quickly it rested for a second on the buckle of his belt. The other moving arm slid slowly down, helping the other unfasten the narrow strip of leather that circled his slender waist. With a swift jerk, he yanked out the belt, throwing it wildly in the air. He danced around the center of the room, shaking his body, trying to rid it of the heavy burden that shadowed it. Then he stopped. His hands went down quickly to his trousers. Unfastening them, they fell to his feet. With two steps, he was out of them. Now he moved like a ballet dancer. Tenderly, he held out his hands as if he were waving a last goodbye to a lover he would never see again. 
His swaying figure looked beautiful in the soft candlelight. The muscles on his long legs were tense and quivering as he glided on his toes over the soft carpet. Maisie, look at that, whispered Cleo, watching the front of the white silk shorts. I wish that thing would fly out so I could take a good look. He'll take him off. Just be patient. He will? I've never seen him dance before. You've really missed something, dearie. Who does Claude live with? No one. He's a lone queen. He doesn't look like a queen. He's a manly thing, but queer as a snake. Someone else screamed. I can't stand the suspense any longer, Gilda. His hand feeling his own quivering flesh. Take off those shorts before I do. Claude moved and stood in front of Gaylord, his hips rotating and his hands swaying above his head, the bouncing in his shorts jumping up and down. With each bounce, Gaylord just knew he would see what was bouncing behind the thin silk. The thought of Blake came again, stronger than ever. For a moment, his heart beat wildly with anticipation. Then he shied from it, sank back into the sofa. Unfasten them, whispered Claude to him. Me? You, darling. In a trance, Gaylord obeyed. He didn't want to, and yet he reached out and unfastened them. His hands trembled, touching the warm, damp skin. His heart beat furiously as he glided the silk down over the hips, the quivering thighs. An arm from behind tried to draw him back, but it was not strong enough to pull him from the magic that held him. He wanted to free the legs of the flimsy material that held them captive, kept them shaking instead of dancing. There. He let go, and the silk fell to the floor. A strong arm drew him back to the divan, and he went back willing. He stared at the naked body in front of him. It pivoted slowly on its toes, showing the full cheeks of its buttocks, curved back, then again the rising chest, panting stomach. It moved gracefully closer to him. Closer, the tensely drawn legs came, thighs quivering, straining. Desire and fright both rose sharply in Gaylord. Paul didn't wait any longer. He grabbed Gaylord and kissed him long on the lips. A dark shadow blacked out the approaching artful figure, and Gaylord was glad. He closed his eyes, but it was still there. There in his mind, the naked body came closer and closer. Gay, whispered Paul. You don't mind, do you? Gaylord opened his eyes slightly. Paul was there in a blur. No, he said softly. No, Paul. The music stopped as suddenly as it had started. Claude ran from the room. Cleo sucked in his breath appreciatively as Claude's naked torso ran past him. His words were mumbled when he said, Honey, you're marvelous. Can I help you do something? You stay right where you are, whore, laughed Jean. He began to light the candles, looked at Paul and Gaylord, who were still in each other's arms. My God, get those two. Want to rent a bedroom? He giggled. Or you can have it for nothing if you let me watch. Paul grinned and straightened up, answered with a sheepish grin. Do we need those lights? He turned to Gaylord. I don't think we do. Do you, Gay? Gaylord shook his head and a smile filled his face. He ran his fingers through his hair, pushing back the waves. Claude yelled for his clothes and Jean took them to him. It wasn't too long before he and Jean came back into the room. Guess I'm not his type, snickered Jean. Darling, you were wonderful, a boy said to Paul as he passed. You got me so hot, I feel sorry for my husband tonight. Thanks, said Claude. He came up to Gaylord and again dropped to the pillow, looking up at him, asked, What do you think? Was I too awful? I think you were wonderful too, Gaylord answered. He couldn't resist the temptation in stroking the cheek. Claude smiled back at him triumphantly and caught the hand on his cheek. Just as long as you think so. Paul just sat there. From the gleam in that kid's eyes, I'm afraid Paul's going to sleep by himself, someone whispered to Cleo. They watched Claude. It was just a little too obvious a little snickering. That bitch, Cleo whispered. She's always after someone's trade. I wouldn't trust her with my dog. Can a folly's beauty come in? yelled a feminine voice from behind the front door. There followed several light knocks. Oh, Dusty, screamed Jean. He quickly went to the door and unsnapped the safety latch he had fastened when Claude had begun his dance. It's about time you got here, he said, opening the door. Come on in, girl. Dusty came in. My God, Jean, what have you got in here? The crown jewels? Dusty laughed, looking back at the safety latch. Afraid the law or well, some piece of rough trade might break in. Or have you got someone in here you don't want to let out? Dusty had on the same dress she wore in the club. You know how it is. A girl can't be too careful, Jean replied, snapping the latch again. 
Hey, kids, look who's here. Hi, everybody. Dusty laughed and waved her handkerchief at the crowd. They all yelled back at her. Then she turned back to Jean. Looks like a pansy patch in here. So many faggots. She grinned. I hope you don't mind me coming like I am. I didn't have time to change. Honey, right now I'm so drunk and excited. I wouldn't care if you came stock naked. Well, give me time. I took a cab from the club. Anyone else in drag? Dusty asked. No, I don't think so. There might be some naked bodies laying around, Jean laughed, throwing his arms about. Now that you've seen me, peasants, Dusty began in a deep bass voice. You can go back to the things you had your hands on before I came in. Who's going to get this bull dyke a drink? Or am I going to have to get it myself? She yelled. Gaylord looked at Dusty in amazement. The masculine voice was too much for him. Isn't Dusty a girl? he asked. No, did you think so? He's a female impersonator. Did you think he was a girl? I sure did. Dusty came toward him, holding a cigarette and a large glass in the same hand. Hello, Dusty, he grinned. Hello, darling. How's my dream lover getting along? Dusty asked. I see Dracula still has you in his bat-like trance, he looked down at Claude. For Christ's sake, what in the hell are you sweating about? Having hot flashes or something? Dusty ruffled up the sweating boy's short hair. Claude just danced for us. You should have seen him. He was wonderful. Honey, he's not sweating from the dance, Dusty laughed. Are you, Claude? This one starts sweating every time he sees a cute chicken. I've seen this one knock herself out before. He is good, real good. Move over, Paul. Let a lady sit down. You and Claude have had gay long enough. Go on, move over. Oh, you, Paul uttered. Don't you dare call me nasty names, Paul Boudreaux. Paul took his arm from around Gaylord and moved reluctantly. In a friendly voice, he warned, Keep your hands to yourself. Oh, hell, Mary. Dusty grinned, flopping down between Paul and Gaylord. Whew, I'm tired. He brought his glass to his mouth and took a deep drink, then a puff from a cigarette. Tastes good. Whew. What's the matter, Gay? Nothing. I thought you were a girl. Did you really? I am, darling, he said with a chuckle. Feel. He raised his large bosom so that one breast touched Gaylord's right arm. He laughed when Gaylord drew back. It won't bite, honey, only rubber, but it feels like the real stuff. Here, feel it. Gaylord giggled as he felt the protruding breasts. Sure does, doesn't it? He said with a grin. This boy knows all about us girls, Dusty said to Paul. You like girls, don't you, Gay? Certainly, don't you? His face turned a deep pink at the personal question. Well, they're all right to cook for or take dancing, but I'd rather have you in bed with me. Gaylord grinned again and was glad Claude asked. Gay, may I speak with you for a minute? Certainly. What? Privately. Gaylord was glad to leave for a moment. He said, All right. Don't be a slut, said Dusty to Claude as Gaylord got up from the divan. Look who's talking about being a slut, snapped Claude. Come on, Gay. And Claude led Gaylord from the room. They went into the bathroom and Claude turned the key in the door. What is it, Claude? Gaylord asked. Gay, he said, placing his arms around Gaylord's waist. What do you think of me? Gaylord looked at him puzzled. What do you mean, Claude? I think you're awfully nice and I like you. Will you come home with me? Let's leave. Claude spoke hurriedly. He pressed himself closely against him. Gaylord didn't mind. Claude was very nice and he didn't want to hurt his feelings. He didn't separate himself from him but remained still. Claude moved in closer. His body came to meet the others, and Gaylord felt a stiffness against his groin. He could feel it pressing hard and big against him as he took him into his arms. Their mouths met. Gaylord woke up. Don't, Claude, don't. He pushed away the hand that had groped his body. Sorry, Gay. I want you so badly, Claude whispered, kissing his ear. We'd better go. Look, whispered Claude glancing down at the front of his trousers. Gaylord didn't have to look. He knew without looking. That's your worry, sputtered Gaylord. Let's go. Don't leave me, cried Claude. I've got to, he said, unlocking the door. He stood there for a moment, turned back and kissed Claude, held him in his arms for one brief moment. I like you, Claude. I like you very much. But, he turned again and left. All eyes followed him when he re-entered the room and sat down beside Paul. They smiled at each other, but neither said a word. In fact, the whole room was dead silence. I'll sing you a number if someone will play for me, screamed Dusty, trying to break the tenseness. He walked over to the piano. Come on, Jean, play for me, whore. 
Claude came into the room. I'm in no condition to play, cried Jean. But Claude is. Play for Dusty, Claude. Claude tried to grin. All right. What's it going to be? Sing something, dirty honey. I'm feeling nasty and evil, screamed someone. Come on, Jenny Lind, start belching, cried a high voice. Okay, you faggots, be quiet. A golden throat is going to sing for you. He shook the long net skirt that fell over a slip of green satin. Taking the long handkerchief from under the jewel-studded belt, he waved it at the group. Everyone laughed again. Quiet, he bellowed, or I'll shove these tits right down your throats. Would that be bad? screamed another. Well, there are better things, cried Dusty. Paul looked at Gaylord. Are you all right, Gay? he asked. Yes, are you? I am now. Claude began to play a fast number, and Dusty screamed out words. Not the words written for the song, but his own version, which was quite different. Gay, let's go, let's go to my apartment, whispered Paul. I should go back to the hotel. Later, huh? But I want you to see my place. I'd like to see your place. Dusty's loud singing filled the room. His hand ran through Claude's hair, down over his shoulders. Claude laughed back at him his hands flying over the keyboard in a wild and reckless manner. Dusty was drunk, and the vile words poured forth, getting louder and more insulting. The sheer material in his hand was now nothing but long strips of silk which he still waved furiously. More high shrill voices, wild screams, followed by a grunt slap that came from the left corner. Then a scream. Get your damn hands off my husband, you bitch. Don't call me a bitch, you freak-looking old auntie, someone screamed back. The two were on each other screaming, biting, scratching, pulling hair, and cursing. More laughs and yells followed. Freak it up! Freak it up! Hit him! screamed Dusty. Let's go, Gaylord said to Paul in a frightened voice. All right, let's. They left quickly, without saying a word to anyone. End of Chapter 17 Chapter 18 It was late, and it was early. It had been only by great effort that Paul Boudreau had persuaded Gaylord Leclerc not to go directly to his hotel. Now, his heart pounding, Paul led the way up the dimly lighted, threadbare flight of stairs. Gaylord had no idea how far the cab had taken them. He tried to understand the significance of why he was here. He thought of his parents, his vacant hotel room. He looked at the kind eyes that had just turned. There was something very nice about them. Perhaps it was the dark hair the expressive mouth and quick smile. They all had a peculiar effect on him. He compared what he saw with the others they had just left. Paul was the most intelligent, the cleanest of them all. Can you see? Paul asked. Here, take my hand. Gaylord took the hand offered him. I'm all right, he answered. A little dizzy, though. They reached the second landing. The dilapidated state of the hall surprised him. The worn carpet had been patched from various rugs. The paint on the walls curled, and the ceiling was a design of brown water stains. Not even a straight chair was in sight. Only an old-fashioned floor lamp stood in the hall. A cluster of artificial flowers made from faded Georgette drooped and sagged on it. They looked decayed and tired, too tired to drop in the rusted wastebasket beneath them. Five doors in dark and dismal frames leaned against the right wall. At the second one from the left, they stopped. In the center of this dark and varnished door, something shone. Gaylord looked hard. It was a small brass plate, inscribed with the name Paul Boudreau. It gave the door an air of something personal, and he liked it. Here we are, Paul said, turning his key, then pushing the door open. Hope this spooky hall hasn't scared you. I'm not scared. Paul turned on the light, and Gaylord was again in the modern world, amidst blonde structures of wood and shiny metal. The light came from brassy lamps beneath clean house-spun fabric and was directed toward a shaggy carpet. My gosh, Paul, what a difference, he cried, aghast. Like it? It's like from a magazine, he absorbed the modern masculine room. Did you do this? No, I had it done. I'm afraid I'm not the artistic type. Want to see the rest of it? He smiled and patted Gaylord's waist. Come on, I'll fix you a drink first. You think you should? I don't want to pass out on you. Paul laughed, a throaty baritone. Just a little one. I want to fix you a real special one. Gaylord giggled. What? Surprise. Like surprises? Sure. Come on, then. With his hand still on Gaylord's waist, they strolled across the room to a mirrored niche. 
Gaylord sat on the cushioned stool in front of the rounded blonde counter. He had never seen so many bottles of liquor in a private home before. He grinned back at Paul, who was busy shaking a chrome cocktail shaker. What do you do, Paul? Gaylord asked innocently. I have a rich, a very rich aunt who thinks I'm terrific. He handed Gaylord a tumbler filled with frosted whiteness. In fact, she thinks I'm so terrific, she gave me this building along with four others. I don't know why. She was my mother's only sister, never married. She was a wonderful woman, so kind and thoughtful. She loved the gay crowd. Oh, I guess I'm sort of a cruel landlord. Taste your drink and see if you like it. Gaylord took a sip. It's good. Tastes like a milkshake. Paul laughed and stood beside him. You're cute, Gay. Awfully cute and sweet. He looked at the milk-stained lips, sparkling blue eyes. He put his hand under the chin and kissed away the stains. Now, come on before I get carried away. I'll show you the rest of the place. Paul clicked on the lights as they passed a blonde, flat-top table surrounded with four padded chairs onto a small but compact kitchen then to a panel den of books, pipes, and leather. Gaylord looked into the brown-walled bathroom. Paul, it's beautiful, he thought of the dingy hall and wondered about it. You haven't seen anything yet. Wait till you see the monstrosity that decorator put in the bedroom. The monstrosity turned out to be an oversized bed. It was covered with a white goat skin that touched the floor. Gaylord put his hand on his chest and uttered a sweet cry of amazement. Paul turned on a radio after he had snapped on another soft-shaded lamp. This is something, Gaylord grinned at him. May I sit on it? Walk on it, sit on it, lay on it. Do anything your little heart desires, Gay. It's all yours. Gaylord placed his empty glass on a nearby table and sat on the bed. Then he lay down on the fur and stretched. Soft music filled the room, flowed like bare arms embracing, nakedness and young mouths kissing. Gaylord listened, hearing it, hearing the voices and jazz bands intermixing from the streets. He remembered the Negroes, bare-chested and sweating, working on the lower Mississippi, the same ones he and his parents had passed. He forgot all about this as Paul came close. And now Paul had lifted his legs onto the softness and was sitting by his side looking down at him. Gaylord stretched his arms over the fur and felt it between his fingers. He looked into the brownish face and with a deep sigh, breathed. Gee, this is wonderful. Paul bent over him. Tired? He asked softly. A little. Want to undress and go to bed? Paul's voice trembled with the whisper. Here? He looked at his watch. Oh my gosh, it's 2.30. Mother will be worried sick. I promised I wouldn't stay out late. He started to get up. Stay a little longer. Paul whispered. He bent down and kissed him. Gaylord trembled and sank back onto the fur. I should go. I can't stay too long. Maybe they're asleep. Should we call? No, I don't think so. The two arms like dark columns pressed the sides of his waist. His own arms still stretched beyond them. Now he placed them on the columns. A faint smile played on his lips. A violent pounding hit within his chest. He felt no strangeness, no sense of contrast or of vanished time. And yet, I'll take you home. Don't worry, Paul murmured. I'm not worried. You're awfully sweet. The columns broke and went around his neck. A gear seemed to shift in his mind. He spoke hurriedly. You are too. His arms patted the shoulders over him. You are very nice, Paul. I had a wonderful time tonight. Thanks to you. He smiled, a childlike grin. That was some party, wasn't it? First time I've ever been to one like that. It is, Paul asked with surprise. Funny, Jean didn't have any girls there, isn't it? It all depends on the way you look at it. Paul grinned and patted Gaylord's cheeks. He saw him watching him with an odd expression. All those boys should have been girls, Gay. Nature just played a dirty trick on them. Funny? It is funny. Boys, it should have been girls, and girls, it should have been boys. His expression changed, became serious. Just a bunch of innocent sheep, that's what we are, trying to find happiness in our own little way. 
being whipped, cursed, and slaughtered by the noble ones who think that we are trying to corrupt their evil sexual selves, throwing young and innocent kids in jail unless they can pay off some Shasta lawyer, cop, or judge. They're the ones who should be locked up, those that bleed the young minds that fall in the dirty, filthy traps they set. Instead of helping, they destroy. He shook his head as if in great grief. Okay, the whole thing is a mess. It breathes of loathsomeness. He sighed deeply and looked tenderly into Gaylord's startled eyes. Be careful, my little gay. You're the kind they like to catch, the kind they like to take up to some damn doctor who's generally the biggest faggot of us all, and have him pump you with stupid questions, trying to make you all the time. Then he always wants to give shots. Shots. He wants to change you. God knows they can't. I've had them. Paul? What? What's a faggot? A faggot? You don't know what a faggot is? Their cheeks touched with a shuddering, continuous laugh. Paul gripped Gaylord tightly in his arms. I guess I'm just dumb. Oh, gay. I'm sorry. Here I've been talking like a condemned old man. I thought you knew all about, well, about faggots and gay life. You sound like you know what you're talking about. How old are you, Paul? I'm 27. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong. I get carried away sometimes, and I didn't want you to get mixed up with all this mess. I'm sure of one thing, though. I know what a faggot is. A faggot is the name one feminine boy calls another. Now, do you know what a faggot is? I think I do. Ah, uh, let's forget this serious stuff. I'm sorry I got so rattled. You know what a faggot is. You know how one works? No. I'll show you. How's that? Gaylord gazed at Paul. What could he say to that? Paul touched his hair, adjusting the wave on his head. Then he reached down and put his hands behind his neck, locking them there. Gay, he whispered. Is this the way a faggot works? Gaylord tried to grin. Paul gave him a quick kiss and sat up. Stinker, here I was trying to make love to you. Oh, I'm going to take this tie off. Do you mind? I don't mind. He watched the other untie the knitted silk and place it on a small end table. Watched him unbutton his shirt and throw it across the chair. I'm going to do a strip tease for you, too, Paul teased, fastening his pants. Claude's not the only one who can. And I'm doing it the hard way, without music. Gaylord watched, looked through the semi-nude physique. It was standing on the streets of the French Quarter amid the rows of spoiled bricks and flashing signs. It moved among feminine men who sat in smoke-filled clubs, among mannish women who sipped exotic drinks from skull-shaped goblets. It floated over the broadness of Canal Street. It glided down the miles of streetcar lines. Over the heads of blacks, yellows, and whites it flew. There, over the river, from the mist of the steamboat whistle, it became wet and came back to the sides of the fur-lined bed to get warm. It was no dream. It spoke to him. You've got to take these off, remember? Gaylord grinned and flushed. He looked from the face to the underwear the other was fingering. He remembered Claude's nude body, the way it looked. The mattress gave under him as he moved towards Paul. With shaking hands, he unfastened the shorts. There, he flushed. The underwear dropped slightly, showing the navel and a line of dark, wiry hair. He started to lay back down. Oh, no. You've got to pull them down, teased Paul. I do. You do, grinned Paul. Well, Gaylord leaned over again and drew down the underwear, while wave after wave of excitement went shuddering through him. He felt even dizzier than he had at the club, and his heart beat as though it would break through the cage of his ribs. Paul's body came clear and even closer. Gaylord tried not to breathe, to stifle the swallowing sound of his throat. The room rang out in a whisper. Don't be afraid of Paul. He likes you. He's your friend. Don't be afraid. Abide with us restless seekers of love, and we shall teach you. He listened to hear if the imagined call would continue, listened for the soft voice to tell him more, but it was gone. All the endeavors of his life seemed drawn into the blazing fulfillment of this moment. He asked himself if he was really here, 
if this was really happening. In his own experience, when something was about to happen to him, particularly anything rather unpleasant, he always had a vague sort of preview of what was coming. It was like a net in which he had been caught, but it was not unpleasant to be caught. In fact, he did not want to escape. There was joy in the captivity, and in it, all the freedom that his former life had never given him. Gaylord could only lay there baffled. He wanted to touch Paul's hair softly and tell him that it was all right. He wanted to put his arms around him and draw him close to him, but the idea still seemed preposterous. Paul's hands found Gaylord's face and moved over each ear, and then his head bent. Lips met his, and they were warm and loving. After a moment, they drew away. Gaylord fixed them with his gaze, taking their image to his brain to hold through the darkness he knew was coming. Faggot. He had received his answer to this question, and now what new mysteries were soon to unfold. Paul raised his hand, and with a magic touch, the light faded. The luminous naked figure darkened. Again, he felt lips on his, and the knot went from Gaylord's throat. He felt his shirt being opened and pulled from his trousers. Should he get up and fly from the room before it was too late? Fly from the hands feeling, groping? Again, his throat choked up, his legs tightened. He heard a voice and raised his body, obeying a command softly spoken. He filled his vision with Paul, drawing at his shirt, imagining the fingers fumbling around each button. Passion was tearing his limbs. The weight of a love mate was crushing him as he felt warm breath over his naked hard nipples. Visions of what was happening came as clear as reality with a million thoughts. He grabbed at the head on his chest. Don't, Paul, he panted. That tickles. In the darkness, he saw the burning eyes, felt the dripping lips on his again. Let's take these off, Paul whispered. And without waiting for an answer, he unbuckled the belt and pulled the zipper. He jerked at the trousers as if the eagerness of his love could not wait. Wait, breathed Gaylord, sinking deep into the fur. Let's don't. Please. Gaylord's eyes filled with fright as he looked up at Paul. But the expression on the darkened face he saw, so eloquently sincere and miserable, killed the other protest on his lips. He said humbly, Well, his mind could not sustain. He was afraid this was all wrong. But his whole life had been wrong. All the evenings of his life had been dyed in a cloak of morbid gray. The lost years ebbed with a waning voice in the cloak's creases, cuts where tears soaked its flimsy fabric. Yes, he had cried himself to sleep many times, but he had been fated to live after all, chosen for a task that called for more than ordinary strength. He and only he had stood on the rim of mysterious deeds and had had that deep vision, that passionate, wildlike dream. Gaylord knew what he wanted. He knew he would remember this night all his life. He held the hands on his trousers, and a nerve in his thigh began to jerk, and his body seemed out of control. His hands trembled so that he knew Paul would know he was afraid. He didn't want that. Somehow, this moment was longer than all the rest of his life together. Or rather, the forms had been subtly changed and hidden by a veil. Why are you trembling, Gay? Paul whispered. There seemed so much warmth and tenderness in his question. If you don't want to. I'm all right, uttered Gaylord, removing his hands, which were holding those on his trousers. You want to? I don't know. In the soft light, he saw Paul's face. He gave in to his emotions and pulled down at the base of Paul's neck, like one wishing to uproot a little tree without hurting it, pressed the lips down on his, reminding himself that this was an old friend or perhaps a long-lost lover he was about to kiss. When their lips parted, he began to tremble again. He clung to Paul as though for support. They embraced again, and his trembling increased. He seemed unable to control it. He might have been afraid. He felt the warm hands at his trousers again, and when a soft voice asked him to raise a little, he did as he was bid. A hammer seemed to be hitting the sides of his skull. He felt dizzy on feeling sticky fingers on his naked legs. He shut his eyes and opened them again when he heard his shoes hit the floor. 
He heard this, and because he was afraid of white shadows on the black ceiling, closed his eyes again. He pictured himself standing at the threshold of a door, about to lunge into the delirious festive rites. The ceremonial day that he had spent a lifetime preparing was at hand. A warm gush was covering his body, coming from a sky-reflecting pool. He saw white pillars and a shrine. He heard distant voices calling. The sound was muddled, appealing, with a note of sadness. He should have asked this gracious boy about time past. Surely he would know the answer to the riddle that had puzzled him for so long. He was happy to be here, glad that he had followed Paul's beckoning hand down the mystic river of life, back to the gates of time, the beginning of himself. Paul knew the answer. Later he would ask and learn. Gently and slowly his tumid shorts left his body, and in their place was a warmness, like scented spring water, dripping gently over him. His heart pounded, flamed as the drops passed over his tingling skin. Now, in the still of night, Gaylord Leclerc was carried on a magic carpet of ermine, over the dark earth, which had no boundaries in time and space, where lurked melodious and far-fetched names and elfin and perplexed peoples, and which was by itself only a name melodious and far-fetched. And lying there, he dreamed he was floating among twinkling stars, and as he passed them, they reached out and touched him, kissed his naked body with fevered kisses. He felt their soft caress move over his legs, linger on life-giving parts, growing moist and warm. He was helpless in their domain, and was half-blinded by the brilliant reflection that leaped from the shimmering sky. He wanted to lie forever on this soft magic fur, wanted to feel the kisses of his nakedness until time grew out, to dream he was part of them and still nothing. He was traveling fast now, shooting past comets, stars, and growing hotter and hotter. He should turn back, quick, quick. But he had gone too far. He was almost at the sun. He was scorching hot now, and their cool kisses had suddenly turned to steam. His carpet, his beautiful magic carpet, had suddenly burst in flames. And the stars sprang shrieking into flight, taking with them everything, draining him of his beautiful dream, tossing him back into reality. End of Chapter 18 Chapter 19 The careless slam of a downstairs door echoed dully in Gaylord's ear. He sat up abruptly and rubbed his eyes. What a shame, he thought, with unreasonable despair. I wonder what would have happened next. Darn, Dad, wish you wouldn't get up so early. And when he does, wish he'd be a little quiet. He had been dreaming the most wonderful dream. He looked at his watch, five minutes of seven, and sank back on the wrinkled pillow. He closed his eyes and tried to recapture the dream. But instead, Paul Boudreau repeated words and sentences. There are thousands like you, Gay. You're not the only one, my dear so don't let it upset you too much. This has been going on since the beginning of time and will probably continue for a long time to come, man-loving man and woman-loving woman. No, dear, you're not a freak of nature. Far from that. You're a sweet, flustered little boy, afraid to do the things that seem natural to you. But are we all just a little afraid? I know it's hard to feel free around a bunch of naked boys, but God knows I've felt the same way for years. I've gone through the same heartaches. We all do. Promise me one thing, one thing out of all I've said. Remember this. Whoever or whatever you love is beautiful. Well, love is beautiful. It depends on you, your words and actions, if it becomes ugly. Here in New Orleans, you grow smart young. You're not a virgin very long here, and that goes for me, too. I was brought out while very young. Would you believe it? I've never had sex with a woman. I tried once and ran home, left a laying naked in bed. I just couldn't do it. So, you see, if having sex with a woman makes a man out of you, you're more of a man than I will ever be. Try, Gay, to take things as they come. It's really the best way. If you want to have sex with a girl, have it. If it's Bob you want, well, all kids play with each other at least once in their life, so don't feel that you and Bob are the only ones. You haven't done anything that isn't being done right now in lots of places. You might find the right girl someday. I don't know. You may fall in love with a man. And it's a hard life if you do. It's not easy, Gay. Not easy at all. Were you shocked at me? 
Do you think I'm terrible? Could you do what I did? You don't think so. Well, I hope you don't. You're sort of bisexual now. That is, you don't know what you want. But I'm afraid, from what you've told me about Bob, that you're not going to be that way for long. Do what seems natural for you. It's too bad that mothers make the mistake in raising boys like you and thousands of others do the same thing. Sometimes, I believe if I would have been raised more like a boy instead of like a girl, I might have been different. Who knows? If you find you want to change, that you want to get married, talk to your family doctor. There are some good ones. The one I went to was very understanding. He told me frankly it all depended on myself, and that he was afraid even myself couldn't change my ways. Then I went to another. He gave me those shots. All they did was make me hotter than ever, and not for women either. Still, they may work for others. I doubt it. He sure was a quack, and there are lots of them. The last time I went to him, he tried to make me. I asked him if he had taken the shots. He said, hell no, I'm satisfied the way I am. I never went back to him. You heard Gene mention Arnold. We lived together for over a year, happy too. I thought a lot of him. I don't think a married couple could have been any happier. Then he started drinking more than he could hold, and I couldn't take it. He started running around. One day I came home and found a note he had left with another boy. Said he was in love this time for sure. Funny, huh? It wasn't funny to me. I was absolutely lost. Miserable. Three weeks later, he came back and wanted to start all over again. But the love I had for him was gone. I couldn't see him. And still, deep in my heart, I wanted him so bad. I've just gotten over that. I still think about him, but when I found out he was using dope, I was through. I've done things I'm not too proud of, but some things I'll never do. I'll forget him, for he made our love ugly, repulsive. There's bound to be someone else, I keep telling myself. Someone who'll give me a clean companionship. Sure, I could love you, Gay. Who couldn't love you? You're the sweetest boy I've ever met. And you all's from Texas. Maybe I'd better go to Texas for a while, huh? You'll write to me, won't you? I want you to. Don't let this be a one-night affair. It isn't to me. I want to be your friend, Gay. If you have troubles and would like to tell them to me, I'll do my best to help you. Write them to me. And be careful who you go out with. I should give you this advice, shouldn't I? But see, I could have been nasty. I could have been a plainclothesman. I could have hurt you. You could have hurt me, too. We both took a chance. Don't take too many chances. Be careful who you go out with. Who you give your love to. For whoever or whatever you love, love is beautiful. Remember that. Between the white sheets, Gaylord propped his legs. With his eyes still closed, he repeated the words just heard. Whoever or whatever you love is beautiful. Bob. The name lingered after he opened his eyes. Bob, he thought, and his flesh tingled. I'm going to see Bob today. I can be with Bob. An hour later, a tired but happy Gaylord walked lazily into his schoolroom. He sat at his desk, watching Joy walk up the aisle her hips softly moving. It was the first time he had seen her since that afternoon. Hello, Gay, she said simply. Hello, Joy, he blushed, remembering that afternoon. She walked past and sat at her desk. He wanted to say something nice, but his throat felt tongue-tied. Glenn Rogers appeared and broke the tenseness. Hi, Gay. Have a nice trip? Sure did, Glenn. When did you get back? Last night. Miss Gray tapped her pencil on the desk. Glenn, she said, you and Gaylord refrain from talking while in this room. Yes, ma'am, sputtered Glenn. Gaylord was silent, but some girl behind giggled. He was glad it was joy. A sound of high heels tapped past the door only to be broken by the sudden clanging of the school bell. There was a mad scramble of books and legs. Gaylord looked at Joy as she passed, but she only smiled. She's mad, he thought and I don't blame her. Glenn Rogers came up to him. His face beamed with joy and excitement. How was the trip? You gotta tell me all about it. Joy was forgotten, as New Orleans came back into his mind. Jean Limbo's apartment, the large divan, the smoke-filled air, the pasty faces, Claude's naked body, Paul's. Wonderful, Glenn. I had a wonderful time. 
I wish you could have been along. I wish I could have, too. They strolled down the corridor. Gaylord was saying, I don't know where to begin. What did you do? Gaylord thought a moment. Well, for one thing, I went to a party. And what a party. It was mad. He wasn't sure if he had used the word correctly, but he had heard someone at Jean's use the expression. Mad? Who was mad? Everybody. Sounds goofy to me. Gaylord laughed. It was that, too. Crazy. That's the only word I could think of. Mad. I almost got drunk. You did? Uh-huh. Did you meet any cute gals at the party? Dusty, Gaylord thought, and said, I met one. She was something you'd never meet here. Pretty? Gosh, yes, Gaylord squared his shoulders. I say she was pretty. She was a Lulu. Sweet, too. Uh, did you go out with her? Rogers grinned and tossed the damp hair from his forehead. Gaylord laughed in a series of chuckles. Oh, Glenn. Tell me, Gay. Glenn Rogers, stop cracking your knuckles. I'll tell you. She was okay. Fun. What else happened? Did you go to the cathedral? Yeah, Sunday. Gosh, it was beautiful, Gaylord sighed. Then we went on down Royal Street, looked in all the shops, went to the cemeteries, down to the Mississippi and looked at the boats. Oh, we just went everywhere. He stopped, noticing a glistening head of hair coming toward them. The face was blurred with another in front of it. It's Bob, he thought, and his blood beat rapidly. Here comes Bob. He had called Blake this morning around 7.30, but his mother had informed him he had left. Going down the hall, he had been watching for him. He saw the face and his spirits dropped. Hi, okay. Gay. The glistening-haired boy smiled. Hi, Ramon. He smiled, but his heart wasn't in it. Well, here's where I stop, Rogers said with disgust. Darn geometry, and I don't know that problem this morning either. Putting a hand on Gaylord's shoulder, he added a couple of slaps and said softly, Missed you yesterday, Gay. Thanks for saying so. I mean it. I missed you too. See you at lunch? Glenn asked. Yeah, I'll see you. Bye. He continued down the hall alone. Hi, sissy, a dissipated dirty face cried. Gaylord turned red, his mouth tightened, then his lips twisted in a sneering smile. You dumb, ugly faced baboon. He didn't care if he had been heard. He lengthened his steps. Well, I'll be goddamned, thought the boy, scratching his head. He watched Gaylord's graceful stride, uttered again. Well, I'll be damned. Class in the gymnasium was hard and tiring. It smelled of sweat and dirty feet. He tried not to breathe the vile air as he sprung up and down, up and down. His body ached. He must breathe. His hands flew over his head, together, apart, wide apart, together, one, two, three, four, and over again. Eddie's yelled the gym teacher. Gaylord stood there, panting, sweat covering his forehead. The teacher went right on yelling. Keep them wide apart, fellas. Hey, you on the end. Stretch those things you call arms a little more. Touch those ceiling beams. At least try to. What's the matter with you? Got a corn cob up your ass or something? Spread out those legs farther. They stood there with their hands on their hips, taking the nasty words. They were mostly boys. Fifteen. 16, 17, 18, and 19 years old. Gaylord stood looking at his classmates, his face wet. Darn, he knew his hair was a mess. He looked at the boy next to him. He had a flat nose and pimples, big pimples with yellow centers. He turned away quickly and rubbed his nose. Okay, cried the instructor. Let's do this like men and not like a bunch of lovesick girls. Come on now. One, two, three, four. Muscles thought Gaylord. I've got to have big muscles. I've got to be strong. I've got to be able to protect myself. I've got to be strong. Strong. I've got to be like Bob. Bob. Arms went out everywhere, reaching, filling the musty air. Gaylord's, with Blake's name on his lips, reached even higher, stretched greedily for the beam so high above him. Good, LeClaire. That's good. Keep it up, cried the instructor. After a shower, Gaylord walked back to his locker. He walked over the wet floor at a normal pace. Hi, Jack, he said, 
slapping a naked buttock belonging to a boy bending over a stool tying his shoe hi oh hello gay a surprised look spread over his face it was the first time gaylord leclerc had ever done anything like that gaylord walked on he looked to the door that led outside the gym then back again at the laughing talking rustling boys he reached his locker opened it and took out his underwear he paused thought should i take off this towel right now like the rest of them do should i stand here naked the way they do he decided he would and took the towel from around his waist he laid his underwear on the bench sat there naked and dried his feet he turned his lowered head and squinted around the room to the others has that red-headed bastard gone someone asked yeah another voice answered thank god damn i'm dying for a cigarette give me one gaylord watched him puff and inhale the smoke a fat naked kid of fifteen passed him hi gay gaylord returned the same greeting and slipped his dried feet into his socks he felt strong hands on his shoulders and then a slight whack how's my buddy gaylord knew instantly whom the voice belonged to he dropped the shoe from his hand and reached for the towel which he placed over his naked lap said oh bob hi i'm fine how's new orleans wonderful simply wonderful how have you been bob blake smiled okay then he whispered missed you though he put his foot on the bench there's no place like it he grinned and shook his head no sir no place i learned a hell of a lot in new orleans yeah it's some town did you have fun he lit a cigarette wish i could have gone with you i wish you could have too he answered an enigmatic look in his eyes what had blake done in new orleans had he gone to a party too the same kind he had attended what people had he met the same kind he had did you happen to meet a paul boudreau when you were there bob paul boudreau no i don't think so he scratched his head i don't know too many people there didn't meet too many either does he play football no what does he look like like you like me blake put a finger on his fresh laundered shirt he reminded me of you gillard said slipping his legs through his underwear fastening them he got up and drew his trousers from the locker and put them on bob he said may i have a cigarette blake unconsciously handed him the lighted cigarette he was smoking said he reminded you of me his eyes danced between the dark eyelashes huh he paused he did did he what did you and this guy do huh gaylord did not answer he puffed the cigarette and coughed suddenly he was busy dressing come on confess blake grinned what did you do they're watching us gaylord answered softly ah oh, to hell with them what did you do what do you think we did that's what i'm asking they grinned at each other and then gaylord asked what did you do over the weekend oh you want to change the subject huh i think we'd better don't you i don't see why i just ask a simple question a simple question yeah a simple question not that simple to me bob it isn't no it isn't blake took his foot off the bench and lit another cigarette said what do you mean nothing wrong is there gay his wide grin tightened then relaxed and smoke came from between his lips he put his other foot on the bench no said gaylord there's nothing wrong i just found out about about what about myself blake's eyes were tender and his voice soft about yourself yes gaylord looked at him his eyes amorous and moistened what else did you do shot back blake with a quick smile i think i know why Shh. Here comes some of the fellows, he whispered. Yeah, he said real loud. That New Orleans is some hot town. Who knows, Gay? You might have screwed the same whore I did. He laughed and slapped Gaylord's shoulder. Hi, Pop. Gay? One of the boys said. Hi, they both answered together. The boys looked back with a curious look. Gaylord LeClaire screwing a whore. Ha, huh. that was a laugh. Bob busts me nuts why did he hang around with that sissy for still bob was like that nice to everybody gaylord had finished dressing 
I've got to go, Bob. Yeah, so do I. How about lunch? No, I can't. I've got to pick up mother. How about tonight? Can I come by? You know you can. About 7.30? Anytime. I'll be home, breathed Gaylord. He wished he could have added, waiting for you. See you tonight, then. Tonight. He left it suspended. He would know that the word meant an eternity. Blake patted his arm. Probably at seven. I'll be there right after supper. Bye, Gay. He turned and left. Gaylord's very soul seemed to follow the swaying strides. All life, all time had gone from him and mixed themselves among the glistening air. He had become lifeless, and the arms that closed his locker door were bloodless pieces of flesh, and the legs that now moved were its continuation of floating veins. Tuesday afternoon, a soft rain began to fall. It was still raining when Gaylord pulled his car to the wet curb in front of Roger's home. Thanks for the lift, Gay. Roger smiled. Won't you come in for a while? No, I guess I'd better get home. And you're more than welcome. Wish it wasn't so nasty, cried Rogers. Looking at the clean-cut face, Gaylord asked. Why, Glenn? Rain makes me lonesome, Rogers squirmed in his seat. I hate to sit in the house. Then, with a wide grin, Say, how about a show? Can I take you to a show after supper? I can't tonight. I've... Some other night, huh? Rogers dropped his head, and Gaylord knew he was disappointed. Yeah, he said, and tried to force a smile. Some other time. They were silent and awkward sitting so close to each other. Gaylord apologized. I wish I could go tonight. That's okay. The dimples deepened. Thanks for the lift. He slapped Gaylord's leg and opened the car door. I'll come by for you in the morning. Same time? Rogers nodded. The rain splattered across his face. He waved and ran for the house. Gaylord drove away. Here was his house now. He turned the car into the water-soaked driveway. The shrubbery looked fresh and strong, and the house looked retired behind it as though withdrawing from the busy street. He left his car under the carport and went inside. The house was cool and empty. He went to his room. On his dresser was a large sheet of white paper, his mother's handwriting on it. Under the paper was a gray envelope. It had a special delivery stamp on it and was postmarked New Orleans. Paul, he cried breathlessly. He read his mother's note hurriedly. Gay, dear, I am at the beauty shop if you want me. Love, mother. Then he tore open the gray envelope. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 My dear Gay, I have just hung up the phone, and after hearing your voice again, maybe for the last time, I feel morbid and sad. It was so good to hear you again, and I know I talked too long, but I just couldn't hang up. You were probably busy packing for your return trip to Cotton, even though you said you had nothing to do. Now that I've hung up the receiver, I feel like crying. Yes, just plain bawling. Already tears are hard to keep off this paper before me. My hand is shaking, and you'll probably have a hard time reading this letter. Here I am, a grown man. Supposed to be. Crying like a baby. I don't know why. Yes, I do too. I'm afraid I won't see you again. Right now, while I'm writing, I'm tempted to call you. To tell you that I already miss you. Just to know that all I have to do is dial your hotel, and I'll hear your voice again is too much. Forgive me, Gay but I must talk to you again. I can't even think. Words don't seem to come to this troubled and mixed brain that I'm supposed to have in my stupid head. I must call you. I will. Now that I've talked to you again, I feel better. Or do I? Thanks for saying you'll miss me, for I'll miss you in so many ways. I know it's sudden to say such things, but life is sudden. Short. Things happen so quickly, maybe one should say the things he wants to instead of keeping them inside. You must know how I feel. Saturday night was wonderful, and I hope that all of my talking didn't scare you. Sunday was wonderful, too. I'm glad that I was able to show you and your parents the town. So glad it was me, not someone else. I guess by now you've left the hotel. Remember, you told me you were just leaving. You didn't lie to me, did you, Gay? You were ready to leave, or did you just want to get rid of me? My mind is full of doubt. No, you didn't lie. 
Forgive me, but I just had to call, and they told me you had just checked out. Forgive me, but I just had to. I've been lied to so much the past eight years that it's hard to believe people anymore. I hope that we never lie to each other. Don't ever lie to me, Gay. Please, don't ever lie to me. I'll never lie to you. You don't lie to those you love. Did I bore you with my past Saturday night? You're the only one who knows the way I felt toward Arnold. Gene thinks he does, but he couldn't. He's too giddy to believe in real love. Still, we never know what lies behind the thoughts of the giddy ones, do we? I just made a cup of coffee, and I'm using the same cup you used. Just to know you held it makes me tingle all over. Silly, perhaps, but nice. I shall never forget you. You will come back after school. You did mean it when you said you would spend a week with me. Here I am in doubt again. Doubting. Guess that's my name right now. I hope your mother and father liked me. I thought they were grand. Your mother is charming, and I hope your father didn't read my mind when he thanked me for being so nice to you. He's so good-looking. You look like him, and yet you look like your mother, too. Thank them for asking me to visit you. Maybe I will someday. It would be nice to see your house, your town, to be around the things belonging to you. Oh, gay. It would be so easy to be nice to you the rest of my life. Spoil and pet you. Love you. The next days and weeks are going to be awfully long without you. I just glanced at this messed up bed and could see you on it, kicking and laughing as I undressed you. I had no idea you were so innocent. And when you asked me what a faggot was, I almost choked. You seemed so willing to do everything. I thought you had had affairs before. I don't mean just playing like you and Bob did. Every boy has done that. I used to, and before I was brought out, it was fun. But that was long ago. Looking back, I can see that you were innocent, and I should have known it. That party must have startled you, seeing and talking to all those gay boys. I wish I would have known at the time, but I was so jealous of Claude shoving his naked bod almost in your face. I wasn't thinking of innocent things. Especially when he took you in the bathroom. I was wondering what you two were doing, and I almost got up and knocked on the door. Those few minutes you were gone seemed years. I could have clawed his eyes out. I was startled when you called me Bob, afraid you were waiting for someone. I just knew you were gay. I wondered about Bob then, and I do now. Bob, I'm afraid I don't like him. Right now I hate him. Hate him enough to fight for you, and I don't even know him. But he has held you in his arms, and maybe right now you two are together. He must be gay himself, or have a tendency toward it. They say normal men don't kiss other men. Like hell they don't. They do worse than that. I've known some so-called normal men that would put a bell to shame by some of the things they want to do. Normal. What's normal and what's abnormal? Isn't it merely a point of view? I ask myself. I'm sorry about what I said about Bob. Again, I say I'm sorry, but I'm jealous of him. It's a miserable feeling. A feeling that I have no right to feel, but I do, gay. And I guess it's there, and I can't do a thing about it. I was looking for love when you came along, gay. You were it, but you're in love. I wonder if Bob loves you. Has he told you he does? Do you love him? Here again, I'm selfish and hoping you don't. I have a date tonight with Greg Brassard. I think I mentioned him to you. He's a very nice kid, but I don't know now. Now that you came into my life, I'm sort of planning for it to continue. Right now, I'm afraid I'd be bad company for anyone except you. This letter is probably all jumbled, but my mind is the same way, still in the clouds where you left it. Write me real soon. I can hardly wait until I hear from you. It has just started raining. I hope it doesn't make your trip home unpleasant. For me, it is perfect. For today, I don't want to see the sun. Greg just called, and I told him I couldn't see him tonight. A headache is always a good excuse, isn't it? Tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow things will straighten out. Who knows? Remember the old saying? Absence makes the heart restless? Or something like that. Please destroy this letter as soon as you finish it. Don't even read it over. Please don't. Just tear it up. I keep wanting to tell you I miss you and love you. 
wondering, too, if I said too many strange things to you that Saturday night. Wondering what you really think of me. Wondering. Wondering. So many things. Wondering about your Bob. Come back to me soon. Real soon. I can't help loving you. P.S. Thank your parents for a lovely dinner Sunday and give them my kindest regards. P. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 The rain hid on the metal top of Blake's car, parked alongside a dark gravelled country road, and a dim light inside silhouetted two heads. One pressed against the glass of the car door, the other bent forward as if in deep thought. Gaylord watched breathless as Blake read the letter, watched him devour Paul's words on the slips of gray paper. Not once did he glance at Gaylord or even speak. Gaylord looked through the wet glass, out into the night through the driving rain. There was nothing anywhere to be seen. His hands lay nervously in his lap and his head ached dully, both from fatigue and from his efforts to keep from wondering. It would not do to wish he had destroyed the letter. It was too late to even think of such a thing. Paul had told him to destroy it. Why hadn't he? Tear up this letter. Don't even read it again. He remembered every word. There seemed to be bands of iron wrapped around his heart, welded there by some unknown power, and though he burst asunder, he could not escape. He was aware after a time that Blake had finished the letter and was looking at him, the letter still in his hand. Stiffly, he turned and tried to smile. Blake unfolded the letter and began searching. After turning several pages, he stopped and read out loud. I wonder if you really love Bob. He stopped and looked up. Do you, Gay? Do you love him? He read the letter without looking at it. Gaylord experienced an emotion of complete bewilderment. He remembered how pleasant it had been to explore with Blake those things he had always dreamed of, remembered how youthful and eager he had seemed. But now something had swept all of that beauty away, leaving only a more bewildering life and a crushing sense of intolerable shame made his shoulders sag. Why am I so confused? Gaylord wanted to scream. Do you? Blake whispered. He dropped the letter on the seat and turned out the light. Do you, Gay? He asked again. Oh, Bob! Gaylord cried and flung himself into the arms that went around him. He tried to recall just what he had planned to say after Blake had finished, but he couldn't. He reached up and touched the bronze face, shoved back the glistening wisp of hair from the broad forehead. His whole body was one big ache, and the pain inside of his head was fierce, like a tornado. His lips came apart, but he said nothing. At that moment, there was nothing to be said. Well, Blake whispered. Oh, Bob, I... He cried. Don't answer now if you don't want to. Go on. Go on and cry. Get it out of your system. Oh, but I do love you, Gaylord was thinking. That's the trouble. It's not right. I don't want to be like those I saw in New Orleans. I want to, and I don't. I don't know what to do. Our loves. Oh, it'll never last. Because, Blake broke in on his thoughts. Guess this Paul is some fellow. Sure can write a letter. I don't like to write. Blake reached for the other's chin. Feel better? I guess you think I'm an awful baby, Gaylord choked. I don't know what's the matter with me. There's nothing wrong with you, and you know I don't think you're an awful baby. Bob? Huh? Do you think I'm a... a queer? I wouldn't call you a queer. What would you call me? Gaylord heard himself asking. A faggot? With this, Blake smiled. He began chuckling, and then uncontrollable laughter shook his entire body. Gaylord looked at him. He found himself waiting for the next move, braced and eager because he didn't know what words would follow. He was half frightened and half angry. Whether because of his own words or Blake's actions, he could not tell. Now, as he waited for the answer to his question, he couldn't tell if Blake was laughing at him or at the question, or whether what he was feeling was not something akin to sarcasm. You're some pistol. Blake grinned and, pulling up the tear-streaked face, kissed the lips. And if I'd called you a faggot, I'd add pretty right in front of it. He paused a second. No, I wouldn't, he went on. I'd add beautiful. 
Gaylord felt the masculine arms around him. They felt both good and bad. Oh, Bob, what are we going to do? Should I tell you? He made a move. No, no, not that. Why not? Because. Because why? He made another move, and Gaylord drew away his hand from where Blake had placed it. Do you like me a little? Just a little bit, Bob? Sure, my beautiful little faggot. I like you a whole lot. Don't this prove it? Again, he put Gaylord's hand on his lap. He was a faggot. In Blake's eyes, he was exactly that. What was Blake? What would Blake think if he had called him a faggot? He wouldn't like it. Neither did he. You don't love me, do you? Let's don't say we love each other yet, gay. Why? Because... And for an instant, there was only the noise of the rain beating down on the car. There had been a look of repression in Blake's eyes, grotesque and something more. What? What was it? Gaylord knew with finality that he was caught up in Blake, bound to him by some strange power, to sit waiting always for his next move, to obey his command, to withdraw, only to come back again at his call. He would do anything Blake wanted. He was as common as the worst he had met in New Orleans. There was no escape from the blind drive toward a destiny of ruthless years, and they would be ruthless, cruel, jealousy at every corner. Paul had told him that, and he had eyes. He could see. Bob, what do you think of me? Am I wrong? You do like me, don't you? Blake laughed a throaty, hoarse sound. Of course, Gay. The sound indulged Gaylord. It continued. A hell of a lot. Do you love someone else? No. Come on, Gay. Let's... He squeezed Gaylord's hand. You go out with so many. You... What about all the rest of the guys you've been to bed with? Blake's voice had changed and now became questioning. A tremble ran through Gaylord's body. The rest, Bob? He asked, plucking at Blake's pants. The rest? Who else? What about Paul? He loves you. So he says. Gaylord had forgotten that. Yes, Paul did say he loved him. He had said other things, too. I told him about so many strange things about homosexual life, his life, for wasn't he one too? Paul's clear eyes were before him. The same far-off look that had penetrated them when he had said goodbye was still there. Sad eyes. Sad because in this world they had nothing they could claim. Perhaps love for one night or a week, maybe a month, but not for always. They only saw things possessed by others, and Blake had the same look. It was all too complicated. But who did Blake mean when he said the rest? There had only been Paul, no one else. His mind was muddled, confused. Everything was mocking him. I told you about Paul, Bob. I even let you read his letter, thinking it would bring us closer together. But when you say the rest, who do you mean? Oh, tell me. I've got to know. Forget it. Don't be so serious. Life's too short. I didn't mean that. Let's have some fun. Come on. Gaylord felt the strong arms embrace him again, and he allowed Blake to take his hand and lead it. He felt Blake's hard, warm flesh. It shot an electric current through him. He tried to free his hand, but Blake held firm. He couldn't. Not tonight. Tonight it would be kind of blasphemy to make love in the presence of his thoughts. He didn't want to be that way now. He wanted something more than only a few moments. He remembered his feelings toward Paul after it was all over. Somewhere in his mind, slow black clouds appeared. A bed, a long, dismal hall leading to a dark, varnished door. A shiny nameplate, a voice that sounded like the one who had just spoken, said, Never lie to me. Never lie to me. I'll never lie to you. Never, never, never lie. The word lie dug deep in his brain. Well, Blake had lied. He had meant it when he had said, the rest, but now he wanted to forget it because he was anxious for love. Love for one night. One night and then what? Lies and one night stands. All through life he must endure it. Even Blake was like that. He only wanted sex. He didn't love anyone. There's never been a rest. 
never been anyone but you and Paul, he muttered quickly and turned his face toward Blake. I didn't do anything. I swear I didn't. Hell, gay, I know you didn't. I don't know why I said it. Let's forget it. Come on. We're wasting time, and I can't go on like this forever. How could he say such a thing? And why had he been such a fool to allow himself to become involved in Blake? But he had been involved all his life with lies and names. Terrible names. He saw the sorrowful faces in the dimly lighted bar he had gone to in New Orleans. Pale faces without blood. Faces full with lines of pain, grief, and underneath artificial laughter, heartaches. It was so plain to him now. He didn't want to become one of them, and he wasn't going to either. His face wasn't going to become shallow, puffy, circled. His life wasn't going to be one continuous long search. He hated anyone who was going to try to make it so. What about Blake? He wanted exactly that, and he didn't love him. He only wanted release. Only wanted him for one thing, and before long he himself would become one of those unhappy creatures. One who would cast him aside after his carnal greed was fulfilled. There was something tearing and wild inside him, some need to attack and fight back. Tearing his hand from Blake's groin, he screamed, Let go of my hand, Bob. But Blake didn't let go. Instead, he held tighter. You can't back out now. Come on, you beautiful. Let go, Gaylord cut in. He stiffened his back and jerked himself. But the hand was too powerful. Let go of my hand, he cried again. Gay, what the hell's wrong? Damn! he said in a shocked tone. What in the devil did I do? Then he grinned and tightened his grip. Want to fight me for it, baby? You lied to me, Bob. So I'm a liar. You still love me, don't you? He tried again to soothe him. I can't love a liar. And this was the man he loved. Yes, he was the one, Robert Blake, a heathenish and wicked name for a man of the same nature. And to top all this, he was a liar. Gaylord beat at the strong chest and tried to free his one arm. You'll never get me to do that again, or say I love you. I hate you. Hate you. Hate you. You damn liar. Now, Gay, this is too much. You are acting like a baby. You know I wouldn't lie to you. Say you know I wouldn't lie to you, Blake said, still holding his grip. I'm not going to let you loose until you say it. Come on, say it. Blake held fast to the struggling boy. He was still grinning and wondering why this had happened. Come on, honey, let's don't fight. You know how I feel towards you. No, I don't know. I know I hate you. You, you damn faggot, Gaylord moaned. Me, laughed Blake. Yes, you. Gaylord didn't hesitate, but let his hand fall with all its strength across Blake's cheek. The sharp slap echoed in the glass enclosure. There, now are you going to let me go? Why, you... Blake grabbed the hysterical boy and shook him hard. Now look. He said, this has gone far enough. What the hell's wrong? Let me go, screamed Gaylord. Sit down here and let me talk to you, Blake demanded. You can't boss me around like you do everybody else. I don't want to talk to you. He shouted through tears and let go with another whip-like flash across Blake's cheek. Blake released his grip. He looked as if he had seen a two-headed giant. Gaylord sprang for the door. Damn you, come back here, Blake shouted. You're not getting out of here that easy. Blake grabbed and dragged the sobbing boy back. There, he said, letting his hand fall on Gaylord's cheek with lightning force. How do you like it? Gaylord uttered a shrill cry of pain and tried for the door again. Go on, Blake laughed out loud. Go on, get out of here. I won't try to hold you. He pushed Gaylord closer to the open door. If you want to go, go. You're damn right I'm going. Gaylord sobbed and slammed the door after him. And don't come back, cried Blake. There was only slush, ankle deep and with biting rocks ahead of him now. There were only the rain gusts stinging his eyelids, only the cold ache in his fingers and the death ache in his heart. He was running, crying, stumbling down the rough water-filled ruts of the gravel road. I hate him, he sobbed, knowing he didn't at all. I hate everything. I wish I were dead. And he was sincere. He heard dimly the muffled voice of Blake calling, swearing. It came through the darkness, pistol shot clear. He ran on, looking neither to the right or the left, while the rain clung to his hair and flattened his shirt and trousers. He ran faster, and as he ran, his lips moved in prayer. 
a strange rhapsodic prayer of his own invention. Oh, God, everything's over. Finished now. Take back this life you gave me. Do not ask me to go on living. I can't bear it anymore. You could have made me different. Why didn't you? Why did you make me fall in love with Blake? But no. You let me love him, knowing all the time it was all wrong. And now I've lost him. He's gone. Gone forever. And there's nothing left to live for. Strike me dead. Lightning come down and rid me of this anguish, this torture. He stumbled hurriedly on, tears mingling with raindrops on his cheeks. He did not see the trees he passed. He was unaware of the rocks. He plunged on through the driving rain, his head bent, hearing old words in his heart. You do remind me of Venus. I wouldn't hurt you. And again, Blake's bass rumble. And I hope you have a lousy meal. Come on. Love me. His heart was breaking. He tried to push the dripping hair from his eyes. It was raining as if the whole heavens had opened up and the rain was the tears of millions of angels who understood and were sorry for him. Sorry they could not help him find his way. He was tired and his legs heavy. He had passed over the rocks and was now on a bridge. Its loose planks tore at him savagely, worrying his legs. He picked up needles of slush and flung them blindingly around his feet. It caught at his shoes and snatched at his trousers so that his head reeled dizzily and he was aware that he was scared, lost, lost in a downpour of cold glass arrows. The terror became panic, cutting and overpowering. There were moments when he thought he could hear Blake running after him, calling in a rich, deep voice for him to come back. But that too could not be, for Blake had left by now and he was alone. Instead of slowing down, he ran faster, over the rocks and puddles, into the blackness he staggered past weird sounds reaching out trying to stop him, clutching and grabbing. He moaned because he was breathless, because even though he wanted to die, he was afraid of death, afraid of drowning in that endless crevice beneath the loose planks. Gay! Gay! Wait! He heard the voice, and it was God sent. It rang in his ears, and he wanted to wait, but the nothingness in front urged him on. He glanced back, and in doing so, collapsed. He did not try to rise, but lay in the dirty slush, his head against his hands that touched rough gravel beneath him. Oh, if the slush were only deeper, why doesn't it cover me completely, he cried inside, and all this misery of forever running away. Gay, cried Blake, his big hands tearing the soaked body from the guttered road. Sobbing, he sat down in the shallows and cradled Gaylord's head and shoulders across his knees and in his arms. He pushed back the hair still bound around the forehead and drew him close as if trying to protect him from the driving rain. Bob, oh Bob, I'm here, Blake cried and kissed the quivering lips. Your Bob's here. Don't cry, darling. I love you so much, Bob, so much. Gaylord's hands drew Blake closer. I don't know why I did this. I don't, really. It's my fault, Blake drew him closer. I'm a fool. I'm the fool. Is it your fault? Come on, Gay. Let's get you to the car. You're shaking like a leaf. Please forgive me. There's nothing for me to forgive. But you know I do if you say so. Blake got up heavily and drew Gaylord up, stood with his arms around the shaking boy. He was held by the thing that he could not name. It had held him from the first meeting in the gymnasium. The sense of mystery and emotion and desire in this boy. I do love him he thought. You clumsy fool, you do love him. Are you all right now? he asked. I'm all right. Awfully tired and weak, Gaylord confessed. I'm so sorry. And after a moment, he said, I'm all right now. He did feel better with his arms around him. His hands came up slowly and clenched themselves upon Blake's soaked shoulders. Oh, Bob, he sobbed and lay his head on the heaving chest. They stood there and stared blindly into each other's face, their separate breathing coming quick and jerky. Above, the flashes of lightning and the distant thunder shook about them in the glistening night. Let's go to the car, Gay, Blake repeated. You're cold. You're shaking like a leaf. Before Gaylord moved, he said, Will you please forgive me? Blake kissed him. You know I'd forgive you anything. Come on, let's go to the car. All right. Gaylord panted breathlessly. 
The black outline of the woods dropped behind them, and with it the gutted ruts of the road. Gaylord realized with little amazement that they were already at the car. Why, they had just walked such a short distance, and only a moment ago the road had seemed so long, so full of miles of rough rocks and dirty holes. They stopped at the car, and Blake embraced him again. I'm sorry, Gay. I'm sorry I'm such a bullheaded bastard. You're not bullheaded. He reached up for the kiss. No, you're not. You're everything to me. Inside the car, Blake said, Come on, Gay. Take those wet clothes off. He grabbed a blanket from the back seat. Here, wrap yourself in this. The dark air was cool, almost frosty. Gaylord felt a breathe along his wet body. The sweet scent of brilliantine and bronze loam came up into his nostrils like something new and undiscovered. Somehow, he was not surprised when Blake unbuttoned his clothes and wrapped the blanket around his naked body. Blake's hands then went around the blanket, making him even warmer. They held him tightly, roughly. But what about you, Bob? You're soaked too. Why don't you take off your clothes and get in here too? I'm all right. You get warm. Blake's big hand began to soothe Gaylord. He looked at him and grinned. Don't think it would be safe, do you? I don't care. Come on. I'd better not. I'm all right. Feel better? Gaylord said he did, and nestled close. His sobs were low, and the quivering had almost stopped. He felt warm there inside the sticky wool, the wool so close to Blake's own wet side. Dark eyes looked down at him from under dripping hair that crossed his forehead. Gaylord tenderly smoothed it back with his hand. There was nothing that could diminish the kindness of those eyes, nothing that could take the gentleness from them. And then Blake grinned, and Gaylord grinned back at him. Blake said in a whisper, I didn't know you were such a little hellcat. He rubbed his nose against the others. I didn't either. Feel better now? I'm fine. Gaylord answered softly, scuffling his legs together in the blanket. I'm worried about you. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. His mouth came down upon Gaylord's again in a protective manner. I'd better get you home and put you to bed. I'd better put my clothes on then, said Gaylord, unwrapping the blanket. Oh, no. Blake pulled the blanket together again. You wear that home. You can run in with it on. No one will see you. Those wet clothes will give you a hell of a cold if you put them back on. Suppose mother and dad are up. What could I tell them? It wouldn't be any different than you going in with your wet clothes. I don't guess it would. Do you think they'll be up? They might be. Well, Blake thought hard. Well, we could say, what? We could say we had a flat. Guess we could. Gaylord straightened up and began to put his disheveled hair into place. His clothes, he thought ruefully, are going to look a sight after wallowing in the road. And my hair, it must look awful. I must look awful. Don't forget now, we had a flat. Gaylord heard the sound of the motor start and the car moved. Then the hand returned around his shoulders and drew him close. Linked thus, they drove down the soaked road leisurely and in silence. They met no one and there was no sound but the ring of the motor, the swashing of water and the falling rain. As they crossed the bridge, Blake broke the silence. Are you all right, Gay? Fine. Only... Only what? I'm so ashamed of the way I acted. Ashamed? I'm not. You know, honey, Blake grinned rubbing his cheek. You've got a wallop I didn't know you had. So have you, Gaylord grinned back and ran his own hand over his cheek. Now I'm ashamed. Blake frowned, and the dark, handsome face stared broodingly down at him. Forgive me? I forgive you. The dark outline of the trees cast deep shadows over the narrow road. The rain splattered quick and sharp on the windshield. The wipers, scratching crosswise across the glass, made a moaning sound going to and fro, trying to free the speckled crystal of the many stars that tried to rest on it. Gaylord sat at Blake's side, and his hand gently caressed the leg that moved up and down, up and down, giving life to the humming motor. A dirty splash of red muddy water arose before them. Gaylord jumped, but the glass protected him. The wipers worked madly, wiping the dirty windshield, clearing the view before him, Again, there was a splash of melted rust. Again, the thin blades of the rubber scratched hurriedly. His eyes followed the lake-like road. The bumps, 
holes like the narrow bumpy street he had seen somewhere. Somewhere. Where? Where? Where had he seen all this before? In memory, he closed his eyes, heard a cab screaming to a stop, saw a man staggering, a horn, bumps, rough. Sure, that was it. The two drunks and a cab. That too had frightened him and made him catch his breath. Bob, he said softly. Yeah? What did you do in New Orleans? Gaylord asked in a whisper. Do you really want to know? Uh huh. I met a dame. What kind? A drunken whore. Was she pretty? So so. Did she have carrot hair? Have what? Was her hair sort of orange color? I don't remember. I only know I couldn't get away from her quick enough, Blake uttered in disgust. Why? Guess I wasn't her type. She, uh, made fun of me. Of you? Yes, of me. It's easy to make fun of someone, Blake said in an echo. I'd never make fun of you, Bob. I'd rather die first. His fingers dug into the wet trousers, down into the drawn flesh. He remembered the many times he had been hurt, hurt by the remarks that had been said in fun. Blake had been hurt, too. He understood how it felt, how it made you want to go hide, hide from the ones who said them to you. Anyone could say things, anyone. Among people, you were always in danger. You passed when you were alone or among trees. Yes, among trees you were safe, but around people, you weren't. I know you wouldn't make fun of me without you telling me so gay, but there are some that get a big kick out of saying things that hurt a fellow. I don't know what anyone would say about you. Oh, it wasn't really anything. Seems kind of silly now. Guess my ego was cut short. Want to tell me about it? If you want to listen, I'd love to listen. I met this gal in a bar, Blake began, recalling the action very vividly. He saw the girl again, small, cute, carrot hair. I was drinking at the bar, and I felt her leg rub up against mine. I didn't mind. She was young and looked like she was out for a good time. Well, I bought her a couple of drinks. We got loaded. Then she asked me if I was as big and strong as I looked, and I told her she'd have to find out. Then she handed me more of that line of hers about me being her type and that she'd just love that big wide chest over her. So you went home with her? Yes, I went home with her. You should have seen her apartment. Damn, what a dirty hole she lived in. I didn't care too much. I was so loaded I didn't care what kind of dive she lived in. She stripped and got on the bed, laid there naked and watched me, her old tits sticking straight up. She did have a cute shape. When I pulled off my shorts, she started giggling. I didn't know what she was laughing about until I got on her. Large drops of sweat formed on Blake's forehead. He was hot inside his wet clothes. Inside, he was furious. A flaming hate arose within him and glowed in his eyes. Gaylord saw the look, but remained silent. He felt the sudden jerks in his legs and trembled. Finally, he said, Don't tell me any more, Bob. I don't want to hear any more. I want to tell you. Blake answered petulantly. You wanted to hear, so I'm going to tell you. And you're the only one I've ever told this to. All right, if you want to tell me. I got on her and asked her to spread her legs. She laughed again and told me to stick that little thing of mine up her nose, that it would probably fit there better. Then she laughed that damn laugh again. I slapped her right on the mouth, got up and dressed and left. She was still laughing when I slammed the door cussing like a sailor, too. I walked out of there sober as a judge. Gillard raised and kissed him. She must have been drunk. To say a thing like that? You're not that little. He stopped, grinned, and blushed. I'm not big, Blake grinned. I love you, Bob. I love you for what you are. Because you're Bob. That's why. Silly, isn't it? For something like that to be in your craw for years? Never forgot that. I'm glad you told me. Confession is good sometimes. Then I went to another bar and started getting good and drunk. A real pretty boy, he looked something like you, Gay, only smaller, asked me for a match. I knew what he wanted by the way he said it. You mean you've known about? Sure, honey. When I was 14, some old man went down on me. Oh, Bob, that's awful. No, it wasn't, Blake grinned. I've always looked older than I am. Well... To get back to this kid at the bar, he asked me if I wanted to go home with him. 
You know what I did? No. I took his hand like this. He grabbed Gaylord's hand and laid it like this. I said, feel, feel good and hard. It's not big. You guys like big ones. Do you still want me to go home with you? Blake uttered a chuckle. Okay, you want me to stop the car? Why? Feel anything rising? Gaylord jerked his hand away. I wasn't even. I'm only kidding. Keep your hand there. Feels good. I'd better not. What happened? Did you go home with him? Yeah. You should have seen the expression in his eyes. I'll never forget it. He said, I don't care if you don't have anything in your pants. I'm just lonesome. Okay. He was lonesome. He really meant it. Did you go home with him? Yes, I went home with him. He had the nicest place. I stayed all night with him. Darn, he was a swell fellow. What happened? Same thing that happened to you and Paul. Oh. Love was never mentioned, though. He brought me coffee in bed the next morning. I got a big kick out of it. I think of him real often and wonder whatever happened to him. Don't know whatever happened to him. We wrote to each other, but then I stopped. What was his name? Gene, um... For a moment, Gaylord's heart was in his throat. Was Blake going to say Gene Limbeau? That short little fat man that had given the party? Gene Baxter. I almost forgot his last name. He lived on Royal. He looked at Gaylord to ask, What's wrong? I thought you were going to say Gene Limbeau. Who's that? He's the one who gave the party I told you about. Is that the Gene that... What's his name? Paul? Yeah. That Paul mentioned in his letter? Uh Uh-huh. Funny. When I read that letter, I thought that might be Gene Baxter. Wouldn't that have been something? Sure would have been. I'm glad it wasn't, whispered Gaylord. Why? asked Blake. I'm afraid I'd be jealous. Blake giggled. Oh, for Christ's sake. It's good to hear you laugh, Bob. Laugh some more. Gaylord grinned and began tickling Blake. Hey, stop that. You want me to run off this damn road? I don't care. I'm dressed for anything. He laughed and spread open the blanket. See? What are you trying to do? Get me excited? Think I could? I think you could. Blake grinned and pulled at the patch of curly hair around the other's groin. Ouch! You better cover up or you'll catch a cold. I won't catch a cold. Gay. Huh? Will you tell me something? Anything. What? What about this guy, Paul? What about him? Do you like him? Yes. He's awfully nice. I told you he reminded me of you, and you're tops to me. You know that. Blake raised his arm. You want me to bust you one again? He grinned. Yes. Blake's hand came down on his cheek with a gentle caress. There, he said. I don't want anyone to hold you like this except me. No one has, Bob. No one? No one. Not even Glenn. The name came upon him with a swift blow that shocked him, staggered him more than the slap he had received earlier. He had never thought of Glenn Rogers as a lover, or had he? Two large dimples flashed before his eyes, two lips saying, Wish I could go to New Orleans with you. How did he feel towards this vision? Why was he always wishing he could see him naked? Why did he have that funny feeling around his heart when he was with him? Did Blake know about these emotions? How could he have discovered them? What could he suspect, conceive? He couldn't know anything that the two had done. How could he? There wasn't anything to know. Now yet, there wasn't. Now why did he think that? Suddenly he grabbed for Blake, held him fast and said, No, Bob, he whispered. Not even Glenn. End of chapter 21. Chapter 22. The driving rain of Tuesday afternoon and night passed into a warm and sunny Wednesday. The yellow sun rose upon the water-soaked roofs of Cotton, Texas, and soon the shingles began to give off steam. A thin gliding ghost rose from them, rose until it was lost in the vastness above. The large trees surrounding the dark-soaked auditorium seemed fresh, clean, They swayed under the touch of some unknown hand that brushed them. After a wonderful night's sleep, Gaylord lay back on his bed and pushed his hair from his forehead. A smile crossed and lingered on his face as the memory of the night before passed through his semi-conscious mind. 
He had taken the world back on his shoulders, releasing his heroic twin, Gaylord Leclerc, who had run away from the one he loved last night. He had almost let the world slip through his fingers, or rather, he had drawn away from it. But thank God, it had been saved. He turned on his side and sank his head deep in the soft pillow, his hand going under his cheek and then slowly over it, as if trying to feel its structure. Bob sure did hit me, he thought. He's sure strong. He smiled at the reflection and after a coarse cough, turned over on his back. He imagined himself a woman and living with Blake, cooking and keeping their house. He saw the people who would come to see them. They were not of the normal world. They were sad-eyed boys that moved under the crust of a special and unique civilization, a world with its own special bars, nightclubs, languages, and gestures. They all seemed transients to him now. Nothing seemed permanent in this particular world. It was a world without normal women, a world of continuous chases and fantastic exchanges. They were all hunting, searching, wanting. The aim of conquest was constant, for that seemed the only important thing. Maybe tomorrow, the conquest would be the right one. Gaylord muttered to himself, I shouldn't think of things like this. I should be happier than a lark, and I'm not. I have Bob, and he understands me better than I understand myself. That should be enough for the time. Why couldn't we have normal friends? We don't have to run around with those we don't care for, sissy ones who paint their face and talk so funny. He brought his arms up and cradled his face between his hands. I wonder, he murmured, if I'll turn out to be one of them. Wonder if Bob and me will go chasing after others. Will we grow tired of each other? I know I won't, but what about him? The moment he voiced the thought, he wanted to cry. Maybe this would clear his mind of all whirling and spinning questions. But he had said it, and the words sank deep and couldn't be uprooted. He thought of Blake. He was above him, and Gaylord could see his face very plain. Could see the grin, his wide, soft mouth. It was moving, talking to him gently, tenderly. But he could not hear the words. Then abruptly, in a blinding flash of clairvoyance, he knew that something was wrong, horribly wrong, for the face faded, leaving only spinning objects in front of him. He was suddenly aware he was cold, his whole body bedewed with icy sweat. He sprang from the bed. Bob, why didn't you say you loved me? Why didn't you? He cried, realizing suddenly, with a misery that was bottomless, Blake had never said the words. Why did you call me a faggot? But there was nothing so bad about that. He had been called worse. What baffled him, what he could not explain, was this icy terror that beat about his head like invisible wings. I'll get rid of it, he cried. I'll wash it out of my mind. I'll drown it. And like a frightened deer, he ran naked towards the bathroom. He reached for both faucets and turned them on full force. The water shot out of the shower nozzle with a tremendous sizzling, flattening his hair making it run down his forehead in long, straight, dripping streaks. His jaw trembled, and he tried to clench his teeth to steady it. Bob, Bob, I love you, he hysterically muttered, the roaring water drowning the words, filling his open lips. Why, he coughed, didn't you say you loved me? Why, why? A feeling possessed him of the fragility of his life on the earth and the transiency of all human habitation. The thought reminded Gaylord of the mashed squirrels he had often seen lying on the roads around Cotton on autumn mornings. It was shocking to soak in, all in an instant, the fact that people are as soft and destructible as squirrels. He had a sensation of long absence and return, or as if he had awakened into some earlier time. Suppose he had lived in the time of Louis IV. Would things have been different? Suppose he had been a queen. He had heard somewhere that Queen Elizabeth was really a man. He wondered about it, remembering Dusty. Dusty looked more like a woman than Queen Elizabeth. She certainly wasn't beautiful or feminine-looking from the pictures he had seen of her. The water chilled him, and now goosebumps covered his body. I'm cold, he thought, and abruptly came back to his own. And he wondered at the miracle by which he had been spun into that era that had nothing to do with him. I think of the craziest things, he said, drying himself. I guess I really am queer. He sighed deeply. Queen. Paul said that's what queer boys called themselves. Queen. Queen Gaylord Leclerc. I'll never call myself a queen. 
After the shower, Gaylord wrote to Paul Boudreau. Dear Paul, First, I want to thank you for the wonderful time you showed me while I was in New Orleans. I know if it had not been for you, the whole trip would have been a failure. You showed and told me so many things I had no idea were going on in this world of ours, things that have become clear to me now. Your letter was sweet, and I thank you for the things that you said and the way you expressed your feelings towards me. Forgive me for not obeying you and tearing it up, but I couldn't, Paul. I had to show it to Bob and see his reactions. I know now that I love him and have loved him all along. He didn't say much after reading your letter. Never told me he loved me. And you would have laughed to have seen us fighting. We really had one, and I'm glad it happened, because I feel closer to Bob, and I think he feels the same way toward me. I wish you were here so that I could talk to you instead of writing. My words seem misplaced too, like you said yours did. I do so want to be your friend and hope that I'll be able to see you as planned. I guess we are a lot alike and I'm so glad I met you. Something good is bound to come from our friendship. It has to me for just knowing you, even if it was for such a short time, has opened my eyes to facts that really do exist. After school, I'm going to try to get Bob to come to New Orleans with me. I'd love for you to meet him, and I want so much for him to meet you. He's such a wonderful person, so different than I am. I only wish I were like him. After graduation, I just know I won't be able to stand it around this town. If it wasn't for Bob, I'd be tempted to leave today. I hope that everything works out for you and that you will find someone just as wonderful as Bob. You deserve the best. I wish it were possible for it to be me, but feeling the way I do toward Bob makes that impossible, and I'm sure you'll understand. There are so many things I'd like to say, but maybe you won't finish this letter now that you know the way I feel. I hope you will, for I certainly don't want to hurt you. Only to be honest with you and not lie. You told me never to lie, and I will do exactly that, Paul. Write me if you find it in your heart to do so. If I don't hear from you, I'll understand. Thanks again for everything. Gay. P.S. Will you send me Jean's address? I'd like to thank him for inviting me to his party. He was very nice, and I like him very much. Gay. The mirror in the knotty pine frame glared back at Robert Blake as he sat up in his bed, rubbing his eyes. He looked out the window and was glad to see the sunshine streaming through the blinds. He stretched his brown arms, and the muscles in his biceps expanded as he bent his elbows, drawing his hands slowly down his shoulders. He yawned deeply and raised his chest forward stretching the skin under the brisk hair that seemed alive and springy. Then he fell back on his rumpled pillow. You little devil, he said to himself with a grin. His hand rubbed his cheek. You're not as weak as I thought you were. I had no idea you had such a temper, you pretty little faggot. Joy Clay had slapped his face once, but it had felt like she hadn't really meant it. A sort of coy slap. His hands went down between his legs and rested there. Then, slowly, moved up and down, up, down, slowly. He could feel the warmth of Joy's body again, visualize the soft material that covered his fingers as they reached higher and higher until, and then the slap. He had barely felt it in his excitement. Please, she had pleaded, snatching his hand away from the warmth that was beginning to burn his fingers, his mind, his body. Then she had cried and he had kissed her. All right, honey, he had said. If you don't want to, we won't. What a difference between Joy and the girl he had met in New Orleans. How utterly different, and still, they were the same. He wondered how and why a girl could become so false. The large painted mouth, dark shadowed eyes, the straw-like hair. It was all false. Surely before she had become so, she had been a sweet girl like Joy. Others. She was still young still youthful under the false veil that shrouded the sweetness that possibly could have been hers. He wondered if a man had been the cause of her downfall and was glad Joy had protested, glad that he had been man enough to obey her wishes, even if he did feel that if he had tried a little harder, he could have succeeded. There had been other girls that had given themselves to him without a struggle, girls who had lain with men, other young boys. He thought of them, and his hand shut tight around his flesh, hard, throbbing flesh. Let someone else break them in, he thought. I won't break them in, but I'll take them afterwards. I don't want to be the first. They can brag about getting a cherry. To hell with that. I'll take them afterwards, after it's dropped and gone. He 
thought of the time he was working in a filling station, about a certain man who had watched him as he had serviced his car, the man who had asked him to come to his hotel room. He had liked the sensation that had gone through his body, remembered pushing away the face that had tried to kiss afterwards, after the sensation was gone. Yes, his maturity had come early, perhaps a little too early. The stranger had come back, and he had followed willingly up to the room. Many times this had happened. In fact, he had looked forward to these meetings, had liked it as much as the acts that had occurred with girls behind trees, along the Gulf Coast, and other places. He grinned to himself, remembering all these past escapades. He thought of Gaylord, and a nervous tingling crept over him. It brought with it an exciting desire to have him here with him, to feel his warm body next to his. Right now, his body was more desirous than joyous, and he wondered, ask himself why. Not queer, he thought. I've never liked to play with dolls or girls. I can't understand it. Words of his father came to him now. Bob always has been a real boy, his father had proudly told his uncle. A boy of yours is too damn sissy, Jim. Blake had overheard the conversation, and from that day on had avoided his cousin. He had never been too fond of him. There was just something about him that didn't click. Still, he had never mistreated him, and he had been glad when they had moved to a different state. Lying here now, Robert Blake wondered what his cousin, Frank Blake, looked like, how he acted, and if he had outgrown his feminine ways. Frank was three years older than himself. A hoarse cough shook him, followed by another, and then another. Damn, I've got a cold, I'm afraid, he uttered. Guess I did catch one last night. He withdrew his hand from his lap and reached for a tissue on a stand next to the bed. Blew his nose. He tossed it into a waste can and relaxed, his hand going back down to its old position. Dreamily, he stroked his flesh, pulled and stretched it without realizing it. Gaylord loved him. He knew that, could feel it, see it in the blue eyes. Joy liked him, too. Others liked him. He was lucky to have so many friends. All these faces reflected friendship and love. They respected him, never called him names. They'd better not. Too bad Gaylord couldn't say that. Gaylord. And again he thought of the warm body that had plunged out of the blanket. Flesh that had been so cold such a short time before, now warm again and ready. Ready for him, he told himself. There was no sort of warning or premonition. His tense hand had stopped moving lay there still clutched around his body. You little faggot, he grinned and reached for another tissue. Glenn Rogers was always up by six in the morning in order to milk, stake the cow out afterwards, and the family usually had breakfast together at exactly 6.30. This morning, he was kissing his pillow when he opened his eyes. He yawned and then grinned at the memory of the dream that had just left him. Looking down at the softness in his arms, he grinned again and wondered if he should feel ashamed, ashamed that he had enjoyed what had been going on in dreamland. He threw off the light sheet and slipped his hand under his pajamas, touched his body, the part that Gaylord's hand had just been around, touched his body with the hand that had just touched Gaylord's. God, what a dream, he thought. I'm glad I woke up when I did. He lay back on the bed, relaxed, his mind centered around his new friend. He was conscious of certain things he had to do, but still lay there, thinking. He decided he liked Gaylord more than anyone he had ever met. There was something about his new friend that made him feel a bit uncomfortable when he was with him. And yet, he had never felt so free. He had talked about things he had never talked to anyone else about. Had confessed things about himself he wouldn't dream of confessing to anyone. Why should he feel strange around Gaylord Leclerc? he asked himself. You're too ignorant. He answered himself, too darn ignorant. You've never been around. That was so right. He had never been anywhere, had never seen anything worthwhile or met people who had. All he knew was horses, cattle, and farming. Instinct rather than reason told him that he had been shut off from the world by a barbed wire fence. Certain things which had to be done were always cropping up successfully, and it was up to him to do them. There had been no time or money for travel or deep subjective reading. In all his years, there was no time to think of himself or do things to improve his mind. No time to analyze his feelings about the world outside. But since he had met Gaylord, after he had been with him, all the things he had missed came over him in dark, disorderly waves, 
and sometimes those moods were hard to control. He was like someone who stood on the stern of a ship, watching a vanishing shoreline. Gaylord must like him, or he would not pick him up mornings or take him out to lunch. He raised his legs, bending his knees. Nervously, he brought them together and then apart. Oh, I wish I would have gone to New Orleans with Gay, he thought. Someday I'm going. With Gay, I hope. He watched his vibrating limbs, remembering how angry he had been at his father when he had refused to let him go, remembered taking out all his disappointment on the cattle with each jab of the needle. God damn it, be a little more careful there, Glenn. His father had yelled at him after he had kicked a small calf after shooting it with serum. To hell with you, he had muttered under his breath. I hope these shots don't do any good. What are you muttering about? His father shot back at him. Nothing, he had answered. Nothing you'd understand. It had been a discordant instant, and it had broken unpleasantly into the morning. He had thought of Gaylord again, and Gaylord was suddenly more real to him than the calf in front of him. Glenn Rogers could still recall the glow he had felt on this occasion and the sudden moment of elation. It came to him again now. The blue eyes, the wavy hair, the soft hands. Everything came together into sudden focus. Though common sense told Rogers that he should get up, some other inner impulse made him stretch and sink his head into his pillow. He saw the sunlight hit the wings of a plane that must be on its way to Mexico City. He lay there, gazing out of his windows and watched the plane. I wonder where Gay was last night, he thought. His mother said she didn't even know where he was. Glenn, a voice rang out. Yes, mother. Six o'clock. All right. I'm awake. He jumped out of bed onto the bare floor. He was quite happy and hummed to himself as he dressed. He thought of his father and was sorry for the thoughts that had passed in his mind about him. His father had really needed him. The old home, the place where he was born, had needed him. Gosh, I wish I could have gone to New Orleans, he said, combing his hair. Looking at his reflection in the mirror, he laid down the comb and left his room. If a roaring storm had been raging outside instead of the warm, gentle breeze, it would not have changed the expression on Joy Clay's face as she got out of bed and walked to her dresser. The air was full of earth odors and smelt of leaves and damp wood. But it meant nothing to her. Her heart was heavy as she picked up the comb and ran it carelessly through her hair. Always before she had been happy. Now it hurt to think of the future hours. She glanced into the blank mirror. It's my fault, she said. I have no one to blame but myself. Only myself. Why did I do it? She walked about the room in her nightgown, pacing the floor like a tired caged animal. Then, as she sat down on the bed again, wished she could erase the memory of the afternoon disturbing her mind. You little fool, she thought. You stupid little fool. She flung herself on the bed and cried, cried like she had never cried before. He came to her and brought the memory back. How about some strawberries? She jerked her head up, looking around the room to see who had spoken. It had been so real. There was no one. Nothing but the dreariness that filled every corner, the utter bleakness of the morning sun. She was half-blinded by the brilliant reflections that leaped before her watery eyes. She saw Gaylord's naked body and cried even harder, closing her eyes so that it would vanish, but it remained deep within her. She had been a victim of a willing rape to gratify an ancient craving, and now that she had tasted the sweetness of the marriage night, the craving was still there and not to be concealed. She had sinned, there was no doubt about it, but she didn't care. The act would surely bring him back to her, for she knew that men found in this act the keenest pleasure. And even if Gaylord was effeminate, he had proven to her he was a man. She was certain he had loved the moment as much as herself, and he would come and seek her again, and they would lose all time and garments like they had done before. She felt a great anguish wishing again for the thrilling bodily rapture that she had experienced, that exquisite mingling of pain and ecstasy, and her mind was capable of only one explanation for it. She, Joy Clay, must be depraved. I don't care, she said lying there. I'm glad. So glad, she whispered. He'll be back. They come back. She looked down at her bosom that showed plainly from behind the thin silk. She suddenly felt better, with the familiar odors of the room and the morning air. 
She dropped her hand from her breast and settled back peacefully on the wide bed and waited. A little laugh escaped her parted lips. Oh, gay, she sighed. You must love me. You simply must, my darling. I shall make you love me. And the brightness was all around her like a living thing, around her and within, filling up the vast and echoing beat of her heart. Gay, my little gay. Paul Boudreaux whispered in his sleep and touched the naked figure next to him. What did you say? asked the masculine figure. Hey, he shook Paul. You want some more lovin'? What? Paul stammered and opened his eyes. You've been talking in your sleep, said Gay, and felt of me. I'm ready, honey, but my name ain't Gay. Paul paid no attention to the look or the words. His head ached dully and his mind worked slowly, painfully his unhappy thoughts groping through the lingering fog of liquor and the memory of his shameful assault on his bedmate. Oh, he said in self-disgust, and only when he saw the man's face did he realize he had made the sound aloud. Got a hangover? the man asked. They stared at each other searchingly, looking deep into each other's eyes, both with different thoughts. And then Paul broke the silence by saying huskily, I sure have. Please don't. I feel terrible. He rubbed his eyes and asked, How do you feel? As Paul's eyes watched, he saw him suddenly throw down the sheet to expose his body, lying naked and so close to him. The man glanced down at his own nakedness, and Paul's eyes followed until he saw again what he had already seen. How's that? The man grinned and tried to draw Paul close. I'm ready again. I'm not, muttered Paul with disgust. I'm going to make some coffee. And with this, he sprang out of bed picked up a robe and put it on as he left the room. So the night had passed in different rooms, and so the morning followed. End of Chapter 22 Chapter 23 Jean Limbeau had spent eight hours behind a desk, and now, as he stood at his apartment door fumbling for his keys, he looked like a tired old man coming home from a hard day's work. Once he had been a little boy, but he had almost forgotten that. That boyhood, full of unhappy memories, was better dead. Those screams of kike, you sissy Jew, Jew sucker, yelled at him had also been buried along with lonesome past years. His apartment felt steamingly hot as he drew his stout short frame through the door, and taking off his tan seersucker coat, he threw it across a chair. Out of his pocket, he pulled a soiled handkerchief and wiped his face. He looked at the damp linen and shook his head. He would cream his face and take off these sweaty clothes, but first he would turn on the window fan. The suction of the fan immediately sent a cool breeze through the room. He could hear the humming noises of the street mix with it as he drew open the long drapes and opened several windows. Then, going back to the door, he closed and locked it. So Jean Limbeau stood again in his make-believe world. His whole expression had changed from a drab, uninteresting man to a younger, full-of-life person. Taking off the rest of his clothes, he strolled around the room naked. Picking up overrunning ashtrays and emptying them into a wastebasket, he hummed to himself in a high falsetto voice, picked up a dustcloth, and began dusting the furniture. Here in New Orleans, he had found his niche. Bookkeeping seemed to be in his blood. Starting as a helper, he was soon in charge of the whole office. He loved the technical details and the long columns of figures, mistakes to be demolished. He loved them because he was demolishing mistakes made by others. He did not think of it as work. He thought of it as tearing apart a normal world. He quickly became known and liked by his co-workers. They found him witty, a good sport, and very free with his money. They liked to kid him about the many girls he was seen with. Every new show that opened, he was there with a different one, and he took the ribbing good-naturedly. Jean Limbeau was no fool. To go to shows with feminine men was taboo. Instead of them, he took lesbians, not the masculine-looking ones, but those that looked and dressed like lovely debutantes. He loved to read not only cheap novels, but Voltaire, the Bible, and Shakespeare. He read everything so that he could demolish the things in his path. To discover power, weakness, and have ease when he was around people, wanting it, he managed to find the secret of being liked among a crowd, and he found that by words he was a man among men. There was nothing frilly or feminine in his actions at work, but now, in the soft-colored walls that protected him, he was himself. 
He could relax. He had played his part all day at the office. Now he could swish about, scream out in a high voice if he wanted to. He was no longer an actor of actions and words in a normal scene. Jean Limbeau was no longer a normal man. My God, he screamed as he looked at himself in the bathroom mirror. Miss Limbeau, you're a big mess. Old Auntie Jean is what the faggots will be calling you before too long. They haven't started already. Why do we have to grow old? Why? Getting out a jar of face cream, he was about to pat it all over his face when the doorbell rang. This was followed by a voice. Jean, it's me, Paul. May I come in? Sure, just a minute, Jean yelled. He put the cold cream away and grabbed a robe. He shook the floor as he ran across it, reached the door and opened it. My God, Paul, what happened to you, honey? You look awful. Paul's eyes were dark and circled. The corners of his mouth drooped the same way his broad shoulders did. His clothes looked soiled, and he needed a shave. I just had an awful night. It's good to see you, Jean. What happened? Oh, I got drunk and picked up some jerk. Took him home with me, and when I woke up this morning, there he was, he said in a disgusted tone. Why do we do such things, Jean? I don't know, honey. I've done the same thing. But I cut my wrist the next morning, too. Wasn't he any good? Oh, I don't remember. Now, it couldn't have been that bad. At least he didn't roll you or blacken your eyes. I don't know. They look pretty black. What's the matter, honey? Did he have lace curtains? Paul grinned and lighted a cigarette. I don't remember what he had. No, he didn't have that. I guess he was all right. But all I could think about all the time was gay. It's just the first one I've had since Gay left. I don't know. I just feel awful about it. Jean, I just feel terrible. Jean placed his arms around the droop shoulders. Come on and sit down, he said. Your mother needs a drink, and I know damn well you do. I could stand one. Jean mixed drinks, and Paul gulped it down in one swallow. I feel like getting plastered, Paul said. May I have another? You know you can, Jean said. Pouring another straight bourbon, he drank his drink and poured himself another. I feel the same way. There's a bunch of bitches coming over later, and we'll have a good start on them. That reminds me, I've got some calls to make while I'm still thinking. I'm getting so absent-minded lately. I'd probably forget my ass if it wasn't clipped to these gorgeous hips. You don't mind? Of course not. Go ahead, Jean. Jean picked up the leather address book off the large coffee table, opened it, and began to dial, said, I'm going to call this piece of rough trade I had the other night and ask him if he wouldn't like to spend the evening with a bunch of actresses. He let out a loud scream. I'll ask him if he hasn't a pilot for you, honey. I always look after my sisters. He laughed again at Paul, then into the phone, he said. Hello, may I speak to Mr. Russell? Oh, no, no message. He hung up the receiver. Not home, bastard. Wonder who's goosing him up now. He dialed again and spoke to someone, then to several others. After he had hung up, Paul said, I can't stay long, Jean. Just thought I'd drop by and see how you are. I've got to go by the bar and see Dusty a minute. Then I think I'm going home. Wish you could stay, Paul. Don't let it get to you. You're too sweet. I wish you could be a little more vulgar like me. Jean giggled and put his hands on his fat hips. It just doesn't pay to be coy these days. The more vulgar and common you are, the more fun you have. And right now, I feel like the commonest bitch in this common town. Paul laughed as he looked at Jean. You're just what I needed, Jean, he said. Why don't you take a quick shower and shave? You look a mess, baby, and I don't like to see you look that way. You can go and see Dusty then if you want to, or you can stay here. You just do anything you want to. I've got some more calls to make, so you just go right ahead and get beautiful. You know where everything is, and if you can't see it, call me. Thanks, Jean. That's a good idea. I do look terrible. Think a shave and a shower will sort of revive me. He started for the bathroom, and his shirt was already off when he got to the door. He pulled off his pants, underwear, and hung them on a door hook. You better close that door before I do you for trade, Jean giggled, and his hand hit Paul's buttocks. Paul grinned. Remember the first time you picked me up, Jean? Do I? I'll never forget it. My old box puckered all the way home. Jean patted Paul's cheek. Funny, he said soberly. How time flies. 
isn't it? Sure is, said Paul, turning on the water, remembering the small wasted boy who had propositioned him. He was so thin then. Wasn't I, Jean said dreamily. I didn't have money to waste on the food then. Poor boy sandwiches three times a day. That was it. That reminds me. I'm going to stop all sweets and anything fattening. I'm going to have to streamline this old bus if he kills me. Better put the bourbon down then. Bourbon? Me quit booze? Oh, God. Do I have to? It's got sugar in it. Oh, shit. He tossed his head and laughed. Guess I'll stay like I am. Paul laughed and began his shower. Jean hung up the phone as Paul walked from the bathroom. He looked his old self and his face was handsome. Still calling? he asked. Yes. Bunch of bitches, Jean answered with a chuckle. Did you ever see anything like a bunch of bitches, I ask you? Some said they were going to stay home. They were too upset to go out. One said he was going cruising. Another wanted to know if she could bring her trade with her. Another said she was having the vapors, but she'd try to make it. Mary, they'll all be here. Free drinks, huh? Even if they don't give a damn for your mother, they'll come for free drinks. But this is the payoff, girl. You know Miss Cochran, don't you? Paul nodded. He did. Well, Miss Cochran says, Darling, imagine her calling me darling. I just love to come. But Jim and I are going to the theater. Going to the theater, huh? Probably cruising that nasty old burlesque house on St. Charles. I've got her number. That bitch wouldn't know how to act in a theater. And then she continued, in that frog-like voice of hers, we're meeting some friends in the blue room afterwards for cocktails, but after that we'd just love to stop by for a few drinks. Few drinks, hell. She guzzles like her holes on the fire and she's trying to put it out. Was foaming at both ends when she hung up. I don't know why I put up with her. I know why you do, Jean laughed. Well, a husband of hers is kind of cute, isn't he? I'm going to get him if I have to pay for it. That shouldn't be hard to do. He doesn't work, does he? No. Doesn't do anything. Miss Cochran supports him. Cochran doesn't make very much, does he? Hell no. Don't you know where she works? She slings hash down on St. Charles Street in some sloppy dive. I don't even know the name of it, but one day I was walking by and I spotted that bleach switch of hers behind the counter. She saw me and tried to duck. But I was too fast for her. Honey, they've got to be pretty fast to get ahead of your mother, and you know that. Well, she wasn't. She was really upset, and you know what she said? Said she was writing a book. Something about a girl who worked in a restaurant. She was getting the feel of the character. Honey, that bitch couldn't even write her name so that you can read it. I asked her if this was a restaurant. I said, why don't you go to Antoine's, girl? Paul was holding his sides laughing. Jean continued. Let's face it. She didn't even know what I meant. She's an ignorant whore and tries to be elegant. I almost let her have it full force, but I had to fault so bad I just stood there pressing my cheeks together. I was afraid I'd do something else if I let one little teeny weeny one out. So I sat down and had a Coke. She brings it to me and flashed this big hunk of glass in my face. I wanted to see how far the bitch would go, so I said to her, I say, very coy-like, That's a lovely ring you have there. Let's see it. As if I couldn't. She sticks out this skinny paw and says, Yes, it is lovely, isn't it? It's an heirloom of the families. Honey, I almost shit. Jean gave a wild scream and continued. Then I says to her, I says, Honey, I've got large news for you. Some of the loom is rubbing off on your finger. Her finger was all green. Jean screamed a shrieking laugh. Paul was holding his stomach, shaking with laughter. Her finger was green from this ten-cent ring. She almost dropped. She pulled that old paw so quick like you'd think I was going to steal the Hope Diamond. Honey, that ring had about as much sparkle to it as one of those old rhinestones in my G-string. And that's not very much. Oh, Jean, Paul laughed. You're a kick. Honey, those bitches can't put nothing over on your mother. It was like the other day in the can at the Apollo Theater. I was standing there taking a pee, minding my own business. And this faggot shook her honker at me, she said, trying to be butch. Want to buy this? You should have seen it. Evil. I took one look and told him to put it back in his pants. What do you want to do with that pointed thing? Stab me? 
I said, and laughed right in his face. You should have seen his face drop. He zipped his trousers and got out of that can like a striped-ass ape was after him. I can imagine. Can't blame him for trying, though. Guess he took one look at me and thought I'd buy anything. But I'm not that hard up. Not yet, I ain't. He let out a deep sigh, said, Oh, I've got something to show you, Paul. And he minced to a closet, taking out a pair of women's shoes. He held them up, and Paul grinned. How do you like my new drag shoes? Bought them this morning. Didn't Delman go mad with this pair? I think they're real kissy. They certainly are. Those heels are so high. Just so my nose don't stop bleeding, Jean screamed. Jean, you're kick. I swear I'm going to get in drag one of these days. Don't know what you're missing. You'd be a doll. Think so. With his hair, chest, and these arms? I don't think I'd call myself a doll. Guess I'd better stick to male attire. Butch type, huh? grinned Jean. Just like my last husband. He was so butch he wore all my drags out. Even added more ruffles and crap to them. She was queer for ruffles. I swear if I'd been married in a veil, I'd have to tear it in two so both of us could have worn it. She was a good lay, though. Wish she was back. A girl needs a husband. Jean grinned and looked at Paul, said, Want to be my husband? You know I'm a lousy lay, and tomorrow you'd throw me out. Oh, I don't think so. Dog, I've got to go before I take you up. Paul gently slapped Jean's cheek. Jean came up with his arms. It's nice to have you as a friend, Paul. There are so few, real friends. I hate to have you go. I've got to go see Dusty before he goes on. How about a drink for the road? I'll take a rain check on it. I really got to go. Thanks. Thanks for being my friend. Your tops, Jean. So will you, Paul. Come back later if you can. Come back any time. And I mean any time, Jean said very seriously. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 It was misting rain when Paul Boudreau emerged from his favorite bar. Flashes of lightning illuminated the sky for a brief second, then followed distant rolls of thunder. A cloud, hitherto unseen, came upon the horizon and hovered like a dark hand before a face. The whores, pimps, queers, and tourists had taken to the many bars and restaurants, leaving the usually busy Bourbon Street practically deserted. Alone with its many electric signs, reflecting on wet stones and drooping awnings, cabs kept busy by whistling people splashed down the street, and those who whistled in vain returned behind doors, doors that they had emerged from, doors that kept inside the loud disturbance of blaring instruments and shouting. It all went on around him concealed and unnoticed. Raining again, Paul murmured, watching the drop splatter against a lighted street lamp. Wish Dusty wouldn't have been off tonight. A cab pulled up, and the driver asked, Cab? No, thanks, Paul replied without looking. Won't cost you nothing, no? Paul looked into the dark front seat. Gaston, he cried. I didn't know it was you. How's everything? How's tricks? Good tonight. Where you going? Can I take you? Now, thanks, I'm just walking, Paul said. You'd better get some cash customers tonight. May not be raining tomorrow. So what? Hop in. Not tonight, Gaston. Thanks. Thanks anyway. Want to be alone? Sort of. Okay, Paul. I'll see you. Come up soon and I'll buy you a drink. You know the address. I'll do that. Bye. Bye. Gaston's a good Joe, he thought. Maybe I should have gone with him. We've had a good time together. He's nice. Oh, well, some other night. He shrugged his shoulders and, from under an iron balcony, looked down the street. His eyes searched it bit by bit and section by section. It all seemed dismal and lonesome, almost as lonely as himself. Where did you come from? he questioned, looking down at the large slabs of slate. Did you really come from France? Who brought you here to this miserable street? What things have happened to you? over you. Did the cart that carried the queen to the guillotine roll over you, or were you still buried happily in the deep earth? They beamed back at him and looked almost alive, glared in wet changing colors. They were secretive and silent, as they had always been. They would not tell their past to anyone. Why should they? No one would believe a stone could talk. Paul had been drinking for hours, but the wonderful glow that always came, that glow that made him forget, 
had also forsaken him. He plodded patiently through the rain, and his whole life was spread out before him, and the walk before him stretched like a sheet of silver, placid under the lights, like a lake undisturbed by wind or storm. No waves would come to ruffle the stream water, no bulk of cloud, wind driven from the gulf, obscured the clarity of this pale sky. The different doors, verandas, signs were all part of him. All around were things he had lived with as a child and a young man. He looked at a certain red door and remembered the older man who had lived there. It was such a long time ago, and now he wondered what had ever become of him. What did happen to gay men as they grew older? What happened to those that did not have the normal fulfillment of love and companionship, and sometimes even when they did? He thought of Jean Limbeau, alone and old now. Did Jean deserve this? This way of life that had only doom for an ending? He must have had lovers, many of them. In fact, he had known several. But today he was alone too, just like himself. And because his memories were so cruel and unpleasant, Paul's eyes filled with tears. His mind was a series of days past and of days to come. Rain can play odd tricks upon the fancy, even upon a dreamer's fancy. And as he walked hushed and sad, he thought, maybe some old aunties are happy and content. Maybe age does things to you. At least I've got money, and money is important to one growing old, real important to a gay person. He looked lost and puzzled his normal expression dying away from his face as though swept clean by an unseen hand, and in its place a mask had formed, a sculptured thing, formal and cold, handsome still but lifeless. The smell of beer and rubbish made him look skyward, and the kiss-like drops felt good on his uncovered brow. His thin sports shirt stuck close, showing his upper physique, and his cut-out sports shoes sopped up water from the puddles and trenched on broken slabs making each step remind one of rubbing taffeta. He was not aware of his appearance. He was aware that he had known fear and loneliness and very great distress on this very street. It all carried him back to his past with such force that he seemed to be reliving it again. Something inside him wanted to be carried back to the days when he was happy, when the city and Bourbon Street had been beautiful, when he had lain on his bed and watched his lover coming toward him. Hey, look out, fellow. He stopped, quickly coming from the past to the present, but he was too late. He had collided with the couple with such force that the girl would have slipped and fallen if her companion had not quickly caught her. Paul's confused and halting apologies brought forth a flow of cuss words from the girl, but his face was so sincere that her anger died down as quickly as it had flared. That's okay, honey, she said. We shouldn't have had a newspaper over our face. Took it for granted that people would see us. It's our fault. She turned to her companion. Damn, baby, did you have to grab me here? She rubbed her breasts. You almost ruptured me, baby. She laughed. I'm going to do more than that when I get you in bed, baby. Her companion grinned. Then he winked at Paul in a you-know-what-she-is manner. You are, are you? She said. Come on, then. I can hardly wait. He looked at Paul with a subtle change in his eyes, the indefinable something that lingered there momentarily said something personal to himself with which she had no concern, as if he had preferred Paul's companionship to hers. Another horror with a trick, thought Paul. He grinned back at them. Her companion looked so young, so good-looking. He would have liked to have shaken hands with him, say, I'm Paul Boudreaux, and I'd like to buy you a drink. He had done that before, but only when they walked alone. He sort of respected whores. They had a tough life, too, even though he felt the boy would have gone with him, he would not interfere. No, Ors didn't have it easy either. He started to walk and wondered as he did so, wondered what happened to prostitutes when they got old. Two men in gaudy suits passed with a cunning grin. They glared at Paul, and one said, I don't know whether he's one of those queers or not. Kind of looks like one. I don't give a damn if he is or isn't. I'd like a fling with him. He looked at Paul and said, Ha! Huh? Want some company, fellow? Paul only glared back at them and walked silently on. Beat your gums, you hop-headed bastards, he wanted to say. I'm not that hot up. Thank God I'm what I am and not like you. Sex. Sex and more sex. Isn't there anything to life but sex? He kicked at the sidewalk. 
He walked a long time, down Bourbon to St. Louis Street, on which he turned. He looked into Antoine's. It was very busy, but did not hold any interest. He thought of Café Lafitte on Bourbon and wondered if he should go back to it. He thought of Dusty and wondered where he was tonight. He was on Royal Street before he realized it. In fact, from this very spot he had seen Gaylord come down those steps across the street. He stared at them as if expecting a reappearance, but a short, bulging male had taken Gaylord's place and was now waddling to a waiting cab. The door closed and another person was gone. Paul gave a sickening little laugh. What a difference appearance makes. What a difference age. The separation of the moment was heartbreaking, for he was certain Gaylord had gone from his life as fast as he had come into it. Why should he assume that Gaylord would come back? After all, it had only been a pickup, and he had had many of those. They never came back, and when they did, it was only for one thing. It was only to end the same way as before. Someday, one of them would get tired. One of them would want new fields to conquer. This love begun would soon end. Paul looked up at the tall white hotel, and when his eyes focused on what he thought was the room in which he had spent the night with Gaylord, an idea occurred to him. He would stay in it again. Tonight, in that room, he could relive a wonderful moment in his life. It wouldn't be the same, no, but it might help clear his muddled mind. The room was dark, and a dark room meant vacant. Most times it did. Yes, it would feel good to sleep in the same bed again and relive that night. It would be restful tonight. He moved away from the restaurant, crossed the street, and mounted the hotel steps. He looked around. No one was watching him, although there were many people about. He was conscious of his wet clothes and tried to free his skin from the sticky shirt. He took out his comb, ran it through his hair, and moved again toward the revolving doors, informing himself he was doing the right thing, knowing that above him he might perhaps find solitude and comfort. He murmured the name Gaylord, and even the thought of the couple that he had bumped against, which had been on his mind, was forgotten. So were the names of past lovers and friends. On entering the lobby, Paul made his way over the carpeted floor. He spoke to several bellboys, busy with bags and bundles. He grinned at the porter, busy cleaning over run ashtrays. He noticed the crowd, busy getting reservations and checking out. They never stayed in one place long. They were always coming and going, like his life. Nothing was permanent. He crossed, walking between and around the milling figures, to a desk marked sightseeing tours. Paul, the man behind the desk cried. How good to see you. They shook hands. Kind of wet, aren't you, kid? Hi, Grova. You'd be wet, too, Paul grinned. Don't you know it's raining outside? Is it? Grover pulled out a chair, smiled, and looked in Paul's face, said, Sit down, honey. I just had mad sex before I came on, so I'm pooped. I wouldn't know if it was sleeting. Yes, I guess I would, too, for I'm sure I would have fallen flat on my ass coming to work. I guess you would have at that. Grover handed Paul an open package of cigarettes. Smoke? he asked. Paul took one, and so did Grover. He sensed something was wrong. How's it going, Paul? They looked at each other between a thin screen of smoke, and Paul said, Fine, then added, Grover, find out if 1210 is occupied, will you please? If it is, I'd like to have it. I'm so wet I'd hate to go to the desk and ask. Sure, Paul. Grover turned to the phone on his desk. Just a minute, I'll ask Charles. He picked up the house phone and flipped the cigarette ashes with his finger. He studied Paul, began to wonder. That something was wrong, he had no doubt, but why did he want 1210 when he had such a lovely apartment? No, 1210 was occupied, but he could have 128. He told Paul and added, How about 128? No, Paul said quietly. It's got to be 1210. Sorry, Charles. Skip it. Thanks anyway. Grover hung up the receiver. Why in the hell do you want to stay in this dump when you've got a dream house to go home to? If it was mine, I don't think I'd ever leave it. You would too, Grover. It gets kind of lonesome alone. Well, honey, this isn't the Follies Bajer. It's dull as hell here tonight, Grover sighed. I'm sorry, Paul, that I couldn't help you. Did you make a date? Was someone going to call you in 1210? Piece of rough trade. No, Paul grinned. That's really nothing. Thanks anyway. Grover gave a quick snap. Oh, I remember that cute thing you stayed all night with at 1210. That kid from Texas. He waved his wrist. He was a doll. 
Every time he passed, my heart stopped. I tried to talk to him several times, but he knew how to avoid me. Guess he could read my mind. He was cute. Real cute. Yes, he was. Oh, I've seen some just as cute. Not like him, murmured Paul. Have you heard from him? asked the pale Grover. Paul shrugged in the chair. No, I haven't. Guess that's why I'm so low. Now don't let that one get you down. I knew there was something wrong the moment I saw you, but I had no idea you had fallen for that kid. You've had one-night stands before. Now haven't you, and they were just for the evening. What you need is someone, someone new. Go out and find something. I wish I didn't have to squat behind this evil desk. I'd go with you. A new face always peps me up, and the bars must be gay tonight. Think so. Think that's what I need? I know it is. Why don't you go over to the Green Parrot? Is it still open? Is it? Grover threw a hand on his chest. It's madder than ever. Absolutely mad. They've got a bunch of drag queens working, and the trade just flocks there. Sounds interesting. I love drag shows. Wish I could go with you. I'm not as tired as I thought I was. Grover laughed and flipped the cigarette into a tray. It's so hard to meet someone you want to be with. I generally get the type that either wants money or one-night stands. Grover's mouth popped open. Oh, hell, I wish you'd been here earlier. There was the best-looking John here a while ago. Real manly and very nice. Just the type you're looking for. He came up to me and asked me if I knew some girl who would have dinner with him and then go to some club and dance. Just out of a clear blue sky, he pops up with this. I started to tell him I'd leave any time he wanted to. I decided I'd better not. He looked and talked so serious I wasn't sure just what he did want. Grover took a needed breath. I suggested Rosie. You know Rosie. I didn't think she'd look like a whore. Do you? No. He asked me what she did, and I told him. He didn't want a whore and didn't care what she looked like, he said. I told him she was very attractive, but no. No whore. God, he was handsome. Just my type, too. Just left before you came in. He must have been something, Paul exclaimed. I've never seen you like this. Honey, he was a bitch's dream of heaven. Maybe he'll be back. You might try tomorrow, as always tomorrow. Paul rose from the chair and patted Grover's drooped shoulder. Thanks. I hope you get him, Grover. He started to leave, but Grover hung on to him. Wait, he grasped. I think that's him. It is him. Grover was breathless. It is. That's him over by the door. See? Paul saw him, and his heart beat furiously. For from that distance, he could have sworn he was looking at Gaylord, an older, sophisticated Gaylord. He looks like gay, doesn't he, Grover? A little, only better. And he's here. Go on over, and let's see what happens. I'm so excited. Grover let out a soft high giggle. Go on, Paul. Get him. Oh, go on before he leaves. Should I? You should. You better grab him before some other queen sees him. He won't be free long when the vultures see him. Wouldn't you hate to see some whore get this gorgeous thing? You know what they say about men, and I think he's willing. If he don't find someone, he'll turn to a whore. I know the type. You've been carrying on over that asshole Arnold long enough, and this kid from Texas is too sissy. He'd make a good sister, but who'd be the husband? What's wrong with me? Get you, girl. I knew you win. Now go on. You're only young once, and I say when love calls, answer. If you have to hogtie them. I guess you're right, Paul grinned. Guess I could stand a pickup after what happened last night. Well, here goes. I hope he doesn't talk with a lisp. If he does, I'll kill myself. He doesn't, honey, Grova said. Then he screamed softly. Fly, girl. He just left the lobby. Fly before the bats get him and Paul walked rapidly out of the hotel, leaving a nervous and grinning Grover. End of Chapter 24 Chapter 25 Ted Miles stood under the hotel awning, smoking a cigarette, wondering just what he should do. Something about the superb cut of his clothes and the spotlessness of his linens reminded one of an advertisement for costly tailors and haberdashers. The freshness of his face and the breeziness of his bearing in no way suggested his inner thoughts. He watched the bellboys loading and unloading cabs. They moved up and down the steps like ants, each with his bag under his arm, bending eagerly at the sight of a coin or a rumpled bill. 
He looked down at them again and ran a hand over his smooth jaw. For some time, he was not aware of Paul's close presence, but when he noticed the wet-clothed boy, he smiled. Looks like you got caught in the rain, he said good-naturedly. Paul grinned back and stroked the front of his shirt. I sure did. This is some night, isn't it? It sure is. Does it rain like this often in New Orleans? This is typical New Orleans weather. It'll probably continue like this for a couple of days. Oh, no, don't say that, Ted chuckled. He threw away his cigarette and lit another one. He also handed Paul the package. It would rain on my first day here. What in the hell can a fellow do on a night like this? I generally get drunk, said Paul, and wished the eyes were blue instead of brown. There was a provocative glance and a gleam of perfect teeth. His face was arresting, sensitive, medieval in some strange, inexplicable way, and Paul was reminded of a dancer he had once known. Could he rob him of his English tweeds and put him in tights with stripes running around his legs? He was sure he would have looked the same. He wished he could have remembered the dancer's name. He remembered the first. Peter. Peter. Armentrout. That was it. Armentrout. And Peter's eyes followed his. They were saying, How about me buying us a drink? Paul lost the thread of his past. I like that. I don't like to drink alone. He paused, expecting him to smile. But he went on smoking his cigarette, and Paul noticed, faint as gossamer, the line between his brows. It's no fun to drink alone, Ted said brusquely. I'm Ted Miles. He held out his hand, which Paul took. I'm Paul Boudreau. Where can we go, Boudreau? Boudreau? Okay. Where can we go, Paul? The gesture with which he accompanied the words was so pompous that both broke into laughter. That's better, grinned Paul. There's lots of places, but I think I should go home and change. I've been walking in rain. Silly to like to walk in the rain, isn't it? I don't think so, Ted said sharply. I kind of like it myself. Seems to clean oneself. He smiled now. Do you live far? I do think you should change. Might catch cold. I don't live too far from here. Would you like to meet me, or would you like to come to my apartment? What do you think I should do? I don't like to drink alone, either. You're more than welcome to come along. What will your wife say? Wife? I'm not married, Paul Stiffen said. Are you? Ted did not answer, and Paul was aware of a feeling of discomfort as though he had trespassed on forbidden ground. I'm sorry, Paul continued. I didn't mean to get personal. Let's go to my apartment. That's all right, Ted said. I am married. He seemed embarrassed with his words. But she's in Los Angeles. It's a long ways from here. I don't guess she would mind, Paul told Ted. I've got some bourbon and scotch and gin, if you like gin, at home. Let's go. If you go in a bar by yourself, those bee girls will pester the hell out of you. Sounds good. You must have read my mind. We'll get a cab, if we can, and I'll get a bottle. But I've got. I was going to buy you a drink, remember? All right. Ted hailed a cab and they both got in. The car seemed to have the wings of Mercury as it rambled down Royal Street. It went dangerously fast, and the danger seemed to please them both, because it was taking them to adventure, because they were young. The sky was blue over the cathedral, and in the wash of mist it looked new. Even the heavy doors had lost their weathered look. One of them stood ajar, and as they passed, Paul could see dancing flames clustered about the feet of a beautiful statue. There was a wild, sweet joy in his heart, and as he looked back at the man of yesterday wrapped in secret self, they got out of the cab and walked toward the door of his building. On the right side, a mass of crystal chandeliers gleamed through the wet plate glass window and on the left an array of golden furniture. Ted had paid the cab driver, and Paul now said, Can't I pay for anything? No, Ted said emphatically. You've done your part by rescuing a lonesome guy. Inside Paul's apartment, he turned quickly to Ted and told him to mix himself a drink, a big one. He pointed to the stocked bar. Okay, Ted said, walking to the bar. I'll mix you one too. What do you want? A little bourbon and coke, said Paul. I won't be long. He turned and went into his bedroom and stood undressed when Ted entered, carrying two large, thick glasses. Try this, he said. Paul took the glasses and clumsily reached for a robe. He could feel the color creeping into his face. 
A change had come upon their evening. It was not the thing of Gossamer it had been. Ted had the face of one who walks in his sleep, and for a wild moment the idea came to Paul that he would be kissed right then and there, and that the tangled orders of their subconscious minds were the same. They were both in a trance, both lonely and desirous of each other. He took the glass after a second and said, Thanks, Ted. You're welcome, Ted said, then asked, Where's the bathroom? There. He was sitting on the bed putting on some dry socks when Ted returned. He smiled up at him, thinking he would not be alone tonight. Tonight, there would be Ted, and if there weren't any Teds or Gaylords, he'd go searching for someone else. Someone. But tonight, there would be Ted. He would be there, and he would smile, saying, You're very nice, Paul. Very nice. Ted sat on the bed. You've a lovely apartment, Paul. Almost too nice to leave. Well, you don't have to, Paul said, and his fingers trembled around the glass. He was in a flush stage looking at Ted, seated so close, and it was almost too much to bear just sitting there. He was like a little schoolboy being tempted by a stick of striped candy. How's your drink? Paul tasted it again, said, Very good. How's yours? Fine. Would you mind staying in? Of course not. I'd rather. It's so nasty outside. He took a deep drink and arose. I'll turn on the radio. Didn't Ted know he didn't want to go out, he thought? Was he going to have to make the first move? In his present savage mood, he wanted no delay. The quicker, the better. The whiskey was taking effect, making him warm inside. Might as well get it over with. Find out about his companion. Why don't you take off your coat and tie? Get comfortable. If you don't mind, that's a good idea. Ted took off his coat and tossed it over the back of a chair. He untied the cravat and unbuttoned his stiffly starched collar. That is better. Wonder who invented them. He ran his hand over his neck. Kinda hard on the neck, aren't they? Kinda, I wish, Paul said savagely, still mindful of his thoughts and the soft smile. I wish they'd take stiff collars and throw them to the wind. To the wind? Paul looked at him, seeing him masculine, tender, high-cheeked, wide of eyebrows, fair, and a lump formed in his throat. The mouth was just right, with a touch of wry humor about it, and the eyes looked out of hidden mysteries. He's married, he found himself thinking. He's married and has a wife in Los Angeles. It was only a quick thought, for Ted had suddenly taken him in his arms. He shivered inside himself, and the tenseness seemed unbearable. He went up on tiptoes to meet the lips, his eyes closing. His arm stole upward about the neck, and lips met his, hot and passionately. The radio blared out a jazz tune, but was not heard by either of them. Paul's mind ran riot then. Figures came before him, and pictures after pictures, and all the while, he was in Ted's arms, giving back each kiss, meeting each demand. His own robe rustled slightly. He heard the sound of loose change rattle as Ted drew off his trousers. It stopped with a clump as they fell to the carpet. His robe fell silently on them. And then their bare bodies met and hands dug deep of each one's flesh. They laid back on the goatskin and Ted's grip on his arms were loops of steel. His lips of wine and his body was night descending. On the other side of town, Dusty, glamorous female impersonator, set sewing sequins on a new drag. His slightly bald head ached and it required an effort to focus his eyes upon the tiny openings. His lover brushed the drops of rain from his forehead as he came into the room. He looked at Dusty with an indifferent glance and lit a cigarette. Did you get a bottle, Bill? Dusty asked. No, he answered harshly. I didn't get a bottle. Why in the hell didn't you? Dusty glared back at him. Isn't that what you went out for? Where's my five? Your five, yelled Bill. So it's your five now. Well, I spent it on a good piece of ass. I need something good for a change. What else you want to know? If I thought you did, oh, shut up. The sound of his voice in the tumult was so clear and definite, so full of pure scorn and rage, that Dusty stopped cold. He grabbed a pair of scissors and clutched them tightly. His face was contorted. Don't tell me to shut up, you no-good son of a bitch. Don't you ever tell me to shut up, you damn cheap pimp. He shrieked with rage. Shut up, Bill yelled and threw his cigarette at Dusty. 
There followed a shocking crash at Bill's feet. Looking down quickly, he saw a confusion of glass fragments and the cigarette butts bounding across the floor. Bill laughed loud. I don't need an ashtray. He laughed again real loud and dodged a glistening object that shot past him. He coolly raised his eyes and, with another loud laugh, yelled, You missed me, you wild-tempered bitch. He laughed again. I don't need a haircut. Still grinning savagely, he came toward Dusty like a wrestler meeting a better one. You damn wild cat, but I like him wild, so I can tame him. There was a sound of tearing cloth. Dusty screamed, and his long nails dug long, bloody furrows down Bill's face. He only laughed louder and tightened his grip. Don't. God damn you. You're hurting my arm. Say you love me. Say it. Come on. Say it. Stop. You bastard. I said say it. He swung Dusty roughly to face him. Don't, Bill. You know how I feel toward you. Don't be so goddamn jealous. Ain't you getting enough? It's not that. What is it? I've got enough for five women, but I'm saving it just for you. You hear that? Just you. You jealous bitch. Someday I'm going to break your damn neck. Come here. His mouth came down in a hard, devouring kiss, and as the room reeled about him, Dusty thought, He's no good. No good at all. But I don't care. I love him. Through the closed windows, Paul could hear the rain still falling. He did not want to flee this time, only to settle back peacefully on the wide bed with the darkness around him like a living thing, around and within, filling up the echoing contentedness of his heart. Paul said lazily, I want a cigarette. Want one, Ted? Uh Uh-huh. There's some in my shirt. I've got some right here. And Paul swung sideways and turned on a lamp. Something lay forlorn on the floor near the bed. It was their clothes. He grinned, looking at them, and reached for a cigarette box. He handed Ted a lighted one and lit one for himself. Then he put a pillow behind Ted's back and asked, How's that? Wonderful. Only one thing missing. Ted held out his arms and the other crawled into them. I just like to lay here and dream and dream. Dream of what? Just dream. No bad dreams, I hope. Just pleasant ones? Some are good. One isn't. What isn't? When are you going back to Los Angeles and your wife? I'm not going back, he answered. He glanced at the hand in his. It was strong, long-fingered, manicured, and entirely capable. He looked for lines of effeminacy in the face, but the eyes were male, yet tender and kind. They reminded him of a picture he had seen in the Huntington Library in Pasadena of a young man of days long past, but he couldn't remember the artist or the name of the picture. He went on, No, Paul, I'm not going back. I never intended to. I'm divorced. His mouth was so close to the others that his breath rustled against the other's lips. So this wasn't a one-night stand after all, Paul thought, and they wouldn't be wasting last moments laughing at each other, telling how much fun it had been and hoped to see you again. He would not stroll back to the bedroom alone after he had said goodbye to Ted, because he was not leaving. Or was he? Are you staying in New Orleans? Paul asked. I'm staying in New Orleans. I hope you'll let me come back once in a while. You're always welcome. You know that. Thanks, Paul. Tonight has been mine, and I'll never forget it. I wish it could go on and on. It's been mine too, Paul. I don't know when I've ever been so contented. I don't seem to remember the things bothering me before I met you. And my mind was full, real full. I didn't know which way to turn, or where to go. I wanted to stay in New Orleans, and I didn't. I wanted to go, and I didn't know where to go. He sighed deeply. Ever been in that shape? Paul was assailed with a familiar pang of loneliness, and from the street, a girl screamed with delight, and a horn from a passing cab caught it up and carried it deep into his mind. Why was he remembering drinking coffee at the dingy old French market? Why was he remembering the place he had met Arnold? Damn, that's an ugly boy, he had thought. But the ugly one had gone home with him and stayed. How happy they had been for months following that meeting. How utterly full of joy his soul had been and how handsome Arnold had become in his eyes. Yes, he had wanted to leave after their separation. He had wanted to go places, and there had been no places for forgetfulness or rest. He had come back to New Orleans to feel as lonely as he had left. I know what you mean, Ted. It's happened to me, too. Paul, are you crying? I'm sorry. I was just thinking. 
He smiled, and his eyes were dry. Of someone? He used to live with me. Oh, Ted's voice was distant and grave. Still miss him? No, I don't miss him. I'm glad it's all over. Do you like to live alone? I detest it. Why don't you live with me? It was just that suddenly. Would you really want me to? I asked you, didn't I? I know you did, Paul, but... But what? Not sure, he said slowly. I don't think I know how to explain. I don't know if I belong to your sort of world, for one thing. What is your sort of world? Paul asked. I'm not sure, really. Please believe me. I don't know. You see, I am divorced. Free of the girl I spent three years with. She wasn't bad. Yes, it was my fault she fell in love with another man. We didn't belong, even though we tried. I could see she wasn't happy, and I think she knew I wasn't. I tried to be a man, and the first year was quite happy, but after that I began to be restless. I was mixed up like an unworked puzzle, all to pieces. I even went to a psychiatrist, but it didn't do any good. It's tough to enjoy both sexes. I guess it is, Paul muttered. I've never had an affair with a woman. Don't guess I ever will. I've been gay all my life. Queer, normal people call it. You're not so queer. You don't know me very well. You don't know what a bitch I really am. I've been in love lots of times. Each time I knew it was the real thing, but it wasn't. They all leave. Like Gaylord. Gaylord? I met him a few nights ago and fell madly in love again. Why isn't he with you? He lives in Texas. He's in love with someone else. Oh. Tonight, I'm in love with you. See? I'm really a bitch. I fall in love. I cruise. I do everything a common bitch does. But tonight, I do love only you. You don't believe me, do you? I don't know. It's hard to believe love is so easily found. Easy? No, it isn't easy knowing you will leave, too. Leave? I'm the one that gets left all the time. He'll have a hard time getting rid of me. You mean I've got a roommate? You have one if you want one. If you'd call me a roommate. I hope you don't. You work fast, too, don't you, Ted? Gotta be fast. I'm getting old. How old? I'm old enough. See? So you got hair on your chest. That's old enough for me. We're not a bit alike. You know that, don't you, Ted? Paul looked him straight in the eyes. There's no reserve about me. I lose my temper on the slightest provocation, flare up and get so mad I could kill. He smiled and pinched Ted's arm. That's all right with me. I may help you, grinned Ted. You want to get rid of me? Scare me so I won't move in? Suddenly, Paul rubbed his cheek against the others. I don't want to get rid of you, he whispered. I just want you to know what you're going to have to put up with. But I don't want to get rid of you. I want you to stay. I'll take my chances. I'll stay. Ted kissed the lips close by. And I'll take my chances too, whispered Paul. He was about to enter a new life beginning with this moment. Tomorrow it would continue, and the following tomorrows? Who knows? End of Chapter 25 Chapter 26 New Orleans was a pleasant memory, and the Sunday morning following his return, Gaylord awoke at 7.30. To him, now lying wide-eyed and motionless on his bed, he remembered Blake had not called last night as he said he would. A frightening feeling that his perfect existence might crumble made him fidgety. He lived through their past week, through evenings they had been together. His hand pressed against the silk pajama pants, tenderly cupped his flesh, and dreams filled his brain. He whispered, I want you, Bob. I wish you were here in my arms now. I wish I were in your arms. Why didn't you call last night like you said you would? He had waited for the call alone in the living room until 10.30. Several times he had been on the verge of calling, but had put it off. Then it was too late, and he had given up and gone to bed. Hurrying up the stairs to his room last night, his heart had been heavy. His mind muddled. Was Blake peeved with him? Had he done something wrong? No, nothing he knew of. Something must have come up, but he could have at least called. 
He had picked up a book and gone to bed and read until twelve before he had finally turned out the light, and then sleep had come quickly. On this beautiful Sunday morning he drew new courage, and with it came a gnawing in his stomach. I'm hungry, he decided. I should be, I guess. I didn't have any supper. I think I'd like a glass of milk. He moved quietly down the stairs, not wanting to awaken his parents, who always slept late Sundays. They had gone out early Saturday evening and had not returned until Sunday morning. He went to the kitchen. Out of a cupboard, he got a glass and tiptoed to the large refrigerator. Filling it with milk, he selected three cookies out of a pottery jar. He paused a moment, listening, wondering if he had awakened his parents. But no sound came from their rooms, except the low snoring of his father. The house was silent. With the glass of white liquid and cookies in his hand, he went back to his room and slumped into a chair. He turned on the radio and nibbled at the pastry. As he listened to the organ music, he couldn't help thinking of Blake. He reached over and turned up the volume. He loved organ music, and the deep, mellow tones seemed to climb and intertwine in the large tropical leaves that arose from behind the bed. As he listened, he felt such a sense of loss and desolation sweep upon him that he snapped it off. Bob, he thought, where did you go last night? Did you have a date with Joy? He was alone again and didn't like it. He wanted to be around people, and again he didn't. What should he do? Where should he go? I'll go to church, he said, biting his lip. Church always makes me feel good. He looked at his watch. Yes, he had time to make it to the eight o'clock mass if he hurried. In his bathroom, he took a quick shower and carefully combed his hair. He critically examined his image in the mirror, then reached for the pink powder puff. It stopped in midair. No, he snapped. I'm not going to use you anymore. He threw it in the wastebasket. He reached for his favorite suit from behind the closet door and donned it quickly. With one last glance in the door and mirror, he gave his cravat a final jerk. You look all right, Gaylord Leclerc, he said out loud. You look fine without powder. He grinned and thought of Blake again. I'll see you after church, he said in a low voice. And you'd better have a good excuse about last night, too. He ran a finger over each eyebrow, left the mirror, and started for his car. The sound of the mighty pipe organ, together with the chanting voices, filled the air. Gaylord ascended the stone steps of St. Philip's Catholic Church. His specially tuned ear caught the clear tenor voice of a classmate. How beautiful, he sang, and how ugly the mouth from where the sweet tones came. He entered the outer vestibule and dipped his fingers into the holy water, crossed himself, and gazed down the long vista of the center aisle, where the sanctuary lamp glistened in gold and crimson comfort before the marble altar. Rays of morning sun fell through circles of stained glass. They crossed and recrossed and lay rose golden upon it. Before the shrine of St. Joseph, a pyramid of candles flickered, and on the main altar were more. These stood white and straight in their gold-encrusted holders with flames like twinkling stars. The church was crowded, and he was almost at the altar rail before he had found a vacant seat. He would have preferred one at the rear of the church. Here he felt everyone's eyes upon him. Why did he have to be so self-conscious? Inside the pew, he knelt on the footrail, crossed himself again, bowed his head and prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, the organ swelled and the voices raised and mingled with his prayers. Dominus Vobiscum, chanted the priest. Gaylord rose from his knees. God be with you, he whispered. He looked at the priest. The rays of sunlight fell and gleamed on the brocaded chessable, heavily embroidered with silver and gold threads. He watched the altar boy, surrounded with the sweet-smelling half-circles of smoke, and wondered if he was as bored with the whole surroundings as he seemed to be. He had never been an altar boy. The priest had asked him several times, but he had been afraid, afraid he would do something wrong or trip over the long red skirt. Deep in his heart, he cursed himself for being afraid. He would have loved nothing better than being an altar boy. Bless my mother and father, he prayed. Don't ever let me do anything to hurt them. Make me lose these sissy ways, please, dear God. Help me do the right things and see what's right from wrong. Please help me. Give me strength and courage to face people and talk without being so bashful. Make me like Bob. Make me a man. Please, blessed virgin, help me. Holy Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus, is it wrong for me to love Bob? Please tell me. I'm sorry for what I did to Joy. Deeply sorry. Forgive me and don't let her hate me. Our Father, who art in heaven. As he sat there praying, he was perked out of his daze by a sour, stale wreck of alcohol. It can't be him, he thought. It can't be the drunk who thought I was a girl. Still, it could. And he breathed heavily as the hangover breath assailed his nostrils. He sat there praying it wasn't, dying to turn around and see for himself, but he was afraid to. He knelt again when church was over, and as he did, he glanced at the man behind him who was leaving. It wasn't him, and he let out a deep sigh. He wasn't in a hurry to leave. Everyone else seemed to be, for the aisle was crowded. He knelt there and said another prayer. The church was almost empty when he did leave. On the front steps, a loud buzzing of mixed voices greeted him as he stepped through the door. He shaded his eyes and looked over them for a quick moment. He wished he didn't have to walk past so many people. He wished he was in his car and on his way home. A middle-aged woman came up to him, smiled, and spoke. Hello, Gaylord. How nice to see you in church. Good morning, Miss James, he smiled back at her. He walked down the steps and spoke to several more he knew among the chattering throng, and then, blinking in the sunshine, he stopped because standing right in front of him stood Glenn Rogers, his face all smiles. Hi, Gay, Rogers said cheerfully, and the dimples deepened. I didn't know you were Catholic. Hi, Glenn. Yes, I'm one, but I don't go to church as often as I should. Don't guess you'd call me a very good Catholic, Rogers grinned, said. My mother makes me. Mine doesn't. Maybe it would be a good thing if she did. Don't hurt you, I guess. But some Sundays I'd rather do other things. Rogers rubbed his eyes. This sun sure is bright, isn't it? Sure is. I'll be glad to get rid of this coat. Gaylord looked at the heavy fabric. How could he stand it? Why, even with this thin tropical gabardine he wore, it was warm. Rogers must be roasting. Mine's hot, too, he agreed. I was going to call you last night and ask you if you wanted to go to the show with me. I wish you would have. I stayed home all evening. I was afraid you didn't like westerns, so I went alone. Then, too, I just knew you wouldn't be home on Saturday night. I've called during the week, and you're never at home. Do you ever stay home? I've been running around a lot lately. He looked at Rogers, but saw a deep bronze face. Blake's face was as plain as if it were before him. I'll call you tonight. It said, we'll go places, just you and I. He felt like someone peering through the keyhole of a locked door, a door that had no key or even knob for him to turn and enter. Footsteps echoed in his mind, whispers and memories, and he wished the vision was less remote and himself anything but the creature that he was in this soft coat and shirt, his creased trousers. Tilly Rogers, neat and trim, broke Gaylord's vision. I bet you're Gaylord, she said, and the dimples in her cheeks deepened. Yes, ma'am, I am. I bet you're Mrs. Rogers. She extended her gloved hand. It's nice to meet you, Gaylord. Glenn has talked and talked about you. It's about time we met. Thanks, Mrs. Rogers, said Gaylord. He liked the way she spoke. He looked at Rogers, then back at her. I hope it's been good things you've been hearing. They certainly have been. She turned from one boy to the other. Glenn doesn't make friends easily, but he certainly has taken to you. Mother, blushed Rogers. Well, you have, haven't you? Well, I think a lot of Glenn, too, put in Gaylord. He liked Mrs. Rogers very much. She made you feel so at ease. Why, Gaylord LeClaire, a woman cried in a fish peddler's voice. I ain't seen the likes of you in near a couple of years. She reached out and hugged him vigorously right there in front of everybody. Gaylord blushed at his mother's ex-housekeeper's actions. She was crude, but she had been so good to him. He had been sorry when she left them to get married. Hello, Selma, Gaylord said. He tried to smile. You sure growing. Look more like your pa than ever. Darn if you don't. She scratched under her arm. How's your folks? They were all watching, and he felt embarrassed. Why should he feel that way? Even if her hat was outdated or the rouge on her cheeks smeared. What did it matter? Selma, he began, this is Mrs. Rogers and Glenn Rogers. Pleased to meet you. She held out her rough, naked hand. Mrs. Rogers and her son knew this farm woman type. 
They held out their hands to her, and she squeezed each with a tight, warm grip. They talked for a while, and then Selma left. Gaylord breathed a sigh of relief. He waved back at her and kept remembering the birthday cake she made for him. They talked of Selma, and then Mrs. Rogers asked, Why don't you come and have breakfast with Glenn, Gaylord? Yeah, broke in Rogers. Come and have breakfast with me, Gay. How could he refuse? It was still early. Probably Blake was still in bed. He wouldn't stay long, and he could call from Glenn's and let his mother know where he was. He'd call after he had eaten, because his parents were probably in bed, too. Well, uh, come on, Gay, pleaded Rogers. All right, I've got my car. I'll meet you at your house, Rogers said. I'll ride with you and make sure you do. He grinned, and the dimples grew deep. That'll be fine, beamed Mrs. Rogers. You two boys run along. Won't you come with us, Mrs. Rogers? He asked. Thanks, but I have a way home. A neighbor brought us to church, and she'd wonder where I was. I'll see you at the house. We'll see you. Bye. And Gaylord and Rogers walked away. After the old-fashioned breakfast, Gaylord was so pleasantly aware of the overstuffed chair's comfort he never noticed the upholstery of pressed flush, flowered rug, cheap oak table flanked with family portraits, or even the plain electric bulb hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the room. But it was Mrs. Rogers who did affect him. She had served them calmly on a table covered with oilcloth, and her hands, unornamented except for a wide wedding band, had been busy moving over the stove, dishes, and table. I never want to see any more food, he said, rubbing his stomach. Rogers looked at the relaxed figure, said, I don't either. I had a glass of milk and some cookies before I went to church. Then those hot cakes and eggs and grits. I bet your mother thinks I'm awful. She should, the way I ate. She would have if you wouldn't have eaten anything, grinned Rogers. Gaylord was glad Mr. Rogers wasn't there, and he never asked about him. The telephone rang, and though Rogers arose to answer it, his mother had already done so. Phone will get me out of my chair. I think that's about the only thing that would. He smiled and slumped in his old position. I'd better call mother, Gaylord said, realizing he had forgotten to call home. May I? She doesn't know where I am. Sure, go ahead. Mother's through. It's in the hall, Gay. I'll show you. He started to arise. Don't move, Gaylord said. I'll find it. There was an instantaneous response to his call. His mother was up and wondering about his whereabouts. Did he want to go to the country with him to see Aunt Emma? No, he didn't want to go. Had anyone called? No, no one had called. In fact, the phone had not rung all morning. Damn, Bob hasn't called yet, he thought, not listening to his mother. No, he didn't know what he was going to do today. Maybe he and Glenn would go for a drive. Yes, he'd be careful. He hung up the receiver and went back into the Rogers living room. Rogers had turned on the radio and was reading the funny paper. He laid this down when he saw Gaylord enter the room, said, Everything all right? Yes. They're going to the country to see an aunt of mine. Wanted me to go. Oh, Rogers sounded dejected. Now you'll leave. I told them I didn't want to go. Let's take a spin or something. Maybe it'll settle our breakfast. Okay. Rogers was up, willing to do anything his companion suggested. I've got to go to the bathroom first. Do you? No, I'll wait for you. Rogers started to leave, but a brilliant idea stopped him. Say, he began, let's go out to the farm, Gay. I think you'd like it. We could fish in the creek, take a swim, or just mess around. I'd like for you to see it. His eyes beamed as he thought of his beloved woods. So Blake didn't call after all, thought Gaylord. Well, he wouldn't be at home if he did call. I'll get even with him. He's a little jealous of Glenn anyway. He looked at Rogers, all smiles, and said, Sure, let's do. I think that would be fun. They walked into Rogers' room, and he had already ripped off his tie. Gotta change these clothes, Rogers said, and then we can go by your house and you can change yours. Won't take me long. And it wasn't long before Rogers stood disrobed. He left on his shorts, and Gaylord watched him as he put on a pair of khakis. Hard work had made his arms and legs strong and muscular. His chest was broad under the undershirt of cotton and a few hairs were visible at its neckline. He put on other socks and slipped on his old boots. Glenn, Gaylord exclaimed, I haven't any cowboy boots. Are shoes all right? Sure, but they sure get scratched. Do you have some old ones? These are old. Rogers looked at the polished shoes. Don't look old to me. They look brand new. He reached under the bed. Here, wear these, he said, handing Gaylord his good boots. 
Try these on. I couldn't wear your good ones. They're not new. Just polish them, grinned Rogers. Try them on, Gay. He tried them on, and they fit perfect. They felt good to him, maybe just because they belonged to Rogers, maybe because he had never had on a pair before. I hate to wear your good boots, Glenn. I might get them scratched. So what? I can shine them again, said Rogers. Better take some shoes, too, in case your feet get tired. Shortly thereafter, Gaylord, equipped with cowboy boots and accompanied by Rogers, departed for his home. Rogers was already in a gay mood over the anticipated outing. His mood increased still further when he learned that Gaylord was anxious to see his old haunts, and it made him feel good that his friend wore his boots. His joy was so obvious and overflowing, it seemed to rub off to Gaylord, for he too looked happy. Blake was forgotten. For the first time, he was wearing cowboy boots and going fishing. Maybe this was the turning point of his life. He was doing what other boys did. He had never been privileged to enjoy such a friendship before, and he found it fun to be going fishing. His father had tried to arouse his interest in sports and hunting, but somehow this was different. His mother had always discouraged such things with the pretext that it was unsafe and dangerous for Gaylord to shoot or cast. Why, he might get shot or put his eye out. Though Carol LeClaire had been sincere in deploring these, she had unknowingly blundered. She never once realized how unhappy her son actually was. But this morning he was a real boy, and there was no question of unsuitability, of getting shot or blinded. He had thrown the powder puff away and now wore good shiny skin. And he was actually going fishing. Do you have a reel for me, Glenn? I don't have any. No, but I've got some poles. You can't use a rod and reel where we're going. That's fine. Don't you worry about any of that stuff. Just leave it all to me. Okay. It seemed the night had descended again on entering the Leclerc's living room. Gaylord immediately drew the drapes and opened the blinds. Kind of dark, wasn't it? He said. Let's go to my room, and I'll change. Rogers followed him up the stairs. He liked the feel of the carpet under his boots. This rug's soft as cow... He stopped and laughed. Gaylord grinned at him. Did you mean cow shit? How'd you know? That's what you were going to say, wasn't it? Well, yes. Say it then. It is soft, isn't it? They both are, grinned Rogers. It was an odd comparison, but it struck Gaylord as being rather clever. In his room, Gaylord bade Rogers to make himself at home and that he would hurry. Rogers glanced from the drapes to the large nude picture. He was impressed by everything. Turn, this is a pretty room, he said and meant every word. Like it, Glenn? I did it myself. You did? Sure did. I didn't know you could paint in paper. Mother does, but I didn't think you could. I can't worth a darn. I helped her pace, though. I can do that. Oh, I didn't do the actual work. I just chose the colors and things. You sure did a good job. It sure is pretty. Let's see, Gaylord began, opening his clothes closet and looking back at Rogers. What in the world should I wear? He wished he had said hell. Anything old. There's lots of brush, so don't wear anything good, because you might ruin it. Gaylord pulled out a pair of light blue gabardine slacks, said, Guess these'll do. Hell, Gay, Rogers cried. Those look brand new. Don't you have some jeans or khakis? They're not new, and I'm tired of them anyway. He wasn't going to confess. He had neither one suggested. He sat down and tried to pull off the boots, but couldn't. He laughed and followed instructions as Rogers came to his rescue. You've got a high instep, Rogers grinned. He took hold of the boot with both hands and grinned again. Now push. Gaylord pushed and stretched his toes free. Boy, what a fit. Think I can get them back on? Sure, you can get them back on. Gaylord undressed, leaving on his silk shorts. He wore no undershirt. The shorts kept Roger's gaze. His mother had some of the same material. He had seen them on the clothesline. Of course, they were made different and were not white. Funny, he thought. I didn't know men wore silk underwear. He picked up a magazine and looked, uninterested at the pictures. Do you know, spoke Gaylord, this is the first time I've been fishing? He didn't mind confessing this horrible secret to Glenn Rogers. It is, said Rogers, and laid down the magazine. That's about all I used to do on Sundays. Gaylord answered eagerly that he knew it was going to be fun, but that he was dumb, that Rogers was going to have to be his teacher. As far as he was concerned, he didn't even know how to bait a hook. 
The sun was rising between the tree branches, which veiled it without hiding it. It shone through the Selenese glass curtains and fell across the bed. There were a few sounds. A rooster crowed, a bird chirped in the window tree, a truck passed on the street which lay beyond the alley. Yes, it was a perfect day for anything. All his perplexities, all his worries were relegated to another sphere. He forgot that he had wondered why Blake hadn't called. He had even forgotten to deepen the waves in his hair or care that one button was off on the sports shirt he had just slipped on. Things like that were far away and so unimportant here and now. As Roger said, it was unimportant how you looked or dressed when you went fishing. He slipped on the boots again. It was fun to be wearing something that belonged to Roger's. He grinned at Roger's then and said, They go on a lot easier than they came off, don't they? I told you they would. That's right. You did, didn't you? Uh-huh. Ready? Already. Watch out, fish. Here we come. Oh, I almost forgot. You said I'd better take some shoes, didn't you, Glenn? I think it would be a good idea. So do I. I don't know how long I'll be able to walk in these. Not a very good cowboy, I'm afraid. But I'll try. And he walked bow-legged to the clothes closet. They went downstairs, and Gaylord suggested some sandwiches. Just in case they didn't catch any fish, he grinned. Maybe a good idea, Rogers said slowly. Sorry he had not suggested it himself. Gaylord talked disjointedly as he buttered the bread and ran to the refrigerator where he brought out sliced ham, cheese, pickles, and sliced salami. Can't I help? put in Rogers. I've just about got everything under control, like salami. Oh, yeah. In that drawer are some luncheon claws, Glenn. You can get one of those out if you will. We don't need any. We might. It'll get dirty. So what? It can be washed. We'll have a picnic, too. If we catch some fish, we can fry them over the fire like they do in the movies. I'll take a skillet and some lard, too. That would be fun. I think it will be, too. Gaylord's voice sounded excited. How do you know you're going to like fishing, Gay? That's just it, he answered, pushing the cloth over the top of the box he had packed. I don't really know, but at last I'm going to have a chance to find out whether or not I like it. Thanks to you. They left the house and were off to adventure. End of Chapter 26 Chapter 27 Lynn Rogers sat back in the leather seat of the cream convertible and pushed his legs out in front of him. From time to time he gazed at Gaylord with increasing admiration, not unmixed with awe. He had never heard of a boy who had never gone fishing, and the consciousness that other things might exceed it in fun and opportunity opened new vistas to him. Moreover, the thought that Mr. Leclerc had never taken his son fishing puzzled him. Still, neither had his father taken him. He had always gone alone or with friends. He wondered at Gaylord's likes and dislikes and hoped his suggestion would not end in disaster. After all, he didn't know too much about Gaylord. He was certainly not well informed about his hobbies. But now that the question had arisen, he dismissed it easily with the certainty everything would work out. Only Gaylord was so advantageously placed that he could choose or pick where he would go or what he would do. Would he have chosen this himself? Don't expect too much, Gay. Gaylord, now well along on a strange road, said he didn't, that everything would be better than staying home or going to a movie. The woods hasn't been cleared out, Rogers went on. Guess you'd rather have gone someplace else. Glenn Rogers, stop worrying about me. I'm thrilled to death about going. Why, today, I'd rather be out in the woods fishing than any place I know. He spoke reassuringly, easing Rogers' fear. As they rode along, Rogers pointed out familiar landmarks. Old Man Turner's water well, where, he said, when they were pumping for the rice fields, he had once gone swimming. In that big house lived his widowed aunt. She was his mother's only sister and had six kids. No, that field wasn't oats. It was flax. Turn here, Gay. Gaylord obeyed and turned down a narrow dirt lane. The air was warm and seemed to cheer him. It was good to be out of the heavy traffic where you had to be so careful. Good to be able to drive at ease and watch the moving landscape. He reached a wooden gate and stopped. An immense chain circled it and a cedar post, and he wondered how Rogers would ever open it. It was both fascinating and puzzling to him because as if by magic the gate swung open under Rogers' touch. Giving it a shove, Rogers drew back to let him pass. Rogers jumped back into the car, said, This is the farm. Now, just follow the path until I tell you to turn. 
and turn, it's rough. Not like you used to be. But you can't get people to keep your place as good as you would. I used to have it as smooth as glass, except when it rained. Boy, it's impossible. I don't mind the bumps, and I bet it is bad when it rains. It's so black. That's our house. Rogers pointed to a small wooden house with a porch, which, as Gaylord first peered, at it seemed to consist mostly of small, brightly painted window frames, though these were flanked on either side by white walls. It wasn't an unattractive house, and he was presently aware of the many blooming rose bushes around it. He turned a questioning gaze on Rogers. Who planted all those rose bushes? Mother, said Rogers, whose natural orbit surrounded him, including the spreading tree on the right side of the house. They're sure in bloom. We won't stop now, Rogers said good-naturedly. But if you want some, we can stop on the way back. I don't want any. They're too pretty to pick, and by the time we got home, they'd be dead. Thanks anyway, Glenn. They passed the house, stables, and fenced-in corrals, over an open cattle guard, and headed for a solid line of trees outlining the horizon in front of them. There's Jake, cried Rogers. Hi, Jake, he waved his hand. Gaylord turned when Rogers referred to Jake. He saw a brown-faced middle-aged man, dressed in overalls, sitting on top of a red tractor. He waved without speaking and continued down the plowed rows as unobtrusively as he had approached. Jake and his wife farm for us. They're not bad renters. She dips snuff. That's what mother doesn't like. I don't see why anyone would want to use that nasty stuff. I don't either, but she does. Spits in a can and has a piece of stick in her mouth all the time. Roger's hand went in front of him. See that big tree over there? Gaylord nodded. Pull up under it and your car will be in the shade. You mean this is it? This is it. I don't see any creek. Rogers laughed and grinned. It's just in the woods a little ways. You'll see it. He stopped under the tree's low branches and they both got out. Gaylord pulled at the moss that hung from them like beards from old men. He remembered another woods of days past, a woods and creek that ran through the oil fields he used to live in. He remembered how they used to run hand in hand across the yards and then crawl under the barbed wire which protected the creek and woods from the cows which grazed among the yards. Safely inside, he and past playmates used to play in the small creek. They fished for minnows with bent pins for hooks and grasshoppers for bait. All the memories of the creek running under the cluster of willows were so acutely happy that they forced a sudden longing to Gaylord's eyes. In those days he had been joyous with every sense of the body. He had often thought since that that kind of happiness would never come again, that it had been lost when they had moved away. Perhaps he had been wrong. Gaylord's eyes were brought back to the present by catching the glint of light on the box under Roger's arm and now Rogers looked at him and bade him follow. These sandwiches sure are going to be good, Rogers grinned. I hope so. Is the box heavy? No, it's not heavy. Come on, Gay. The last outline of plowed fields dropped behind them, and with it the smell of dust, and gave way to a fresh clean smell of things growing. Gaylord realized with little amazement that they were already in thick brush. Why, they had only started and already the thickets lay behind them. A squirrel dashed past and scampered up the beaten bark of an old tree. Gaylord, startled, walked closer to Rogers, walked on the thick mold beneath his feet. The wet scent of decayed wood and loam came up into his nostrils like something new and undiscovered, and each sound, each step, seemed to intensify the stillness, the mystery of the place. He saw a lizard sunning itself under a sunspot, and somehow he was not scared or surprised when it scampered for new grounds. He was thinking of snakes now, and with the thought came a big splash of water. This scared him. Panting and grabbing Rogers, he asked, What was that? Just an old bullfrog, Rogers replied, unconcerned. Then he remembered the tone of the voice. Turning around, he said, Nothing to be scared of, Gay. It scared me. I was thinking of snakes. There ain't no snakes here. A little white lie wouldn't hurt. I hope not. I hate the slimy things. He heard the sound of his feet trying to keep step with Rogers. How much further? he asked. Not very far. Tired? No, just wondering. Hot? Sort of. Rogers wiped his brow. He looked at Gaylord, saw no sweat, and the thin shirt was not sticking to his slender body as his was. Then, at last, he announced, We're almost there. 
Gaylord gave a deep sigh. I'm glad. These thickets are pretty rough. After about ten yards, they came to a clearing, worn bare of berry thickets and grapevines. The creek ran smooth, and quiet sunbeams glimmered and flashed on its moving surface. No rocks, no rapids, disturbed or darkened its cool color. It mirrored only the image of arcing green. Gaylord liked what he saw, and dreamily followed the flight of four dragonflies that skimmed the surface of the water under the arc of trees. He watched them until they vanished. The green world swam about him blocking out the glaring outside world on all sides, and the high-bending trees followed suit. Patches of sun, shining like spotlights, formed on the cool short grass and sand and clear water. Now and then the deafening silence was broken by the chirp of a bird, crickets, and occasionally the splash of a frog. Glenn, Gaylord said with an air of enchantment, this is beautiful, just beautiful. His boots sank in the soft sand beige sand that continued in a gentle slope until it melted into the clear water. Memories, the greatest of arts, recreated for Gaylord scenes out of the past that must have taken place here. Scenes now in action, now in words, bits of dialogue, touched him deeply, remembering all the time that this was Glenn Rogers' paradise, or had been. And then Rogers made it more fascinating by saying he had found several Indian arrows. He had even found an old rusty hatchet. Gaylord could see their naked red skins plainly as he listened, could even see the teepees they lived in and the cruel tomahawks they scalped with. They must have been a carefree people, though, living all over America long before the pioneers came. He said, I saw some Indians in Oklahoma City. Of course, they don't look like they used to. I don't guess they do. Dad says there's lots of them in Arizona, live on a reservation. I'd hate to live on one, wouldn't you? I sure would. Guess you'd have to get permission to do anything on a reservation, probably even to leave it, Gaylord grinned. If we lived on one, we couldn't go fishing, could we? That's right. We came here to fish, didn't we? Rogers got up from his squatting position. I have some poles and a seine over by that shed I built. He pointed to a small shelter almost hidden with brush. Three handmade poles lay against it and continued up the tree trunk. From inside the shelter, he drew a tarpaulin, unfolded it, and brought forth a seine. Damn, you're smart, Glenn, Gaylord said by his side. You want a nickel? Then he brought out a shovel. And if we can't catch any bait, we can go dig for some. There's lots of worms. With only their shorts on, they pulled the seine through the shallow water, and it wasn't long before they had a can full of minnows. Gaylord fell once, but he only laughed and pulled at the wet shorts sticking close to his body. Rogers baited one of the hooks and handed the pole to Gaylord. Then he baited one for himself. He heard an owl and hooted back at it. Then together they threw their lines. Bet ya I catch the first one, grinned Gaylord. You won't if you stay there. Better try over here. He didn't mind. After all, he didn't know anything about fishing, but Glenn did. They were silent after he had moved to the spot where Rogers had indicated. What kind of fish are in here? whispered Gaylord. Perch and catfish. I hope I catch a perch. I hope you do too, smiled Rogers. Let him catch one, he prayed. Let his hook go under real quick and let him pull out a perch. I've got one, Gaylord cried and pulled a small sand perch out of the water. I've got a fish. Damn, if you haven't. Want me to take him off for you? Yeah, but don't hurt him, giggled Gaylord seriously. Rogers laughed. He's already hurt. He's not so small, is he? He's not so big. Grinned Rogers, holding the perch in his hands, he stretched out to Gaylord. Here, he grinned. Want him? No. Don't they stick? Feel. He fell to the flopping fish in Rogers' hand and added, Isn't he pretty? Yeah. Wish he was bigger. He's big enough. Bait my hook and I'll catch a Lulu this time. Okay. I'll spit on it for luck. They stood motionless for a long time and the warm fragrant air filled his lungs deeply. Gaylord wished for another bite, and Rogers helped, but the creek seemed vacant. He watched a bird fly skyward. It seemed so free, so happy. Now he remembered Blake, and with it came a confused emotion. He turned and looked at Rogers, leaning against the end of a tree stump. Glenn, he said slowly. Yeah? Let's go swimming. I was just going to ask you if you wanted to. I think you caught the only fish in here. He threw his pole on the sand. Come on, 
I'll be in. Rogers threw his shorts on the sand and ran naked for the water. He was not embarrassed here. This was his hideout from the outside world, the spot he loved best. There in the quiet running water under the trees whose roots reached down into the sandy soil and fixed themselves in the bank like a protecting hand, he had swum many times. Lying at their base, he had looked up into the sky and dreamed of being twenty-one and of all the things he would then be able to accomplish. Gaylord's eyes traveled over Roger's body. He felt that there was in Roger's a memory of Blake which expressed itself in the flesh, in Roger's skin, and in the eyes and hair, especially in the warm light of his eyes. The body reminded him of a graceful tree that had sprung up adventitiously from the chance dropping of a seed. To rid what he was feeling, Gaylord drew off his shorts and splashed through the water. For some reason or other, he wasn't ashamed for Rogers to see him naked. In the water, a few minutes later, Rogers swam over to the cliff and scampered onto a log that extended over the water. Rogers stood naked there on the end of the log, his hands on his hips, his eyes on Gaylord, and the dimples in his cheeks were very deep. Gaylord looked up at him and grinned. Well, he thought. You got your wish, Gaylord LeClaire. There's Glenn right before you, and he's as naked as a newborn babe. Gaylord watched and admired the developed naked body. He wondered what was going on behind the smiling eyes, wondered what was going through the handsome head. He wondered all this, and as he watched the muscles of the arms and legs expand with each movement, watched the sun play over the dripping hair and hips, Rogers stood grinning, his hands on his hips at him, and there was a playful twinkle in both their eyes. Well, Gaylord, he thought, you've got your wish. Take a good look. And he did exactly that. He started from the feet and ended at the grinning eyes, then went back over the naked oven brown skin, and the dripping water seemed to melt from its warmth. An undercurrent pulled at his feet, and he braced himself to meet it. The stillness lay around him, and the shadows made valleys between the brush ridges, deep and cool. Rogers broke the silence with a yell. Here I come. Below Gaylord, in the obscure depth, something moved and touched his leg. He uttered a scream of delight and with strong movements tried to swim away. A burst of bubbles burst before him and Rogers' head appeared close to his own. Boo! Rogers cried. Glenn laughed Gaylord. And a sudden warmth shot through him on feeling the other's hands around his waist. They clung together a second laughing and the warmth grew greater as their bodies touched. Gaylord's sides ached with pleasure under the other's strong hands, and he wanted to kiss the grin so close and yet so far away. Gaylord was afraid Rogers would read his eyes, and a strange new sense of shame, a hot flush, as though he had fever, swept through him. He pushed away the shoulders his hands had rested on. Then Rogers laughed. He laughed and drew Gaylord to him again. I didn't scare you, Gay, did I? he asked. Gaylord tried to laugh. Of course not. And while Rogers talked, Gaylord listened, frightened like a mouse in the paw of a cat. I sure didn't mean to. I'd never want to do that, Gay. Pensive, Gaylord listened to the pulse of silence and the water. The water alone endured the same. The log still lay at the limit of the land, and the creek ran on down its pathway to some unknown end, tracing a word of prophecy and recollection. But this was not a period for dreaming. It was a time of awakening to the fact that if he and Rogers stayed in this embrace much longer, he would inevitably yield to the passion engulfing his being. This attraction was too strong to find easy or swift appeasement, and it was quite possible it might explode unless Rogers released him. He was thankful for the water, thankful it wasn't too clear. But Rogers could feel his tense body growing more so with each passing second. He couldn't hide from this. Then Gaylord LeClaire, that sober young man whose wet hair hung over his forehead and whose blue eyes were tense, would lie a long time in his lonely bed and wish it had never happened. And yet, to just kiss those lips so close to him would be so wonderful. But he shouldn't. It wouldn't be fair to Blake, but still the longing was there. And in the warm water, a shiver went through him. You're not cold, are you, Gay? No, Glenn, he answered. I'm not cold. Are you scared of water? No, silly. It's not the water. He broke away, and there welled up in him stronger than ever that he must get away. He was not going to do anything he might regret. He was going to be like normal boys, 
not like the ones he had seen in New Orleans. He looked back at Rogers and called out, I'll beat you to the other side. Better hurry then, screamed Rogers, and started swimming after Gaylord. Gaylord did reach the other side first, but as he tried to scale the clay bank bordering the water's edge, he slipped. Rogers' embrace was waiting. Gaylord stood so still that Rogers looked at him puzzled. Then he moved and put one hand on Rogers' shoulder. I slipped, he grinned. Thanks for catching me. His hand remained on the wet flesh. But you beat me. I didn't know you were such a good swimmer. There's lots of things you don't know about me, Glenn. Now why did he say that? Is there, grinned Rogers. And the way he said it, putting his hands around the other's waist, made the blood rush to Gaylord's head. There was a blast of sound, a splash of water behind him, and Gaylord tightened both hands around Roger's neck. Is that somebody? whispered Gaylord. Just another frog, eh? Phew, guess you know I'm a baby, too. He let go of the shoulders. You're not. I'd be scared, too, in a strange place. But I don't think nothing could scare me here. Nothing? Nothing. Gaylord wished the hands around his waist would draw him close, but they just stayed there. For Gaylord, everything seemed to stop. He heard a bird's shrill cry in the tree overhead. It sounded to him like a cry of a male in search of a mate. He felt that old urge returning and dug his toes deep into the sandy bottom of the creek. Then, all of a sudden, for a quick second, his hands came up to Roger's face and he patted the wet cheeks. Then he broke away quickly and yelled, I'll race you back. And with a swift lunge, he was on his way. Glenn doesn't feel the way I do he thought, swimming through the water. He doesn't know. He probably thinks I'm a funny guy. They lay together on a bank of soft white sand, lay naked, and let the breeze blow over them. It was a little breeze, swishing through the tall trees, rustling the leaves of the creek bushes. There was a sound of frogs, and every now and then a quick splash of water, and there were wild roses blossoming around them. You could smell them in the breeze, they lay on their bellies and used their arms for a pillow. After a while, Gaylord raised his head from his arms and looked at Rogers, who grinned back at him. Gaylord said, It's good just to lay here. I feel so relaxed after swimming. He stretched his legs out full length and dug his toes into the sand. Gosh, the warm sand felt so good next to his naked body. So soft and warm. Rogers agreed and raised his head. He rested on his elbows. He was content here in his haven. There was nothing to worry about here. No fences to fix. No cows. No nothing. He picked up a twig and pulled it through the sand, drawing nothing, writing nothing. Gaylord raised on his elbows, too, and watched. Let's come back here again, Glenn, real soon. You just named the day. Next Sunday? He picked up a twig, too, and on the sand he wrote B-O-B. Then he wrote G. L. E. Suddenly, he realized what he was doing and quickly scratched over it. He turned on his back and looked into the green trees overhead. To hide what he was feeling, he grabbed a handful of sand and let it run through his fingers. Rogers rolled on his side and faced Gaylord. Next Sunday's a date, then. He took a handful of sand and let it run through his fingers. I'm glad you like it out here. I just love it. He sighed deeply. Gosh. I wish we could come out here every day. I do too. You want to fish some more? Gaylord looked into Roger's face. Do you? He asked softly. I ask you first. Oh, not particularly, unless you do. I don't care to. The soft brushes of the wind swayed the branches overhead and small specks of light shone through the clusters of leaves and danced on their naked bodies. One so brown, one so fair. Rogers picked up a rock out of the sand and tossed it into the creek. Gay, whispered Rogers. Gaylord dared not open his eyes or speak. In this wild and somewhat fearful moment, he became tense and frightened. Frightened at the thought of what he would do if Rogers suddenly kissed him. Rogers had read the name he had written in the sand, and a funny look had come over his face. Had that started something? He could not answer for the sudden lump in his throat. Gay? Rogers repeated. He opened his eyes ever so slightly, breathed, Huh? He looked at the other's soft eyes and didn't care then. I'm hungry, aren't you? Let's have a sandwich. Rogers brushed at the sand on Gaylord's chest, tickled the flat bare stomach. 
Ouch, I'm ticklish, Gaylord cried. How about here? Rogers asked menacingly, digging into the other's ribs. Are you ticklish here? Yes, cried Gaylord, and he tried for Rogers' ribs. But Rogers was too fast. He laughed and sat on Gaylord's stomach. How about here? He reached for the armpits. Don't, Glenn, cried Gaylord. Okay, Rogers laughed. Let's have a sandwich. His hand came down and patted Gaylord on the thigh. You're not mad, are you? No, grinned Gaylord. I'm not mad. He watched Rogers get up and stand over him for a second. Watched him walk over and pick up his underwear. He's cute, he thought as the naked buttocks disappeared behind the shorts. He's real cute. He wasn't even thinking of me. He was thinking of something to eat. Just like a man. I'm glad he was, though. Maybe he was afraid to make the first move. He must have been thinking the same as me. Surely he felt the same emotions. I'm glad he didn't say anything. I'm glad he didn't. For Christ's sakes, Rogers cried. Look at these damn dance. Rogers held up a slice of bread and tried to brush off the thousands of insects covering it. All over everything, he said with disgust. Look, Gay, ants all over. All over our lunch. Gaylord got up and laughed heartily. Good ants, he said, pulling on his shorts over his legs. Guess they got hungry, too. Rogers gave him a puzzled look. You're not mad. What are we going to eat? Let's eat ants and all, he walked up to Rogers. Okay, here's the Lulu. Take a bite. Rogers held a ham sandwich close. Gaylord gulped as the black-moving ants almost touched his lips. No, no, he cried gleefully and knocked it out of Roger's extended hand. The bread landed on the sand. I'm not hungry. He watched Roger's battle with the sandwiches. He blew on them, hit them with his hands, grinning and talking all the time. It was unbelievable and yet, obviously, true. This friendly feeling which now swept through him bore no sexual passion. Unconsciously, he watched Roger's, watched the dimples grow deep as he was handed a sandwich. Sure there aren't any ants on it? He grinned. I don't see any, do you? I think I got them all off. No, I don't see any, Gaylord said, taking it, and after a close examination, took a bite. Rogers did the same, said, Good, isn't it? Sure is, Gaylord answered, looking into Rogers' face, between the developed legs for a split second, then back again into the dimpled face. I'm hungry, grinned Rogers. I always get hungry out here. I could eat a horse. He pulled on his shorts. I feel like I got ants in my pants. So do I, Gaylord grinned. Stop scratching, Glenn. Suddenly, he wasn't hungry for food. He was hungry for affection and wanting what he remembered. He had once said, I hate the world of men. They have hurt and killed something in me. I don't care for them that much. But now, it wasn't that way. Rogers was a man, fully developed and very desirable. He sat there in the lurid evening, nibbling on his sandwich, thinking of Roger's naked body. Also thinking of Robert Blake, who had not called. And he thought of other men. Paul Boudreaux, Jean Limbeau, Claude. What was Claude's last name? And as he sat there, he wound and unwound in his mind the skein of his life that was lived in New Orleans. A life that seemed rooted in the shadows of a club, flowered in the room void of sunshine, living a brief while on the crammed sidewalks of a city and returning suddenly into darkness, the same web of darkness and blind hunger from which it had arisen. Gaylord's thought then dwelt on what Paul Boudreaux had told him, that possibility through shots, doctors, men, and women sexually attracted by their own sex might be rendered normal. But now, looking at Glenn Rogers, Gaylord knew that he had no wish to conform to a standard, alien to his nature. He thought of Robert Blake again. Blake was a wonderful person, a person so broad-minded in his way of life that trivial matters, and they were trivial, meant nothing to him. He understood and accepted them. He was a real man too, tall and broad-shouldered, with a strong handclasp, a man you could love and trust. He made you feel as though you had filled your lungs with a wind that was blown to you direct from the sea or from the heavens. Of all that Paul had said, 
Gaylord liked best the idea that the shadow world might be one of nature's experiments. He saw nature as the great designer, the great creator, fashioning the earth and all that is therein, experimenting, revising, working with vast numbers. He remembered that Paul had said there were thousands of such men and women in the United States alone. Thus the thought of shots or doctors which might present him with normality made no appeal to Gaylord, since he was part of a great experiment in creation, and looking into Roger's eyes he wished that they had kissed. Perhaps that climactic scene would have at last answered the confused drama in his heart. But you weren't even thinking of me, Glenn, he thought. You were thinking of something to eat. But I got my wish. I've seen you naked. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 Dusk had fallen on Cotton, Texas, and the dim spread beams of streetlights stretched out before him, quiet and serene. He drove through the center of town, passing the square. It seemed more deserted than usual. There were people on the sidewalks, but most of the stores were closed and there was none of the crowded hurry and bustle that had become common of late. He came into the old residential section at the foot of Columbus and West Gray Streets. Gaylord noticed again how badly kept all the old familiar houses were beginning to look. Many of them had become apartment houses, one a tea room. Little signs advertised their changed status. He was relieved when he had passed through it and turned down his own street. The swim and tramping through the woods had been fun, but it was going to feel good to be home. He was tired, but when he had let Rogers out in front of his own home, Rogers had suggested a show. I'm not tired, he had cried. Let's go to a show, Gay. No, thank you, Gaylord had replied. I'm going home. See you tomorrow. Remember, next Sunday. I won't forget he had said before driving off and leaving Rogers. And now Gaylord looked out of the car window, gazing out moodily at the passing scene. Seventeen years of viewing the world around him had given his eyes an accustomed slant, and he had no desire to change his perspective now. He was too tired. A car moaned behind, but it made not a ripple on his private reverie. This reverie was a pleasant one, dominated by the prideful knowledge that Glenn Rogers liked him. He pulled off the street into his driveway and stopped his car in the garage. He sat for a moment before descending, recalling the past afternoon. It had been fun. He had really enjoyed himself. Glenn Rogers had been so nice. Gosh, he was a swell boy. He pulled himself erect, got out of his car, and turned to the front of the house, stepping heavy on the paved driveway. The pavement was hard underfoot, and he recalled the softness of the thick carpet of leaves leading to the creek the huge green wall of vines dipping to the edge of the banks. The old tree Rogers had dived off of was all so clear in his thoughts. He rubbed his eyes as he walked, half contented, and dreamily visualized the naked body on the end of the log. Then he heard it. For a moment, he was not sure if it wasn't just a shrill bird, a high cadence in the voice of the woods deceiving him. But before him came the unmistakable squeal of tires and the locking of brakes. It was followed by a man's voice in a flat declarative. Gaylord, it commanded, come here. The woods, with all its beauty, suddenly disappeared, and the water in the creek had become black and lost. He stood rooted to the spot. A twinge bisected his larynx. He glanced at his wristwatch with a stalling-for-time maneuver. The car looked familiar. There were many such models. But the word Gaylord sounded strange. He walked up to the car, expecting to find someone he did not know. He looked into the car window. Bob. It was Bob Blake. Bob, bidding, his dark features flushed and excited. And the violent face he saw was the same that had haunted the background of his life, shadowy and unrevealed. But this was not the boy he loved. This was not that boy's face. This one was full of hate, with black and really hair and stormy, demanding eyes. Blake was definitely in a stage of agitation. He had never called him by his full name before. Gaylord's brain was confronted by a white barrier thick and high, a barrier that he could not pierce or leap. His words came stumblingly as he tried to speak. Why, Bob, it's you. He looked into the stern eyes, but they did not return his glance. What happened? Are you all right? Serene egotism radiated from Blake's features. 
Get in, he said. Get in, Gaylord. He shivered miserably on the seat. He sat very quietly, looking at Blake through eyes strangely marine in color and depth. He seemed a changeling now, an undying creature condemned to spend his life gazing from sea caves at the only mortal who could give him a soul. His need to be made whole, to be valued by one man, to light his cigarettes from the flame of a match, to sew his buttons onto his shirts, to be saved from fatigue and humiliation of success of Blake's. All these were in his eyes and voice as he pleaded. What is it, Bob? What's wrong? Are you in trouble? Hell no. Blake's jaws grit feverishly. Nothing's wrong. I want to talk to you. For the first time, he looked at Gaylord. Can you go for a short ride? It won't take long. Or do you have someone else coming over? For a mad instant, Gaylord felt as though he must throw his arms about the other. Here, without thought or sense, was all security, all the answer that he needed to the poignant confusion he had always felt. But he couldn't. He could not then any more than he could fly. He knew it in a flash, and knowing it, recognizing its inevitability, forced his hand away and looked up. You know I can go for a ride, Bob, he said. You know better than to ask me that. You know there's no one else coming over. Again, he wanted to break the tenseness between them, speaking so formally and meaninglessly there alone. Words that said nothing, and yet words that uttered a whole wild torrent of meaning. I wonder if people know about us, he thought. I wonder if they told Bob. But I can't ask him. I don't. And because he would not, it thundered through his mind as they drove away. Suppose people know what I am, what I've done, thought Gaylord. They'd never understand. I'd have to leave. Run, run, run. And he knew once more that he would be running all his life. They drove in silence, past the long, shivering edges of corrugated porches fronting the one-story buildings. The glare picked up shiny spots on them, spots free of rust that almost totally covered them. Gaylord spelled out the peeled lettering, neon signs, his lips never moving. His hand moved up slowly and brushed across his throbbing forehead. They passed the large and stately Stephen's home, and the branches of its surrounding trees spread over them like bat wings and bad omens. He felt enclosed in ice as the landscape, unrecognizable and meaningless, drifted by. Drifted by in a series of frame houses. They shone a fresh paint, fronted with porches, some screened, crowded behind dark shrubbery and soft light. A few of them were set back in large spaces of grass earth, enclosed by painted picket fence covered with honeysuckle and wisteria vines. Here and there a china berry or cottonwood tree offered its shadows, but to Gaylord the whole combination was nothing. Only when he heard, from somewhere out of the still dusk air, a child's penetrating cry, Mother, mother, can I go to the show with Chuck? Did he feel some of the frozen tension leave him? Even then, he could not turn to Blake and pour out upon him what was tumbling about within his brain. Looking at him sitting sunken behind the wheel, he knew that he could tell nothing, and he wondered if the time would ever come when he could tell him everything again. The line of houses on either side broke away. They were on an open road. A bug hit the windshield, making a loud thump, but this time it did not change the expression on Gaylord's eyes or frighten him. He felt only sad and drowned in compassion for both of them sitting there alone under the metal top, oblivious, farther apart than all the changes, the complexities that had mazed them in and engrossed them during the past weeks had placed them. He knew now. He had begun knowing from the minute Blake had spoken his name and then he had entered the car, and then Blake had spoken his name again, coming toward him like an enemy, four such simple and inconsequential things considered apart. Placed side by side, they answered a lot of things. In fact, they answered the whole mystery that had tormented him from the time he had heard his name called. He did not even yet know the answer. He only knew, and knew hard, that he had lost. Gaylord cringed at the fantasy he had worked up for himself. Why? Why? he cried within himself. Behind them lay the town, and ahead a blank space of open fields, poles, and billboards. A hidden bird gave out with a melodious chirping. A butterfly hit, close to where the bug had, 
splashing the windshield with a dirty yellowish film, obstructing and making the moving pattern before him blurred. More indistinct than before, his face was without emotion, frozen, motionless. His hands clutched tragically together. His short span of happiness was over, past. He turned toward Blake and out of the corner of his eyes saw him. Bob, he thought, with helpless and loving recognition. He bit his lips. He had been holding off for a long time, and now he couldn't keep it at bay any longer. It was a moment of supreme agony for him as he sat there clinging to impossible hopes. It was not a moment for silent weeping, even for crying out. He could only sit and hope, and think through the hoping. He tried to pull himself together, tried to touch ever so slightly Blake's leg. He couldn't and his hand fell back on his own curled bones beneath his gabardine trousers. Blake lit a cigarette, then moving the package at Gaylord mumbled, Here, want one? Simple, devastating statement, devoid of kindness. The sharp dictatorial tone fell around him. You smoke too now, don't you? I'd like a cigarette, thank you. How formal his answer, how artificial the sound. The look in Blake's eyes was frightening, cold. He thought, why do you look at me like that, as though you've never seen me before? What do you want me to say? He turned again to Blake, a tense outline framed in smoke. May I have a light, Bob, please? He wanted to sound natural, understanding. You've always lighted them for me, remember? Blake's exothalmic eyes popped with indignation. Shit! He stopped short, like a cyclist jamming on a coaster brake. There's a lighter right in front of you. Can't you push it in, or are you too weak to even do that? Gaylord saw the rage, forces, dark and nameless, leap up in Blake's face. He recoiled from the picture it presented. His nostrils choked. He froze and held his breath. In that terrible moment, his frustration was maddening. Yet he did not dare press the matter, lest he lose all. There was something cruel and savage about Blake now. Something detached. A something he had never seen there before. The challenge was frontal, and he could not meet it. Despair. Was there nothing in his life but despair? Was life to be like this always, full of words and looks and harsh actions from every side? Was there no escape? He thought of Glenn Rogers as he pushed in the lighter. It jumped out and he lit his cigarette. He put it back and looked again at Blake. Blake did not look back. Instead, his hand hit hard on the wheel and Gaylord felt it had been meant for him. The duel between them, half confessional, all counterpoint went silently forward. Gaylord murmured, I'm sorry I forgot about the lighter. The soft, trembling young voice was flat. No apology, no nothing. He threw away the cigarette. Huh, grunted Blake. Gaylord felt crushed under the sour indictment. Reality hit him with cold, metallic touch, but he would not admit it. He could not lose Blake. He would overlook the bad and see only the good. To have Blake's love in spite of the hateful words clamored in the young Gaylord tempted him to despair devices. I'm sure tired. It's... Blake cut in bluntly. Guess you ought to be. Gaylord listened to the words and the sneer that followed. Bob, he asked, what's wrong? Have I done something? He looked at Blake and there was sentiment in his survey. He touched Blake's leg and asked, can't you tell me? Don't touch me. Blake's teeth met hard, and he deliberately drew his leg from under the gentle caress, shrank away as if his hand was unclean, as if by the touch his leg would become diseased, decayed. The car about Gaylord seemed to draw in. It shrank even more. Panic was growing. It was a flame along every nerve, burning in the heart of every body cell. He lived a terrible moment before he cried out, Oh, Bob. Yes, Blake snarled gripping the wheel angrily. What the hell do you want now? He hung on to the wheel as if his life depended on it and stared out in front of him like it was the last day of his life. Gaylord hesitated, lost and miserable. I wish you'd tell me why you're acting this way. How do you want me to act? Want me to purr over you like I would a dame? No, Gaylord answered, and his lips felt parched, dry. He was afraid he was going to cry. I don't want you to purr over me. He was going to cry. Tears were already forming. He looked up again at Blake, withdrawn and cold, and even as he did so, he could feel Blake stiffening away from him. And then the other looked at him, 
examining his face angrily. You don't want me to? He pushed away a strand of hair from his forehead. Is that it? What do you mean, Bob? I don't want you to. Huge, hideous laughter burst from Blake. You're so damned innocent. He sat back against the seat, lifted his rump off the seat like a man suffering from meningitis, and roared into Gaylord's face. So goddamn innocent. He stopped laughing. What in the hell do you take me for? A chump? Hot tears came into Gaylord's eyes and spilled on to his cheeks. For a moment, he only looked into Blake's cold eyes silently. There was no sound of his crying. There was no sound of the hurt he felt as only he could be hurt. Memory of childish sorrow crept in him. Maybe we'd better go back, he said. Don't you think you'd better take me home? Home. What a valued word. A restful word, that monosyllable home. He savored it. God damn it, Blake roared. I said I wanted to talk to you. You haven't so far. He was tired and wanted to get it over. It looked hopeless now, but maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow? What about tomorrow? He didn't want to think about tomorrow or the other tomorrows. I wish you would say something. Can't you wait? I waited for you all afternoon, Blake said harshly. You sit there and wait until I'm damn good and ready. That is, if you want to hear what I have to say. He went on as if he was unable to stop talking. Make up your mind, because it don't make a damn bit of difference to me either way or the other. I'll take you home right now if you want to go. No, I don't want to. No, I don't want to. Blake imitated him. Well, God damn it, be a little patient. But you're not that way, are you? You want things to happen right away. You're so damned innocent, he repeated. So sweet and innocent. You just don't know what's wrong. You'd love to know, but you don't. And you want to so bad, don't you? Shit. You're wrong. That's what it is. You're all wrong, Gaylord. You're wrong for me. You're wrong for yourself. And you're wrong for anybody. I guess I am, Bob. He answered quietly. He felt defenseless and beaten under the truthful phrase. The old familiar pain of exultation cut through him. It seemed only yesterday that he and Blake had stood under the shower. He remembered the kiss and felt like a captive bird. Blake turned his head and snickered. Well, at least you know you are. That's something. Gaylord met it openly, reached out for the hand on the steering wheel. He felt defenseless, beaten but he must try and regain his respect at least. I didn't know you felt I was wrong for you. I'm sorry you feel that way. I didn't feel that way toward you. I still don't understand why you're treating me like this. It's not like you to treat anyone this way. Even as he spoke, Gaylord knew it was all over. How do you want me to treat you? Blake shot back. Like a, a fairy queen? He laughed, a throaty laugh. The words had been an effort, but he had found the right ones. That all depends. Depends on what? How you'd treat a fairy queen. Blake chuckled maliciously. How in the hell should I know? He pressed on the gas, and the car moved faster. You and your fairy queen make me sick, he said, and a sneer crossed his lips. I don't see why in the hell I've messed around with a bitch like you. A goddamn cheap little bitch. That's all you are. A cheap sissy bitch. He was filled with contempt and wanted his words to hurt. To cut deep and stay. Fairy queen, huh? He growled. He threw the word savagely and accurately hitting his goalpost target right in the middle. You and your sissy ways. Again, that word arose to mock him. Gaylord was sorry he had spoken. Fairy queen had only been a word, but now it came back haunting him. He sat destroyed, believing that all his dreams had toppled. The hope of regaining Blake would forever be a dream. He was lost to him, and all that was good in life was lost before his need to lose himself in this man. He gazed on Blake, seeing him a wondrous being. Even as the triumph of Blake's words continued, in his head, Blake was still Blake. I'm not a bitch, Gaylord sobbed. Or a fairy queen. How can you say I am, Bob? How can you say things you don't mean? Don't mean, Blake grinned in a flat, mean tone. Like hell I don't mean it. You wouldn't call yourself a man, would you? You're a cheap little queer, and right now queers make me sick. Sick to my guts. You make me sick, you and your damned whining. And stop that silly sniffling. You can find yourself someone else. You're good at that anyway. 
The expression of malice across his face was cold, white hatred, and he gave each word time to strike. Lake let up on the gas a little, and the car almost stopped. He went on. I wish you were a man. It'd be different then. I could slap the shit out of you. But you're not. You're too damn pretty. Too innocent, too. Too much like Venus. Isn't that what Stud called you? A Venus with a penis? He laughed a nasty laugh. He sure hit the nail on the head. I guess you were sorry I came in when I did. They would have really given you a big time. All three of them. But you've had that many before, haven't you? You like changes anyway, don't you? Like to try them all out and see who's got the biggest. Or do they come too big for you? Did you have a big one today? You must have. You look sort of pooped out. Which way did you do it? Did you try something different? His loathing tones came faster and faster, and a look of self-ridicule engulfed him. From now on, you can try them all. I won't butt in any more. You're not that good, and I'm sure I'm too small now that you've tried everybody in New Orleans and this damn new asshole buddy of yours. I'm through. Did you hear? Through. Can't you talk? Yes, but I'm... I know, you're tired. Well, I'm not, and I'm going to keep driving as long as I damn please. You like to be with me so much, I'm going to give you a real treat. Even if you do make me sick, you're going to get it one way or the other. You're going to listen and do exactly what I tell you to do, and I'm not kidding. I'm going to give you a chance to show me how good you really are. And Blake turned down a deserted lane. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 The narrow road in front of them was red earth free of traffic, except for them. Gaylord could hear the sound of the car wheels and feel the vibration against his closed lids. He shivered at his thoughts. He was lying bound, stretched out on the red earth, his body naked and slashed like that of some person being sacrificed. Around him danced vicious creatures, carrying sharp thin twigs, slapping and cutting into his torn flesh. Still they continued, jabbing red-hot pieces of smoking steel, touching his heart with the first lunge. He saw them far above, coming at him from a sea of blood, dazzled and remote under its red carpet that now covered him. He was cut off from everyone, was being punished. There were laws against desires and loves he longed for, and his love had been forbidden long before it began. This was no dream. He had never felt more sharply aware in all his life. He was almost afraid to open his eyes, and on opening them he cried again silently, the note of despair poignantly within him, because it was only a dream. All his life, as much as he could remember now, seemed to be a time of dreams. He had never seen things clearly or understood them. The blankness seemed a living, formless thing, like three-dimensional shadows in his brain. He had no idea or cared less where they were going or what was going to happen. He only knew that he was lost and death would have been welcome. How strange it was that the mind could change in so short a distance, from a bright welcoming hue to this dark, restless, puzzled state. The pain, humiliation, and sighed kept rolling over and over him so that he was almost choked with the feel of it. Blake was his friend, his dearest one. Why had all this happened? What was the reason? There was something more behind all this, something insidious, the nearest thing to evil he had ever known. But what was it? Whom could he ask? There was no one, no one whom he could talk. He felt unprotected, beaten, and alone. He dared not look at the bronze face in fear of doing something wrong. Instead, he thought of the many times he had wanted Blake to take him in his arms and love him instead of just saying hello and passing on down the long school corridors, sidewalks, in their cars. Again, he saw the face he thought so handsome, searched that unknown landscape, that grin he could never invade. It had been so easy for others, but to him it had been almost like a hostile land, untouchable, and it had become that way again. And with this inside, he buried himself deeper into the seat. He wanted no one to hear his sobbing, Glancing across the bare flat land, he watched a pale light coming from a window of a farmhouse. It flickered, sputtered like himself. In its reflection, he saw Blake, naked to the waist, and his broad chest glistening gold. 
The legs were covered with football clothes, and he lay stretched out, as if dead. Gaylord remembered the time well, remembered the sudden cry of terror that had sprung from his lips when Blake had been knocked out of the game and lay there on the grass-covered field, crushed and jumped on by the thick legs and arms that had suddenly covered him. Bob, oh, Bob, he had cried out to the surprise of others seated around him. They hadn't understood then, and they wouldn't understand now. Blake struck the brake pedal, and the car stopped. Gaylord was not surprised or shocked. He did not look in Blake's direction. Instead, he turned to look back in the night toward some trees. He could hear Blake breathing deeply, and he waited for what he did not know or care. But he could no longer restrain himself. He must know what was wrong. A sound broke out of him. Bob, don't hate me. Please, don't hate me, he whispered. Gaylord, Blake said cruelly, savoring the cruelty. You don't have to be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. And I don't hate you. I don't want to. I guess I should say I'm sorry for what I've called you, but I'm not. Not really. I meant every word I said. You know, Gaylord, you take the cake. You sure made a fool out of me. A goddamn big fool. But how? How have I made a fool of you? How? It was as mysterious to him as was his love to play with dolls and why other boys did not. Why? Did you enjoy it, Gaylord? Did I enjoy it? He was like a country boy in a big city. Don't play so damn innocent with me. I've been around. I'm not that dumb. What did I enjoy, Bob? What? Please, tell me. Listen, Blake began. Don't think you can pull the wool over my eyes. Gaylord saw the blood color the bronze of Blake's face had turned, as though the words had been an effort, as though it had taken a long time to find the necessary ones. I don't want to do that, cried Gaylord. Why should I? I know you and this Glenn were out in the woods all day, Blake said glibly, and don't think I don't know what happened. Shit. Guess you should be tired. How many times, Gaylord? Did you make up for lost time? He tried to grin. You know, you are cheap and common. I didn't think you were, but you are. You're cheap and common. His voice choked. That kind of crap catches up with you sooner or later, and I thought you were something real special. I didn't think you'd ever do that to me. Out of the dullness that seemed to completely cover him, the reason had finally been solved. The cause of all those bitter words was plain. Jealousy. Responding to some desperate call of his emotions, he cried. You're wrong, Bob. So wrong. How could you think such a thing? Don't you know I love you? Tears came back to his eyes, onto his cheeks. He threw his arms around Blake's neck, holding him tightly against his chest. You must believe me, Bob, or I'll... I don't know what I'll do if you don't believe me. Why don't you grow up? Blake measured the other shrewdly. You can't be a spoiled baby all your life. With a stab of jealousy, he went on. I hope this Rogers guy really does you up brown. He shoved Gaylord away and stopped pawing me. Time stood still and the squirrel gray sky grew more melancholy. Even the air seemed more restive and depressed. Gaylord hunched in his seat, unable to say any more. What else could he say? What a fool he had been to succumb to Rogers. What a fool. Oh, what a fool. But he hadn't. Nothing like that had happened between them. But how could he make Blake believe him? After reading the contempt in the dark eyes, how could he explain that nothing had happened? He was caught in a world of image and feeling. In the drained light, the trees were stark and mournful. He had the fantastic notion that on those naked branches dead men hung, their lifeless bodies swaying in macabre rhythm. It seemed to him he was kin with all the dying, all the misery in the world. He put his sweating hands to his throbbing head and, in a daze, shaped a name. Glenn. The symbol of his guilt. Glenn. Names. His numb lips repeated it. Abruptly, he sprung up, cried, No, Bob, you're wrong. I swear you're wrong. Nothing like what you think happened. Blake wasn't looking at him. With a clumsy gesture, he pulled at the other's shirt, looked at him hoping his face would reveal he was speaking the truth, would tell him better than words. Look at me, Bob. Please look at me, he silently cried. Can't you see I'm not lying? 
Can't you see I'd never hurt you? I love you too much to do that. Understand. Please, understand. Gaylord's head inclined towards Blake's chest, his face sober and tear-stained. He did feel guilty because the desire had been there. It had been deep, and if Glenn would have made even the slightest move, he realized now that Blake would be speaking the truth. He did not look up, only rested his tired head across the broad chest. How strange it felt beneath him, how awfully strange. He was innocent, and yet he was guilty too. But life was like that. The littlest seed could grow into a huge tree, the same as one act or word could become a burning quarrel. You were in the woods with him, weren't you? Blake said gravely. Yes, but nothing like what you think happened. Blake laughed. What's the matter? Wouldn't he let you? Roughly, he pushed Gaylord aside. You must be losing your charms, Gaylord. You didn't give me a chance to finish. You don't have to. I know what went on between you two. Blake looked off into space. Bob, nothing like what? Please let me finish. We're finished. Washed up. You and me. I've had enough of this mess. Blake shrugged. You go to New Orleans and let those queers paw you. Come back here and go out into the woods with this guy. What the hell do you expect me to think? Or do you think I should say, Did you have a nice time, gay, with the nice boys? Shit. Again, he shrugged his shoulders. What's the use? Then he growled. What I'd give for a good stiff drink. Words. Words. Gaylord couldn't hide from them. He was silent. He had never felt more helpless in his life. Blake fumbled in his pocket and drew out a package of cigarettes. His hand shook as the lighter contacted with a white column of tobacco. Here, he said in a bass voice. Don't you want another cigarette? You're getting good at that too, aren't you? Don't, Bob, don't. Gaylord cried out miserably, pushing away the package shoved under his nose. You mean you don't want one? What's the matter? Mouth tired too? Somehow he lived through the mixed sentences. His despair so great, he felt sick and dizzy. He sat there, looking out into the vast, unprotected sky. He gazed intently as if there was nothing he wanted from it. Nothing could ease the dullness or be found there or any place else. It's all over. The thought was like a white-hot iron rod drawn quickly across his mind, searing a deep burn that would never heal. His hopes, desires, and dreams were all gone. His hands lay limp on his legs, and the damp trouser cuffs made a chill run through his body. He wished he could cry, scream, do anything besides just sitting there. He thought of the cool creek in the woods. Why couldn't he have drowned? Died with the knowledge Blake loved him, wanted him, instead of this. Bob, Gaylord began uncertainly. Why didn't you call me last night? You said you were going to. I stayed home all evening, waiting. I was so... Oh, I don't know. His lips quivered. I don't know. His voice was mute and dejected. Blake turned on him. For your information, he began, and I don't know why in the hell I'm going to the trouble of telling you. I went over to Joy's. She called and wanted to talk to me. You know what she wanted? No, I don't. She wanted to talk about you. We had quite a talk, and I even told her about us. That's another laugh. She's a smart gal. Already knew, he laughed. She knew we were fooling around all the time. I felt like a damned fool. He hit the steering wheel with his closed fist and continued. You know what she said? He looked at Gaylord, not waiting for an answer. Said she loved you too. Poor kid. He laughed loud. You're a good one, you are. Even screwed her, didn't you? She wouldn't let me, and she lets you. What do you think of that, huh? Doesn't that flatter your ego? Blake's two fists came together with a loud crack. She knew you were a fruit all along. She didn't think you'd do anything, but you sure fooled her, didn't you? Is that the first cherry you ever got? You know what a cherry is, don't you? Of course, you didn't get Thelma's. You know that, don't you? I got there ahead of you. You're some guy, you are. What did that guy in New Orleans call you? A faggot, wasn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you don't know what a faggot is, do you? Sarcastically, the words rushed, wild and cutting, but to Gaylord they became only a sound. Be good to him, Bob, Joyce said. Blake continued. 
He's such a lovely boy, so sweet and thoughtful. Isn't that a laugh? And the funniest part of it is, I agreed with her. Damn fool, both of us. She didn't know you were throwing that thing of yours in anybody's face that would take it. She was suspicious of Thelma and was so afraid she would hurt you. Thelma, huh? She couldn't hurt you. You're both nothing but a couple of cheap whores. Not even a whore. You give it away, don't you? Why in the hell don't you sell it? Yeah. You're thoughtful, all right. Thoughtful, huh? Like so much hell. Then, as if speaking to himself, Blake uttered in a drab, low voice, thoughtful of yourself. That makes sense. Just as long as you get what you want and don't give a damn who it's with. Now it's this Glen. Well, I hope that farmer can satisfy you. Does he smell like a horse or do you care? Resolutely, Gaylord tried not to think about the afternoon, but it swam in his memory. He was not sorry he had gone. No, not now he wasn't. He didn't see the creek as cold and dismal under the warm sun. He saw it as friendly and all blue, friendly the way Rogers had always been. How could Blake say such things about Glenn Rogers? An adult emotion was being born in Gaylord for the first time. He felt the strangeness of it within him, but it meant nothing. He only knew he must not let Blake feel this way toward Glenn Rogers. He began, I'm sorry, deeply sorry if I've hurt you, Bob. I know I've done things I'm not proud of, things that I'm ashamed of. I guess I am what you called me. But I don't want you to feel that way about Glenn. I don't think he knows about queers, queers like me. Faggots, yes, I know now. I'm one of those too, I guess. He's a fine boy, and sex never entered his mind. It would have. Who knows what would have happened, because I believe I would have been willing. Even loving you, I would have weakened. I think I would have. I'm not sure. But that time with Paul was the only. Play cut in short. Now isn't that just too sweet? Gaylord's feelings of failure were intensified, not only because of the words, but because of the look that followed. Without wishing to hear more or even caring about the results, he threw a bombshell. I don't care what you say or believe, Bob. I just don't anymore. I'm telling you the truth. I can't change your feelings and neither can you change mine by calling me names. I can't explain what it is about me. I don't understand why I want to do such things. I don't know why I've solidly loved you for so many years. You certainly never gave me any encouragement. But I did. I've thought of you so many nights. I used to lay in bed and wonder about you. Wonder how I could become your friend. Wonder what I could do to make you even notice me. I've loved you for so long. You loved me? Shit. You have a hell of a way of showing it, Blake barked. I told you I wanted to see you today. Why didn't you call last night? That hurt me, too. I thought you were out with someone. I told you why. But I didn't know then. I wanted to call you, but I was scared you wouldn't be home. I called Mother from Glenn's this morning, and she told me you hadn't called. I slept late. Just don't hate me, Bob. Blake sat, holding his head with one hand, listening, then said, I can't help the way I feel. I know, replied Gaylord. I don't know why I went to church this morning. Now it seems such a long time ago, and it was only this morning. I was feeling blue. Church is always comforting to me. After church, I saw Glenn and his mother, and Mrs. Rogers asked me to have breakfast with them. I didn't want to, but I just couldn't refuse. It wasn't all planned like you'd think. It just happened. Glenn suggested going out to their farm and fish, and I thought it would be fun. You hadn't called, and I'd never been fishing. Why didn't you tell me you wanted to go fishing? I'd have taken you. I'd never thought of it. Never had any desire to go. But you did. Yes, I did. I felt so miserable when you didn't call last night. And this morning I was so jittery. I hadn't been to church for so long. I thought it would make me feel better. It did, too. Blake said like a piece of machinery, his thumb hitting the same spot on his forehead moving mechanically back and forth as if it was drilling a hole between his eyes. I guess we'd better go, Blake said, still tapping his thumb. Again, Gaylord felt crushed under the happiness that could have been. He considered Blake silently, uncertain of words. The space between them had broadened even more. 
he could never win him back if only Blake didn't hate him. Bob, Gaylord began, please don't hate me. Can we be friends? I don't think so, Blake said sharply. I'll take you home. You said you were tired. No, I don't think so. Again, the vibrating was around him, and again Gaylord looked into the space before him. He sat there silently looking into the moving sky toward the high, clear stars. They looked down as hard and cruel as death. He could feel himself shrinking to pygmy size under the gigantic sky. The wind went through it, crying. It stretched above him, endless and black and utterly empty, and Gaylord was alone, alone in the vast universe which became suddenly formless and without plan. They drove in silence. Nothing but the sound of the motor echoed inside the moving machine. He had been denied, shut out. His head felt heavy, almost too heavy for the cord in his neck to hold it up. Words filled his brain, but they were tangled, twisted, meaning nothing, saying nothing. He looked like a figure of wax and ebony sitting upon a pedestal. Thus, out of what seemed only a few short moments, with its embraces meeting, school with its lessons and naked bodies, between the act of finally falling in love, the afternoon with Joy, Thelma, New Orleans, Paul, Glenn, slaps, kisses, Bob. Out of all this, his downfall had been gradually forming. You were on my mind all afternoon, Bob, he began sadly. I even wrote your name in the sand along the creek without realizing what I was doing. It scared me for a minute because I didn't know what Glenn would think. I didn't want him to know I loved you, and I was afraid he could read my mind. I didn't want him to think we were, well, you know. Then I didn't care. I wanted to tell him all about you. Tell him I loved you. I guess the same way you told Joy. Oh, yeah? Blake interrupted. Yes, Bob. That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't. His lips quivered. I'm sorry for what happened between me and Joy. I know it was wrong, and I can understand the way you must feel about me. I think she knew I was thinking of you all the time. I was so ashamed afterwards. Would have given... There's some things you can't undo after they've been done, Blake said gravely. Anyway, it's all over now. The next moments passed with unbearable slowness. But at least Blake's last words had not been cruel. Gaylord covered his face, hearing their despondency. A mosquito began to sing around his ear, but he didn't care. Let it bite. Let it bite hard. His blood was useless to him. It felt like water. Then he heard, Son of a bitch! And Blake slapped hard at his own cheek. A mosquito can get him to talk, Gaylord thought. And he was envious of the singing pest. Out of the corner of his eyes, he watched Blake get another cigarette. He lit it, puffed a few times, and flipped it from him distastefully, out upon the road. I'm like that cigarette, thought Gaylord. I've been thrown away, too. Within him, a wound was bleeding, but even in his distress, all his senses converged and focused on Blake, his young prince out of the Arabian Nights. He would always remember every detail of that exposed body which moved with such precision charm. He sat dreamily, watching rhythmic ripples of the arms, thighs, the grinning face, and the swinging of the genitals as his prince waved at him. It made him feel a little better, even though it was only a vision of the impossible. What now? What was the solution? He asked himself, and the pounding of his heart made a desolate tangle in front of him, a rectangular pit like a huge sunken grave swarming with weeds so thick and tall that he could not see the base of their axis. Was the only answer death? Was this why he was seeing this? He had a strange frown as he studied the grave. He lay beneath this earth, flesh, hair seared off by decay, the same decay that touched him now. But it was peaceful, alone, his only solace, the realization that he had tasted the object of his hungry searching, as if sought to drive him off. There were happy memories that nothing could take from him. It was something he had desired passionately, like a parched plant in dry soil. He had begun to believe that he might clutch at the edge of something like real love and happiness here in this small, dingy, and uninteresting town, about which he felt a stranger. But before he humbly lived and hoped, but that security had been short, and beneath his failure in all these, 
moved the mysterious dreams of his profound longing, longing not because of the things he was without, but for the things that he could not accomplish. He sensed almost a hatred in him, as though he had only himself to blame for his feminine ways and questioned himself desperately about the reason. It seemed to him that he had suddenly assembled here the pages of a myth of himself, but where was the answer in putting them together? Where was he? In what space and time, this strange young man desiring manhood? It was as if suddenly a blinding light on something that had always been half in the shadows must come to light. He must change. The nervousness, softness, and tenderness must be completely demolished. But why should he? Now that the searchlight which Blake had turned on, the world was off. He remembered, as if he had heard them all before, the dirges in the night, and the sound of his own wailing. He remembered trying before. Trying. He clutched at his trousers. He would try again. But the tragedy that cluttered his mind roared steadily on. He closed his eyes hard. It was as blind and useless an action as he had ever known. The far, fair bark of invisible hounds aroused him, and he thought of a poor, helpless animal running for its life, running from jaws that could so easily destroy it. He had been running all his life. A mist crossed his eyes, and his throat felt dry as he tried to swallow. He wished he would choke. Choking had smote many with death, and love's end had smote all with a desire for it. He beheld a world that no youth ought to see. A world of gray skies, buildings, and lawns. Death had fixed ghost-like on the scene and sucked it bloodless. But it wasn't devoid of relevance for him. Clouds beat around in a beautiful tide, and he wondered how much iodine it would take for him to become part of this. Yes, all things were restful in this dawn, but the happiest of all was himself, a beautiful young man, almost transparent in a thin garment of shining gauze, riding on a star. Somewhere before, he had ridden on a star. Again, he heard the wail of the hound. It seemed close, and he imagined himself caught in quicksand. Sinking in slime, he reached up and grabbed a golden branch. Instantly, the branch became a bronze arm. It circled his mudded form. He could hear his own cries, feeble as from a great distance. This was no dream. He was being violently squeezed, and a warm breath was on his lips. It spoke, and the car came to a halt. Gay, it cried, tightening its arms. I can't hate you. Don't you know I love you? The mythical words, those long-awaited mythical words. He went on, holding his breath. Affection, pity, and plain hunger for this passionate creature he had known so long broke to the surface of Gaylord's life. He was tired of living with ghosts, no matter how beautiful, weary of loyalties that no longer sustained the weight of loneliness. His gaze traveled from Blake's lustrous hair spread over his bronze forehead, past his full-lipped mouth, lingered at the dark lashes of his eyes, and slipped back to the dark hair. He buried his face on Blake's chest and wept, the terrible tears of a boy sick and far away from home. Oh, Bob. And his voice was like part of a dream. He turned his face upwards, and as he did, the vivid face descended. Their lips met fiercely, passionately. Everything swung under him and stopped. For a long, timeless moment they sat thus locked. Shadows filled the noiseless car about them, and the sky was warm above them. With something like a groan, Blake released him slightly. Blake whispered, It's taken me a long time to say it, but I'm sorry, Gay. Can you forgive me? I was a jealous fool over nothing. I know you didn't lie. I knew it all the time. All Gaylord could think of was how warm Blake was how precious the skin under his touch, the fragrant odor of his oily hair. Oh, Bob, Bob, he cried silently. But all he could do was look into the dark face. He could see no features, but he didn't need to see. He already knew, had known for so long, every shape, color, line of that handsome countenance. They stayed in a death-like grip, feeling each tensely drawn body, patting, grinning, both sobbing. Do you forgive me? Do you like me a little bit? Oh, Bob, I have loved you all my life. Don't ever leave me. I don't want to live if you do. Please don't ever leave me. I won't, Lick whispered. I'll never leave you. They filled their lungs full of the warm night air. The trees stood silent and friendly. 
seemed to understand as they had probably understood many times before. Gaylord shivered and Blake asked, Are you all right? I'm fine. What are you shaking about? I was wondering if that poor little animal got away. Animal? What animal? The one a dog was chasing. It barked again just before you touched me. It scared me for a second. It was good to see the grin prying at him out of the darkness. What a difference it made in the expression of the eyes. You mean I scared you? Not for long, Gillard said quietly. At first I thought that dog had me. Blake laughed. You mean you thought I was a dog? And then he whined. Instead of answering, Gaylord moved closer. No one o'clock in the morning ghost rose from the road to haunt him as they started back towards Cotton. If loving Blake was a crime for which society would never forgive him, he didn't care. In Blake, all the beauty, life, and loyalty, the endless dreams and young hopes had come alive. Was it so easy to dispose of someone who gave all this? Who else would save the effeminate boy to find beauty in his sensitive soul? For whoever or whatever you love, love is beautiful. This was his legend, and no one could take this from him. As if to reassure himself, he reached for the hand on his shoulder. Still holding it, he looked at the other on the steering wheel. Blake broke in. What are you thinking of, Gay? Gaylord opened his lips, still moist with the taste of passion. Of you, he murmured. And how lucky I am to have you. Blake tightened his grip. So am I to have you. We're all supposed to be created equal, but I think this is the first time I've ever felt like I was. Gay. What, Bob? Let's take a little trip together. Let's go someplace. Just you and I. I'd love that, Gaylord sighed, already imagining them on a strange land, riding over roads and long expanding bridges, together and without questions to be part of each other, to be able to sleep in each other's arms each night. He sat there enthralled, picturing their flight. I'll go anywhere you want to go. Anywhere. I think you would, Blake grinned. You know I would. Where would you like to go, Gay? Where would you? I'd like to show you New Orleans. New Orleans. Gaylord became alive with anticipation and memories of the old city. I'd like to see New Orleans with you. Okay, it's New Orleans, said Blake curtly. I've got some money saved up. We'll take in everything, just you and I, he sighed deeply. You don't like cotton, and I don't anymore. Maybe we could stay there. A new place with new faces and problems. That's what we need. Hell, what can you do in cotton without everybody knowing it? Not a damn thing. But Gaylord was not thinking of others, for in that instance, the faces of people became an image of unimportant time. They were the only two in the world, and they would go thus together through some oriental garden full of love and vastness. They would explore cities, clusters of shining jewels on the dark surface of the night. They would not be lost wandering in metropolitan jungles, for they would have each other. This was no dream, and if it was, wasn't he the dreamer of dreams? He had dreamed his whole life, dreamed in an upstairs bedroom in a little town so many years, and so dreaming. He held the golden bronze next to him, and the flesh responded warm and alive under his hands. Blake's fingers pressed against the warm, naked skin of Gaylord's chest. It would be fun to live in New Orleans. He cleared his throat. I'd like that. I'd like to meet Paul Boudreau. He must be a nice guy. He is, Bob, a very nice guy. There's so many like us in this old world. Wonder why? Gaylord did not answer. Instead, he looked into the darkness and beyond it he could feel the heartaches, the miseries, and the great mysterious pattern of life it sheltered. To his ears came the distant sounds of voices and laughter. They beat softly on the wall of his school, a harsh surf churning on immemorable shores. They poured scorn and mockery over the listening soul of Gaylord Leclerc. If only they had not been so accusing. If only the years had touched him with kindness. If only people were. Take away the scorn and give love. Go out and ask and listen before condemning. His memory rehearsed for him the faces he had seen in a club, at a party. They were unnaturally white, and they all smiled with sad grins. No one seemed to understand why their meetings had to be behind locked doors and smoke-filled dives. 
No one seemed to understand that they concealed a crime so dark and a secret so dreadful that it had never been put into print. They didn't know why they seemed to crave strange love. No one had ever tried to help them understand. Gaylord saw that they were not all bad, but wasn't that true of all humanity? There was a rotten apple in every crate, the same with men and women. But why should they all suffer? Did God number them among his angels, or had they been forgotten? No, they would be officially banished from the masses where their love had not taken root and which they had made fragrant with pen desires. But nothing could keep the good from God, because they too were his children. A train whistle could be heard in the distance, and Gaylord's thoughts again centered on their departure. It was as if someone were announcing a sunlit morning. It was to him that someone wholly had spoken. He nestled close to Blake. In a few weeks they would be leaving. There was going to be a tomorrow now. The sun would come up. Life would go on. His life. And now he wasn't tired at all. Far from it. For life was strong in him. So strong that the fevered and strange dreams of the past were like a climax and a farewell to a life he had left forever. And Bob, he said, besides Paul, there's someone else I'm just dying for you to meet. He's such a character and says the funniest things. His name's Jean Limbeau. And the earth on which they rode was unimportant as they planned and drove toward Cotton. End of chapter 29. Recording by Kurt Trotwine. End of Maybe Tomorrow by Jay Little.